Now to Gastonia, where the city is making plans after getting a $250,000 donation from an anonymous donor. However, that donor says the money must go towards improving the aesthetics of some busy roadways. WCNC Charlotte's Jesse Pierre shares more about how this money will be used. Yes, the city of Gastonia received a very generous gift and the money will be used to make the area surrounding several interchanges more appealing to the eye. Anything to do to beautify this area, it's going to be seen. Along US 321 and just under a mile from I-85 is Allen's Mobile Home and RV Supplies. Owner Billy Linhart says one thing he can count on seeing outside his doors is a flow of cars. Just probably almost double how much traffic I've seen out here in just the nine years that I've been here. But now, due to a generous donation, drivers can expect a more pleasant drive into Gastonia. Thanks to an anonymous $250,000 donation, three busy interchanges along I-85 will be freshened up. Those interchanges are at Cox Road, New Hope Road, and US 321. The first step, starting with some simple cleanup. The trash, the underbrush, the vine, I mean, just right. to, to clean that, and then the next step would be to uh, spruce it up. The money will also go towards replacing aging and broken fencing, planting grass and low maintenance shrubs. City leaders gave the green light for the beautification project to begin, despite some concerns of wasting money ahead of the I-85 widening project set to begin in a few years. Just hate to see him put a lot of landscaping plans in place, you know, plantings and things like that to have them yanked out in a matter of a short period of time. Mm -hmm. I think the conversation was had with the anonymous donor yes. that that project would impact, and they said, go forth and do good things. City leaders hoping to save some of the money until after the widening project is done. Linhart says this will be a good look for the city. To give people an impression of Gastonia, to make them want to come back, to make them want to shop, stop, eat. He hopes it will make the congestion in the area more bearable and hopefully attract more foot traffic in. Jesse Pierre, WCNC Charlotte. In just a few hours, the ACC men's basketball tournament is set to tip off. This is one of several major tournaments going on this week. It all comes ahead of Selection Sunday when we'll get our first look at March Madness brackets. NC State plays Louisville this afternoon at 430. Duke and UNC have their first games of the tournament on Thursday. Well, these intense games sometimes lead to fans storming the court in excitement. But WCNC's Megan Bragg explains why that might not be a great idea in today's Verify. Buzzer beater moments are what the madness is all about. But sometimes those moments can cause harm to the players. This year, a Duke player was hurt after Wake Forest fans stormed the court after their win. So can fans be civilly liable if they injure a player while storming the court? Let's verify. Our sources, attorney Eric Hayes with James Scott and Farron Law Firm, the NCAA, and the ACC. The NCAA does not have a policy on storming the court and leaves punishment up to each conference. Duke and Wake Forest are in the ACC conference. Currently, the ACC does not have rules against it. However, NCAA spokesperson David Warlock told NBC News court storming is not allowed during NCAA tournament games and they work with venues to develop a security plan to try and prevent it. They don't go into it thinking that they could be hurt during an after game court storming incident. Attorney Eric Hayes says if a player is hurt by a fan because of court storming, they could be held liable for that injury. Fans are um, if not just negligent, maybe grossly negligent or reckless, whatever they are taking the court like that if they were to cause an injury to someone. What would the argument be for a fan who rushed the court, ran into a player and hurt them? I didn't mean to do it. Well, then you should have stayed in your seat. As for schools being held liable, that's still an open question. A player who was injured did sue the school and did settle the case. Whether or not a school could be held liable, I think that that is an open question and certainly one that schools would be concerned about. So we can verify that, yes, fans can be held civilly liable if they injure a player while storming the court. With your Verify, I'm Megan Bragg. If you have something you would like verified, just email us at verify at wcnc.com. With your help, WCNC Charlotte is making a difference in our community. 
beautiful day, so many people helping. This is incredible. Let's spread that love tonight. Here is a $5,000 check that you guys wow. can use to further the mission. There is nothing on earth like the feeling of giving back with your hands. $5,000 to you and uh, Block Love Charlotte for what you guys do. If you'd like to make a difference, go to wcnc.com slash make a difference now. Time now to connect the dots when we make the news make sense. Lots of kids hearing back from colleges and universities this week as schools release their decisions. But a few a new form has colleges and families asking, where's the money? Problems with a new financial aid system have both colleges and families waiting for answers. Let's connect the dots. Before families can make a decision on college, finances are often a huge factor. But colleges are in limbo as they still wait to receive information about applicants' finances. The root of the problem comes from the FAFSA website. That's where students can see if they qualify for aid. The Department of Education has been trying to overhaul the form for years. The changes use a new calculation called the Student Aid Index to determine how much a family should get. It's meant to benefit low-income students, but it hasn't been a smooth process. Some families say they're not getting as much aid as they should. Now experts say you may want to consider appealing your case to try and get more money, hopefully in time to make a choice by College Decision Day on May 1st. And that is Connecting the Dots. Well, tomorrow is Canvas Day, where every county election board inside North Carolina will vote to officially certify the primary election results. The primary was the first election under a new state law saying mail-in ballots must be in by election day rather than getting that grace period. Yes, WCNC Charlotte's Julia Kaufman shows us how voting activists say this change discounts uh, legitimate or discounts legitimate votes, but supporters call it common sense. When North Carolinians voted by mail in previous elections, their ballots had a three day grace period to get to the county election office. That grace period is gone and now ballots marked as returned after deadline are piling up. 31. Under new state laws, absentee ballots need to get to the election office by 7.30 p.m. on election day to count. It was very unnecessary, very unfair to voters. The State Board of Elections tells WCNC Charlotte in the 2020 presidential primary, which had a higher voter turnout than in 2024, 800 ballots were returned after the three-day grace period and not counted. This year, 999 absentee ballots have been received so far that will not count due to missing the new deadline. There are people right now who did everything right and through no fault of their own, but the mail service not getting their ballot in time to the County Board of Elections, their vote won't count. Bob Phillips with Common Cause argues the new deadline hurts all absentee voters regardless of party affiliation. This law, I think, is going to contribute to that feeling that something is wrong with our elections. Supporters like the North Carolina Republican Party argue the new voting laws restore trust in elections. A spokesperson says, quote, the changes enacted by the General Assembly to strengthen election integrity and create one singular deadline worked as intended. These laws are reasonable, common sense efforts to create certainty and transparency in the election process. County election offices are required to notify voters if their vote did not count and explain why. That process will begin after the election is certified. Julia Kaufman, WCNC Charlotte. Verify, WCNC Charlotte. Verify is all about trying to make a difference in the community by making sure that the community has the correct information. This is what we know. And hey, this is what we don't know. Sometimes you're actually surprised by the answer. Verify the difference. Verify is a great way to combat that misinformation, making sure that people know the process of the reporting. Time now to connect the dots. When we make the news make sense, thousands of drivers are reporting their insurance rates are going up, and it could be thanks to data collected behind the scenes. A report shows cars made by GM, Ford, Honda, and other popular manufacturers are sending your data to insurance companies, and you may not even know about it. Let's connect the dots. In most of these vehicles, there's software tracking how you drive. It keeps data about 
when you're on the road, how fast you drive, and how quickly you brake. It's all thanks to the ability of newer cars to connect to the internet. And the New York Times reports all that data gets sent off to your insurance company for a personalized rate. And automakers say it's all legal, thanks to all those papers you sign when you buy a new car. That is Connecting the Dots. To this, another push to provide mental health resources to Carolina's most vulnerable students. We do thank you for sticking with us this evening for the news at six. I'm Vanessa Rufus. And I'm Colin Mayfield. Now, in the aftermath of a deadly school shooting in Uvalde, Texas, Congress dedicated money to help prevent future school violence and improve student mental health. But our Where's the Money investigation found new schools in the Carolinas are actually putting that money to use. Yeah, not many schools tonight, nearly yeah. two months after our Nate Morbido exposed this problem. South Carolina is making a second effort to deliver millions of federal dollars to students who are most at risk. When we discovered South Carolina had only awarded this money to a dozen school districts, the Department of Education said it would find a way to spend the rest of the money. Well, now if everything goes as planned, more than twice as many school districts could receive this potentially life-saving money in round two. In Uvalde, Texas, a gunman murdered two teachers and 19 children. Almost two years later, millions of dollars in grants sit unused. Funds elected leaders approved to prevent another Robb Elementary School shooting. It makes no sense to me for these dollars to be offered by the federal government to be sitting in coffers while our schools are not as safe as they can be. We, we need to do better. It's a revelation WCNC Charlotte took all the way to the top. First with the Secretary of Education and then with the vice president herself. Well, that's part of why I'm here, to make sure that the money gets to where it needs to be going. These so-called Stronger Connections grants are meant to help school districts with high rates of poverty, bullying, absenteeism, and exclusionary discipline. Sometimes I just think I'm not sure how some of these children kind of survive their life. But York School District 1 is the only school system in the Charlotte area that's received a grant so far. The district is using the money to ensure every school has its own mental health therapist. My mission is to help these children who are struggling so much. South Carolina is hoping others will take notice of York's efforts. If you are eligible, please, please apply. The Department of Education opened a second round of applications this month. Records show more than 50 South Carolina districts are eligible and they have two months to submit their applications. We just wanna make sure that this gets out there and we don't have to send any of it back. While South Carolina is moving on to round two, North Carolina has still not spent a single cent of this money. You can blame that on bureaucracy and delays in communication. Nate Morbido, WCNC Charlotte. Now to go further here, we asked some of the districts that did not apply in round one why not? The Lancaster County School District told us the timing was not good back then, but assured us if there was a second round, it would apply. So we alerted those district leaders earlier today that this opportunity is available to them. And so as you can see, Nate and our Where's the Money team are very hard at work. They are tracking those federal dollars. They're keeping receipts here. They're checking those. They're holding those in power accountable, really all in an effort to give you answers. So that being said, if you have something out there you think our team should be looking into, please let us know. You can send us an email to money at WCNC.com or reach out to our team on social media. Calmer weather here. Beautiful view from uptown. Starting to see some of the green pop up on those buildings. I bet by tomorrow for the parade, you're going to see a lot of green showing up across the skyline of Charlotte. So a little bit of fog tonight. Don't be surprised to see that tomorrow morning. A sunny Saturday. We're going to see temperatures in the mid 70s. St. Patrick's Day looks great, though. I do expect to see a few more clouds in the afternoon. If you are going uptown for the parade, certainly looks like a perfect day. I mean, you can't ask for better weather than this. Mid 50s early on temperatures climbing into the 60s. Eventually we will be in the 70s as we get into the afternoon. The weekend overall is not bad. Maybe a, a few sprinkles in the morning with some drizzle or mist, but as the day goes on, it'll be mostly sunny and Sunday. I, I do think we'll see some sun, but we're certainly going to see increasing clouds as we get into the afternoon. The one thing that could kick, up, kick off a sprinkle is that little front pushing through, but should be gone by sunrise. Lots of sunshine tomorrow, but a second front comes through on Sunday. This is the one that cools us off, and there might be a few sprinkles to the south as that pushes through. Even on Monday, we might have some low clouds, fog, and drizzle. And just to show you what that looks like, 
overnight into the morning hours should be okay. And then by tomorrow afternoon, I mean, just wall to wall sunshine. What a great Saturday Sunday, though. Notice the increasing clouds and watch the rain pass just to the south. As we go into early Monday, that's why we could see a stray shower. Now the cooler temperatures come in with that second front as it blasts through the Carolinas. It will drop colder air at least for a couple of days into the east and southeast, and that means chilly afternoon highs in the 50s. But more importantly, the morning lows could dip down to or uh, to freezing or below for a couple of nights. So enjoy the spring warmth this weekend because going back to work on Monday and Tuesday, it is going to be noticeably cooler. And if you're a gardener, landscaper, you started planting things early, you may want to take some precautions or things that are already flowering that you didn't want to flower early because of the early warmth, you might have to take some precautions. Remember, get those sheets out. We'll probably need those a couple of nights. The other thing you do, remember, heavy watering the day of or the day before can actually help retain heat in the plant and the soil around it to keep it a little bit warmer overnight. We're not going to get much rain this weekend, just a 20% chance on Sunday, but late next week again, we might have another system on that Friday, Saturday time frame. The timing is very fluid right now. This far out little shift can mean all the difference in the world, so stay tuned, but we're likely going to have another system. Other thing to look out for this weekend, allergy suffers a lot of pollen. We saw some today get washed away a little bit by the rain. It'll come roaring back this weekend and be back in the high range as we go into next week. So planning your weekend, both days, not bad. Probably a little bit more cloud cover on Sunday, but heck, it's 70s and <laughs> we're talking about St. Patrick's Day weekend. You can't believe it. I mean, just a warm stretch of weather. The cooler temperatures are moving back in Monday and Tuesday. We go 10 days into the future and notice the temperatures staying in the 60s all the way until next weekend. All right, Brad, thanks for that extended look too. Next. WCNC Charlotte. Weather is a, a kind of science that you get to see and experience every day. And I think some people don't even realize how much it affects them. That weather has a huge impact on how it threatens your family, your livelihood, or your home. So I think it really is one of those defining things we do that really affects everybody in our community. See the difference. That process of giving you a warning ahead of time and keeping you and your family safe is really important to me because I live here too. It's my family, it's my friends, it's my neighbors. Well, an 11 year old boy with dreams of starting up his own landscaping business is getting some big help. We first told you about Quentin Hines earlier this week. Now he's getting a big boost, getting some fresh new tools. WCNC Charlotte's Miles Harris gives us a closer look. To see him at 11 with adult equipment um, is scary for me as a mom. <laughs> But it's just what he loves to do. By far one of our best mowers. Who would have thought an 11 year old would love to cut grass so much? That's exactly where Quentin Hines passion lies, making a difference inside his community one lawn at a time. What do you like about cutting grass most or doing yard work, huh? I don't know. I just enjoy it. Probably just beautifying lawns and yeah, making lawns look beautiful. We'll help you out all we can. He's getting a helpful hand from Cenex. The company caught Quentin's story and wanted to assist his service. Easier we can make that on him, whether it's lighter tools, uh, tools that move on our own uh, with just the squeeze of a handle, uh, or whatever that is, uh, and then providing him with all the tools uh, that he needed. Not only adding more tools in the shed for Quentin, but also adding $1,000 to his GoFundMe. The fact that we're helping a young kid at a young age um, mold into what's going to be a very, very productive uh, and positive role model uh, in his community and in our community. Life lessons on generosity that his family surely appreciates. I think you know, this is really just showing Quentin now that people will stand behind you and support, you know, saying your dream when you let it be known. Yeah. So I think that's very big for him at this early age. His next step might include getting more space. And with all the stuff that they're giving now, we're definitely going to need additional space to yeah. put this stuff. Yeah, oh, wow. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. Our garage is now gone. <laughs> <laughs> space to continue his dreams. What do you hope, big picture? What do you want to do? Um, just give like free services to senior citizens, help out other people, and. Just beautiful lines. In Huntersville, Miles Harris, WCNC Charlotte. Unemployment rate is going in the right direction. There are many still struggling to find a job with a livable wage. Yeah, it is tough out there for many folks. The Charlotte Cooking School is helping people get ahead and get into the workforce, particularly by training them to prepare 
five star meals. Our Larry Sprinkle has been asking, where's the money? And for some folks, it's right there in the kitchen. 21 year old Courtney Allen, also known as Cam, moved to Charlotte a few months ago. Growing up, she always had the dream of playing basketball. I love basketball. But she also liked to cook. A few bad work experiences in the kitchen had her feeling like cooking was not a good fit, especially when combined with some difficult life experiences she was going through at the time. I was going through a lot before I came down here. Then she heard about the community culinary school. So I was able to see how it felt to be in a position that a real chef would be in. We are a 501c3 nonprofit that works with adults who've experienced barriers to long-term employment. Since 1997, skilled and professional chefs like Chef Ron have been helping students reach the goal of earning a living wage, creating delicious meals. The Community Culinary School of Charlotte gives back. We offer folks an opportunity to touch the success that they envision for themselves. And there is a hunger for the chefs who learn their craft here. As we emerge from COVID, the hospitality industry needs help and they need trained professionals. This training is just what Cam needs to give her the confidence to get back into the kitchen. My knife skills, yes. That prove you so much on your knife skills. Giving her the cutting edge, just like on the hardwoods. It's a passion. <laughs> I love basketball, so I made this a passion as well. So Cam is putting on a full court press to complete the training and take her victory lap. It's like you won a championship when you graduate. You get what I'm saying? It's like you won a medal. So hopefully I get my medal because I'm almost there. We are training hospitality folks so they have the ability to grow and, and uh, take care of themselves, their families, their community. Earning the title of chef isn't the end. It's just the beginning for Cam, who has a very big dream. It's hopefully in 10 years I have my own restaurant, my own staff, me working under me. Chopping it up on the east side of Charlotte, Larry Sprinkle, back to you. What's that old? WCNC Charlotte. Good morning, Carolinas. Tune in to the team that's preparing you for your day. The one and only Larry Sprinkle. See the difference in your morning. It is bitter cold just about anywhere you look. Here's a look right here at I-77 northbound. Trying to make your dollar stretch a little bit further. Responsible reporting, community focused, unique content. It's so good to see you. you too. Oh, y'all are having too much like fun. This. See the difference weekday mornings on WCNC Charlotte. Now, burnout in nursing is on the rise, and this is an issue we've seen only get worse since the pandemic. There's no doubt. Right now, the American Nurses Association says it's more important than ever to understand how to manage and then prevent the condition. WCNC Charlotte's Lexi Wilson introduces us to a local nurse who is using comedy as her outlet. In uptown Charlotte, it's a real big deal to be invited here. The Bloomingthal Arts Stage Door Theater is a place with passion for local productions. The lighting, the sound, the tech crew, uh, there's ushers here. We love the ushers. Debbie Millwater has a love for comedy. Comedy has played a huge part in my life. Even though I like to think that I'm funny, uh, my kids assure me that I am not. While she spent time on stage, she enjoys being a comedy show producer even more. <laughs> helping create shows like the 2024 March Mania Comedy Tournament, where 32 local comedians battle it out until there's one winner. It just lights them up inside. It's very validating. It's a light <laughs> Debbie also needs. I just celebrated my sixth anniversary as a overnight bedside nurse. These days, there's an urgent warning about the shortage of health care workers. Research shows burnout and fatigue are prevalent. It's something Debbie has felt, especially during the pandemic. Staffing numbers had dropped and uh, the complexity of the patients didn't change. She's worked in the COVID unit and now works with cancer patients, most of them fighting for their life. That's why the laughs made here are so important. Comedy definitely helped me push through I, not only the pandemic, but nursing in general. A love for comedy, rewarding on and off the stage. And the March Mania Comedy Tournament finale is this Friday here at Stage Door Theater at 7 p.m. Tickets are $10. Reporting in Uptown for WCNC Charlotte, I'm Lexi Wilson. What an empowering way, you know, to find a, a medium to get all of that out. It's not good to keep in either. So true, and, and it is a tough job. 
Man. Someone who comes from a family, mom's a nurse, yeah. cousins, nurses, yeah. aunts, nurses. Those are special people. Humanity has to be <laughs> thankful. And uh, so I think sometimes we take them for granted. Yeah. So. Good Wednesday morning. Now Zillow, which is a real estate market company, is doing some research on how much we need to make to afford a home without stretching the budget at least so much. Now the report can be very numbers heavy, but we broke it down like this. First, Zillow is finding that the income needed to comfortably afford a home is up 80% since 2020. Now keep in mind the median income has only risen 23% in that same amount of time. For those shopping for homes today, you need to be well in the six figure range. Zillow says you need to be making, taking home rather more than $106,000 a year. Then those researchers took that, those numbers and made a ranked list. They took 50 metro areas across the country and compared how much is needed to afford a house in each one. Charlotte came in at number 23. Now the ranking shows you would have to save for about nine years just to afford a 10% down payment. And as for possible solutions, well, the article points to an interesting trend. So it's called house hacking. It just means being able to rent out all or part of a home so you can get some extra cash. Zillow says at least 21% of last year's buyers reported co-buying with either a friend or a relative in order to save some money. So it's why we're asking if you'd be willing to take the same route this morning. Here's the question. Would you co-buy your house with a friend or a relative? Make sure you text us 704-329-3600. Wake up to the news that matters most with meteorologist and traffic reporter Chris Mulcahy. And we're all clear. We're keeping you smarter, safer, and on time. Start your day the Mulcahy way. See the difference. 430 to 7 on WCNC Charlotte. If you've ever received a bill or bought a ticket for a concert and noticed the price was a lot higher than you anticipated, you may have gotten hit with junk fees. But what exactly are they and can you combat them? WCNC Charlotte's Megan Bragg looks into it in today's Verify. So let's get the facts. Our sources are the Biden administration, a bill filed in the Senate, and Sarah Rathner with NerdWallet. Rathner says many people don't know this, but we're spending a lot of money each year on junk fees. These individual fees on their own might not seem like much, but Added up all together, junk fees are costing American families tens of billions of dollars a year. A bill filed in the U.S. Senate known as the Junk Fees Prevention Act would make merchants disclose these hidden fees up front instead of hiding them at the very end of the transaction. Rathner says while this won't make these hidden fees any lower, it's still a step in the right direction. But it is going to make it easier for consumers to comparison shop knowing the final price and not just the initial price that's being advertised. This means if you're deciding between, let's say, two hotel rooms under the Junk Fees Prevention Act, both places would have to disclose any hidden fees before you get to the end of the checkout process. You can then choose which hotel works best for you. Rathner says since junk fees aren't going away, you'll need to include them in your budget. It is unfortunate that you can't always tell what something's going to cost until the very end, but really what might be helpful is just budgeting an additional amount of money. So if you think something's going to cost you $50, maybe budget 75 just in case. With your Verify Fact Check, I'm Megan Bragg. And if you have something you would like verified, just email us at verify at wcnc.com. Meantime, right now at 6, learning can be a challenge for many students for a lot of different reasons. For students who are hard of hearing, though, those hurdles can be tougher to overcome. Now, a Charlotte family is pushing for CMS to change the way their child who is deaf is taught, saying the current system is too isolating. The state provides extra funding for each student who is deaf in public schools. However, the parents argue those dollars are not going to their child's education the way it's supposed to. That has our Michelle Bowden asking, where's the money? Up until a few years ago, there were several different options for teaching deaf students in Mecklenburg County. Now, though, the parents we talked to say there's only one option, and they say it's setting their kids up for failure. Afternoons in this house look a little different than most. There's all the hubbub of after school energy, but not a lot of noise. Mom and dad are deaf, and so are four of their seven kids. Three of the kids who are deaf are at University Meadows Elementary School, where they are mainstreamed in a class with all hearing kids and have an interpreter. It's nice for my deaf children to be in a challenging environment where they're stimulated to learn and around other hearing children. That's fine. 
but there isn't communication and association with other deaf children. Besides their siblings, they need to be around with other children who are like them. We worked with an interpreter to do this interview where mom told us how frustrated she is with the way her kids are being taught. So all day long, the only person that they're interacting with is the interpreter. So they don't get to learn vicariously from other students. They don't get the opportunity to uh, help other students. They don't get the opportunity to be helped by other students. They don't get to talk about what's cool and what's not cool. She says the only people that know sign language at her kids' school are the interpreters assigned to each of them. So when the kids go to school, they literally can only communicate with the interpreter and that's it? Yes, just the interpreter. It hasn't always been this way. Until 2016, CMS had a special program for deaf students in Mecklenburg County where the kids were taught under one roof at Cotswold Elementary. In fact, that's where Carolyn went to school and it's what she wanted for her own kids. To see what's happening and to hear from the interpreters. Donna McCord Smolik is a deaf advocate who also grew up here in Charlotte and sent her kids to Cotswold. You know, the hearing students are in such a uh, for them, an integrated classroom, but it is such not an integrated classroom for the deaf student. They're left out, they're placed on an island, and all of the hearing people around them who don't know any different think they're doing the right best thing because they've got them so integrated that they've erased them, and there they are sitting alone, and it just breaks my heart. We checked with the state and learned every North Carolina school district decides how they want to approach teaching deaf students. Wake County, the school district most comparable to Mecklenburg, told us most of the students who are hearing impaired in their district attend their home schools with an interpreter if needed. But Wake County also offers regional programs or cluster programs for deaf students at three schools. We also checked in with the National Association for the Deaf, NAD, who told us as of 2020, 70% of deaf students were mainstreamed across the country, but pointed to the 2004 Federal Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act, or IDEA. That requires options for deaf children, including cluster schools that serve large groups of deaf students at selected schools. A spokesman for NAD told us, quote, deaf schools are an important placement opportunity mandated by IDEA that can be very beneficial for deaf children in providing education and community. Because right now, all of the deaf children are dispersed. And it is hard for deaf children to be around other deaf children. The state gives each school district an extra $5,600 per deaf student to make sure they have the tools they need. But Carolyn says money meant for her kids is being lumped in with money for all kids with special needs. To use the money that is allocated for the deaf student and then subsume it into a larger budget that's paying for ramps and for other forms of access isn't fair. That money was allocated to the deaf student. It makes me wonder about their future. I see a lack of resources. I see a lack of education for the deaf children. I see them not being set for success. The family we talked to say they're working with several advocates in town looking into the possibility of bringing a charter school for deaf students here in Mecklenburg County. They tell us right now they're in the exploratory phase. Reporting in Charlotte, Michelle Bowden, WCNC Charlotte. Now our Where's the Money team works hard to hold those in power accountable, including the school systems and government agencies that use your taxpayer dollars. That being said, most of the time it's your tips that really prompt us to start digging into those receipts. So if you have something you think we should investigate, please let us know. You can send an email to money at WCNC.com or reach out to us on social media. When it comes to WCNC's Chief Meteorologist Brad Panovich, our viewers tell the whole story. Hey, if you're new to the area, this meteorologist is awesome. I always stick with Brad Panovich when it comes to severe weather. He's rarely wrong. You should follow Brad if you don't already. He's usually right on the money with his forecast. I don't look at anything else besides what Brad says. We are fortunate to have him here. Brad Panovich, experience the difference with WCNC Charlotte weather. Well, many people in North Carolina are trying their hand at mobile sports betting. Of course, there are going to be some wins and some losses, but are you allowed to deduct your losses from your taxes? WCNC Charlotte's Megan Bragg spoke to the experts in today's Verify. Are you getting lucky or are you seeing more losses than wins on these bets? It's okay, you can be honest. So if you do lose, can you deduct gambling losses on your taxes? Let's verify. 
Our source is Mark Stieber, tax information officer with Jackson Hewitt Tax Services, the IRS, and Intuit TurboTax. According to the IRS, winnings from any gambling are taxable. Stieber says if you win over $600, that's when you will get a form to fill out to record those winnings. If you win more than $600, you're going to get a W-2G with the amount, where you want it, how much you want, and those details. And the IRS will get it too. Now, if you win $5,000 or more, there's a mandatory withholding. And the government will take 24% of their taxes up front. But what if you lose? Fast answer is yes. If you have losses while gambling, you may be able to take a tax deduction. May is the key word here because there are certain conditions you'd have to meet. According to TurboTax, you can deduct your gambling losses, but only to offset the income from your gambling winnings. You can't just deduct losses without reporting winnings. And the dollar amount of losses you can deduct can never exceed the winnings you report as income. To report losses, says you must itemize income tax deductions on a Schedule A form. Also, the IRS doesn't permit you to subtract your losses from your winnings and only report the difference on your tax return. Overall, if you have winnings, you can deduct same day, same types of losses to the extent you have winnings, but not a net loss and not all different types of bets, one at the casino, one at the dog track, and then one playing poker, and then the other one in the March Madness pool. Same types of bets can offset same types of income and losses. So we can verify that, yes, you can deduct gambling losses on your taxes. However, there are rules you must follow so that those deductions pass muster with the IRS. With your Verify, I'm Megan Brown. When did you know what you wanted to be? Hey, Mom, the weather's on! WCNC Charlotte's chief meteorologist, Brad Panovich, always knew what he was meant to do. Right, don't forget your umbrella. In fact, he joined the American Meteorological Society when he was 13. Now Brad is all grown up. You can see him right here on WCNC Charlotte, making sure you're informed and safe. Hey, where did all my hair go? Experience the difference. Calmer weather here. Beautiful view from uptown. Starting to see some of the green pop up on those buildings. I bet by tomorrow for the parade, you're going to see a lot of green showing up across the skyline of Charlotte. So a little bit of fog tonight. Don't be surprised to see that tomorrow morning. A sunny Saturday. We're going to see temperatures in the mid 70s. St. Patrick's Day looks great, though. I do expect to see a few more clouds in the afternoon. If you are going uptown for the parade, certainly looks like a perfect day. I mean, you can't ask for better weather than this. Mid 50s early on temperatures climbing into the 60s. Eventually will be in the 70s as we get into the afternoon. The weekend overall is not bad. Maybe a, a few sprinkles in the morning with some drizzle or mist, but as the day goes on, it'll be mostly sunny. And Sunday, I, I do think we'll see some sun, but we're certainly going to see increasing clouds as we get into the afternoon. The one thing that could kick, up, kick off a sprinkle is that little front pushing through, but should be gone by sunrise. Lots of sunshine tomorrow, but a second front comes through on Sunday. This is the one that cools us off, and there might be a few sprinkles to the south as that pushes through. Even on Monday, we might have some low clouds, fog and drizzle. And just to show you what that looks like overnight into the morning hours should be OK. And then by tomorrow afternoon, I mean, just wall to wall sunshine. What a great Saturday Sunday, though. Notice the increasing clouds and watch the rain pass just to the south as we go into early Monday. That's why we could see a stray shower. Now the cooler temperatures come in with that second front as it blasts through the Carolinas. It will drop colder air at least for a couple of days into the east and southeast. And that means chilly afternoon highs in the 50s. But more importantly, the morning lows could dip down to or uh, to freezing or below for a couple of nights. So I enjoyed the spring warmth this weekend because going back to work on Monday and Tuesday, it is going to be noticeably cooler. And if you're a gardener, landscaper, you started planting things early, you may want to take some precautions or things that are already flowering that you didn't want to flower early because of the early warmth. You might have to take some precautions. Remember, get those sheets out. We'll probably need those a couple of nights. The other thing you do remember heavy watering the day of or the day before can actually help retain heat in the plant and the soil around it to keep it a little bit warmer overnight. We're not going to get much rain this weekend, just a 20% chance on Sunday, but late next week again, we might have another system on that Friday, Saturday time frame. The timing is very fluid right now. This far out little shift can mean all the difference in the world, so stay tuned, but we're likely going to have another system. Other thing to look out for this weekend, allergy suffers a lot of pollen. We saw some today get washed away a little bit by the rain. It'll come roaring back this weekend and be back in the high range as we go into next week. So planning your weekend, both days, not bad. Probably a little bit more cloud cover on Sunday, 
but heck, it's 70s and we're talking about St. Patrick's Day weekend. You can't believe it. I mean, just a warm stretch of weather. The cooler temperatures are moving back in Monday and Tuesday. We go 10 days into the future and notice the temperatures staying in the 60s all the way until next weekend. All right, Brad, thanks for that extended look too. Next is continuing to fight for his life tonight after a triple shooting in Mooresville left him hospitalized. A suspect and two victims dead. The Iredell County Sheriff's Office responded to a call, shots fired call on home drive Saturday night. When they arrived, they say they found three people tied up, two victims already dead. Another person in critical condition was taken to the hospital. Shortly after, deputies then got information leading them to another home on Oswald Amity Road in connection to the suspect in the incident. And that's where an hours long standoff took place before coming to a deadly end. WCNC Charlotte's Anna King has the latest on the investigation. Neighbors in Iredale County say they were jolted out of their sleep to the sound of multiple gunshots Saturday. Those shots were coming from a home on Oswald Amity Road. Deputies with Iredale County Sheriff's Office say they were trying to take 39 year old Justin Strawyer into custody. They say Saturday night he tied three people up at a home on Home Drive in Mooresville. Officials say Strawyer killed two of those victims, 22 year old Eduardo Cordova and 24 year old Caleb Loper. The third victim is in the hospital in Charlotte. Officials say shortly after the shooting, Strawyer barricaded himself inside the home on Oswald and Mitty Drive. They say he was shooting his AR-15 when they arrived on scene. For hours, there were negotiations to get him out, as well as four juveniles who deputies say were in the home and refused to come out as well. Deputies eventually used gas to get everyone out of the home, and they say Strawyer followed the juveniles out while shooting at deputies. Officers then returned fire, shooting and killing Strawyer. The Iredell County Sheriff says the crimes that took place on the home were not random and notes drugs and robbery are a possible motive. In Mooresville, Anna King, WCNC Charlotte. The North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation will now lead the investigation. And as per protocol, three deputies are on administrative leave. Thanks, Brad. There's an ongoing study, though, in Gastonia analyzing barriers to housing and then recommending how to remove them. The goal here is to implement policies that create more affordable housing and then address the disparities. But it does seem like the city is falling short in some places and has been for years. WCNC Charlotte's Julia Kaufman takes a closer look. A third party analysis found five main issues that are making it harder for people to find fair housing in Gastonia and the barriers go beyond affordability. The Gastonia City Council's Housing Committee received an update Monday on the federally required housing study that's done every five years. Of course, there's a limited supply of affordable housing. City data says rent prices have nearly doubled since 2015. But Director of Housing Danette Dyes says the analysis also found there's limited housing supply for those persons with disability. The same problem was found in 2019, and the study says the city has not implemented anything yet to try to address it. Making sure that our most vulnerable citizens and those people who have the least voice are not left behind and don't fall through the cracks. Um, and I think that the, the study definitely showed that some of that does happen. Housing Committee Chairman Robert Kellogg says the city is working to update its zoning codes so it can be more inclusive with development. As we implement more ways to build and more ways to include different zoning opportunities, that that would also help individuals who are disabled. Gastonia leaders adopted an affordable housing plan in fall 2023. Goals in the 10 year plan include creating a housing trust fund and building a housing resource center. I think there's definitely room to improve, but I think we're on the right track. Researchers want your feedback on the fair housing analysis and recommendations before they present them to the city council next month. We have details on how you can participate on WCNC.com. WCNC Charlotte. Good morning, Carolinas. Tune in to the team that's preparing you for your day. We are following two major breaking news stories this morning. See the difference in your morning. We can see clear skies out there off of the distance. Everything is flowing just fine. We're asking where's the money so you can get ahead in 2024. Responsible reporting, community focused. 
unique content. Good morning, Savannah. Hi, Sarah. Great to see you. See the difference. Weekday mornings on WCNC Charlotte. Living in a neighborhood run by a homeowners associations association has its upsides and downsides. A Mooresville family found themselves asking where's the money after discovering some of their HOA's approved colors didn't even exist anymore. The family picked a color they liked only to be hit with a thousand dollar fine until neighbors stepped in. Kenneth Threed and his wife, Tisha, say most of the time they've enjoyed their house at the end of a quiet cul-de-sac in the meadows at Reed Creek Community. They've always taken pride in its upkeep. I'm a peaceful guy, you know, in this neighborhood I've been here 18 years. Um, we never had no problems. But things started stirring up last fall when the couple decided to refresh their home's exterior paint. Threet admits it was almost completely painted before he learned he needed to fill out a request for architectural approval. So I went to the HOA representative and she said to me, this color you have is not an approved color. After requesting a hearing in which the Threets were denied permission to keep their darker shade of gray, Threet says the board told them they'd have to change the color. We want to be in compliance um, with, with the HOA rules and regulations. So we was trying to work with them. Three then took a drive around his neighborhood. I found out that there was other colors in the neighborhood that was not approved colors. So to be clear, Threed says other neighbors had homes painted in colors that were not approved. We were not able to determine whether those neighbors requested and received HOA permission before painting. Either way, Threed says he was told to change theirs or else. They charged us $1,000 fine for not having the right color. Another neighbor, Mark Lepard, says he could empathize. The personal feeling was that uh, not everyone on the board had complete empathy with a lot of the requests that were being made. And it just so happened last month, homeowners voted in new HOA board members, including Lepard. From what I've heard personally, there was an overwhelming amount of people that did want to see a difference in the way that the, the rules are enforced on them. Three is one of them. Thank God for Mark and the ones that came on. The new board has signed off on the, the paint colors that they chose, and so they don't have to paint their house. Um, they were assessed some fines, and we've waived those, and so they're good to go. It worked out for the threats, but he says the last several months have been stressful. It also serves as a reminder if you live in a neighborhood run by an HOA to read the guidelines when it comes to changing or adding to the appearance of your house. Homeowners usually have to fill out an application for an architectural review for major changes. It'll save time and aggravation knowing if you can proceed with any kind of construction or remodeling work. Well, if you've been here in Charlotte for a couple of years or maybe longer, you've seen Charlotte continue to grow. But as businesses come and go, there's one local business that is standing the test of time. Dilworth Mattress Factory has been in Charlotte for 92 years, opening up in 1931 during the height of the Depression. WCNC Charlotte's Jesse Pierre spoke to the owners about how they have helped folks rest easy for decades. Mm -hmm. Dilworth Mattress Factory has been in the Dilworth South End community for over 90 years, and there are generations of history behind this door. The photo of Dilworth Mattress Factory founder Thomas Philbeck firmly mounted to the wall. When he started it as a um, as a mattress refurbish business, he would. It was right after the Great Depression. Since 1931, the company has evolved from a mattress repair shop to handmade custom orders helping folks rest easy. We start with a traditional spring right like this on some mattresses. Scott Hirsch picked up the family business and is the current owner where the work is all about the feels. We can make this side soft and this side firm. Along with his wife, Dory Hirsch, who showed off a mattress fit for a queen. This is the only mattress that we actually do not make in our factory. It holds the royal warrant, and this is actually what the entire royal family sleeps on. The factory, in its third location in 92 years, is surrounded by new development. Hirsch says he's been around to see a lot of the changes. Plenty of mattress stores have come and gone since we've been here, and, and plenty of businesses in the South End area have come and gone. He says referrals and repeat customers keep their operations from taking a snooze. And the pandemic came along, 
and people weren't really going out. So it kind of introduced us into uh, mattress sale by appointment only. Adapting with the times, Dilworth Mattress Factory is springing forward to a century and beyond. Sold to generations to generations and kids of, ki kids of parents and, and, th and their kids now. So um, I think it's important for us to continue this uh, tradition. Jesse Pierre, WCNC Charlotte. I'm astonished by the bed for the Royals. About that. Yeah, I mean, I know it's not the exact bed that they sleep on, but I want, yeah, I want to know more about that. I'm gonna have to ask Jesse. Ask the Royals. Or yeah, they'll, they'll dish on <laughs> how it feels. Is I'm it just, angelic? Like sleeping on a cloud? Yeah, like yeah. how do they get in touch with them anyway? That caught my eye too. Yeah. All right. Well. When I think about the community, I think about the time that I've been here. I've been in this community almost my entire adult life. So I, I, you, know, you get to know the people. When you know what they care about, then that's what you care about. This community looks at all of us who do weather here at WCNC Charlotte as part of their family. And uh, when you're part of their family, you want to make sure you do it just for them. Time now to connect the dots. When we make the news, make sense. President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris set to campaign here in North Carolina later this month once again. And Democrats think he has a real shot at winning the state come November. Down ballot races could help President Joe Biden pull out a win in the Tar Heel state. Let's connect the dots. The president lost North Carolina in 2020 by just under a percentage point. But the New York Times reports Republican candidate for governor Mark Robinson could push voters to a Democratic ticket. Robinson has a history of anti-Semitic comments and opposes abortion and gay rights, which may even turn away some conservative voters. With the governor's race getting even national attention, outgoing Democratic Governor Roy Cooper believes it's a battleground state that could give a slight edge to the president over former President Donald Trump. Biden's campaign making the state a top priority as North Carolina quickly grows, many new residents are coming from blue states. But it won't be easy. A Democratic presidential candidate hasn't won the state since 2008. And that is Connecting the Dots. A Charlotte nonprofit is asking for your help tonight after receiving some generous donations. Yeah, Beds for Kids is looking for volunteers to help families get ahead, starting with a good night's rest. Our Larry Sprinkle takes us to the warehouse and tells us how you can make a difference here. I'm going to take this over to the trash. Lauren Patterson is volunteering to help out and get her hands dirty at the same time. It's not very glamorous, but it needed to be done. For the past two years, Lauren has helped kids across the Mecklenburg and Cabarrus County areas get a good night's sleep by lending a helping hand. I am from Charlotte, born and raised, and I feel like it's very easy to grow up in a, in a bubble here, but there is so much need just 10 to 15 minutes down the road. And, you know, one hour, one volunteer can do so much. She's just one of a handful of volunteers with beds for kids, helping families get everything from a chair to a dining room table. Every single volunteer that we receive and have at this warehouse is essential and really important to our mission. So without volunteers, we could not operate. And their work is critical. I think that a child who feels safe in their home and gets a good night's sleep is only going to be um, more successful in school, and that's only going to continue to carry them um, to be successful. Beds for Kids usually delivers to 30 families per week. But next week, with the help of several suppliers, they want to try and furnish 60 to 70 family homes. There's only 12 of us, so we definitely need more volunteers for that. Volunteers making a difference, getting together and cleaning furniture, and the reward for their work is often seen firsthand. To see the kids come home and to be so excited to have a bed to sleep on that night. In West Charlotte, I'm Larry Sprinkle. Back to you. So if you can help and you don't mind lifting and moving some furniture, get in touch with Beds for Kids through our website, WCNC.com or our mobile app. Hey YouTube, this is Chief Meteorologist Brad Panovich here at WCNC Charlotte. We want you to head over to our Weather IQ YouTube page, where we're making you smarter and safer. We have a passion for weather science, and we want you to understand what's happening when the weather changes, because in the end, that's what keeps you safe. It's not about being scared, it's about being informed. Browse our collection of fun and informative clips and look for new segments every week. We're here to raise your Weather IQ. Experience the difference on WCNC Charlotte calmer weather here, 
beautiful view from uptown. I'm starting to see some of the green pop up on those buildings. I bet by tomorrow for the parade, you're going to see a lot of green showing up across the skyline of Charlotte. So a little bit of fog tonight. Don't be surprised to see that tomorrow morning. A sunny Saturday. We're going to see temperatures in the mid 70s. St. Patrick's Day looks great, though. I do expect to see a few more clouds in the afternoon. If you are going uptown for the parade, certainly looks like a perfect day. I mean, you can't ask for better weather than this. Mid 50s early on temperatures climbing into the 60s. Eventually we will be in the 70s as we get into the afternoon. The weekend overall is not bad. Maybe a, a few sprinkles in the morning with some drizzle or mist, but as the day goes on, it'll be mostly sunny and Sunday. I, I do think we'll see some sun, but we're certainly going to see increasing clouds as we get into the afternoon. The one thing that could kick, up, kick off a sprinkle is that little front pushing through, but should be gone by sunrise. Lots of sunshine tomorrow, but a second front comes through on Sunday. This is the one that cools us off, and there might be a few sprinkles to the south as that pushes through. Even on Monday, we might have some low clouds, fog and drizzle. And just to show you what that looks like overnight into the morning hours should be OK. And then by tomorrow afternoon, I mean, just wall to wall sunshine. What a great Saturday Sunday, though. Notice the increasing clouds and watch the rain pass just to the south as we go into early Monday. That's why we could see a stray shower. Now the cooler temperatures come in with that second front as it blasts through the Carolinas. It will drop colder air at least for a couple of days into the east and southeast, and that means chilly afternoon highs in the 50s. But more importantly, the morning lows could dip down to or uh, to freezing or below for a couple of nights. So enjoy the spring warmth this weekend because going back to work on Monday and Tuesday, it is going to be noticeably cooler. And if you're a gardener, landscaper, you started planting things early, you may want to take some precautions or things that are already flowering that you didn't want to flower early because of the early warmth. You might have to take some precautions. Remember, get those sheets out. We'll probably need those a couple of nights. The other thing you do remember heavy watering the day of or the day before can actually help retain heat in the plant and the soil around it to keep it a little bit warmer overnight. We're not going to get much rain this weekend, just a 20% chance on Sunday, but late next week again, we might have another system on that Friday, Saturday time frame. The timing is very fluid right now. This far out little shift can mean all the difference in the world, so stay tuned, but we're likely going to have another system. Other thing to look out for this weekend. Allergy suffers a lot of pollen. We saw some today get washed away a little bit by the rain. It'll come roaring back this weekend and be back in the high range as we go into next week. So planning your weekend both days. Not bad, probably a little bit more cloud cover on Sunday, but heck it's 70s and <laughs> we're talking about St. Patrick's Day weekend. You can't believe it. I mean, just a warm stretch of weather. The cooler temperatures are moving back in Monday and Tuesday. We go 10 days into the future and notice the temperatures staying in the 60s all the way until next weekend. All right, Brad, thanks for that extended look too. Next. Governor Rory Cooper has announced an executive action striking down the state's rules on name, image and likeness compensation that were issued back in 2021. They, he says these rules are no longer needed, adding they set the standard for colleges and universities to come up with their own NIL policies. Go, uh, Governor Cooper also says his executive action plays a key role in leveling the playing field for student athletes across North Carolina so they have the same access to NIL as athletes in any other state. Time now to connect the dots. When we make the news make sense. A new study says air pollution is hurting the performance of North Carolina students in class and in sports. And it turns out a new statewide initiative could help reduce those numbers. Electric buses are coming to North Carolina and that could help keep your kids healthy. Let's connect the dots. Yale researchers looked at test scores and pollution exposure for every public school student in North Carolina over 17 years. They found the more time a child was exposed to pollution, there was a direct correlation to failing test scores. While pollution in the Tar Heel State has improved over the last 20 years, kids are still exposed to lots of pollution. The study suggests this is in large part because of cars and buses. And there is a program looking to change that. The state is currently in the process of using more than $25 million to buy 114 electric buses. 27 of those will be deployed here in Mecklenburg County. Experts say these buses could significantly reduce kids' exposure to pollution and potentially help their performance in school. And that is Connecting the Dots. At WCNC Charlotte, we believe it is crucial to make a difference in our communities. That's why we go beyond just reporting the news. 
We ask, where's the money to hold the powerful accountable and get money back into your pockets? Our verified team takes claims, finds sources, and gets you answers. And we're keeping you weather aware, making you safer and smarter. I'm Vanessa Rufus. And I'm Colin Mayfield. Join us weeknights at 5, 6, and 11 and see the difference for yourself. Only on WCNC Charlotte. Now at 6, we have a quick warning for you before we really dive into this story. You're about to see and hear something that really no one wants inside their home, apartment, or business. We are talking about raw sewage. A Where's the Money investigation found that the city of Charlotte has paid nearly $2 million to help people deal with damages tied to the city's sewer system. And our Nate Norabito discovered the problem is only getting worse. With enough miles of sewer to make it from here to Alaska, Charlotte Water has said logistically, crews just cannot proactively inspect the entire system. So the city tends to be reactive, paying up when a failure is found in their lines. Leaders even increased the maximum payout in recent years. But some believe the city needs to make prevention a bigger priority. Oh man, this is going everywhere. The sight. I literally heard her scream. The sound. It's raw. It was disgusting. The smell. Like Of sewage. It was everywhere. Like it, there was like no stopping it. Overpowered Dwayne and Catherine Pennant. This was all flooded. All as their infant and toddler slept nearby. And it was flown in that room, which is our children's room. More than a year later. It interrupted our lives. The parents still feel overwhelmed. I'm tired. I'm tired and, and I'm over it. Left with a bad taste about why. We just don't want this to happen to anyone else. In the hours before the penance toilets and bathtubs spewed sewage, they heard gurgling noises. So they called out a plumber who found a clog in the city's sewer line. But when Charlotte Cruz came out to clean it, the you know what. I said, hey, hey, what are you guys doing? hit the fan. It blew back. The penance say crews pushed sewage back into their home. A failure in cleaning and they believe prevention. One that forced the family to spend the next month in a hotel. This is something that could be avoided with better maintenance. Public records show since 2018, almost 900 people have filed sewer blowback and blockage claims against the city. It seemed like everything was just destroy where, where are we going to live. Last year alone, Charlotte water records show blockages nearly doubled. It's a real thing. It's happening all the time. Seth Wyatt says his small family plumbing business receives three to four calls a day, often tied to problems on the city side of the sewer, routinely caused by thirsty tree roots rupturing the lines. And they will do just about anything to get water especially worse when there's a drought. When there's a lack of rain, the, the call volume goes up. Tree roots are only part of the problem, though. This is preventable. Most blockages are at the kitchen drain. Charlotte Water spokesperson Cam Coley says customers are also clogging the lines over time when they dump grease and wipes. The goal is to keep all the wastewater in the pipe. Regardless of the cause, it's the city's responsibility to keep the lines clean. Is the city doing enough to prevent this? That is worked on every day. We are doing preventive maintenance when we're not responding to emergencies or sewer related uh, concerns. Coley says Charlotte Water dedicates a team to inspect 600 of the city's highest priority lines, is on pace this year to clean 20% of its sewer system up from the prior year and uses technology to monitor its lines. So crew's limited time is used efficiently. We're looking to clean where it's needed most. He says it all comes down to a balancing act between resources and priorities. What can the city do? I mean, the first step is admitting you have a problem. Council member Tarek Bakari believes leaders have failed to prioritize basic services. Those non-sexy but critically important things that's why he's calling for a strategic committee that can focus on infrastructure needs. We don't even know the size of the problem yet, so we have to size things out. That's all broken. The penance say they now know the full scope of their problem. She was breastfeeding at the time, and the level of stress, she couldn't do it. She couldn't Yeah, my produce. supply just, like, and cut off. After months of back and forth with the city. Still, some days are 
are not good. They finally agreed on a price to cover the cost and installation of a backwater valve to prevent this in the future, leaving them finally with a sense of relief. If you don't want to take any chances, a plumber can install a backwater valve, but that will cost several thousand dollars. Either way, don't ignore the warning signs. If you hear gurgling noises or notice that your drains are slow to drain, call 311 immediately. Nate Morabito, WCNC Charlotte. Well, we know this, Nate, in our Where's the Money team, they really work hard to take these story tips and dig into every avenue possible to get you answers. Yeah, tonight on WCNC Plus, actually, Nate's going to sit down with our Nate Stur uh, Nick Sturdivant, that is, to talk more about the investigation process. Nate and Nick, from how the story started, the questions we've asked, and the answers we're still waiting to get. You can get that in-depth perspective only on WCNC Plus, starting at 6.30 on your preferred streaming device. Seven now in this Women's History Month, we're focusing on the stories that highlight the difference and disparities between men and women. Good morning and happy Tuesday. Now, here's what we've got from Wallet Hub this morning. A site came up with this ranked list on the best and worst states for women. Now, before we get to the big reveal, I want to break down some of the methodology here. Researchers looked at some key metrics when they were making this list. The data ranges from median earnings for female workers to women's health care, even the female homicide rate. Now, as for that big reveal, both Carolinas are in that bottom half of the list. North Carolina came in at number 30. South Carolina is about 10 spots lower at number 40. And some numbers before we let you go. Women represent more than two thirds of all minimum wage workers. And the U.S. political representation is also suffering. Even though women make up about 51% of the population, we're only making up about 25% of the Senate and then 29% of the House of Representatives. It's numbers like those that led writers to create this list in the first place. Ben? WCNC Charlotte. Weather is a, a kind of science that you get to see and experience every day. And I think some people don't even realize how much it affects them. That weather has a huge impact on how it threatens your family, your livelihood, or your home. So I think it really is one of those defining things we do that really affects everybody in our community. See the difference. That process of giving you a warning ahead of time and keeping you and your family safe is really important to me because I live here too. It's my family, it's my friends, it's my neighbors. Maternal health care continues to be a problem in North Carolina. The latest March of Dimes report found for every 100,000 births in the state, 26 people giving birth die from complications of pregnancy or childbirth within six weeks. That's higher than the national number. And for women of color, the numbers are even worse. Now a nonprofit called Queen City Cocoa Beans is trying to help. WCNC Charlotte's Lexi Wilson shows us how they help guide families of color through the birthing process. It is a blessing, truly, that um, Jackson and I are here today. <laughs> the gift of motherhood is something the Dean family doesn't take for granted. We, um, like so many people, experienced a pretty traumatic birth. Their original birth plan didn't go as expected, eventually leading Rachel Dean to be readmitted into the hospital. She says it was the support of her team at Queen City Cocoa Beans that helped her get through the ordeal. Everyone deserves those troops to rally for them. Having a team in place really does make a difference. Making a difference in the lives of Charlotte Black families is the goal of this organization by helping them achieve better birth outcomes. According to the CDC, Black women are three times more likely to die from pregnancy-related conditions. My mom died very early after giving birth to me, as well as I've had many stillborns and miscarriages. For Assistant Director Lugina Grinder, this work is personal. She says her mother was unheard and unseen, later finding out she had a brain aneurysm from birth that was never diagnosed. It was just assumed that she was using drugs or that she was doing uh, something that was harmful to her. She now uses her story to change the narrative, turning sorrow into support. It's kind of like I was born to do this work. <laughs> it's work that's seen here with 16-month-old Jackson. We focus on the whole person, the whole family. There you go. A healthy and happy <laughs> baby where life isn't taken for granted. Reporting in West Charlotte for WCNC Charlotte, I'm Lexi Wilson. Thank you. College kids and incoming freshmen across our area, they are stressing out. Many of them are waiting on the FAFSA to see how much it'll cost to have to go to school. The federal financial aid program got a big overhaul this year, and to put it bluntly, 
It's been a mess. Mm. We are talking major delays in the process, leaving students and schools in limbo asking where's the money. Our Michelle Bowden talked to some who say they are now scrambling. This is so hard on so many families and the schools are struggling too. So far, there are 30% fewer applications this year than in the past, meaning the result of this whole mess could be tons of students who simply don't go to college. Johnny Darling is a senior at Philip O'Berry High. He got into his dream school for next year, but might not get to go. Although I wanna go there, it's very expensive and I'm not sure how I'm going to pay for it as of right now. Darling is the oldest of four kids and the son of two school teachers. I don't know which school I'm going to choose because I don't know how much I'm going to get from FAFSA. FAFSA is the free application for student aid, the federal government program that was revamped this year, causing major delays. These changes affect everybody who is in college or thinking about pursuing higher education in the upcoming year. Students fill out the application, the government processes it and sends it back to the schools that then determine how much financial aid a student is eligible for. We typically begin notifying students in November. And when are you expecting now to be able to do that? Realistically, April. So there are some students that are literally waiting to find out now if they can afford to go to college next Correct. year. Correct. Adrian Amador Odi is the vice president of strategic enrollment at Queens University and says she worries some students won't go to college this year at all because of the difficulties. I can't even count how many times we've been delayed. My biggest concern, they'll just give up. It's very stressful because FAFSA is one of those things that once you know what that dollar amount is, you can navigate what else do we need to do? And right now with the delay, it's really putting a strain because we can't make a decision on, well, it's gonna be this school or that school. Alan Davis works with high school seniors as part of Road to Hire, a nonprofit that helps underrepresented high school students on the path to corporate jobs. He's working to help students avoid taking out costly long-term loans to pay for schools, and says the FAFSA delays are making that tough. We have learned from many of our folks who have gone through this uh, historically that the challenge of financial uh, aid and loans and what that looks like. And we want we understand, particularly for families of color, uh, that that represents a barrier to wealth. How worried are you that some of your kids may not go to school because they just don't know how they're going to pay for it and this delay is really a problem? Yeah, it's a real reality for many of our students. Uh, 47% of our students are first gen, so they are trying to figure this thing out. This is the first time this process has had a complete overhaul in 50 years, and critics say the government simply didn't put enough money or resources into making the change. Once they work everything out, all these kinks, it is supposed to make things easier for students and their families. Back to you. It can be so frustrating, too. So the price of higher education is expensive. There's really no other way to say it. Yeah, we know there are plenty of students and families who are struggling to pay for it. We do want to help you get ahead. So tonight on our streaming app, WCNC Plus, we are sitting down with an expert who shared some strategies to help parents and students save for college. You can watch our latest Your Money episode to hear some accounts that can help your money grow and also understand the changes happening with financial aid. So tune in at 8 o'clock tonight. It is available on your favorite streaming device. Connect the dots and let us clear up the confusion. We're here to make sure the news makes sense. And with Connect the Dots, you'll understand how the headlines impact your family. See the difference on WCNC Charlotte. New at 430, a neighborhood's battle against proposed development continues to get a lot of attention. A current change.org petition centered around a Piper Glen development has nearly 20,000 signatures against a rezoning petition. WCNC Charlotte's Julia Kaufman shows us why some neighbors are against the plan. We're on the four mile greenway here in Piper Glen and on the other side of these woods, developers want to build apartments and a retirement community, but homeowners are against the development. Even on a rainy day, people in South Charlotte love the four mile greenway. Long, spacious greenways, lots of nature. Charlotte native Chris McIntyre and his neighbors are fighting to preserve that nature. 70% of the trees will be wiped out on 53 acres. The proposed Sutherland at Piper Glen development calls for 640 rental units on the other side of this creek. That's just really dense. 
McIntyre understands the land will be developed, but he'd prefer to see houses for sale. Some neighbors want the land untouched. Councilman Ed Driggs says that's not an option. The county expressed an interest at one point to the owner uh, in buying the site for a park. The owner said, I don't want to talk about that. It's under contract. Under the land's current zoning, the developer can build about 470 homes, but no apartments. Driggs says rezoning the property for higher density could save more trees and improve roads, but more negotiations need to happen. Unless some sort of an understanding can be arrived at with that group and with residents uh, in a larger scale, I won't support it. The project has a public hearing Monday at the Charlotte City Council meeting, and it's expected to be a packed house. In Piper Glen, Julia Kaufman, WCNC Charlotte. WCNC Charlotte. This is Flashpoint, where power and politics collide, and the tough questions get asked and answered. Thanks for joining us here on Flashpoint. I'm Ben Thompson. Well, after years of debate on Monday, mobile sports betting will finally be legal here in North Carolina. And between all the ads featuring your favorite celebrity, promotional deals, and big bucks for the state, it's very easy to get excited. But there is a downside. Coming up in a few minutes, how the state is preparing for the very real issue of gambling addiction that comes with this news. But first, joining us now is sports betting regulation expert and editor of Sports Betting Dime, Robert Linehan. Robert, thanks for coming on. We appreciate it. No, thanks for having me on. I know it's a busy time uh, down there in North Carolina. It is. Lots of folks are really excited about this. Listen, you've watched this play out in states across the country. You write about it. Um, give us, with that context, give us some perspective about how big of a deal it is to have sports betting roll out here in North Carolina uh, in the next week. Sure. Well, North Carolina is, is expected to be a very healthy sports betting market in the country, not to mention that it's likely going to be the only state to launch sports betting in 2024. Um, right now, there are no other states that have any scheduled launches. Uh, a few states are considering legislation to legalize sports betting um but even if they do get something done they're likely not going to launch this year so north carolina could be the only state and, and will likely be the only state to launch this year um i know operators i know uh, sports betting companies are very excited for north carolina uh it, it, it's not going to be you know, North Carolina is not going to be a, a top five market in the country. It, it's not going to be a New Jersey or a New York. Uh, those two states dominate the sports betting landscape. But there's a lot to be excited about uh, for North Carolina. Uh, it's it's a populous state. Um, you, you have some 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 crazy sports fans down there. Uh, a, a lot of residents that have been clamoring for sports betting legalization over the last couple of years, as this has been discussed. Uh, you have a very healthy college sports fandom down there, uh, and it's perfect that this is launching a week before um, the March Madness tournaments begin. So there's a lot to be excited about in North Carolina, and there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic that the North Carolina sports betting market is going to be a very healthy one to that. You mentioned a revenue. How much revenue are we talking about here in this uh, first year? Well, I mean, of course, uh, you know, these are just estimates, but, you know, the first actually for these estimates for the first fiscal year, the 2023, 2024 fiscal year, uh, the estimate is there is going to be no tax revenue coming in for this. But but that's just basically how the calendar falls uh, during the first full year of sports betting. The fiscal estimates say that the state could bring in nearly sixty five million dollars of additional tax revenue. By year five, when, you know, typically year five is when the sports betting market has, um, you know, basically aged and, and, and is, is topping out and, and is a mature sports betting market. By year five, North Carolina, according to these fiscal estimates, when the bill was passed, could be seeing an additional $100.6 million in annual revenue. You know, this is revenue that the state was losing out on you know for in years past when people were sports betting in north carolina because as you know sports betting was going on in the state before it was legalized sure. it was 
you know, being handled by offshore regulators, offshore sports betting operators. Um, North Carolina wasn't getting any tax dollars from it. So this should be, you know, 100 million in terms of a state budget. It's it's not 100 million seems like a lot, but in terms of a state budget, it, it's not a ton of money. But this is revenue that the state was missing out on that could have gone to supporting, you know, higher education, youth athletics, all of the good things that the bill has earmarked the tax revenue for. So it, it's going to be a nice uh, drop in the bucket for the state, and uh, it's just going to be money that they were losing out on in past years. Yeah, you're talking about state budget. That's billions and billions, and, and but still, money's money, and <laughs> and everybody likes money. Um, you mentioned this a second ago, but there's a lot of folks already betting using VPNs, dark websites to bet in other states. So based on your reporting, do, do you think there are folks who want to bet, haven't been doing that, and haven't cur currently found a way to do it that are now going to be jumping on the bandwagon? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, this this provides North, Carol North Carolinians or North Carolina residents with a safe and legal way to bet on sports in the state. Um, you know, with some of these offshore regulators, you're basically giving your private information to, you know, this an offshore regulator that, you know, who knows what they're doing with what you're giving them. You know, you're basically giving them your bank account information and who knows who's handling it, who knows who's seeing it. Uh, so this absolutely will give people peace of mind, you know, people that might have been hesitant to, you know, throw $25 into an account and, you know, bet on UNC uh, uh, in the upcoming March Madness tournament. So absolutely, this is going to bring in more people to the sports betting market in North Carolina. Um, like I said, uh, these these legal legally licensed operators in the state will... You know, they're going to provide the services uh, that the offshore books don't. Um, there's going to be more responsible gaming. They're, they're going to be paying you know, certainly more attention to responsible gaming issues uh, as opposed to, you know, some of the unlicensed regulators. So this is a, certainly a way, a safer way and a more responsible way for residents in the state to uh, participate in sports betting. And you're going to see that certainly uh, when it launches on the 11th, and you'll see how, how many people are uh, going to be enjoying this as the state moves forward. Um, any common problems that you've seen in rollouts across the state that, that, that folks should be wary of in this first year? You know, not really. This is old hat for a lot of these operators right now. Um, you know, DraftKings and FanDuel are licensed each in more than 20 states apiece at this point. So. They know what they're doing. Um, there's tip, te typically not a lot of technical difficulties uh, in the state. I mean, you do have some, you do have some newer operators in the state, like ESPN Bet, Underdog, Underdog. Uh, this is actually going to be the first state where they launch sports betting, uh, but they've been around for years, offering daily fantasy sports contests. I, I know for a fact that. They likely will have a good platform uh, for customers to use and a great app to use. So I don't think you're going to be seeing too much in the way of difficulties. I mean, there's always, you know, there could always be some people that may not get a bonus that they're offered or, or, or something may happen along those lines when they sign up. But, you know, all these operators have uh, a great customer service representatives. Um, you know, if you do run into a problem, contact the number that they have prominently displayed in their sports book apps and on their websites and i i think it's going to be smooth sailing in north carolina this, this is too big of a state it's too big of a market for these operators not to be on top on the top of their game when this launches and that you don't want to be the one operator you know you don't want to be the one operator that's down for a couple hours on opening day when the others are are, are raking in the cash and and you know, registering new users. So I, I would not imagine that there's going to be too much that could go wrong. I'll knock on wood when I say that. I, I'm saying that right now. And then, you know, maybe a, a seven out of the eight will have problems on the first day. But typically, it's usually pretty smooth sailing. They've all been here before. This is old hat for them. I really don't think there's going to be too much that could go wrong 
on Monday, March 11th, on when Monday. North Carolina yeah. launches online sports betting. Listen, it's very exciting. Uh, and uh, Robert Linan, you have given us a great lay of the land here. We, we, we do appreciate it. Thank you, sir. And thank you very much for having me. Up next on Flash Flight, how the state is beefing up resources to help battle gambling addiction. Calmer weather here. Beautiful view from uptown. Starting to see some of the green pop up on those buildings. I bet by tomorrow for the parade, you're going to see a lot of green showing up across the skyline of Charlotte. So a little bit of fog tonight. Don't be surprised to see that tomorrow morning. A sunny Saturday. We're going to see temperatures in the mid 70s. St. Patrick's Day looks great, though. I do expect to see a few more clouds in the afternoon. If you are going uptown for the parade, certainly looks like a perfect day. I mean, you can't ask for better weather than this. Mid 50s early on temperatures climbing into the 60s. Eventually we will be in the 70s as we get into the afternoon. The weekend overall is not bad. Maybe a, a few sprinkles in the morning with some drizzle or mist, but as the day goes on, it'll be mostly sunny and Sunday. I, I do think we'll see some sun, but we're certainly going to see increasing clouds as we get into the afternoon. The one thing that could kick, up, kick off a sprinkle is that little front pushing through, but should be gone by sunrise. Lots of sunshine tomorrow, but a second front comes through on Sunday. This is the one that cools us off, and there might be a few sprinkles to the south as that pushes through. Even on Monday, we might have some low clouds, fog, and drizzle. And just to show you what that looks like, overnight into the morning hours should be okay. And then by tomorrow afternoon, I mean, just wall to wall sunshine. What a great Saturday. Sunday, though, notice the increasing clouds and watch the rain pass just to the south. As we go into early Monday, that's why we could see a stray shower. Now the cooler temperatures come in with that second front as it blasts through the Carolinas. It will drop colder air at least for a couple of days into the east and southeast, and that means chilly afternoon highs in the 50s. But more importantly, the morning lows could dip down to or uh, to freezing or below for a couple of nights. So I enjoyed the spring warmth this weekend because going back to work on Monday and Tuesday, it is going to be noticeably cooler. And if you're a gardener, landscaper, you started planting things early, may want to take some precautions or things that are already flowering that you didn't want to flower early because of the early warmth. You might have to take some precautions. Remember, get those sheets out. We'll probably need those a couple of nights. The other thing you do remember heavy watering the day of or the day before can actually help retain heat in the plant and the soil around it to keep it a little bit warmer overnight. We're not going to get much rain this weekend, just a 20% chance on Sunday, but late next week again, we might have another system on that Friday, Saturday time frame. The timing is very fluid right now. This far out little shift can mean all the difference in the world, so stay tuned, but we're likely going to have another system. Other thing to look out for this weekend, allergy suffers a lot of pollen. We saw some today get washed away a little bit by the rain. It'll come roaring back this weekend and be back in the high range as we go into next week. So planning your weekend, both days, not bad, probably a little bit more cloud cover on Sunday, but heck it's 70s and we're talking about St. Patrick's Day weekend. You can't believe it. I mean, just a warm stretch of weather. The cooler temperatures are moving back in Monday and Tuesday. We go 10 days into the future and notice the temperatures staying in the 60s all the way until next weekend. All right, Brad, thanks for that extended look too. Next. Some North Carolinians who owe millions of dollars in back taxes will have their debt forgiven after 10 years. And that's thanks to a new law that passed last year, adding to the state's existing tax forgiveness legislation. Now, if you haven't heard about the law, you're not alone here. Yeah, a viewer actually told us about it after mm. our Where's the Money investigation exposed that state tax on illegal drugs. The so-called drug tax has cost North Carolinians more than $100 million over the last 15 years, even though some of them were never convicted. Our Nate Morabito discovered those taxpayers and others facing longstanding state tax debt now have a better chance of getting ahead in 2024. If knowledge is power. I have to worry about Uncle Sam. You have to worry about Uncle Sam. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Uncle Sam. Antonio Mosley finally has the currency he needs. No more debt. No more Uncle Sam. To control his destiny. Boy, like a burden off my back. It was a burden. The small business owner recently learned the state lightened a heavy load. He spent decades hauling. You gotta realize it's 1993. Tied to a teenage mistake that not only sent him to prison. Yes, I owned it. Did my time for it. But also saddled him with thousands of dollars in taxes tied to illegal drugs. They found some cocaine. A debt that for years stood in the way of Mosley's attempts to make the most of his second chance. 
I don't think it's fair. Just months after we first amplified his plight, he learned the state had already written off his remaining drug tax debt. It was a victory for me. Turns out others are likely unaware they too are now debt free. The lack of knowledge can be just as harmful as the assessment itself. Laura Webb has spent years fighting to end North Carolina's unauthorized substance tax and get the state to forgive all debt. We saw where multiple people were being assessed for the same amount of drugs. The director of the North Carolina Justice Center's Fair Chance Criminal Justice Project says the tax discourages people from getting jobs and forces them to make other major life decisions. They might decide not to go and buy the house. Based on their tax debt. And it's very hard to overcome these. This amended state law passed in 2023 will help. It forgives all state tax debt, not just tied to drugs, after 10 years. And it's retroactive, a major change that's received no public attention until now. It is a step in the right direction. Um, we hope that the law will still go further. You feeling good? I'm feeling great. Okay. No more debt. Antonio Mosley didn't know about the law until we told him. It was a big relief. We didn't know until a viewer taught us. It's been a blessing. Now others have this same knowledge. And that is powerful. This new law is just the latest step toward more tax forgiveness in North Carolina. It was actually an existing law that wiped away Mosley's debt. All of this was news to him and to us. The lesson here is to reach out to the Department of Revenue to see whether any of these laws might affect your back taxes. Nate Morabito, WCNC Charlotte. So our work is never done, truly, right? Nate and our team work hard to dig into the receipts, double check those numbers, and then ask those in power, where's the money? Yeah, this story originally came to us from a viewer tip, and as you can see, it's really taken off from there with multiple folks in the community weighing in. And it really just goes to show that your tips can lead to answers and to real change. We do invite you to tune in tonight on WCNC Plus. There you can see our Nate Morbido explaining the behind the scenes of this investigation, how it started, the questions we asked, who we asked, and the answers we are still waiting to get. You can catch that tonight at 830 on your favorite streaming device. While there is a lot of excitement right now from some folks, there are also some concerns about gambling addiction becoming more prevalent. Yeah, because of this, as part of the legislation to make betting legal, additional state resources were put in place to help those who might struggle. WCNC Charlotte's Nick Sturdivant talks to some licensed clinical uh, addiction specialists specifically about the risks and what you should look out for. I, I want to throw this out there. I mean, I, I just saw an ad for online sports betting. I feel like I run across them every day. You, you can't avoid them either if you're watching a podcast on YouTube or whatever content on YouTube. You're streaming something on your TV. It's concerning. Uh, you know, they're they're saturating the market, obviously. Um, and, and like you said, they're they're exploring all avenues to do so. Bright lights, big celebrities. This is fun. This is exciting. And then at the very end of those commercials, just real quick, 1-800-GAMBLERS. Art and Christina Close are both licensed clinical addiction specialists. They run Coastal Therapy Center, LLC. And now we have sports betting that is just in your fingertips, uh, which makes it difficult to walk away from. So there's no, oh, I have to leave here and go home or I have another responsibility. It's just in my hands at all times. People tend to de de detach themselves because it is online. It's on an app on your phone, but you're you're losing real money. Mm -hmm. um, and and th there's, you know, there's that high that you feel when you are winning. And what I'm hearing is just be aware of like your personal finances and again what you're spending right there, there's thousands of people that can that can safely gamble um but but the awareness like like we said is key anybody can fall victim to gambling um it, it, there, there's no boundaries art and christina tell us don't be afraid to reach out for help here's that number for the north carolina gambling our problem gambling helpline 877-718-5543. That resource is free to anyone who needs it. We also have this online at WCNC.com. You can reach that whenever you need it. And there's a lot of.
time now to connect the dots. When we make the news make sense, there's a new way to order everything from vodka to tequila here in Mecklenburg County, and it's all possible thanks to the online ordering that surged during the pandemic. You can now order some of your favorite liquor from the palm of your hand. Let's connect the dots. Mecklenburg County is bringing beverage sales into the 21st century. The county's ABC board is launching the ABC to go mobile app. It'll allow folks to order ahead and then pick up their purchases in stores. All you have to do is enter a zip code and then browse the inventory of your nearest store. The idea first came together following the pandemic. Thousands used online ordering to avoid going into stores. It's just part of the latest push to modernize a dated system. For years, lawmakers have considered privatizing the sale of liquor to help modernize a system that dates back to the Prohibition era. And that is Connecting the Dots. All new tonight, a Charlotte-based company is leading the country in hiring those who are neurodivergent, essentially folks whose brains work differently than most. And yeah, Wells Fargo has hired hundreds of applicants who might otherwise have struggled to find jobs. WCNC Charlotte's Michelle Bowden shows us how the program is seeking solutions and then paying off for both the workers and Wells Fargo. The bank says this isn't about charity. In fact, they say it is a win-win because they're able to tap into a top-notch talent pool. When I came here, I was 27. I had a master's degree. I was a published author, and I had never held down a full-time job for more than about a month. Alex Lieberman admits he was living with his parents with not much on the horizon when he got his job at Wells Fargo three years ago. It feels good to have a future. After a while, I didn't see myself doing anything. And this gave me a chance to build something for myself, to build a way forward, to help other people build their futures too. And it's a privilege I never thought I would get. Lieberman, who is autistic and has ADHD, is a tech consultant at the company, part of the Wells Fargo Neurodiversity Program that launched in 2020. It's a really a talent play. It's not charity. It is gaining access to an incredibly deep, richly diverse, highly skilled talent pool. Stephen DeStefani runs the program that has so far placed almost 300 workers at Wells Fargo in everything from tech jobs to data analytics roles, finance and more. We see the return on investment and I say that a little reluctantly because I because I often say you, you shouldn't need a business case to do the right thing, but there is a business case. We are closing skills gaps and employee satisfaction, particularly for those who have participated or are impacted by the program, is through the roof. DeStefani says one of the keys is making sure the interview process isn't a stumbling block, letting people be themselves. Vivian Wen is a software engineer who is autistic and says that was a challenge at previous jobs where she was often told to change the way she interacted with people. But things like that have happened throughout my life, whether in the interview process or actually at work. Do you think maybe they just didn't understand that you were a little bit different? Absolutely, I agree with that. Because I was different, because I wasn't like them, because I wasn't holistic and I didn't follow what we call social pro protocols and the, all the scripts that you do. Or it sounds like you feel more comfortable in your own skin here and that they actually value your skill set. Oh, absolutely. Yes, they do, because we're here to do work and we're here to make things better. And I'm empowered to do all of those things without letting those social protocols get in the way. We are all people. We think differently than most but we don't have any more or less inherent value than anyone else. In a program that acknowledges that and accommodates that, we have a chance to contribute in ways that people generally don't think that we can. And the Wells Fargo team running the Neurodiverse program says they're actually sharing their best practices with other companies in hopes that other companies will follow their lead. Reporting in Uptown Charlotte, Michelle Bowden, WCNC Charlotte. And now part of our effort with our Seeking Solutions brand is to highlight the companies and individuals and groups making a difference and giving a voice to those who might not always be heard. So if you know a group or maybe a person who's doing just that, we want to hear about them and get the ball rolling towards those solutions. We can't say it enough. A lot of our great stories come from you at home. So send us an email to newstips at WCNC.com. You can see your story on our air.
go to a murder investigation, though, in Lancaster County tonight. Yeah, we have learned a 23 year old is now in jail in connection to that case. Loyal Lloyd Caldwell Jr. We're told is facing murder and burglary charges. He's accused of killing 65 year old Harriet Mahaffey. WCNC Charlotte's Anna King spoke to neighbors tonight who say they are shocked. Well, neighbors described us as incredibly sad and say with the neighborhood so quiet and tucked away, they're more confused than anything else. With the things that are going on in the world today, you don't never know what's going to happen where. So it's, you know, it, was, it was just more or less a surprise. Neighbors along Stewart Place Road in Heath Springs say they're shocked after 65-year-old Harriet Mahaffey was found murdered in her home Monday. We live in a quiet neighborhood. Don't nobody bother nobody. And just for something like that to happen, just uh, a tragic thing for somebody to do something like that. Mahaffey lived alone and relatives had not heard from her. Lancaster County Sheriff says family members went to check on her Tuesday and they found her unresponsive next to 11 bullet casings. Guys, this was a horrible crime uh, with, with no explanation for it. Uh, uh, lady sitting in her home defenseless, not bothering anybody. Someone walks in and, and shoots her multiple times. During the investigation, officials noticed her 2004 Jeep Cherokee was missing, the same one that was seen in Chester and Charlotte. Investigators eventually traced the car back to 23-year-old Lloyd Caldwell Jr., who was arrested in Chester County. After searching his home, deputies found evidence connecting Caldwell to the murder. We live in a different world today. It's not like it was 20 years ago. And, and, and you know, years ago, people could leave the doors unlocked and things like that. Now you have cameras everywhere. Now you have to keep your doors locked, have to be aware of your surroundings all the time. Caldwell is now in the Lancaster County Detention Center charged with murder, first degree burglary, grand larceny and possession of a firearm during the commission of a violent crime. The Lancaster County Sheriff says there's no clear motive for why this happened, noting the suspect and victim did not know each other. In Lancaster County, Anna King, WCNC Charlotte. 637 now and we're asking where's the money for college students and graduates. Good early Thursday morning and thanks for watching. A new report from the outlet Study Finds is trying to answer a pretty timely question. Is that four year degree still worth it? Now we want to hear from y'all in a second, but here are the details in this article. There were three main takeaways. First, the short answer is yes. Researchers say investing in a college degree still pays off financially. Now the second takeaway is this. Certain degrees lead to a better return. The money makers are going to be engineering and computer science degrees. And then moving on to three, just in time for Women's History Month, the research shows women benefited slightly more than men by earning that degree. On the numbers, here they are. The data covers about 10 years. It compares earnings and tuition costs of about 6 million students and graduates. Then analysts came up with a percentage. That return of investment came in around 9%. But I want to explain the reasoning behind this number, which explains more than the number itself. If you consider more than just how much you make after school, like the cost of tuition after books and even the lost wages from not entering the workforce sooner, they all point to one factor that's gaining more importance. It's the field that you're able to work in. Researchers in this article say while the degree still pays off, well, that bottom line is college keeps getting pricier. So the recommendation is that students should choose a degree that's going to pay more. It's what has us asking this morning. Do you think a four year degree is still valuable? Make sure you text us 704-329-3600. Calmer weather here. Beautiful view from uptown. Starting to see some of the green pop up on those buildings. I bet by tomorrow for the parade, you're going to see a lot of green showing up across the skyline of Charlotte. So a little bit of fog tonight. Don't be surprised to see that tomorrow morning. A sunny Saturday. We're going to see temperatures in the mid 70s. St. Patrick's Day looks great, though. I do expect to see a few more clouds in the afternoon. If you are going uptown for the parade, certainly looks like a perfect day. I mean, you can't ask for better weather than this. Mid 50s early on temperatures climbing into the 60s. Eventually we will be in the 70s as we get into the afternoon. The weekend overall is not bad. Maybe a, a few sprinkles in the morning with some drizzle or mist, but as the day goes on, it'll be mostly sunny and Sunday. I, I do think we'll see some sun, but we're certainly going to see increasing clouds as we get into the afternoon. The one thing that could kick, up, kick off a sprinkle is that little front pushing through, but should be gone by sunrise. Lots of sunshine tomorrow, but a second front comes through on Sunday. This is the one that cools us off and there might be a few sprinkles to the south 
as that pushes through. Even on Monday, we might have some low clouds, fog and drizzle. And just to show you what that looks like overnight into the morning hours should be OK. And then by tomorrow afternoon, I mean, just wall to wall sunshine. What a great Saturday Sunday, though. Notice the increasing clouds and watch the rain pass just to the south. As we go into early Monday, that's why we could see a stray shower. Now the cooler temperatures come in with that second front as it blasts through the Carolinas. It will drop colder air at least for a couple of days into the east and southeast, and that means chilly afternoon highs in the 50s. But more importantly, the morning lows could dip down to or uh, to freezing or below for a couple of nights. So I enjoyed the spring warmth this weekend because going back to work on Monday and Tuesday, it is going to be noticeably cooler. And if you're a gardener, landscaper, you started planting things early, you may want to take some precautions or things that are already flowering that you didn't want to flower early because of the early warmth. You might have to take some precautions. Remember, get those sheets out. We'll probably need those a couple of nights. The other thing you do remember heavy watering the day of or the day before can actually help retain heat in the plant and the soil around it to keep it a little bit warmer overnight. We're not going to get much rain this weekend, just a 20% chance on Sunday, but late next week again, we might have another system on that Friday, Saturday time frame. The timing is very fluid right now. This far out little shift could mean all the difference in the world, so stay tuned, but we're likely going to have another system. Other thing to look out for this weekend. Allergy suffers a lot of pollen. We saw some today get washed away a little bit by the rain. It'll come roaring back this weekend and be back in the high range as we go into next week. So planning your weekend both days. Not bad, probably a little bit more cloud cover on Sunday, but heck it's 70s and we're talking about St. Patrick's Day weekend. You can't believe it. I mean, just a warm stretch of weather. The cooler temperatures are moving back in Monday and Tuesday. We go 10 days into the future and notice the temperatures staying in the 60s all the way until next weekend. All right, Brad, thanks for that extended look too. next. What's near me? If you're out and see news, open the WCNC News app and go to near me on the bottom right. Then tap share with us. Upload your photo or video and tell us about it. Hit submit and your news has reached our team at WCNC Charlotte. Happy Friday, everybody. Yay. We have made it. TGIF. Yeah. This week flew by for me. I don't know about you guys. Uh, you know what? It'd fly back even faster if it was a four day week. That's right. Yes. <laughs> I'm all uh, for it. Can we do this? Uh, well, didn't Larry David have something to say? I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Bernie Sanders. <laughs> wow. He did. Funny you should say. Yes. <laughs> Often confused with one another. Uh, that's what we're talking about this morning. A four day work week could be one step closer to becoming the norm. So let us know this morning. What do you think? Do you think that that uh, that's just as good as five days and you can be just as productive? So Bernie Sanders introducing a bill that would reduce the standard work week to 32 hours without a pay cut. The bill would mandate workers get overtime pay anything after 32 hours of work instead of, you know, most people work an average of 40 hours a week. A recent survey found nearly 90% of workers said they'd be interested in the idea of a shorter work week. I'm sure, especially if you right. get the same pay. So this morning we want to hear from you. What do you think? Do you think it is time we make a four day work week the standard or do you think five days is just fine? Let us know. Uh, some people commenting this morning saying everyone deserves more weekend and less work week. I am all for the four day schedule. I'd love a four day work week, but it will increase costs for employers, especially small businesses, because you have to hire more people to cover the hours that they aren't open. And babysitters and things like oh, that. Oh yeah, four day work sure. week would be a dream, but becomes unfair when you also want the school week to stay at five days a week, yep. uh, four days, but work nine hour days. So there you go, lots of people. Chime in. Joy already, already says she, she'd go for it. Would you guys, what, what, what do you guys think? I'm with you. Yeah. Working <laughs> five days to get two days off, it's just, it's, I'm not a fan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for me, it's almost less about the working four days as much as it is about having three days off. <laughs> That's just such a nice, I feel like. Oh, uh, yeah, for perk. sure. Um, but Larry, you wouldn't take that extra day, would you? <laughs> it was Monday, I probably would. I don't like I'll Friday being that. the day. I think Monday. Because yeah. everyone's happy because like it's Friday. Happy it's Friday, yeah. But then hey, wouldn't exactly. everybody be happy that it's, it's Thursday? Yeah. Thursday, yeah. yeah. I don't know, Thursday is. Uh, <laughs> well, hey, it's speaking. not going to happen. Yeah, so. Melissa, yeah, Melissa says far. she's yeah. she's down already log off early on Fridays. I think a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing, though. Joy I feel Mott like saying she, she'd go for it, too. Yeah, I, I think um, I think there's a couple of things here. Okay. Same thing as our, the AI conversation the other day and whatever else. We're, I, I feel like we're sort of behind the eight ball on, on these conversations. I feel like we've evolved so much and the work week as it is right now evolved decades ago and I feel like we're, we're not staying up on things because I think sure there's a conversation to be had about four day work weeks 
I also think if you have that conversation, perhaps more importantly, is bringing people up to a pay scale that is appropriate. Yeah. I mean, you have a lot of people making less than they would have in the 1950s for the mm -hmm. same job once mm -hmm. you once you adjust mm -hmm. for inflation. And they're working harder. And they're working harder. Doing and that, more. that that just doesn't make sense with technology and everything mm -hmm. else. And I, and I feel like there's issues like that. R retiring, I feel like we have some antiquated ideas of retiring and when to retire and what's the official retirement age. Have you ever thought about I feel like an agent? I need to hire you. Uh-uh. Oh, <laughs> Ben would be a great agent. Yes. yes. I would hate but that. But please don't leave the news <laughs> No, test I would hate that. Because I, who's going to do plus? Uh, yeah, right, right, <laughs> you. <laughs> um, so I, I think I'm, of course, open to the idea of working four days, but I feel like there's other big conversations to have around that as well that we're not having. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. All right, well, hey. Speaking of the weekend, yes. mm. it is going to be a two-day two day weekend, right. but, but there's still a lot going on right. this weekend. So we're talking about three big events happening around the Queen City, uh, kicking off your weekend with the Charlotte Hornets. The team plays their first of two games tonight against the Phoenix Suns. Tickets still available. The game starts at 7 at the Spectrum Center. Also, take a look at this. Celebrating all things green, of course. The St. Patrick's Day party yeah. returns to Uptown. Look at those Irish step dancers. Uh, the beloved parade kicks off Saturday at 11 a.m. You know, technically it's St. Patrick's Day Sunday, but the parade Saturday. Yep, yep. Uh, the parade starts at East 9th Street and Tryon Street. If you can't make it to the parade, a festival will take place before and after the parade from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. So lots going on. Also, uh, grab your green and get ready for more fun at Charlotte's annual bar crawl event for St. Patrick's Day. Uh, they have discounted drinks, free entry at participating bars. The crawl starts at tattoos and booze at 2 p.m. on about the Sunday. Of the crawling? I've always wondered about mm. that. Is no, that... you're just going from oh, okay. place to place, oh, right? Some are. Yeah, yeah. I bet some, of them are some will probably be crawling, unfortunately. <laughs> they need yes. to go yeah, home. Yeah, yeah, right. uh, tickets start at $12. So, um, Lots going on, Larry, mm, but there might on. be some well, some rain. What right? about the weather for yeah. St. Patrick's Day? There you My go. My friend, Leap and Larry's not here. I don't know where he is. He's in the basement, I, maybe. But I thought no. he would yeah. make an appearance. I, I he made thought, an appearance this morning. I know. I don't know where the guy is. Uh, <laughs> today, yes, I would say there's a chance of a few showers and storms, particularly from about noon until four. But tomorrow, for all the big events, the parade uptown, the uh, the festival is going on, uh, looking for temperatures in the, the mid 70s. And then on St. Patrick's Day, that's as perfect as it gets. How about I mean, that? Yeah, that's unseasonally yeah. warm. Lucky Seven. Irish. Wonderful. 70, a green Luck 72. Of the Irish. Wearing a green. But I did want to, let's see, put you the button right here. And I was going to show you what's going to happen next week, but it just not it working works. for me. <laughs> <laughs> and by next Tuesday, it's only good. There it there is. All are. right. <laughs> you can see next Tuesday, a low of 32, a high of only 56. Mm, mm. Take it yes. back. You're going to look well, green. That's right. Uh -uh. <laughs> uh, we still got some people chiming in yeah. about working from home. John Kelly saying, I think the ability of working from home, hybrid or modified work week is long overdue. The old five day in the office is outdated when we're talking about going to four day work weeks. Yeah. Uh, Melissa chiming in saying, John Kelly, I've been working from home for six years. I would take seven figures to get me. <laughs> oh, it would take yeah. seven figures yeah. to get me back into the office. Yeah, well, people. I think I'm that's what's, what I think that's what made the pandemic so hard is that people got a taste of that life. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> and then they were told, "Nah, you got to come back." I mean, people here they left uh, because I they were I just like, "I admire I work people from home. who can work from home." Because I would be the lazy. I still am la lazy anytime I'm home. Anyway. Um, I would not describe would, you as lazy I, at no, all. No, at home, no home. I would be. I would not be able to work. That's why I have to come to work. That's why, yeah. like Ben and myself, maybe one of the, we were here during the during the pandemic. Well, so was I. I know you weren't with us at the time. Oh yeah, I was at night. That was about us. Oh yeah. It just it was it's like having to come in and work and if I stayed at home I would be really I would be lazy I'd be they'd go he's out of here well our uh, job <laughs> is kind of right. different because it's like it's easier here because all the equipment's here yes that's exactly you know right. but depending on what your job yeah. is if you have everything at home and almost have that like that separate mm. space yeah, which is totally. hard because I do think people yeah. you know if your kids are home or you got laundry, you get distracted easily. That's I was for about sure. to say, now I didn't have no kids to distract me, yeah. but when I was just reporting, I had to work from home and I was much more efficient. So I don't know. I think it just depends on what kind of person you are. Like, oh, so, yeah. Well, yeah. A couple of, I know a couple of our reporters uh, did say that they did not like being home. One in particular yeah. used to work on a morning show. She yeah. said she did not like working yeah. at home. So it's every, it's up depends to you. on the person. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 Right. May you be so lucky as to get the decision at some point. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of us I, don't. I doubt it's going to happen. That's right. That's right. All right. Let us know what you think. Have a great weekend. We'll see you back here on Monday. Bye. Bye.
Now to Gastonia, where the city is making plans after getting a $250,000 donation from an anonymous donor. However, that donor says the money must go towards improving the aesthetics of some busy roadways. WCNC Charlotte's Jesse Pierre shares more about how this money will be used. Yes, the city of Gastonia received a very generous gift and the money will be used to make the area surrounding several interchanges more appealing to the eye. Anything to do to beautify this area, it's going to be seen. Along US 321 and just under a mile from I-85 is Allen's Mobile Home and RV Supplies. Owner Billy Linhart says one thing he can count on seeing outside his doors is a flow of cars. Just probably almost doubling how much traffic I've seen out here in just the nine years that I've been here. But now, due to a generous donation, drivers can expect a more pleasant drive into Gastonia. Thanks to an anonymous $250,000 donation, three busy interchanges along I-85 will be freshened up. Those interchanges are at Cox Road, New Hope Road, and US 321. The first step, starting with some simple cleanup. The trash, the underbrush, the vine, I mean, just right. to, to clean that, and then the next step would be to uh, spruce it up. The money will also go towards replacing aging and broken fencing, planting grass and low maintenance shrubs. City leaders gave the green light for the beautification project to begin, despite some concerns of wasting money ahead of the I-85 widening project set to begin in a few years. Just hate to see them put a lot of landscaping plans in place, you know, plantings and things like that to have them yanked out in a matter of a short period of time. Mm -hmm. I think the conversation was had with the anonymous donor Yes, that that project would impact, and they said, go forth and do good things. City leaders hoping to save some of the money until after the widening project is done. Linhart says this will be a good look for the city. To give people an impression of Gastonia, to make them want to come back, to make them want to shop, stop, eat. He hopes it will make the congestion in the area more bearable and hopefully attract more foot traffic in. Jesse Pierre, WCNC Charlotte. In just a few hours, the ACC men's basketball tournament is set to tip off. This is one of several major tournaments going on this week. It all comes ahead of Selection Sunday when we'll get our first look at March Madness brackets. NC State plays Louisville this afternoon at 430. Duke and UNC have their first games of the tournament on Thursday. Well, these intense games sometimes lead to fans storming the court in excitement. But WCNC's Megan Bragg explains why that might not be a great idea in today's Verify. Buzzer beater moments are what the madness is all about. But sometimes those moments can cause harm to the players. This year, a Duke player was hurt after Wake Forest fans stormed the court after their win. So can fans be civilly liable if they injure a player while storming the court? Let's verify. Our sources, attorney Eric Hayes with James Scott and Farron Law Firm, the NCAA, and the ACC. The NCAA does not have a policy on storming the court and leaves punishment up to each conference. Duke and Wake Forest are in the ACC conference. Currently, the ACC does not have rules against it. However, NCAA spokesperson David Warlock told NBC News court storming is not allowed during NCAA tournament games and they work with venues to develop a security plan to try and prevent it. They don't go into it thinking that they could be hurt during an after game court storming incident. Attorney Eric Hayes says if a player is hurt by a fan because of court storming, they could be held liable for that injury. Fans are um, if not just negligent, maybe grossly negligent or reckless, whatever they are taking the court like that if they were to cause an injury to someone. What would the argument be for a fan who rushed the court, ran into a player and hurt them? I didn't mean to do it. Well, then you should have stayed in your seat. As for schools being held liable, that's still an open question. A player who was injured did sue the school and did settle the case. Whether or not a school could be held liable, I think that that is an open question and certainly one that schools would be concerned about. So we can verify that yes, fans can be held civilly liable if they injure a player while storming the court. With your Verify, I'm Megan Bragg. If you have something you would like verified, just email us at verify at wcnc.com. With your help, WCNC Charlotte is making a difference in our community. 
beautiful day, so many people helping. This is incredible. Let's spread that love tonight. Here is a $5,000 check that you guys can use to further the mission. There is nothing on earth like the feeling of giving back with your hands. $5,000 to you and uh, Block Love Charlotte for what you guys do. If you'd like to make a difference, go to wcnc.com slash make a difference now. Time now to connect the dots when we make the news make sense. Lots of kids hearing back from colleges and universities this week as schools release their decisions. But a few a new form has colleges and families asking, where's the money? Problems with a new financial aid system have both colleges and families waiting for answers. Let's connect the dots. Before families can make a decision on college, finances are often a huge factor. But colleges are in limbo as they still wait to receive information about applicants' finances. The root of the problem comes from the FAFSA website. That's where students can see if they qualify for aid. The Department of Education has been trying to overhaul the form for years. The changes use a new calculation called the Student Aid Index to determine how much a family should get. It's meant to benefit low-income students, but it hasn't been a smooth process. Some families say they're not getting as much aid as they should. Now experts say you may want to consider appealing your case to try and get more money, hopefully in time to make a choice by College Decision Day on May 1st. And that is Connecting the Dots. Well, tomorrow is Canvas Day, where every county election board inside North Carolina will vote to officially certify the primary election results. The primary was the first election under a new state law saying mail-in ballots must be in by Election Day rather than getting that grace period. Yes, WCNC Charlotte's Julia Kaufman shows us how voting activists say this change discounts uh, legitimate or discounts legitimate votes, but supporters call it common sense. When North Carolinians voted by mail in previous elections, their ballots had a three day grace period to get to the county election office. That grace period is gone and now ballots marked as returned after deadline are piling up. 31. Under new state laws, absentee ballots need to get to the election office by 730 PM on election day to count. It was very unnecessary, very unfair to voters. The State Board of Elections tells WCNC Charlotte in the 2020 presidential primary, which had a higher voter turnout than in 2024, 800 ballots were returned after the three day grace period and not counted. This year, 999 absentee ballots have been received so far that will not count due to missing the new deadline. There are people right now who did everything right and through no fault of their own, but the mail service not getting their ballot in time to the County Board of Elections, their vote won't count. Bob Phillips with Common Cause argues the new deadline hurts all absentee voters regardless of party affiliation. This law, I think, is going to contribute to that feeling that something is wrong with our elections. Supporters like the North Carolina Republican Party argue the new voting laws restore trust in elections. A spokesperson says, quote, the changes enacted by the General Assembly to strengthen election integrity and create one singular deadline worked as intended. These laws are reasonable, common sense efforts to create certainty and transparency in the election process. County election offices are required to notify voters if their vote did not count and explain why. That process will begin after the election is certified. Julia Kaufman, WCNC Charlotte. Verify, WCNC Charlotte. Verify is all about trying to make a difference in the community by making sure that the community has the correct information. This is what we know. And hey, this is what we don't know. Sometimes you're actually surprised by the answer. Verify the difference. Verify is a great way to combat that misinformation, making sure that people know the process of the reporting. Time now to connect the dots. When we make the news make sense, thousands of drivers are reporting their insurance rates are going up, and it could be thanks to data collected behind the scenes. A report shows cars made by GM, Ford, Honda, and other popular manufacturers are sending your data to insurance companies, and you may not even know about it. Let's connect the dots. In most of these vehicles, there's software tracking how you drive. It keeps data about 
when you're on the road, how fast you drive, and how quickly you brake. It's all thanks to the ability of newer cars to connect to the internet. And the New York Times reports all that data gets sent off to your insurance company for a personalized rate. And automakers say it's all legal, thanks to all those papers you sign when you buy a new car. That is Connecting the Dots. To this, another push to provide mental health resources to Carolina's most vulnerable students. We do thank you for sticking with us this evening for the news at six. I'm Vanessa Rufus and I'm Colin Mayfield. Now in the aftermath of a deadly school shooting in Uvalde, Texas, Congress dedicated money to help prevent future school violence and improve student mental health. But our where's the money investigation found new schools in the Carolinas are actually putting that money to use. Yeah, not many schools tonight, nearly yeah. two months after our Nate Morbido exposed this problem. South Carolina is making a second effort to deliver millions of federal dollars to students who are most at risk. When we discovered South Carolina had only awarded this money to a dozen school districts, the Department of Education said it would find a way to spend the rest of the money. Well, now if everything goes as planned, more than twice as many school districts could receive this potentially life saving money in round two. In Uvalde, Texas, a gunman murdered two teachers and 19 children. Almost two years later, millions of dollars in grants sit unused. Funds elected leaders approved to prevent another Robb Elementary School shooting. It makes no sense to me for these dollars to be offered by the federal government to be sitting in coffers while our schools are not as safe as they can be. We, we need to do better. It's a revelation WCNC Charlotte took all the way to the top. First with the Secretary of Education and then with the Vice President herself. Well, that's part of why I'm here, to make sure that the money gets to where it needs to be going. These so-called Stronger Connections grants are meant to help school districts with high rates of poverty, bullying, absenteeism, and exclusionary discipline. Sometimes I just think I'm not sure how some of these children kind of survive their life. But York School District 1 is the only school system in the Charlotte area that's received a grant so far. The district is using the money to ensure every school has its own mental health therapist. My mission is to help these children who are struggling so much. South Carolina is hoping others will take notice of York's efforts. If you are eligible, please, please apply. The Department of Education opened a second round of applications this month. Records show more than 50 South Carolina districts are eligible and they have two months to submit their applications. We just wanna make sure that this gets out there and we don't have to send any of it back. While South Carolina is moving on to round two, North Carolina has still not spent a single cent of this money. You can blame that on bureaucracy and delays in communication. Nate Morbido, WCNC Charlotte. Now to go further here, we asked some of the districts that did not apply in round one why not? The Lancaster County School District told us the timing was not good back then, but assured us if there was a second round, it would apply. So we alerted those district leaders earlier today that this opportunity is available to them. And so as you can see, Nate and our Where's the Money team are very hard at work. They are tracking those federal dollars. They're keeping receipts here. They're checking those. They're holding those in power accountable, really all in an effort to give you answers. So that being said, if you have something out there you think our team should be looking into, please let us know. You could send us an email to money at WCNC.com or reach out to our team on social media. Calmer weather here. Beautiful view from uptown. Starting to see some of the green pop up on those buildings. I bet by tomorrow for the parade, you're going to see a lot of green showing up across the skyline of Charlotte. So a little bit of fog tonight. Don't be surprised to see that tomorrow morning. A sunny Saturday. We're going to see temperatures in the mid 70s. St. Patrick's Day looks great, though. I do expect to see a few more clouds in the afternoon. If you are going uptown for the parade, certainly looks like a perfect day. I mean, you can't ask for better weather than this. Mid 50s early on temperatures climbing into the 60s. Eventually we will be in the 70s as we get into the afternoon. The weekend overall is not bad. Maybe a, a few sprinkles in the morning with some drizzle or mist, but as the day goes on, it'll be mostly sunny and Sunday. I, I do think we'll see some sun, but we're certainly going to see increasing clouds as we get into the afternoon. The one thing that could kick, up, kick off a sprinkle is that little front pushing through, but should be gone by sunrise. Lots of sunshine tomorrow, but a second front comes through on Sunday. This is the one that cools us off and there might be a few sprinkles to the south as that pushes through. Even on Monday, we might have some low clouds, fog and drizzle. And just to show you what that looks like 
overnight into the morning hours should be okay. And then by tomorrow afternoon, I mean, just wall the wall sunshine. What a great Saturday Sunday, though. Notice the increasing clouds and watch the rain pass just to the south. As we go into early Monday, that's why we could see a stray shower. Now the cooler temperatures come in with that second front as it blasts through the Carolinas. It will drop colder air at least for a couple of days into the east and southeast, and that means chilly afternoon highs in the 50s. But more importantly, the morning lows could dip down to or uh, to freezing or below for a couple of nights. So enjoy the spring warmth this weekend because going back to work on Monday and Tuesday, it is going to be noticeably cooler. And if you're a gardener, landscaper, you started planting things early, you may want to take some precautions or things that are already flowering that you didn't want to flower early because of the early warmth, you might have to take some precautions. Remember, get those sheets out. We'll probably need those a couple of nights. The other thing you do, remember, heavy watering the day of or the day before can actually help retain heat in the plant and the soil around it to keep it a little bit warmer overnight. We're not going to get much rain this weekend, just a 20% chance on Sunday, but late next week again, we might have another system on that Friday, Saturday time frame. The timing is very fluid right now. This far out little shift could mean all the difference in the world, so stay tuned, but we're likely going to have another system. Other thing to look out for this weekend, allergy suffers a lot of pollen. We saw some today get washed away a little bit by the rain. It'll come roaring back this weekend and be back in the high range as we go into next week. So planning your weekend both days, not bad, probably a little bit more cloud cover on Sunday, but heck it's 70s and <laughs> we're talking about St. Patrick's Day weekend. You can't believe it. I mean, just a warm stretch of weather. The cooler temperatures are moving back in Monday and Tuesday. We go 10 days into the future and notice the temperatures staying in the 60s all the way until next weekend. All right, Brad, thanks for that extended look too. Next. WCNC Charlotte. Weather is a, a kind of science that you get to see and experience every day. And I think some people don't even realize how much it affects them. That weather has a huge impact on how it threatens your family, your livelihood, or your home. So I think it really is one of those defining things we do that really affects everybody in our community. See the difference. That process of giving you a warning ahead of time and keeping you and your family safe is really important to me because I live here too. It's my family, it's my friends, it's my neighbors. Well, an 11 year old boy with dreams of starting up his own landscaping business is getting some big help. We first told you about Quentin Hines earlier this week. Now he's getting a big boost, getting some fresh new tools. WCNC Charlotte's Miles Harris gives us a closer look. To see him at 11 with adult equipment um, is scary for me as a mom. <laughs> But it's just what he loves to do. By far one of our best mowers. Who would have thought an 11 year old would love to cut grass so much? That's exactly where Quentin Hines' passion lies, making a difference inside his community one lawn at a time. What do you like about cutting grass most or doing yard work, huh? I don't know. I just enjoy it, probably just beautifying lawns and yeah, making lawns look beautiful. We'll help you out all we can. He's getting a helpful hand from Cenex. The company caught Quentin's story and wanted to assist his service. Easier we can make that on him, whether it's lighter tools, uh, tools that move on our own uh, with just the squeeze of a handle, uh, whatever that is, uh, and then providing him with all the tools uh, that he needed. Not only adding more tools in the shed for Quentin, but also adding $1,000 to his GoFundMe. The fact that we're helping a young kid at a young age um, mold into what's going to be a very, very productive uh, and positive role model uh, in his community and in our community. Life lessons on generosity that his family surely appreciates. I think you know, this is really just showing Quentin now that people will stand behind you and support you know, your dream when you let it be known. Yeah. So I think that's very big for him at this early age. His next step might include getting more space. And with all the stuff that they're giving now, we're definitely going to need wow. additional space to yeah. put this stuff. Yeah, oh, wow. yeah, yeah. My yeah. 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 right. garage is now gone. <laughs> <laughs> space to continue his dreams. What do you hope, big picture? What do you want to do? Um, just give like free services to senior citizens, help out other people, and. Just beautiful lines. In Huntersville, Miles Harris, WCNC Charlotte. Unemployment rate is going in the right direction. There are many still struggling to find a job with a livable wage. Yeah, it is tough out there for many folks. The Charlotte Cooking School is helping people get ahead and get into the workforce, particularly by training them to prepare 
five star meals. Our Larry Sprinkle has been asking, where's the money? And for some folks, it's right there in the kitchen. 21 year old Courtney Allen, also known as Cam, moved to Charlotte a few months ago. Growing up, she always had the dream of playing basketball. I love basketball. But she also liked to cook. A few bad work experiences in the kitchen had her feeling like cooking was not a good fit, especially when combined with some difficult life experiences she was going through at the time. I was going through a lot before I came down here. Then she heard about the community culinary school. So I was able to see how it felt to be in a position that a real chef would be in. We are a 501c3 nonprofit that works with adults who've experienced barriers to long-term employment. Since 1997, skilled and professional chefs like Chef Ron have been helping students reach the goal of earning a living wage, creating delicious meals. The Community Culinary School of Charlotte gives back. We offer folks an opportunity to touch the success that they envision for themselves. And there is a hunger for the chefs who learn their craft here. As we emerge from COVID, the hospitality industry needs help and they need trained professionals. This training is just what Cam needs to give her the confidence to get back into the kitchen. My knife skills, yes. That prove you so much on your knife skills. Giving her the cutting edge, just like on the hardwoods. It's a passion. <laughs> I love basketball, so I made this a passion as well. So Cam is putting on a full court press to complete the training and take her victory lap. It's like you won a championship when you graduate. You get what I'm saying? It's like you won a medal. So hopefully I get my medal because I'm almost there. We are training hospitality folks so they have the ability to grow and, and uh, take care of themselves, their families, their community. Earning the title of chef isn't the end. It's just the beginning for Cam, who has a very big dream. It's hopefully in 10 years I have my own restaurant, my own staff, me working under me. Chopping it up on the east side of Charlotte, Larry Sprinkle, back to you. What's that old? WCNC Charlotte. Good morning, Carolina. Tune in to the team that's preparing you for your day. The one and only Larry Sprinkle. See the difference in your morning. This is bitter cold just about anywhere you look. Here's a look right here at I-77 northbound. Trying to make your dollar stretch a little bit further. Responsible reporting, community focused, unique content. It's so good to see you. You too. Uh, Y'all are having too much like fun. See the difference weekday mornings on WCNC Charlotte. Now, burnout in nursing is on the rise, and this is an issue we've seen only get worse since the pandemic. There's no doubt. Right now, the American Nurses Association says it's more important than ever to understand how to manage and then prevent the condition. WCNC Charlotte's Lexi Wilson introduces us to a local nurse who is using comedy as her outlet. In uptown Charlotte, it's a real big deal to be invited here. The Bloomingthal Arts Stage Door Theater is a place with passion for local productions. The lighting, the sound, the tech crew, uh, there's ushers here. We love the ushers. Debbie Millwater has a love for comedy. Comedy has played a huge part in my life. Even though I like to think that I'm funny, uh, my kids assure me that I am not. While she spent time on stage, she enjoys being a comedy show producer even more. <laughs> helping create shows like the 2024 March Mania Comedy Tournament, where 32 local comedians battle it out until there's one winner. It just lights them up inside. It's very validating. It's a light <laughs> Debbie also needs. I just celebrated my sixth anniversary as a overnight bedside nurse. These days, there's an urgent warning about the shortage of health care workers. Research shows burnout and fatigue are prevalent. It's something Debbie has felt, especially during the pandemic. Staffing numbers had dropped and uh, the complexity of the patients didn't change. She's worked in the COVID unit and now works with cancer patients, most of them fighting for their life. That's why the laughs made here are so important. Comedy definitely helped me push through I, not only the pandemic, but nursing in general. A love for comedy, rewarding on and off the stage. And the March Mania Comedy Tournament finale is this Friday here at Stage Door Theater at 7 p.m. Tickets are $10. Reporting in Uptown for WCNC Charlotte, I'm Lexi Wilson. What an empowering way, you know, to find a, a medium 
to get all of that out. It's not good to keep in either. So true, and, and it is a tough job. Man. Someone who comes from a family, mom's a nurse, yeah. cousins, nurses, yeah. aunts, nurses, those are special people. Humanity has to be <laughs> thankful, and uh, so I think sometimes we take them for granted. Yeah. So. Good Wednesday morning. Now, Zillow, which is a real estate market company, is doing some research on how much we need to make to afford a home without stretching the budget at least so much. Now, the report can be very numbers heavy, but we broke it down like this. First, Zillow is finding that the income needed to comfortably afford a home is up 80% since 2020. Now, keep in mind the median income has only risen 23% in that same amount of time. For those shopping for homes today, you need to be well in the six-figure range. Zillow says you need to be making, taking home rather more than $106,000 a year. Then those researchers took that, those numbers and made a ranked list. They took 50 metro areas across the country and compared how much is needed to afford a house in each one. Charlotte came in at number 23. Now, the ranking shows you would have to save for about nine years just to afford a 10% down payment. And as for possible solutions, well, the article points to an interesting trend. So it's called house hacking. It just means being able to rent out all or part of a home so you can get some extra cash. Zillow says at least 21% of last year's buyers reported co-buying with either a friend or a relative in order to save some money. So it's why we're asking if you'd be willing to take the same route this morning. Here's the question. Would you co-buy your house with a friend or a relative? Make sure you text us 704-329-3600. Wake up to the news that matters most with meteorologist and traffic reporter Chris Mulcahy. And we're all clear. We're keeping you smarter, safer, and on time. Start your day the Mulcahy way. See the difference. 430 to 7 on WCNC Charlotte. If you've ever received a bill or bought a ticket for a concert and noticed the price was a lot higher than you anticipated, you may have gotten hit with junk fees. But what exactly are they and can you combat them? WCNC Charlotte's Megan Bragg looks into it in today's Verify. So let's get the facts. Our sources are the Biden administration, a bill filed in the Senate, and Sarah Rathner with NerdWallet. Rathner says many people don't know this, but we're spending a lot of money each year on junk fees. These individual fees on their own might not seem like much, but Added up all together, junk fees are costing American families tens of billions of dollars a year. A bill filed in the U.S. Senate known as the Junk Fees Prevention Act would make merchants disclose these hidden fees up front instead of hiding them at the very end of the transaction. Rathner says while this won't make these hidden fees any lower, it's still a step in the right direction. But it is going to make it easier for consumers to comparison shop knowing the final price and not just the initial price that's being advertised. This means if you're deciding between, let's say, two hotel rooms under the Junk Fees Prevention Act, both places would have to disclose any hidden fees before you get to the end of the checkout process. You can then choose which hotel works best for you. Rathner says since junk fees aren't going away, you'll need to include them in your budget. It is unfortunate that you can't always tell what something's going to cost until the very end. But really what might be helpful is just budgeting an additional amount of money. So if you think something's going to cost you $50, maybe budget $75 just in case. With your Verify Fact Check, I'm Megan Bragg. And if you have something you would like verified, just email us at verify at wcnc.com. Meantime, right now at 6, learning can be a challenge for many students for a lot of different reasons. For students who are hard of hearing, though, those hurdles can be tougher to overcome. Now, a Charlotte family is pushing for CMS to change the way their child who is deaf is taught, saying the current system is too isolating. The state provides extra funding for each student who is deaf in public schools. However, the parents argue those dollars are not going to their child's education the way it's supposed to. That has our Michelle Bowden asking, where's the money? Up until a few years ago, there were several different options for teaching deaf students in Mecklenburg County. Now, though, the parents we talked to say there's only one option, and they say it's setting their kids up for failure. Afternoons in this house look a little different than most. There's all the hubbub of after school energy, but not a lot of noise. Mom and dad are deaf, and so are four of their seven kids. 
Three of the kids who are deaf are at University Meadows Elementary School, where they are mainstreamed in a class with all hearing kids and have an interpreter. It's nice for my deaf children to be in a challenging environment where they're stimulated to learn and around other hearing children, that's fine, but there isn't communication and association with other deaf children. Besides their siblings, they need to be around with other children who are like them. We worked with an interpreter to do this interview where mom told us how frustrated she is with the way her kids are being taught. So all day long, the only person that they're interacting with is the interpreter. So they don't get to learn vicariously from other students. They don't get the opportunity to uh, help other students. They don't get the opportunity to be helped by other students. They don't get to talk about what's cool and what's not cool. She says the only people that know sign language at her kids' school are the interpreters assigned to each of them. So when the kids go to school, they literally can only communicate with the interpreter and that's it? Yes, just the interpreter. It hasn't always been this way. Until 2016, CMS had a special program for deaf students in Mecklenburg County where the kids were taught under one roof at Cotswold Elementary. In fact, that's where Carolyn went to school and it's what she wanted for her own kids. To see what's happening and to hear from the interpreters. Donna McCord Smolik is a deaf advocate who also grew up here in Charlotte and sent her kids to Cotswold. You know, the hearing students are in such a uh, for them, an integrated classroom, but it is such not an integrated classroom for the deaf student. They're left out, they're placed on an island, and all of the hearing people around them who don't know any different think they're doing the right best thing because they've got them so integrated that they've erased them, and there they are sitting alone, and it just breaks my heart. We checked with the state and learned every North Carolina school district decides how they want to approach teaching deaf students. Wake County, the school district most comparable to Mecklenburg, told us most of the students who are hearing impaired in their district attend their home schools with an interpreter if needed. But Wake County also offers regional programs or cluster programs for deaf students at three schools. We also checked in with the National Association for the Deaf, NAD, who told us as of 2020, 70% of deaf students were mainstreamed across the country, but pointed to the 2004 Federal Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act, or IDEA. That requires options for deaf children, including cluster schools that serve large groups of deaf students at selected schools. A spokesman for NAD told us, quote, deaf schools are an important placement opportunity mandated by IDEA that can be very beneficial for deaf children in providing education and community. Because right now, all of the deaf children are dispersed. And it is hard for deaf children to be around other deaf children. The state gives each school district an extra $5,600 per deaf student to make sure they have the tools they need. But Carolyn says money meant for her kids is being lumped in with money for all kids with special needs. To use the money that is allocated for the deaf student and then subsume it into a larger budget that's paying for ramps and for other forms of access isn't fair. That money was allocated to the deaf student. It makes me wonder about their future. I see a lack of resources. I see a lack of education for the deaf children. I see them not being set for success. The family we talked to say they're working with several advocates in town looking into the possibility of bringing a charter school for deaf students here in Mecklenburg County. They tell us right now they're in the exploratory phase. Reporting in Charlotte, Michelle Bowden, WCNC Charlotte. And now our Where's the Money team works hard to hold those in power accountable, including the school systems and government agencies that use your taxpayer dollars. That being said, most of the time, it's your tips that really prompt us to start digging into those receipts. So if you have something you think we should investigate, please let us know. You could send an email to money at WCNC.com or reach out to us on social media. When it comes to WCNC's chief meteorologist, Brad Panovich, our viewers tell the whole story. Hey, if you're new to the area, this meteorologist is awesome. I always stick with Brad Panovich when it comes to severe weather. He's rarely wrong. You should follow Brad if you don't already. He's usually right on the money with his forecast. I don't look at anything else besides what Brad says. We are fortunate to have him here. Brad Panovich, experience the difference with WCNC Charlotte weather. Well, many people in North Carolina are trying their hand at mobile sports betting. Of course, there are going to be some wins and some losses, but are you allowed to deduct your losses from your taxes? 
WCNC Charlotte's Megan Bragg spoke to the experts in today's Verify. Are you getting lucky or are you seeing more losses than wins on these bets? It's okay, you can be honest. So if you do lose, can you deduct gambling losses on your taxes? Let's verify. Our source is Mark Stieber, tax information officer with Jackson Hewitt Tax Services, the IRS, and Intuit TurboTax. According to the IRS, winnings from any gambling are taxable. Stieber says if you win over $600, that's when you will get a form to fill out to record those winnings. If you win more than $600, you're going to get a W-2G with the amount, where you want it, how much you want, and those details and the IRS will get it too. Now, if you win $5,000 or more, there's a mandatory withholding and the government will take 24% of their taxes up front. But what if you lose? Fast answer is yes, if you have losses while gambling, you may be able to take a tax deduction. May is the key word here because there are certain conditions you'd have to meet. According to TurboTax, you can deduct your gambling losses, but only to offset the income from your gambling winnings. You can't just deduct losses without reporting winnings. And the dollar amount of losses you can deduct can never exceed the winnings you report as income. To report losses, you must itemize income tax deductions on a Schedule A form. Also, the IRS doesn't permit you to subtract your losses from your winnings and only report the difference on your tax return. Overall, if you have winnings, you can deduct same day, same types of losses to the extent you have winnings, but not a net loss and not all different types of bets, one at the casino, one at the dog track, and then one playing poker, and then the other one in the March Madness pool. Same types of bets can offset same types of income and losses. So we can verify that, yes, you can deduct gambling losses on your taxes. However, there are rules you must follow so that those deductions pass muster with the IRS. With your Verify, I'm Megan Brown. When did you know what you wanted to be? Hey, Mom, the weather's on! WCNC Charlotte's chief meteorologist, Brad Panovich, always knew what he was meant to do. All right, don't forget your umbrella. In fact, he joined the American Meteorological Society when he was 13. Now Brad is all grown up. You can see him right here on WCNC Charlotte, making sure you're informed and safe. Hey, where did all my hair go? Experience the difference. Calmer weather here. Beautiful view from uptown. Starting to see some of the green pop up on those buildings. I bet by tomorrow for the parade, you're going to see a lot of green showing up across the skyline of Charlotte. So a little bit of fog tonight. Don't be surprised to see that tomorrow morning. A sunny Saturday. We're going to see temperatures in the mid 70s. St. Patrick's Day looks great, though. I do expect to see a few more clouds in the afternoon. If you are going uptown for the parade, certainly looks like a perfect day. I mean, you can't ask for better weather than this. Mid 50s early on temperatures climbing into the 60s. Eventually we will be in the 70s as we get into the afternoon. The weekend overall is not bad. Maybe a, a few sprinkles in the morning with some drizzle or mist, but as the day goes on, it'll be mostly sunny and Sunday. I, I do think we'll see some sun, but we're certainly going to see increasing clouds as we get into the afternoon. The one thing that could kick, up, kick off a sprinkle is that little front pushing through, but should be gone by sunrise. Lots of sunshine tomorrow, but a second front comes through on Sunday. This is the one that cools us off, and there might be a few sprinkles to the south as that pushes through. Even on Monday, we might have some low clouds, fog, and drizzle. And just to show you what that looks like, overnight into the morning hours should be okay. And then by tomorrow afternoon, I mean, just wall to wall sunshine. What a great Saturday. Sunday, though, notice the increasing clouds and watch the rain pass just to the south. As we go into early Monday, that's why we could see a stray shower. Now the cooler temperatures come in with that second front as it blasts through the Carolinas. It will drop colder air at least for a couple of days into the east and southeast, and that means chilly afternoon highs in the 50s. But more importantly, the morning lows could dip down to or uh, to freezing or below for a couple of nights. So enjoy the spring warmth this weekend because going back to work on Monday and Tuesday, it is going to be noticeably cooler. And if you're a gardener, landscaper, you started planting things early, may want to take some precautions or things that are already flowering that you didn't want to flower early because of the early warmth, you might have to take some precautions. Remember, get those sheets out. We'll probably need those a couple of nights. The other thing you do remember, heavy watering the day of or the day before can actually help retain heat in the plant and the soil around it to keep it a little bit warmer overnight. We're not going to get much rain this weekend, just a 20% chance on Sunday, but late next week again, we might have another system on that Friday, Saturday timeframe. The timing is very fluid right now. This far out, 
little shift could mean all the difference in the world. So stay tuned, but we're likely going to have another system. Other thing to look out for this weekend. Allergy suffers a lot of pollen. We saw some today get washed away a little bit by the rain. It'll come roaring back this weekend and be back in the high range as we go into next week. So planning your weekend both days. Not bad. Probably a little bit more cloud cover on Sunday, but heck it's 70s and <laughs> we're talking about St. Patrick's Day weekend. You can't believe it. I mean, just a warm stretch of weather. The cooler temperatures are moving back in Monday and Tuesday. We go 10 days into the future and notice the temperatures staying in the 60s all the way until next weekend. All right, Brad, thanks for that extended look too. Next person is continuing to fight for his life tonight after a triple shooting in Mooresville left him hospitalized. A suspect and two victims dead. The Iredell County Sheriff's Office responded to a call, shots fired call on home drive Saturday night. When they arrived, they say they found three people tied up, two victims already dead. Another person in critical condition was taken to the hospital. Shortly after, deputies then got information leading them to another home on Oswald Amity Road in connection to the suspect in the incident. And that's where an hours long standoff took place before coming to a deadly end. WCNC Charlotte's Anna King has the latest on the investigation. Neighbors in Iredale County say they were jolted out of their sleep to the sound of multiple gunshots Saturday. Those shots were coming from a home on Oswald, a Mitty Road. Deputies with Iredale County Sheriff's Office say they were trying to take 39 year old Justin Strawyer into custody. They say Saturday night he tied three people up at a home on Home Drive in Mooresville. Officials say Strawyer killed two of those victims, 22-year-old Eduardo Cordova and 24-year-old Caleb Loper. The third victim is in the hospital in Charlotte. Officials say shortly after the shooting, Strawyer barricaded himself inside the home on Oswald and Mitty Drive. They say he was shooting his AR-15 when they arrived on scene. For hours, there were negotiations to get him out, as well as four juveniles who deputies say were in the home and refused to come out as well. Deputies eventually use gas to get everyone out of the home, and they say Strawyer followed the juveniles out while shooting at deputies. Officers then returned fire, shooting and killing Strawyer. The Iredell County Sheriff says the crimes that took place on the home were not random and notes drugs and robbery are a possible motive. In Mooresville, Anna King, WCNC Charlotte. The North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation will now lead the investigation and as per protocol, three deputies are on administrative leave. North Thanks, Brad. There's an ongoing study though in Gastonia analyzing barriers to housing and then recommending how to remove them. The goal here is to implement policies that create more affordable housing and then address the disparities. But it does seem like the city is falling short in some places and has been for years. WCNC Charlotte's Julia Kaufman takes a closer look. A third party analysis found five main issues that are making it harder for people to find fair housing in Gastonia and the barriers go beyond affordability. The Gastonia City Council's Housing Committee received an update Monday on the federally required housing study that's done every five years. Of course, there's a limited supply of affordable housing. City data says rent prices have nearly doubled since 2015. But Director of Housing Danette Dyes says the analysis also found there's limited housing supply for those persons with disability. The same problem was found in 2019, and the study says the city has not implemented anything yet to try to address it. Making sure that our most vulnerable citizens and those people who have the least voice are not left behind and don't fall through the cracks. Um, and I think that the, the study definitely showed that some of that does happen. Housing Committee Chairman Robert Kellogg says the city is working to update its zoning codes so it can be more inclusive with development. As we implement more ways to build and more ways to include different zoning opportunities, that that would also help individuals who are disabled. Gastonia leaders adopted an affordable housing plan in fall 2023. Goals in the 10 year plan include creating a housing trust fund and building a housing resource center. I think there's definitely room to improve, but I think we're on the right track. Researchers want your feedback on the fair housing analysis and recommendations before they present them to the city council next month. We have details on how you can participate on WCNC.com.
WCNC Charlotte. Good morning, Carolinas. Tune in to the team that's preparing you for your day. We are following two major breaking news stories this morning. See the difference in your morning. We can see clear skies at the off of the distance. Everything is flowing just fine. We're asking where's the money so you can get ahead in 2024. Responsible reporting, community focused, unique content. Good morning, Savannah. Hi, Sarah. Great to see you. See the difference weekday mornings on WCNC Charlotte. Living in a neighborhood run by a homeowners associations association has its upsides and downsides. A Mooresville family found themselves asking where's the money after discovering some of their HOA's approved colors didn't even exist anymore. The family picked a color they liked only to be hit with a thousand dollar fine until neighbors stepped in. Kenneth Threed and his wife, Tisha, say most of the time they've enjoyed their house at the end of a quiet cul-de-sac in the meadows at Reed Creek Community. They've always taken pride in its upkeep. I'm a peaceful guy, you know, in this neighborhood I've been 18 years. Um, we never had no problems. But things started stirring up last fall when the couple decided to refresh their home's exterior paint. Threet admits it was almost completely painted before he learned he needed to fill out a request for architectural approval. So I went to the HOA representative and she said to me, this color you have is not an approved color. After requesting a hearing in which the Threets were denied permission to keep their darker shade of gray, Threet says the board told them they'd have to change the color. We want to be in compliance um, with, with the HOA rules and regulations. So we was trying to work with them. Three then took a drive around his neighborhood. I found out that there was other colors in the neighborhood that was not approved colors. So to be clear, Threed says other neighbors had homes painted in colors that were not approved. We were not able to determine whether those neighbors requested and received HOA permission before painting. Either way, Threed says he was told to change theirs or else. They charged us $1,000 fine for not having the right color. Another neighbor, Mark Lepard, says he could empathize. The personal feeling was that uh, not everyone on the board had complete empathy with a lot of the requests that were being made. And it just so happened last month, homeowners voted in new HOA board members, including Lepard. From what I've heard personally, there was an overwhelming amount of people that did want to see a difference in the way that the, the rules are enforced on them. Three is one of them. Thank God for Mark and the ones that came on. The new board has signed off on the, the paint colors that they chose, and so they don't have to paint their house. Um, they were assessed some fines, and we've waived those, and so they're good to go. It worked out for the threats, but he says the last several months have been stressful. It also serves as a reminder if you live in a neighborhood run by an HOA to read the guidelines when it comes to changing or adding to the appearance of your house. Homeowners usually have to fill out an application for an architectural review for major changes. It'll save time and aggravation knowing if you can proceed with any kind of construction or remodeling work. Well, if you've been here in Charlotte for a couple of years or maybe longer, you've seen Charlotte continue to grow. But as businesses come and go, there's one local business that is standing the test of time. Dilworth Mattress Factory has been in Charlotte for 92 years, opening up in 1931 during the height of the Depression. WCNC Charlotte's Jesse Pierre spoke to the owners about how they have helped folks rest easy for decades. Mm -hmm. Dilworth Mattress Factory has been in the Dilworth South End community for over 90 years, and there are generations of history behind this door. The photo of Dilworth Mattress Factory founder Thomas Philbeck firmly mounted to the wall. When he started it as a um, as a mattress refurbish business, he would. It was right after the Great Depression. Since 1931, the company has evolved from a mattress repair shop to handmade custom orders helping folks rest easy. We start with a traditional spring right like this on some mattresses. Scott Hirsch picked up the family business and is the current owner where the work is all about the feels. We can make this side soft and this side firm. Along with his wife, Dory Hirsch, who showed off a mattress fit for a queen. This is the only mattress that we actually do not make in our factory. It holds the royal warrant, and this is actually what the entire royal family sleeps on. The factory, in its third location in 92 years, is surrounded by new development. 
Hirsch says he's been around to see a lot of the changes. Plenty of mattress stores have come and gone since we've been here and, and plenty of businesses in the South End area have come and gone. He says referrals and repeat customers keep their operations from taking a snooze. And the pandemic came along and people weren't really going out. So it kind of introduced us into uh, mattress sale by appointment only. Adapting with the times, Dilworth Mattress Factory is springing forward to a century and beyond. Sold to generations to generations and kids of ki kids of parents and, and, th and their kids now. So um, I think it's important for us to continue this uh, tradition. Jesse Pierre, WCNC Charlotte. I'm astonished by the bed for He's the Royals. About that. Yeah, I mean, I know it's not the exact bed that they sleep on, but I want, yeah, I want to know more about that. I'm gonna have to ask Jesse. Ask the Royals. Or yeah, they'll, they'll dish on <laughs> how it feels. Is I'm it just, angelic, I'm just like sleeping on a cloud? Yeah, like yeah. how do they get in touch with them anyway? That caught my eye too. Yeah. All right. Well. When I think about the community, I think about the time that I've been here. I've been in this community almost my entire adult life. So I, I, you, know, you get to know the people. When you know what they care about, then that's what you care about. This community looks at all of us who do weather here at WCNC Charlotte as part of their family. And uh, when you're part of their family, you want to make sure you do it just for them. Time now to connect the dots. When we make the news, make sense. President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris set to campaign here in North Carolina later this month once again. And Democrats think he has a real shot at winning the state come November. Down ballot races could help President Joe Biden pull out a win in the Tar Heel state. Let's connect the dots. The president lost North Carolina in 2020 by just under a percentage point. But the New York Times reports Republican candidate for governor Mark Robinson could push voters to a Democratic ticket. Robinson has a history of anti-Semitic comments and opposes abortion and gay rights, which may even turn away some conservative voters. With the governor's race getting even national attention, outgoing Democratic Governor Roy Cooper believes it's a battleground state that could give a slight edge to the president over former President Donald Trump. Biden's campaign making the state a top priority as North Carolina quickly grows, many new residents are coming from blue states. But it won't be easy. A Democratic presidential candidate hasn't won the state since 2008. And that is Connecting the Dots. A Charlotte nonprofit is asking for your help tonight after receiving some generous donations. Yeah, Beds for Kids is looking for volunteers to help families get ahead, starting with a good night's rest. Our Larry Sprinkle takes us to the warehouse and tells us how you can make a difference here. I'm going to take this over to the trash. Lauren Patterson is volunteering to help out and get her hands dirty at the same time. It's not very glamorous, but it needs to be done. For the past two years, Lauren has helped kids across the Mecklenburg and Cabarrus County areas get a good night's sleep by lending a helping hand. I am from Charlotte, born and raised, and I feel like it's very easy to grow up in a, in a bubble here, but there is so much need just 10 to 15 minutes down the road. And, you know, one hour, one volunteer can do so much. She's just one of a handful of volunteers with beds for kids, helping families get everything from a chair to a dining room table. Every single volunteer that we receive and have at this warehouse is essential and really important to our mission. So without volunteers, we could not operate. And their work is critical. I think that a child who feels safe in their home and gets a good night's sleep is only going to be um, more successful in school, and that's only going to continue to carry them um, to be successful. Beds for Kids usually delivers to 30 families per week. But next week, with the help of several suppliers, they want to try and furnish 60 to 70 family homes. There's only 12 of us, so we definitely need more volunteers for that. Volunteers making a difference, getting together and cleaning furniture, and the reward for their work is often seen firsthand. To see the kids come home and to be so excited to have a bed to sleep on that night. In West Charlotte, I'm Larry Sprinkle. Back to you. So if you can help and you don't mind lifting and moving some furniture, get in touch with Beds for Kids through our website, wcnc.com or our mobile app. Yeah.
Hey YouTube, this is Chief Meteorologist Brad Panovich here at WCNC Charlotte. We want you to head over to our Weather IQ YouTube page, where we're making you smarter and safer. We have a passion for weather science, and we want you to understand what's happening when the weather changes, because in the end, that's what keeps you safe. It's not about being scared, it's about being informed. Browse our collection of fun and informative clips and look for new segments every week. We're here to raise your Weather IQ. Experience the difference on WCNC Charlotte calmer weather here. Beautiful view from uptown. Starting to see some of the green pop up on those buildings. I bet by tomorrow for the parade, you're going to see a lot of green showing up across the skyline of Charlotte. So a little bit of fog tonight. Don't be surprised to see that tomorrow morning. A sunny Saturday. We're going to see temperatures in the mid 70s. St. Patrick's Day looks great, though. I do expect to see a few more clouds in the afternoon. If you are going uptown for the parade, certainly looks like a perfect day. I mean, you can't ask for better weather than this. Mid 50s early on, temperatures climbing into the 60s. Eventually, we'll be in the 70s as we get into the afternoon. The weekend overall is not bad. Maybe a, a few sprinkles in the morning with some drizzle or mist, but as the day goes on, it'll be mostly sunny. And Sunday, I, I do think we'll see some sun, but we're certainly going to see increasing clouds as we get into the afternoon. The one thing that could kick, up, kick off a sprinkle is that little front pushing through, but should be gone by sunrise. Lots of sunshine tomorrow, but a second front comes through on Sunday. This is the one that cools us off and there might be a few sprinkles to the south as that pushes through. Even on Monday, we might have some low clouds, fog and drizzle. And just to show you what that looks like overnight into the morning hours should be OK. And then by tomorrow afternoon, I mean, just wall the wall sunshine. What a great Saturday Sunday, though. Notice the increasing clouds and watch the rain pass just to the south as we go into early Monday. That's why we could see a stray shower. Now the cooler temperatures come in with that second front. As it blasts through the Carolinas, it will drop colder air at least for a couple of days into the east and southeast. And that means chilly afternoon highs in the 50s. But more importantly, the morning lows could dip down to or uh, to freezing or below for a couple of nights. So enjoy the spring warmth this weekend because going back to work on Monday and Tuesday, it is going to be noticeably cooler. And if you're a gardener, landscaper, you started planting things early, you may want to take some precautions or things that are already flowering that you didn't want to flower early because of the early warmth. You might have to take some precautions. Remember, get those sheets out. We'll probably need those a couple of nights. The other thing you do remember heavy watering the day of or the day before can actually help retain heat in the plant and the soil around it to keep it a little bit warmer overnight. We're not going to get much rain this weekend, just a 20% chance on Sunday, but late next week again, we might have another system on that Friday, Saturday time frame. The timing is very fluid right now. This far out little shift could mean all the difference in the world, so stay tuned but we're likely going to have another system. Other thing to look out for this weekend, allergy suffers a lot of pollen. We saw some today get washed away a little bit by the rain. It'll come roaring back this weekend and be back in the high range as we go into next week. So planning your weekend, both days, not bad. Probably a little bit more cloud cover on Sunday, but heck, it's 70s and we're talking about St. Patrick's Day weekend. You can't believe it. I mean, just a warm stretch of weather. The cooler temperatures are moving back in Monday and Tuesday. We go 10 days into the future and notice the temperature staying in the 60s all the way until next weekend. All right, Brad, thanks for that extended look too. Next. Governor Rory Cooper has announced an executive action striking down the state's rules on name, image and likeness compensation that were issued back in 2021. They, he says these rules are no longer needed, adding they set the standard for colleges and universities to come up with their own NIL policies. Go, uh, Governor Cooper also says his executive action plays a key role in leveling the playing field for student athletes across North Carolina so they have the same access to NIL as athletes in any other state. Time now to connect the dots. When we make the news make sense. A new study says air pollution is hurting the performance of North Carolina students in class and in sports, and it turns out a new statewide initiative could help reduce those numbers. Electric buses are coming to North Carolina, and that could help keep your kids healthy. Let's connect the dots. Yale researchers looked at test scores and pollution exposure for every public school student in North Carolina over 17 years. They found the more time a child was exposed to pollution, there was a direct correlation to failing test scores. While pollution in the Tar Heel State has improved over the last 20 years, kids are still exposed to lots of pollution. The study suggests this is in large part because of cars and buses. And there is a program looking to change that. 
the state is currently in the process of using more than $25 million to buy 114 electric buses. 27 of those will be deployed here in Mecklenburg County. Experts say these buses could significantly reduce kids' exposure to pollution and potentially help their performance in school. And that is Connecting the Dots. At WCNC Charlotte, we believe it is crucial to make a difference in our communities. That's why we go beyond just reporting the news. We ask, where's the money to hold the powerful accountable and get money back into your pockets? Our Verify team takes claims, finds sources, and gets you answers. And we're keeping you weather aware, making you safer and smarter. I'm Vanessa Rufus. And I'm Colin Mayfield. Join us weeknights at 5, 6, and 11 and see the difference for yourself. Only on WCNC Charlotte. Now at six, we have a quick warning for you before we really dive into this story. You're about to see and hear something that really no one wants inside their home, apartment or business. We are talking about raw sewage. A where's the money investigation found that the city of Charlotte has paid nearly $2 million to help people deal with damages tied to the city's sewer system. And our Nate Norabito discovered the problem is only getting worse. With enough miles of sewer to make it from here to Alaska, Charlotte Water has said logistically, crews just cannot proactively inspect the entire system. So the city tends to be reactive, paying up when a failure is found in their lines. Leaders even increased the maximum payout in recent years. But some believe the city needs to make prevention a bigger priority. Oh man, this is going everywhere. The sight. I literally heard her scream. The sound. It's raw. It was disgusting. The smell. Like Of sewage. It was everywhere. Like it, there was like no stopping it. Overpowered Dwayne and Catherine Pennant. This was all flooded. All as their infant and toddler slept nearby. And it was flown in that room, which is our children's room. More than a year later. It interrupted our lives. The parents still feel overwhelmed. I'm tired. <laughs> I'm tired and, and I'm a lie. But when Charlotte Cruz came out to clean it, the you know what? I said, hey, hey, what are you guys doing? Hit the fan. It blew back. The pennants say Cruz pushed sewage back into their home. A failure in cleaning and they believe prevention. One that forced the family to spend the next month in a hotel. This is something that could be avoided with better maintenance. Public records show since 2018, almost 900 people have filed sewer blowback and blockage claims against the city. It seemed like everything was just destroyed. Where, where are we going to live? Last year alone, Charlotte water records show blockages nearly doubled. It's a real thing. It's happening all the time. Seth Wyatt says his small family plumbing business receives three to four calls a day often tied to problems on the city side of the sewer, routinely caused by thirsty tree roots rupturing the lines. And they will do just about anything to get water. Especially worse when there's a drought. When there's a lack of rain, the, the call volume goes up. Tree roots are only part of the problem though. This is preventable. Most blockages are at the kitchen drain. Charlotte Water spokesperson Cam Coley says customers are also clogging the lines over time when they dump grease and wipes. The goal is to keep all the wastewater in the pipe. Regardless of the cause, it's the city's responsibility to keep the lines clean. Is the city doing enough to prevent this? That is worked on every day. We are doing preventive maintenance when we're not responding to emergencies or sewer related uh, concerns. Coley says Charlotte Water dedicates a team to inspect 600 of the city's highest priority lines, is on pace this year to clean 20% of its sewer system, up from the prior year, and uses technology to monitor its lines, so crews' limited time is used efficiently. We're looking to clean where it's needed most. He says it all comes down to a balancing act between resources and priorities. What can the city do? I mean, the first step is admitting you have a problem. Councilmember Tariq Bakari believes leaders have failed to prioritize basic services. Those non-sexy but critically important things. That's why he's calling for a strategic committee that can focus on infrastructure needs. We don't even know the size of the problem yet, so we have to size things out. That's all broken. 
The penance say they now know the full scope of their problem. She was breastfeeding at the time, and the level of stress, she couldn't do it. She couldn't Yeah, my produce. supply just, like, and cut off. After months of back and forth with the city. Still, some days are, are not good. They finally agreed on a price to cover the cost and installation of a backwater valve to prevent this in the future, leaving them finally with a sense of relief. If you don't want to take any chances, a plumber can install a backwater valve, but that will cost several thousand dollars. Either way, don't ignore the warning signs. If you hear gurgling noises or notice that your drains are slow to drain, call 311 immediately. Nate Morabito, WCNC Charlotte. Well, we know this, Nate, in our Where's the Money team, they really work hard to take these story tips and dig into every avenue possible to get you answers. Yeah, tonight on WCNC Plus, actually, Nate's going to sit down with our Nate Stur uh, Nick Sturdivant, that is, to talk more about the investigation process. Nate and Nick, from how the story started, the questions we've asked, and the answers we're still waiting to get. You can get that in-depth perspective only on WCNC Plus, starting at 6.30 on your preferred streaming device. And now in this Women's History Month, we're focusing on the stories that highlight the difference and disparities between men and women. Good morning and happy Tuesday. Now, here's what we've got from Wallet Hub this morning. The site came up with this ranked list on the best and worst states for women. Now, before we get to the big reveal, I want to break down some of the methodology here. Researchers looked at some key metrics when they were making this list. The data ranges from median earnings for female workers to women's health care, even the female homicide rate. Now, as for that big reveal, both Carolinas are in that bottom half of the list. North Carolina came in at number 30. South Carolina is about 10 spots lower at number 40. And some numbers before we let you go. Women represent more than two thirds of all minimum wage workers. And the U.S. political representation is also suffering. Even though women make up about 51% of the population, we're only making up about 25% of the Senate and then 29% of the House of Representatives. It's numbers like those that led writers to create this list in the first place. Ben? WCNC Charlotte. Weather is a, a kind of science that you get to see and experience every day. And I think some people don't even realize how much it affects them. That weather has a huge impact on you know, how it threatens your family, your livelihood, or your home. So I think it really is one of those defining things we do that really affects everybody in our community. See the difference. That process of giving you a warning ahead of time and keeping you and your family safe is really important to me because I live here too. It's my family, it's my friends, it's my neighbors. Maternal health care continues to be a problem in North Carolina. The latest March of Dimes report found for every 100,000 births in the state, 26 people giving birth die from complications of pregnancy or childbirth within six weeks. That's higher than the national number. And for women of color, the numbers are even worse. Now a nonprofit called Queen City Cocoa Beans is trying to help. WCNC Charlotte's Lexi Wilson shows us how they help guide families of color through the birthing process. It is a blessing, truly, that um, Jackson and I are here today. <laughs> the gift of motherhood is something the Dean family doesn't take for granted. We, um, like so many people, experienced a pretty traumatic birth. Their original birth plan didn't go as expected, eventually leading Rachel Dean to be readmitted into the hospital. She says it was the support of her team at Queen City Cocoa Beans that helped her get through the ordeal. Everyone deserves those troops to rally for them. Having a team in place really does make a difference. Making a difference in the lives of Charlotte Black families is the goal of this organization by helping them achieve better birth outcomes. According to the CDC, Black women are three times more likely to die from pregnancy-related conditions. My mom died very early after giving birth to me, as well as I've had many stillborns and miscarriages. For Assistant Director Lugina Grinder, this work is personal. She says her mother was unheard and unseen, later finding out she had a brain aneurysm from birth that was never diagnosed. It was just assumed that she was using drugs or that she was doing uh, something that was harmful to her. She now uses her story to change the narrative, turning sorrow into support. It's kind of like I was born to do this work. <laughs> it's work that's seen here with 16-month-old Jackson. We focus on the whole person, the whole family. There you go. A healthy and happy baby where life isn't taken for granted. Reporting in West Charlotte for WCNC Charlotte, I'm Lexi Wilson. Thank you.
College kids and incoming freshmen across our area, they are stressing out. Many of them are waiting on the FAFSA to see how much it'll cost to have to go to school. The federal financial aid program got a big overhaul this year, and to put it bluntly, it's been a mess. Mm. We are talking major delays in the process, leaving students and schools in limbo asking where's the money. Our Michelle Bowden talked to some who say they are now scrambling. This is so hard on so many families and the schools are struggling too. So far, there are 30% fewer applications this year than in the past, meaning the result of this whole mess could be tons of students who simply don't go to college. Johnny Darling is a senior at Philip O'Berry High. He got into his dream school for next year, but might not get to go. Although I want to go there, it's very expensive and I'm not sure how I'm going to pay for it as of right now. Darling is the oldest of four kids and the son of two school teachers. I don't know which school I'm going to choose because I don't know how much I'm going to get from FAFSA. FAFSA is the free application for student aid, the federal government program that was revamped this year, causing major delays. These changes affect everybody who is in college or thinking about pursuing higher education in the upcoming year. Students fill out the application, the government processes it and sends it back to the schools that then determine how much financial aid a student is eligible for. We typically begin notifying students in November. And when are you expecting now to be able to do that? Realistically, April. So there are some students that are literally waiting to find out now if they can afford to go to college next Correct. year. Correct. Adrian Amador Odi is the vice president of strategic enrollment at Queens University and says she worries some students won't go to college this year at all because of the difficulties. I can't even count how many times we've been delayed. My biggest concern, they'll just give up. It's very stressful because FAFSA is one of those things that once you know what that dollar amount is, you can navigate what else do we need to do? And right now with the delay, it's really putting a strain because we can't make a decision on, well, it's gonna be this school or that school. Alan Davis works with high school seniors as part of Road to Hire, a nonprofit that helps underrepresented high school students on the path to corporate jobs. He's working to help students avoid taking out costly long-term loans to pay for schools, and says the FAFSA delays are making that tough. We have learned from many of our folks who have gone through this uh, historically that the challenge of financial uh, aid and loans and what that looks like. And we want we understand, particularly for families of color, uh, that that represents a barrier to wealth. How worried are you that some of your kids may not go to school because they just don't know how they're going to pay for it and this delay is really a problem? Yeah, it's a real reality for many of our students. Uh, 47% of our students are first gen, so they are trying to figure this thing out. This is the first time this process has had a complete overhaul in 50 years, and critics say the government simply didn't put enough money or resources into making the change. Once they work everything out, all these kinks, it is supposed to make things easier for students and their families. Back to you. It can be so frustrating, too. So the price of higher education is expensive. There's really no other way to say it. Yeah, we know there are plenty of students and families who are struggling to pay for it. We do want to help you get ahead. So tonight on our streaming app, WCNC Plus, we are sitting down with an expert who shared some strategies to help parents and students save for college. You can watch our latest Your Money episode to hear some accounts that can help your money grow and also understand the changes happening with financial aid. So tune in at 8 o'clock tonight. It is available on your favorite streaming device. Connect the dots and let us clear up the confusion. We're here to make sure the news makes sense. And with Connect the Dots, you'll understand how the headlines impact your family. See the difference on WCNC Charlotte. New at 430, a neighborhood's battle against proposed development continues to get a lot of attention. A current change.org petition centered around a Piper Glen development has nearly 20,000 signatures against a rezoning petition. WCNC Charlotte's Julia Kaufman shows us why some neighbors are against the plan. We're on the four mile greenway here in Piper Glen and on the other side of these woods, developers want to build apartments and a retirement community, but homeowners are against the development. Even on a rainy day, people in South Charlotte love the four mile greenway. Long, spacious greenways, lots of nature. Charlotte native Chris McIntyre and his neighbors are fighting to preserve that nature. 70% of the trees will be wiped out. 
on 53 acres. The proposed Sutherland at Piper Glen development calls for 640 rental units on the other side of this creek. That's just really dense. McIntyre understands the land will be developed, but he'd prefer to see houses for sale. Some neighbors want the land untouched. Councilman Ed Driggs says that's not an option. The county expressed an interest at one point to the owner uh, in buying the site for a park. The owner said, I don't want to talk about that. It's under contract. Under the land's current zoning, the developer can build about 470 homes, but no apartments. Driggs says rezoning the property for higher density could save more trees and improve roads, but more negotiations need to happen. Unless some sort of an understanding can be arrived at with that group and with residents uh, in a larger scale, I won't support it. The project has a public hearing Monday at the Charlotte City Council meeting, and it's expected to be a packed house. In Piper Glen, Julia Kaufman, WCNC Charlotte. WCNC Charlotte. This is Flashpoint, where power and politics collide, and the tough questions get asked and answered. Thanks for joining us here on Flashpoint. I'm Ben Thompson. Well, after years of debate on Monday, mobile sports betting will finally be legal here in North Carolina. And between all the ads featuring your favorite celebrity, promotional deals, and big bucks for the state, it's very easy to get excited. But there is a downside. Coming up in a few minutes, how the state is preparing for the very real issue of gambling addiction that comes with this news. But first, joining us now is sports betting regulation expert and editor of Sports Betting Dime, Robert Linehan. Robert, thanks for coming on. We appreciate it. No, thanks for having me on. I know it's a busy time uh, down there in North Carolina. It is. Lots of folks are really excited about this. Listen, you've watched this play out in states across the country. You write about it. Um, give us, with that context, give us some perspective about how big of a deal it is to have sports betting roll out here in North Carolina uh, in the next week. Sure. Well, North Carolina is, is expected to be a very healthy sports betting market in the country, not to mention that it's likely going to be the only state to launch sports betting in 2024. Um, right now, there are no other states that have any scheduled launches. Uh, a few states are considering legislation to legalize sports betting um but even if they do get something done they're likely not going to launch this year so north carolina could be the only state and, and will likely be the only state to launch this year um i know operators i know uh, sports betting companies are very excited for north carolina uh it, it, it's not going to be you know, North Carolina is not going to be a, a top five market in the country. It, it's not going to be a New Jersey or a New York. Uh, those two states dominate the sports betting landscape. But there's a lot to be excited about uh, for North Carolina. Uh, it's it's a populous state. Um, you, you have some 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 crazy sports fans down there. Uh, a, a lot of residents that have been clamoring for sports betting legalization over the last couple of years, as this has been discussed. Uh, you have a very healthy college sports fandom down there, uh, and it's perfect that this is launching a week before um, the March Madness tournaments begin. So there's a lot to be excited about in North Carolina, and there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic that the North Carolina sports betting market is going to be a very healthy one for that. You mentioned the revenue. How much revenue are we talking about here in this uh, first year? Well, I mean, of course, uh, you know, these are just estimates, but, you know, the first, actually, for these estimates, for the first fiscal year, the 2023-2024 fiscal year, uh, the estimate is there is going to be no tax revenue coming in for this. But but that's just basically how the calendar falls. Uh, during the first full year of sports betting, the fiscal estimates say that the state could bring in nearly $65 million of additional tax revenue. By year five, when, you know, typically year five is when the sports betting market has, um, you know, basically aged and and, and is, is topping out and, and is a mature sports betting market. By year five, North Carolina, according to these fiscal estimates, when the bill was passed, could be seeing an additional $100.6 million in annual revenue. You know, this is revenue that the state was 
losing out on, you know, for in years past when people were sports betting in North Carolina, because as you know, sports betting was going on in the state before it was legalized. Sure. It was, you know, being handled by offshore regulators, offshore sports betting operators. Um, North Carolina wasn't getting any tax dollars from it. So this should be, you know, a hundred million in terms of a state budget. It's it's not a hundred million seems like a lot, but in terms of a state budget, it, it's not a ton of money, but this is revenue that the state was missing out on that could have gone to supporting, you know, higher education, youth athletics, all of the good things that the bill has earmarked the tax revenue for. So it, it's going to be a nice uh, drop in the bucket for the state. And uh, it's just going to be money that they were losing out on in past years. Yeah, you're talking about state budget. That's billions and billions. And, and but still money's money and, <laughs> and everybody likes money. Um, you mentioned this a second ago, but there's a lot of folks already betting using VPNs, dark websites to bet in other states. So based on your reporting, do, do you think there are folks who want to bet, haven't been doing that and haven't cur currently found a way to do it that are now going to be jumping on the bandwagon? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, this this provides North Carolina North Carolinians or North Carolina residents with a safe and legal way to bet on sports in the state. Um, you know, with some of these offshore regulators, you're basically giving your private information to, you know, this an offshore regulator that, you know, who knows what they're doing with what you're giving them you know you're basically giving them your bank account information and who knows who's handling it who knows who's seeing it uh so this absolutely will give people peace of mind you know people that might have been hesitant to you know throw 25 dollars into an account and you know bet on unc uh, uh in the upcoming march madness tournament so absolutely, this is going to bring in more people to the sports betting market in North Carolina. Um, like I said, uh, these these legal legally licensed operators in the state will, you know, they're going to provide the services uh, that the offshore books don't. Um, there's going to be more responsible gaming. They're, they're going to be paying you know, certainly more attention to responsible gaming issues uh, as opposed to, you know, some of the unlicensed regulators. So this is a, certainly a way, a safer way and a more responsible way for residents in the state to uh, participate in sports betting. And you're going to see that certainly uh, when it launches on the 11th and you'll see how how many people are uh, going to be enjoying this as the state moves forward. Um, any common problems that you've seen in rollouts across the states that, that, that folks should be wary of in this first year? You know, not really. This is old hat for a lot of these operators right now. Um, you know, DraftKings and FanDuel are licensed each in more than 20 states apiece at this point. So they know what they're doing. Um, there's tip, te te typically not a lot of technical difficulties uh, in the state. I mean, you do have some you do have some newer operators in the state like ESPN bet underdog underdog. Uh, this is actually going to be the first state where they launch sports betting, uh, but they've been around for years offering daily fantasy sports contests. I, I know for a fact that they likely will have a good platform uh, for customers to use and a great app to use. So I don't think you're going to be seeing too much in the way of difficulties. I mean, there's always, you know, there could always be some people that may not get a bonus that they're offered or, or, or something may happen along those lines when they sign up. But, you know, all these operators have uh, a great customer service representatives. Um, you know, if you do run into a problem, contact the number that they have prominently displayed in their sports book apps and on their websites and i i think it's going to be smooth sailing in north carolina this, this is too big of a state it's too big of a market for these operators not to be on top on the top of their game when this launches and that you don't want to be the one operator you know you don't want to be the one operator that's down for a couple hours on opening day when the others are are, are raking in the cash and and you know, registering new users. So I, I would not imagine that there's going to be too much that could go wrong. I'll knock on wood when I say that. I'm, I'm saying that right now. And then, you know, maybe a, a seven out of the eight will have problems on the first day. But typically, it's usually pretty smooth sailing. They've all been here before. This is old hat for them. 
I really don't think there's going to be too much that could go wrong on Monday, March 11th, on when Monday. North Carolina yeah. launches online sports betting. Listen, it's very exciting. Uh, and uh, Robert Linan, you have given us a great lay of the land here. We, we, we do appreciate it. Thank you, sir. And thank you very much for having me. Up next on Flashpoint, how the state is beefing up resources to help battle gambling addiction. Calmer weather here. Beautiful view from uptown. Starting to see some of the green pop up on those buildings. I bet by tomorrow for the parade, you're going to see a lot of green showing up across the skyline of Charlotte. So a little bit of fog tonight. Don't be surprised to see that tomorrow morning. A sunny Saturday. We're going to see temperatures in the mid 70s. St. Patrick's Day looks great, though. I do expect to see a few more clouds in the afternoon. If you are going uptown for the parade, certainly looks like a perfect day. I mean, you can't ask for better weather than this. Mid 50s early on temperatures climbing into the 60s. Eventually we will be in the 70s as we get into the afternoon. The weekend overall is not bad. Maybe a, a few sprinkles in the morning with some drizzle or mist, but as the day goes on, it'll be mostly sunny and Sunday. I, I do think we'll see some sun, but we're certainly going to see increasing clouds as we get into the afternoon. The one thing that could kick, up, kick off a sprinkle is that little front pushing through, but should be gone by sunrise. Lots of sunshine tomorrow, but a second front comes through on Sunday. This is the one that cools us off, and there might be a few sprinkles to the south as that pushes through. Even on Monday, we might have some low clouds, fog, and drizzle. And just to show you what that looks like, overnight into the morning hours should be okay. And then by tomorrow afternoon, I mean, just wall to wall sunshine. What a great Saturday. Sunday, though, notice the increasing clouds and watch the rain pass just to the south. As we go into early Monday, that's why we could see a stray shower. Now the cooler temperatures come in with that second front as it blasts through the Carolinas. It will drop colder air at least for a couple of days into the east and southeast, and that means chilly afternoon highs in the 50s. But more importantly, the morning lows could dip down to or uh, to freezing or below for a couple of nights. So enjoy the spring warmth this weekend because going back to work on Monday and Tuesday, it is going to be noticeably cooler. And if you're a gardener, landscaper, you started planting things early, you may want to take some precautions or things that are already flowering that you didn't want to flower early because of the early warmth. You might have to take some precautions. Remember, get those sheets out. We'll probably need those a couple of nights. The other thing you do remember heavy watering the day of or the day before can actually help retain heat in the plant and the soil around it to keep it a little bit warmer overnight. We're not going to get much rain this weekend, just a 20% chance on Sunday, but late next week again, we might have another system on that Friday, Saturday time frame. The timing is very fluid right now. This far out little shift can mean all the difference in the world, so stay tuned, but we're likely going to have another system. Other thing to look out for this weekend, allergy suffers a lot of pollen. We saw some today get washed away a little bit by the rain. It'll come roaring back this weekend and be back in the high range as we go into next week. So planning your weekend, both days, not bad, probably a little bit more cloud cover on Sunday, but heck it's seventies and we're talking about St. Patrick's Day weekend. You can't believe it. I mean, just a warm stretch of weather. The cooler temperatures are moving back in Monday and Tuesday. We go 10 days into the future and notice the temperatures staying in the 60s all the way until next weekend. All right, Brad, thanks for that extended look too. Next. Some North Carolinians who owe millions of dollars in back taxes will have their debt forgiven after 10 years. And that's thanks to a new law that passed last year, adding to the state's existing tax forgiveness legislation. Now, if you haven't heard about the law, you're not alone here. Yeah, a viewer actually told us about it after mm. our Where's the Money investigation exposed that state tax on illegal drugs. The so-called drug tax has cost North Carolinians more than $100 million over the last 15 years, even though some of them were never convicted. Our Nate Morabito discovered those taxpayers and others facing longstanding state tax debt now have a better chance of getting ahead in 2024. If knowledge is power. I had to worry about Uncle Sam. <laughs> That's the word Uncle Sam. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Uncle Sam. Antonio Mosley finally has the currency he needs. No more debt. No more Uncle Sam. To control his destiny. Boy, like a burden off my back. It was a burden. The small business owner recently learned the state lightened a heavy load. He spent decades hauling. You gotta realize it's 1993. Tied to a teenage mistake that not only sent him to prison. Yes, I owned it. Did my time for it. But also saddled him with thousands of dollars in taxes tied to illegal drugs.
They found some cocaine. A debt that for years stood in the way of Mosley's attempts to make the most of his second chance. I don't think it's fair. Just months after we first amplified his plight, he learned the state had already written off his remaining drug tax debt. It was a victory for me. Turns out others are likely unaware they too are now debt free. The lack of knowledge can be just as harmful as the assessment itself. Laura Webb has spent years fighting to end North Carolina's unauthorized substance tax and get the state to forgive all debt. We saw where multiple people were being assessed for the same amount of drugs. The director of the North Carolina Justice Center's Fair Chance Criminal Justice Project says the tax discourages people from getting jobs and forces them to make other major life decisions. They might decide not to go and buy the house. Based on their tax debt. And it's very hard to overcome these. This amended state law passed in 2023 will help. It forgives all state tax debt, not just tied to drugs, after 10 years. And it's retroactive, a major change that's received no public attention until now. It is a step in the right direction. Um, we hope that the law will still go further. You feeling good? I'm feeling great. Okay. No more debt. Antonio Mosley didn't know about the law until we told him. It was a big relief. We didn't know until a viewer taught us. It's been a blessing. Now others have this same knowledge. And that is powerful. This new law is just the latest step toward more tax forgiveness in North Carolina. It was actually an existing law that wiped away Mosley's debt. All of this was news to him and to us. The lesson here is to reach out to the Department of Revenue to see whether any of these laws might affect your back taxes. Nate Morabito, WCNC Charlotte. So our work is never done, truly, right? Nate and our team work hard to dig into the receipts, double check those numbers, and then ask those in power, where's the money? Yeah, this story originally came to us from a viewer tip, and as you can see, it's really taken off from there with multiple folks in the community weighing in. And it really just goes to show that your tips can lead to answers and to real change. We do invite you to tune in tonight on WCNC Plus. There you can see our Nate Morbido explaining the behind the scenes of this investigation, how it started, the questions we asked, who we asked, and the answers we are still waiting to get. You can catch that tonight at 830 on your favorite streaming device. While there is a lot of excitement right now from some folks, there are also some concerns about gambling addiction becoming more prevalent. Yeah, because of this, as part of the legislation to make betting legal, additional state resources were put in place to help those who might struggle. WCNC Charlotte's Nick Sturdivant talks to some licensed clinical uh, addiction specialists specifically about the risks and what you should look out for. I, I want to throw this out there. I mean, I, I just saw an ad for online sports betting. I feel like I run across them every day. You, you can't avoid them either if you're watching a podcast on YouTube or whatever content on YouTube. You're streaming something on your TV. It's concerning. Uh, you know, they're they're saturating the market, obviously. Um, and, and like you said, they're they're exploring all avenues to do so. Bright lights, big celebrities. This is fun. This is exciting. And then at the very end of those commercials, just real quick, 1-800-GAMBLERS. Art and Christina Close are both licensed clinical addiction specialists. They run Coastal Therapy Center, LLC. And now we have sports betting that is just in your fingertips, uh, which makes it difficult to walk away from. So there's no, oh, I have to leave here and go home or I have another responsibility. It's just in my hands at all times. People tend to de de detach themselves because it is online. It's on an app on your phone, but you're you're losing real money. Mm -hmm. um, and and th there's, you know, there's that high that you feel when you are winning. And what I'm hearing is just be aware of like your personal finances and again what you're spending right there's thousands of people that can that can safely gamble um but but the awareness like like we said is key anybody can fall victim to gambling um it, it, there, there's no boundaries art and christina tell us don't be afraid to reach out for help here's that number for the north carolina gambling our problem gambling helpline 877-718-5543. That resource is free to anyone who needs it. We also have this online at WCNC.com. You can reach that whenever you need it. And there's a lot of.
Time now to connect the dots. When we make the news make sense, there's a new way to order everything from vodka to tequila here in Mecklenburg County, and it's all possible thanks to the online ordering that surged during the pandemic. You can now order some of your favorite liquor from the palm of your hand. Let's connect the dots. Mecklenburg County is bringing beverage sales into the 21st century. The county's ABC board is launching the ABC to go mobile app. It'll allow folks to order ahead and then pick up their purchases in stores. All you have to do is enter a zip code and then browse the inventory of your nearest store. The idea first came together following the pandemic. Thousands used online ordering to avoid going into stores. It's just part of the latest push to modernize a dated system. For years, lawmakers have considered privatizing the sale of liquor to help modernize a system that dates back to the Prohibition era. And that is Connecting the Dots. All new tonight, a Charlotte-based company is leading the country in hiring those who are neurodivergent, essentially folks whose brains work differently than most. Yeah, Wells Fargo has hired hundreds of applicants who might otherwise have struggled to find jobs. WCNC Charlotte's Michelle Bowden shows us how the program is seeking solutions and then paying off for both the workers and Wells Fargo. The bank says this isn't about charity. In fact, they say it is a win-win because they're able to tap into a top-notch talent pool. When I came here, I was 27. I had a master's degree. I was a published author, and I had never held down a full-time job for more than about a month. Alex Lieberman admits he was living with his parents with not much on the horizon when he got his job at Wells Fargo three years ago. It feels good to have a future. After a while, I didn't see myself doing anything. And this gave me a chance to build something for myself, to build a way forward, to help other people build their futures too. And it's a privilege I never thought I would get. Lieberman, who is autistic and has ADHD, is a tech consultant at the company, part of the Wells Fargo Neurodiversity Program that launched in 2020. It's a really a talent play. It's not charity. It is gaining access to an incredibly deep, richly diverse, highly skilled talent pool. Stephen DeStefani runs the program that has so far placed almost 300 workers at Wells Fargo in everything from tech jobs to data analytics roles, finance and more. We see the return on investment and I say that a little reluctantly because I because I often say you, you shouldn't need a business case to do the right thing. But there is a business case. We are closing skills gaps and employee satisfaction, particularly for those who have participated or are impacted by the program, is through the roof. DeStefani says one of the keys is making sure the interview process isn't a stumbling block, letting people be themselves. Vivian Nguyen is a software engineer who is autistic and says that was a challenge at previous jobs where she was often told to change the way she interacted with people. But things like that have happened throughout my life, whether in the interview process or actually at work. Do you think maybe they just didn't understand that you were a little bit different? Absolutely, I agree with that. Because I was different, because I wasn't like them, because I wasn't holistic and I didn't follow what we call social pro protocols and all the scripts that you do. Or it sounds like you feel more comfortable in your own skin here and that they actually value your skill set. Oh, absolutely. Yes, they do, because we're here to do work and we're here to make things better. And I'm empowered to do all of those things without letting those social protocols get in the way. We are all people. We think differently than most but we don't have any more or less inherent value than anyone else. In a program that acknowledges that and accommodates that, we have a chance to contribute in ways that people generally don't think that we can. And the Wells Fargo team running the Neurodiverse program says they're actually sharing their best practices with other companies in hopes that other companies will follow their lead. Reporting in Uptown Charlotte, Michelle Bowden, WCNC Charlotte. And now part of our effort with our Seeking Solutions brand is to highlight the companies and individuals and groups making a difference and giving a voice to those who might not always be heard. So if you know a group or maybe a person who's doing just that, we want to hear about them and get the ball rolling towards those solutions. We can't say it enough. A lot of our great stories come from you at home. So send us an email to newstips at WCNC.com. You can see your story on our air.
go to a murder investigation, though, in Lancaster County tonight. Yeah, we have learned a 23 year old is now in jail in connection to that case. Lloyd, Lloyd Caldwell Jr. We're told is facing murder and burglary charges. He's accused of killing 65 year old Harriet Mahaffey. WCNC Charlotte's Anna King spoke to neighbors tonight who say they are shocked. Well, neighbors described us as incredibly sad and say with the neighborhood so quiet and tucked away, they're more confused than anything else. With the things that are going on in the world today, you don't never know what's going to happen where. So it's, you know, it's, it was just more or less a surprise. Neighbors along Stewart Place Road in Heath Springs say they're shocked after 65 year old Harriet Mahaffey was found murdered in her home Monday. We live in a quiet neighborhood, don't nobody bother nobody and just for something like that to happen just uh, a tragic thing for somebody to do something like that. Mahaffey lived alone and relatives had not heard from her. Lancaster County Sheriff says family members went to check on her Tuesday and they found her unresponsive next to 11 bullet casings. Guys, this was a horrible crime uh, with, with no explanation for it. A uh, uh, lady sitting in her home defenseless, not bothering anybody. Someone walks in and, and shoots her multiple times. During the investigation, officials noticed her 2004 Jeep Cherokee was missing, the same one that was seen in Chester and Charlotte. Investigators eventually traced the car back to 23-year-old Lloyd Caldwell Jr., who was arrested in Chester County. After searching his home, deputies found evidence connecting Caldwell to the murder. We live in a different world today. It's not like it was 20 years ago. And, and, and you know, years ago, people could leave the doors unlocked and things like that. Now you have cameras everywhere. Now you have to keep your doors locked, have to be aware of your surroundings all the time. Caldwell is now in the Lancaster County Detention Center charged with murder, first degree burglary, grand larceny and possession of a firearm during the commission of a violent crime. The Lancaster County Sheriff says there's no clear motive for why this happened, noting the suspect and victim did not know each other. In Lancaster County, Anna King, WCNC Charlotte. 637 now, and we're asking where's the money for college students and graduates. Good early Thursday morning, and thanks for watching. A new report from the outlet Study Finds is trying to answer a pretty timely question. Is that four-year degree still worth it? Now, we want to hear from y'all in a second, but here are the details in this article. There were three main takeaways. First, the short answer is yes. Researchers say investing in a college degree still pays off financially. Now, the second takeaway is this. Certain degrees lead to a better return. The money makers are going to be engineering and computer science degrees. And then moving on to three, just in time for Women's History Month, the research shows women benefited slightly more than men by earning that degree. On the numbers, here they are. The data covers about 10 years. It compares earnings and tuition costs of about 6 million students and graduates. Then analysts came up with a percentage. That return of investment came in around 9%. But I want to explain the reasoning behind this number, which explains more than the number itself. If you consider more than just how much you make after school, like the cost of tuition after books and even the lost wages from not entering the workforce sooner, they all point to one factor that's gaining more importance. It's the field that you're able to work in. Researchers in this article say while the degree still pays off, well, that bottom line is college keeps getting pricier. So the recommendation is that students should choose a degree that's going to pay more. It's what has us asking this morning. Do you think a four year degree is still valuable? Make sure you text us 704-329-3600. Calmer weather here. Beautiful view from uptown. Starting to see some of the green pop up on those buildings. I bet by tomorrow for the parade, you're going to see a lot of green showing up across the skyline of Charlotte. So a little bit of fog tonight. Don't be surprised to see that tomorrow morning. A sunny Saturday. We're going to see temperatures in the mid 70s. St. Patrick's Day looks great, though. I do expect to see a few more clouds in the afternoon. If you are going uptown for the parade, certainly looks like a perfect day. I mean, you can't ask for better weather than this. Mid 50s early on temperatures climbing into the 60s. Eventually we will be in the 70s as we get into the afternoon. The weekend overall is not bad. Maybe a, a few sprinkles in the morning with some drizzle or mist, but as the day goes on, it'll be mostly sunny and Sunday. I, I do think we'll see some sun, but we're certainly going to see increasing clouds as we get into the afternoon. The one thing that could kick, up, kick off a sprinkle is that little front pushing through, but should be gone by sunrise. Lots of sunshine tomorrow, but a second front comes through on Sunday. This is the one that cools us off, and there might be a few sprinkles to the south as that pushes through. Even on Monday, 
we might have some low clouds, fog and drizzle. And just to show you what that looks like overnight into the morning hours should be OK. And then by tomorrow afternoon, I mean, just wall to wall sunshine. What a great Saturday Sunday, though. Notice the increasing clouds and watch the rain pass just to the south. As we go into early Monday, that's why we could see a stray shower. Now the cooler temperatures come in with that second front as it blasts through the Carolinas. It will drop colder air at least for a couple of days into the east and southeast, and that means chilly afternoon highs in the 50s. But more importantly, the morning lows could dip down to or uh, to freezing or below for a couple of nights. So enjoy the spring warmth this weekend because going back to work on Monday and Tuesday, it is going to be noticeably cooler. And if you're a gardener, landscaper, you started planting things early, you may want to take some precautions or things that are already flowering that you didn't want to flower early because of the early warmth. You might have to take some precautions. Remember, get those sheets out. We'll probably need those a couple of nights. The other thing you do remember heavy watering the day of or the day before can actually help retain heat in the plant and the soil around it to keep it a little bit warmer overnight. We're not going to get much rain this weekend, just a 20% chance on Sunday, but late next week again, we might have another system on that Friday, Saturday time frame. The timing is very fluid right now. This far out little shift can mean all the difference in the world, so stay tuned, but we're likely going to have another system. Other thing to look out for this weekend. Allergy suffers a lot of pollen. We saw some today get washed away a little bit by the rain. It'll come roaring back this weekend and be back in the high range as we go into next week. So planning your weekend both days. Not bad, probably a little bit more cloud cover on Sunday, but heck it's 70s and <laughs> we're talking about St. Patrick's Day weekend. You can't believe it. I mean, just a warm stretch of weather. The cooler temperatures are moving back in Monday and Tuesday. We go 10 days into the future and notice the temperatures staying in the 60s all the way until next weekend. All right, Brad, thanks for that extended look too. next. What's near me? If you're out and see news, open the WCNC News app and go to near me on the bottom right. Then tap share with us. Upload your photo or video and tell us about it. Hit submit and your news has reached our team at WCNC Charlotte. Happy Friday, everybody. We have made it. TGIF. Yeah. This week flew by for me. I don't know about you guys. Uh, you know what? It'd fly back even faster if it was a four day week. That's right. Yes. <laughs> I'm all uh, for it. Can we do this? Uh, well, didn't Larry David have something to say? I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Bernie Sanders. <laughs> wow. He did. Funny you should say. Yes. <laughs> Often confused for one another. Uh, that's what we're talking about this morning. A four day work week could be one step closer to becoming the norm. So let us know this morning, what do you think? Do you think that, that uh, that's just as good as five days and you can be just as productive? So Bernie Sanders introducing a bill that would reduce the standard work week to 32 hours without a pay cut. The bill would mandate workers get overtime pay anything after 32 hours of work instead of, you know, most people work an average of 40 hours a week. A recent survey found nearly 90% of workers said they'd be interested in the idea of a shorter work week. I'm sure, especially if you right. get the same pay. So this morning we want to hear from you. What do you think? Do you think it is time we make a four day work week the standard or do you think five days is just fine? Let us know. Uh, some people commenting this morning saying everyone deserves more weekend and less work week. I am all for the four day schedule. I'd love a four day work week, but it will increase costs for employers, especially small businesses, because you have to hire more people to cover the hours that they aren't open. And babysitters and things like oh, that. Oh yeah, four day work sure. week would be a dream, but becomes unfair when you also want the school week to stay at five days a week, yep. uh, four days, but work nine hour days. So there you go, lots of people. In. Joy already, already says she, she'd go for it. Would you guys, what, what, what do you guys think? I'm with you. Yeah. Working five <laughs> days to get two days off, it's just, it's, I'm not a fan. Yeah. Yeah, for me, it's almost less about the working four days as much as it is about having three days off. <laughs> That's just such a nice, I feel like. Oh, uh, yeah, for perk. sure. Um, but Larry, you wouldn't take that extra day, would you? It was Monday, I probably would. I don't like I'll Friday being the day. I think Monday. Because everyone's happy. We because like Friday. It's Friday, yeah. But then yeah, wouldn't yeah, everybody be happy that it's, it's Thursday? Yeah. Thursday. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Thursday is. Uh, <laughs> well, hey, it's speaking. not going to happen. Yeah, so. Melissa, yeah, Melissa yeah, says she's uh, she's <laughs> down already log off early on Fridays. I think a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing, though. Joy I feel Mott like saying she, she'd go for it, too. Yeah, I, I think um, I think there's a couple of things here. Okay. Same thing as our, the AI conversation the other day and whatever else. We're, I, I feel like we're sort of behind the eight ball on, on these conversations. I feel like we've evolved so much and the work week as it is right now evolved decades ago and I feel like we're, we're not staying up on things because I think sure there's a conversation to be had about four day work weeks 
I also think if you have that conversation, perhaps more importantly, is bringing people up to a pay scale that is appropriate. Yeah. I mean, you have a lot of people making less than they would have in the 1950s for the mm -hmm. same job once mm -hmm. you once you adjust mm -hmm. for inflation. And they're working harder. And they're working harder. And that, and that just doesn't make sense with technology and everything mm -hmm. else. And I, and I feel like there's issues like that. R retiring, I feel like we have some antiquated ideas of retiring and when to retire and what's the official retirement age. Have you ever thought about I feel being like, an agent? I need to hire you. Uh-uh. Oh, <laughs> Ben would be a great agent. Yes. I would hate but that. But please don't leave the news No, I would hate that. Because I, who's going to do flash? Uh, yeah, right, right. <laughs> you. <laughs> um, so I, I think I'm, of course, open to the idea of working four days, but I feel like there's other big conversations to have around that as well that we're not having. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, hey. Speaking of the weekend, yes. mm. it is going to be a two-day two day weekend, right. but, but there's still a lot going on right. this weekend. So we're talking about three big events happening around the Queen City, uh, kicking off your weekend with the Charlotte Hornets. The team plays their first of two games tonight against the Phoenix Suns. Tickets still available. The game starts at 7 at the Spectrum Center. Also, take a look at this. Celebrating all things green, of course. The St. Patrick's Day party yeah. returns to Uptown. Look at those Irish step dancers. Uh, the beloved parade kicks off Saturday at 11 a.m. You know, technically it's St. Patrick's Day Sunday, but the parade Saturday. Yep, yep. Uh, the parade starts at East 9th Street and Tryon Street. If you can't make it to the parade, a festival will take place before and after the parade from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. So lots going on. Also, uh, grab your green and get ready for more fun at Charlotte's annual bar crawl event for St. Patrick's Day. Uh, they have discounted drinks, free entry at participating bars. The crawl starts at tattoos and booze at 2 p.m. on about the Sunday. End of the people crawling? I've always wondered about mm. that. Is no, that... you're just going from oh, okay. place to place. Ah, right? yeah, some are. Yeah, yeah. I some bet of them are. Some will probably be crawling, <laughs> unfortunately. They need yes. to go yeah, home. Yeah, right. uh, tickets start at $12. So, um, Lots going on, Larry, mm, but there might on. be some well, some rain. What right? about the weather for yeah. St. Patrick's Day? There you My go. Friend, Leap and Larry's not here. I don't know where he is. He's in the basement, I, maybe. But I thought no. he would make an appearance. I, I he made an appearance this morning. I know. I don't know where the guy is. Uh, today, yes, I would say there's a chance of a few showers and storms, particularly from about noon until four. But tomorrow, for all the big events, the parade uptown, the uh, the festival that's going on, uh, looking for temperatures in the, the mid 70s. And then on St. Patrick's Day, that's as perfect as it gets. I mean, that? yeah, that's unseasonally warm. Luck the Irish. Wonderful. 70, a green Luck 72. Of the Irish. Wearing of the green. But I did want to, let's see, we push this button right here. And I was going to show you what's going to happen next week, but it just not it working for me. <laughs> and by next Tuesday, it's only good. There it there is. All go. right. You can see next Tuesday, a low of 32, a high of only 56. Mm -hmm. Take it back. You're going to look well, green. That's so, right. Uh -uh. <laughs> uh, we still got some people chiming in yeah. about working from home. John Kelly saying, I think the ability of working from home, hybrid or modified work week is long overdue. The old five day in the office is outdated when we're talking about going to four day work weeks. Yeah. Uh, Melissa chiming in saying, John Kelly, I've been working from home for six years. I would take seven figures to get me. <laughs> oh, it would take yeah. seven figures yeah. to get me back into the office. Yeah, well, people. I think, that's what's, I think that's what made the pandemic so hard is that people got a taste of that life. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then they were told, nah, I mean, got to come back. I mean, people here, they left uh, because know. they were I just like, I admire I work people who can work from home because I would be the lazy, I still am la lazy anytime I'm home um, anyway. I would not describe would, you as lazy would, at all, no, at home, No, at home, I would be, I would not be able to work. That's why I have to come to work. That's why, yeah. like Ben and myself, maybe one of the, we were here during the, during the pandemic. Well, so was I. I know, but you weren't with us at the time. Oh, yeah, I was at night. We were talking about us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just it was, it's like having to come in and work. And if I stayed at home, I would be really I would be lazy. I'd be they'd go. He's out of here. Well, our job <laughs> is kind of different because it's like it's easier here because all the equipment's here. Yes, that's exactly you know, right. But depending on what your job yeah. is, if you have everything at home and almost have that like that separate mm. space, yeah, which is totally. hard because I do think people yeah. know. If your kids are home or you got laundry, you get distracted easily. That's I was for about sure. to say, now I didn't sure. have no kids to distract me. Yeah. But when I was just reporting, I had to work from home and I was much more efficient. So I don't know. I think it just depends on what kind of person you are. Like, I, so. yeah. well, yeah. a couple of, I know a couple of our reporters uh, did say that they did not like being home. One in particular really? used to work on a morning show. She yeah. said she did not like working yeah. at home. So it's every, it's a, depends it's on the person. person. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Right. May you be so lucky as to get the decision at some point. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of us I, don't. I doubt it's going to uh, happen. That's right. That's right. That's right. All right. Let us know what you think. Have a great weekend. We'll see you back here on Monday. Bye. Bye.
Now to Gastonia, where the city is making plans after getting a $250,000 donation from an anonymous donor. However, that donor says the money must go towards improving the aesthetics of some busy roadways. WCNC Charlotte's Jesse Pierre shares more about how this money will be used. Yes, the city of Gastonia received a very generous gift and the money will be used to make the area surrounding several interchanges more appealing to the eye. Anything to do to beautify this area, it's going to be seen. Along US 321 and just under a mile from I-85 is Allen's Mobile Home and RV Supplies. Owner Billy Linhart says one thing he can count on seeing outside his doors is a flow of cars. Just probably almost doubling how much traffic I've seen out here in just the nine years that I've been here. But now, due to a generous donation, drivers can expect a more pleasant drive into Gastonia. Thanks to an anonymous $250,000 donation, three busy interchanges along I-85 will be freshened up. Those interchanges are at Cox Road, New Hope Road, and US 321. The first step, starting with some simple cleanup. The trash, the underbrush, the vine, I mean, just right. to, to clean that, and then the next step would be to uh, spruce it up. The money will also go towards replacing aging and broken fencing, planting grass and low maintenance shrubs. City leaders gave the green light for the beautification project to begin, despite some concerns of wasting money ahead of the I-85 widening project set to begin in a few years. Just hate to see them put a lot of landscaping plans in place, you know, plantings and things like that to have them yanked out in a matter of a short period of time. Mm -hmm. you know. I think the conversation was had with the anonymous donor Yes, that that project would impact and they said go forth and do good things. City leaders hoping to save some of the money until after the widening project is done. Linhart says this will be a good look for the city. To give people an impression of Gastonia, to make them want to come back, to make them want to shop, stop, eat. He hopes it will make the congestion in the area more bearable and hopefully attract more foot traffic in. Jesse Pierre, WCNC Charlotte. In just a few hours, the ACC men's basketball tournament is set to tip off. This is one of several major tournaments going on this week. It all comes ahead of Selection Sunday when we'll get our first look at March Madness brackets. NC State plays Louisville this afternoon at 430. Duke and UNC have their first games of the tournament on Thursday. Well, these intense games sometimes lead to fans storming the court in excitement. But WCNC's Megan Bragg explains why that might not be a great idea in today's Verify. Buzzer beater moments are what the madness is all about. But sometimes those moments can cause harm to the players. This year, a Duke player was hurt after Wake Forest fans stormed the court after their win. So can fans be civilly liable if they injure a player while storming the court? Let's verify. Our sources, attorney Eric Hayes with James Scott and Farron Law Firm, the NCAA, and the ACC. The NCAA does not have a policy on storming the court and leaves punishment up to each conference. Duke and Wake Forest are in the ACC conference. Currently, the ACC does not have rules against it. However, NCAA spokesperson David Warlock told NBC News court storming is not allowed during NCAA tournament games, and they work with venues to develop a security plan to try and prevent it. They don't go into it thinking that they could be hurt during an after game court storming incident. Attorney Eric Hayes says if a player is hurt by a fan because of court storming, they could be held liable for that injury. Fans are, um, if not just negligent, maybe grossly negligent or reckless, whatever they are taking the court like that if they were to cause an injury to someone. What would the argument be for a fan who rushed the court, ran into a player and hurt them? I didn't mean to do it. Well, then you should have stayed in your seat. As for schools being held liable, that's still an open question. A player who was injured did sue the school and did settle the case. Whether or not a school could be held liable, I think that that is an open question and certainly one that schools would be concerned about. So we can verify that yes, fans can be held civilly liable if they injure a player while storming the court. With your Verify, I'm Megan Bragg. If you have something you would like verified, just email us at verify at wcnc.com. With your help, WCNC Charlotte is making a difference in our community. 
Beautiful day, so many people helping. This is incredible. Let's spread that love tonight. Here is a $5,000 check that you guys can use to further the mission. There is nothing on earth like the feeling of giving back with your hands. $5,000 to you and uh, Block Love Charlotte for what you guys do. If you'd like to make a difference, go to wcnc.com slash make a difference now. Time now to connect the dots when we make the news make sense. Lots of kids hearing back from colleges and universities this week as schools release their decisions. But a few a new form has colleges and families asking, where's the money? Problems with the new financial aid system have both colleges and families waiting for answers. Let's connect the dots. Before families can make a decision on college, finances are often a huge factor. But colleges are in limbo as they still wait to receive information about applicants' finances. The root of the problem comes from the FAFSA website. That's where students can see if they qualify for aid. The Department of Education has been trying to overhaul the form for years. The changes use a new calculation called the Student Aid Index to determine how much a family should get. It's meant to benefit low-income students, but it hasn't been a smooth process. Some families say they're not getting as much aid as they should. Now experts say you may want to consider appealing your case to try and get more money, hopefully in time to make a choice by College Decision Day on May 1st. And that is Connecting the Dots. Well, tomorrow is Canvas Day, where every county election board inside North Carolina will vote to officially certify the primary election results. The primary was the first election under a new state law saying mail-in ballots must be in by election day rather than getting that grace period. Yes, WCNC Charlotte's Julia Kaufman shows us how voting activists say this change discounts uh, legitimate or discounts legitimate votes, but supporters call it common sense. When North Carolinians voted by mail in previous elections, their ballots had a three day grace period to get to the county election office. That grace period is gone and now ballots marked as returned after deadline are piling up. 31. Under new state laws, absentee ballots need to get to the election office by 7.30 p.m. on election day to count. It was very unnecessary, very unfair to voters. The State Board of Elections tells WCNC Charlotte in the 2020 presidential primary, which had a higher voter turnout than in 2024, 800 ballots were returned after the three-day grace period and not counted. This year, 999 absentee ballots have been received so far that will not count due to missing the new deadline. There are people right now who did everything right and through no fault of their own, but the mail service not getting their ballot in time to the County Board of Elections, their vote won't count. Bob Phillips with Common Cause argues the new deadline hurts all absentee voters regardless of party affiliation. This law, I think, is going to contribute to that feeling that something is wrong with our elections. Supporters like the North Carolina Republican Party argue the new voting laws restore trust in elections. A spokesperson says, quote, the changes enacted by the General Assembly to strengthen election integrity and create one singular deadline worked as intended. These laws are reasonable, common sense efforts to create certainty and transparency in the election process. County election offices are required to notify voters if their vote did not count and explain why. That process will begin after the election is certified. Julia Kaufman, WCNC Charlotte. Verify, WCNC Charlotte. Verify is all about trying to make a difference in the community by making sure that the community has the correct information. This is what we know. And hey, this is what we don't know. Sometimes you're actually surprised by the answer. Verify the difference. Verify is a great way to combat that misinformation, making sure that people know the process of the reporting. Time now to connect the dots. When we make the news make sense, thousands of drivers are reporting their insurance rates are going up, and it could be thanks to data collected behind the scenes. A report shows cars made by GM, Ford, Honda, and other popular manufacturers are sending your data to insurance companies, and you may not even know about it. Let's connect the dots. In most of these vehicles, there's software tracking how you drive. 
It keeps data about when you're on the road, how fast you drive, and how quickly you brake. It's all thanks to the ability of newer cars to connect to the internet. And the New York Times reports all that data gets sent off to your insurance company for a personalized rate. And automakers say it's all legal, thanks to all those papers you sign when you buy a new car. That is Connecting the Dots. To this, another push to provide mental health resources to Carolina's most vulnerable students. We do thank you for sticking with us this evening for the news at six. I'm Vanessa Rufus. And I'm Colin Mayfield. Now, in the aftermath of a deadly school shooting in Uvalde, Texas, Congress dedicated money to help prevent future school violence and improve student mental health. But our Where's the Money investigation found new schools in the Carolinas are actually putting that money to use. Yeah, not many schools tonight, nearly yeah. two months after our Nate Morabito exposed this problem, South Carolina is making a second effort to deliver millions of federal dollars to students who are most at risk. When we discovered South Carolina had only awarded this money to a dozen school districts, the Department of Education said it would find a way to spend the rest of the money. Well, now, if everything goes as planned, more than twice as many school districts could receive this potentially life-saving money in round two. In Uvalde, Texas, a gunman murdered two teachers and 19 children. Almost two years later, millions of dollars in grants sit unused. Funds elected leaders approved to prevent another Robb Elementary School shooting. It makes no sense to me for these dollars to be offered by the federal government to be sitting in coffers while our schools are not as safe as they can be. We, we need to do better. It's a revelation WCNC Charlotte took all the way to the top. First with the Secretary of Education and then with the vice president herself. Well, that's part of why I'm here, to make sure that the money gets to where it needs to be going. These so-called Stronger Connections grants are meant to help school districts with high rates of poverty, bullying, absenteeism, and exclusionary discipline. Sometimes I just think I'm not sure how some of these children kind of survive their life. But York School District 1 is the only school system in the Charlotte area that's received a grant so far. The district is using the money to ensure every school has its own mental health therapist. My mission is to help these children who are struggling so much. South Carolina is hoping others will take notice of York's efforts. If you are eligible, please, please apply. The Department of Education opened a second round of applications this month. Records show more than 50 South Carolina districts are eligible and they have two months to submit their applications. We just wanna make sure that this gets out there and we don't have to send any of it back. While South Carolina is moving on to round two, North Carolina has still not spent a single cent of this money. You can blame that on bureaucracy and delays in communication. Nate Morbido, WCNC Charlotte. Now to go further here, we asked some of the districts that did not apply in round one why not? The Lancaster County School District told us the timing was not good back then, but assured us if there was a second round, it would apply. So we alerted those district leaders earlier today that this opportunity is available to them. And so as you can see, Nate and our Where's the Money team are very hard at work. They are tracking those federal dollars. They're keeping receipts here. They're checking those. They're holding those in power accountable, really all in an effort to give you answers. So that being said, if you have something out there you think our team should be looking into, please let us know. You can send us an email to money at WCNC.com or reach out to our team on social media. Calmer weather here. Beautiful. Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us here for our virtual town hall, if you will, that has all to do with resumes and job hunting and things to kind of set yourself up for success when you are looking for a job. I am joined tonight here by Juan Serong and Connor Walsh with Talent Bridge, and these are going to be our two experts we're going to ask some questions of this evening, and you both were telling me that you have very much a familiarity with what people on both sides of this uh, pipeline, if you will, are looking for. 
the employers, what do they want, and the people who are looking for the jobs. Um, one of the things we wanted to show folks first before we dive into things, now keep in mind, comment, please let us know what sort of questions you want to know about, you know, beefing up that resume, any questions that you have about um, getting that job, getting that interview. Um, but we wanted to talk about this because this was prompted by a Where's the Money report that one of our reporters, Jane Monreal, recently did. We showed it to you last night on TV. We want to show it to you again this evening. And it's all about somebody who is on this job hunt. She is sending out all these applications. She's not hearing a word back. And so this is probably a big, big red flag to update that resume. So um, Sean, who is behind the scenes directing, if you will, can we cue up Jane's Where's the Money report here? Karen Meisenheimer has had a tremendous career as a certified nurse's assistant, but it's physical work, and after 22 years and a recent injury, she can't perform the job as well as she used to, so she wants to go into a different line of work. I was trying to do, like, more uh, clerical, more secretarial, uh, more customer service. She sent out 100 resumes. Oh, God, I've motivated. <laughs> I've sent out a lot. Indeed, LinkedIn, uh, Monster, um, some of them I would just look, Google. None of them called her in for an interview. And each time my heart just sank more and more and more. She went to the Free Career Center at Goodwill. So simply sending resume is not enough. We have to understand the culture of that company, what is it that is important to them. Although Meisenheimer's background's in the medical field, she's also dealt with patients, family members, doctors, and making sure her clients' needs are met. That was customer service. Having the ability to understand what are the critical words that allows you to connect to the right position is something that I know we we coach our participants to understand. According to Flex Jobs, it's important to include on your resume keywords also used in the job description. Thank you. If you land the interview but don't make it further, a local staffing manager says it's sometimes because of TMI. When you're asked that lovely question, tell me about yourself. We want to stay in line with what's related to the work or the job that you're going into versus telling about our life for the past, you know, six to 12 months. For executive positions, going to a staffing agency is beneficial. The old school management style of the 80s and 90s of leading with an iron fist uh, is, I would say, is gone. And, and now it's got to be through vulnerability and humility with your people. One of the perks of working with a search firm like us is instead of being one of three to 500 applicants, you're going to be one of three to five that we put in front of a client. Well, experts also say more companies are looking up your social media, about 70%, so keep it clean. And sometimes there is no time to respond. If an employer gets, say, over 100 applicants for one position, about 20% will get that interview. In studio, Jane Monreal, WCNC Charlotte. All right, so there's your refresher, folks. I feel like there's a lot to digest there. And so, Juan, Connor, I don't know who wants to jump in here. I mean... Is this something that you hear a lot from folks? You know, I feel like I'm qualified. I'm sending out, you know, all these applications. I keep hearing employers are looking for workers. Why am I not getting a call back? Is this a common scenario? Absolutely, Vanessa. We hear it a lot of the time in our industry where candidates will reach out frustrated because they've sent in their resume to dozens of companies and they don't hear anything back. And I think a lot of that points us to an ATS or an applicant tracking system where a lot of these are really just automated systems going in and looking for keywords on a resume and it really takes out the human nature of the recruiting process which can be very frustrating in the eyes of someone looking for a new job yeah okay so that that then brings up the question here you know what sort of keywords should i be putting in there because i think maybe people might not know how automated some of these situations are yeah and that's an that's an excellent question so one thing that i tell every candidate that i talk to is look at each job description um tailor your resume specifically for that job that you're applying to if it mentions leadership if it mentions you know a specific skill set make sure that those words are in that resume because as soon as you apply and it happens even for us if we're searching for candidates through places like linkedin or career builder or indeed we're searching for those keywords and so we want to make sure that your resume stands out above the rest and it's always about the percentage of those keywords that you have in there so maybe this is getting into the weeds a little bit. If I'm putting keywords in and I see in the job listing, they have the word leadership. Am I using the word leadership versus 
I was a leader of whatever. Like, do you think it's getting that particular? Like, you got to use an actual word. Yeah. Be oh, which is insane. Yeah. A lot of times it just pinpoints that specific word. I mean, people have searches that are set up where they'll oftentimes incorporate words that are similar, but most recruiters that work at a corporate job are just searching one specific phrase and that's it. Yep. That is one. Sorry to cut you off. One thing oh, to no, add no, no. too. <laughs> one thing to add is a lot of people try to beef up the resume with really big words or words that make their job title sound really lofty. Um, a lot of times, keeping it simple is the best way to go. Um, the shorter your sentences and just gets to the point of what your job duties and functions are, the better. Um, because one, people don't have time to read hundreds and hundreds of resumes, so the shorter it is, the better in terms of getting through a lot of them. So true. Now you mentioned keeping it simple, and that made me think of something that we heard in Jane's piece, which was TMI. What do we mean by TMI? Like what exactly is too much information? I think it depends on the role and the person, um, especially the job you're applying for. I think there are definitely some extraneous details you can leave out of your resume. You know, say you work a receptionist job, you're a front desk person. You don't have to include every specific thing. Say you ordered office supplies. You don't have to list out every single office supply you ordered. Um, just keeping it very concise, like Juan said, making it as efficient as possible and really broad strokes summarizing the work that you did. You don't have to go too deep into the details unless, of course, the job description is looking for a specific thing, then maybe you incorporate that. But. Now, we also heard the, the suggestion of using a staffing agency. What, is, what sort of, I guess, services would you get from a staffing agency? How would a staffing agency set a candidate up for more success versus maybe just going it alone? So this is where we, a uh, shameless plug, of course, but um, not all staffing agencies are made the same. Um, the really good ones like TalentBridge, we take our time with each candidate. We get to find out your story, your background, everything that you've accomplished at work. Um, I always ask candidates to tell me stories of when they, you know, achieve something greater than what their resume may show. Um, and we also help them tailor their resume to the, each job that we're applying them to. Um, we want to present our candidates, you know, in the best light possible. And so we give tips and advice. Um, we also will do a lot of interview prep with candidates. Um, so things like going through what to say during an interview, what not to say during an interview, how to negotiate, you know, compensation, um, things that a lot of people don't have a lot of experience in. Um, we go through and make sure that everyone is prepared for each and every interview that we send them to. Uh, one other thing, too, to add to that is I always remind candidates, people are, you know, naturally not good at interviewing. Um, I'm also terrible at it, um, even as a recruiter. When I'm on the other side of the table, I get nervous. I get, you know, sweaty, clammy, whatever it is. And. I always tell people, remind yourself that the person interviewing you is also not a professional interviewer, too. Um, and that's something that's important to, to keep in mind. Yeah. And I would also suspect, you know, if you are to the point where you're at an interview, this is someone who is interested in you and is taking the time to learn more about you. So it's not like, you know, <laughs> I mean, there, there's a reason you're there. So I feel right. like that could be a good confidence booster to think of as well. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I, I did want to ask, since we are talking about the interview process, um, and, and we were actually kind of talking behind the scenes before we got started with this live stream about this, but like, you know, a lot of things are going virtual now. Um, and let's say you are going to be doing a virtual interview. I mean, are we worried about what the surroundings are like? I mean, how particular are we getting with this? Are we, like dressing up? You know, the whole thing. I would say we're getting very particular here. Um, in our industry, we've seen a lot of the crazy stories. We've seen a lot of things firsthand. You always wanna be cognizant of number one, what's in your background. And we've had several candidates who have had video interviews that have missed out on opportunities because they've had alcohol in the background or they've had a TV on in the background, like crazy things that they're just not really thinking about because we're getting a glimpse into our personal lives. I mean, you're in someone's home right now, so it kind of can seem like it's all blending together, but definitely put your best foot forward I would say a video interview is the best way to do that. You can dress the way you want to. You can rehearse what you want to say. You can control your space. You can make sure there's no distractions. And this is the time to be very serious with that. Yeah. Now, I, I'll remind, I'll take a moment to remind folks, too, who are watching on our social media platforms that you can ask questions. And I, I say that because I do have, I'm seeing a comment from Ashley Strader, who looks like Ashley is watching on YouTube, from what I can tell. Um, and it looks more like a comment than a question. So Ashley, if you have a specific question you want to know about, um, cause you've commented situation, interview, question slash answer. So if you like be more specific, if you have a specific question about that and our experts will be glad to answer that for you. Um, and thank you, Ashley, for tuning in. 
Um, so while we await for perhaps more clarity from Ashley or other folks to hop in with their own questions, um, let's talk about maybe let continue on the interview um, topic of techniques. I mean, is there anything that you find yourself commonly reminding folks or telling folks for this interview process? Um, simple things, really, really simple things like don't chew gum while you're on a video interview. It's something that it's crazy to have to say out loud, but you know, people forget that the moment that the camera's on, you are trying to sell yourself and you're trying to make yourself be a part of that company. Um, things like keeping your camera at eye level, speaking directly into the camera. Those are things that are very, very important. Um, people forget and oftentimes you get weird angles of holding a phone or something along those lines. We remind folks to make sure that, you know, they're putting their best foot forward, like Connor said. Um, dress appropriately. If, if you're doing a video interview, make sure that you're dressing up as if you're going into an in-person interview. Um, make sure that you're thanking folks as you're, you know, fielding questions, take time, pauses, make sure that you're giving them the ability to provide you answers to the questions that you ask, um, and make sure that you're tying in your responses to whatever those questions are. Like if they point to a, let's say a, a need that the company has, make sure that you're bringing up examples that show how you're going to help them solve the issues that they have at, at hand. Yeah, I guess that you, you brought up the concept of like, if the company mentions a need, how much research should you be doing on a company before you go into this interview? <laughs> That's a good question. I would say you can never do too much research and, and preparation is always your friend here. Um, I would over prepare for these situations. That way, you know, everything about the company, the culture, you have that ready so you can ask questions targeted toward the company and where they see themselves. Look up the LinkedIn profile, the manager you're meeting with, always. That's never a bad idea. That way you can tailor your questions and your approach to that specific person as well. It is so much better to prepare for these things than not. Uh, and then you risk asking questions that are already answered on the website or asking questions about what the company does. And those things just honestly are disqualifiers from interviews because that shows you haven't taken the time to look at the company that you want to work for, supposedly. Yeah, that that's great advice. <laughs> that's very good advice. Um, I, I was actually um, thinking about as far as um, preparations. Um, are there things that you tell people to just like totally avoid? Don't do this. Absolutely, don't do this either. Either maybe you can. It can be resume writing or or interview wise. Anything. There are a couple of things that I always say to avoid, especially in an interview, whether it's virtual, over the phone, in person. Um, number one thing I always say to avoid is speaking negatively about a previous employer. That's, oh. that's a big red flag. Um, specifically in the eyes of an interviewer, they're going to ask you, okay, why are you looking to leave your company right now? And that's a big time for you to, to use that situation and pivot it toward the future. You know, here's what's pushing away from our organization. And it could be something as simple as, hey, you know, I've, I've been here for five years and there's no room for growth because my manager will never leave. And the, the organization is very flat, whatever the case is, but have that ready. But then quickly pivot away to what's pulling you to this company. Right. I saw this company has openings here, here, and here. This aligns with where I see myself in the next five years, and I'm excited to contribute to their growth. Always be thinking of the push and the pull, and don't just be like, well, I hated my last job. One, one thing, too, I, I always tell candidates is make sure after the interview, send a thank you note, um, you know, a short email, a short PDF document, anything that you've got to send to an interviewer and thank them for their time. Also, make sure that you button up your LinkedIn profile. Um, can't tell you how many times people have been disqualified, not only from LinkedIn, but also from like Facebook profiles or, you know, Instagram profiles that are public and suddenly, you know, there's, there's a bad light that's painted on you, even though you did a great interview, it won't matter. Yeah. Great, great tips there. We are starting to get some questions from folks watching at home. Um, Rhonda is asking, how do you handle a huge gap from your last job on a resume? And um, for she's specific here, like three years or more. And it's because of a health issue, which I feel like maybe a lot of people can relate to with what we just went through the past two years. Um, so what was your recommendation for that? I think that we're at a time now where organizations are recognizing that they need to be human. Um, just like Matt said in that piece, right? It's, it's not an iron fist. We're not going to question, you know, all your personal reasons, but have a good enough solid reason to show why you were out of work. Um, and if during that time you can show that you were working on specific skill sets, maybe you were taking online courses, maybe you were, you know, doing things to sharpen up and keep those skills sharp. Um, you want to make sure that you can talk about those things. Um, but there's no shame in, in, you know, trying to get back into the workforce. In fact, that's a lot of the work that we do um, through our agency is making sure that we can help people kind of transition back in. Um, a lot of times, just be honest, be transparent. Most companies will understand. Yeah. 
Um, and I guess I'm, I'll take the question a step further because now I'm picturing like trying to spell that out on a resume. Would you put like, for example, say there's a three year gap, would you like put it on the resume? It, say you were working on something else, like you were going to school or whatever. Would you put that in that three year gap, like on your list of things that you've done? I actually just had a conversation with someone last week about this who left her, her previous employer about a year and a half ago and she focused on pursuing her education, right? She continued education, um, went back to school. And I said, that's something, to be, that's something to be proud of. You should be incredibly proud that you're completing this achievement. And I said, people are gonna see that gap on your resume. They're going to have questions. Let's just get ahead of it. Like, like Juan said, be open and transparent ahead of this. And I asked her, I put it on your resume. Kind of discuss the classes you're taking, discuss what you're doing to continue your education during these this gap period, so to speak. And that way you're addressing those questions ahead of time. You're not having to to risk it, right? Will someone call me or will they not call me? Because I'd rather they see that first and then make the decision than already discount you because of that. Yeah. Um, Karen is commenting from Facebook. Um, and this is this is just some good advice, I feel like, but maybe you want to even elaborate on this. So Karen is saying you should always have a list of questions to ask about the company that you're interviewing with and she also says don't interrupt but i feel like that kind of ties into what we were talking about with like research and maybe just showing interest by having that anything you want to add to that yes Absolutely. we oh, you want to go, go ahead, ahead. Juan. okay <laughs> so we always tell candidates to do homework on three topics one do homework on the company and the organization you're interviewing with do homework on the actual job posting and description that you have so that you know it like the back of your hand and you can tie your examples to what they're looking for. Um, and then three, do homework on yourself and your resume. Um, a lot of people don't take the time to go back through their work history and identify the things that they have done and accomplished. Um, so we want to make sure that people know everything they've done so that in, in a moment of an interview, you can come back and pull out any examples that you have that may show why you're a good fit. Um, can't tell you how many times you know people get out of an interview either through video or driving home and they're like oh man i had the perfect example for you know why i'm a good fit for this company but they think about it afterwards because during an interview you get nervous you get clammy all those things mm -hmm. yeah connor did you have anything you want to add and i would agree karen has a great point um in her comment definitely have questions prepared because if you put that in perspective if you have no questions prepared for someone that's interviewing you that can send the absolute wrong message. You're taking your time to interview and, and they are as well, the hiring manager. And if they ask you, okay, what questions do you have for us? And you say, no, I'm good. I don't think I have any questions. That immediately tells that company and that manager that you're not interested enough to even ask them any questions about the job. Yeah, definitely. Um, it looks like Ashley Schrader from YouTube has um, just kind of elaborated a little bit more. Um, and it sounds like she is pointing out a specific question. Maybe some people might here in an interview asking like tell us a time when you were able to turn a situation around um and that actually just made me think there are probably some questions that people should be prepared to get in an interview and um maybe some of them might be surprises um so what sort of top questions do you think people need to prepare for for an interview I think there are definitely some situational questions that arise. Um, a lot of our clients like to use those questions because they're a good gauge of the person's culture fit and their personality and kind of how they would handle situations, of course. And there's always ways to think about it. There's a couple different methods we use. One of my favorite is called the MSA method. And you know, what did you make? What did you save? What did you achieve? Um, there's also the STAR method. There's different ways to approach these things and different guidelines we can offer candidates, but it's always helpful to before you go into an interview, have these situations in your head. You know, just think of a couple different examples of maybe a time when you had to handle a confrontation, maybe a time when you had to persuade someone to get on your side about something. Just always have those things ready, like Juan said, when you're preparing for interviews, just have those things ready to go through when you need to. Yeah, I feel like some of the questions that I hear nowadays are um, not necessarily like, you know, tell us a great thing about yourself. <laughs> or like it, it's it it is kind of like almost even like how did you turn some problem around or like mm -hmm. how did you take something that was negative and make it positive? So I think that's something that maybe folks should be yeah. thinking about. Yep. Um, Anil is asking, is there something like too much experience in the job market? I feel like I hear that. Like I feel like I'm overqualified for this. I mean, too much experience is that a thing? Yeah. So I actually really like that question, and I think that candidates. Um, kind of reject themselves out of jobs based on not thinking that they're gonna get it even before they apply. Um, and one of the things I tell candidates is don't self-reject. If you think that you're gonna be happy at that organization in that job and the pay is you know, what you're thinking it should be, 
go ahead and apply for it. Um, the biggest thing, again, going back to that original point, make sure that you are tailoring that resume to that um, job that you're applying. So if you're you know, a big leader, but you want to take a step back because maybe you don't want to be in management anymore, make sure that you tailor that resume down so it doesn't show that company that's like, you know, why are you applying for a job that's beneath you? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, Ashley is back with another question, which is a great question because I can't tell you how many stories we've done with people during this pandemic where they said, I've been doing this for so many years and I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> and I want to do something different. And I had this dream to be in this field or whatnot. Ashley wants to know, say, for example, her example here, you've been in customer service, you want to change roles. Maybe you don't have any background in what you want to do. Is there any way to kind of spin that or flip that? So it's not like, I, I don't have background, but here I am. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and changing your career can be very intimidating. It can seem like a scary thing at first. My best advice here is keep an open mind. Um, there is a lot right now. There's a lot in the job market. It's just a matter of keeping an open mind and, and being open to whatever kind of comes your way. I think there are several different avenues you can pursue, whether that's, hey, maybe I have to take a contract role just to get some additional experience in, in a different field, you know, get that on my resume, get that experience. Um, or it's taking a contract to hire role with a great organization here in Charlotte that likes to kind of try that program out to see if this company is the right fit for you and vice versa. Um, a lot of times those organizations will bring somebody on in a role that's contract to hire if they have no experience in a specific field and just kind of try them out and see if they love that company. And then they'll convert that person to a full-time role. Maybe it's the same role or a different role in a different industry. So there's always ways to approach it. Just keep an open mind and, and just don't pigeonhole yourself is my biggest advice. Yep. And, and I would add to that too. Sometimes we talk about maybe it takes one step back to, you know, take a running sprint forward. Um, sometimes you may take a job that maybe is quote unquote by title lower than what you have. But if you want to switch industries, sometimes it takes that for a year, maybe two, and then you're off and running in the direction that you intend to go. Yeah. Yep. All things to consider. You got to weigh it out, you know, maybe the, the bigger picture or the longer run um, mm. for what the move is going to mean to you. Shannon had a similar question, changing industry. So I think we tackled that. Um, one thing that I did want to pick your brain about, is there something, and you both can answer this in turn, but um, is there like a top, like, I don't want to say complaint, but like top feedback that you get from the employer side of like, you know, if this person only did this, or um, I don't know, is, is there like a top correction that you hear from employers for people who apply for their jobs? Um, I think for me, so I've, I've had some feedback um, recently. So number one, if you are showing up to an interview, like we've talked about, make sure that you're presentable. I had feedback, you know, about a candidate being essentially disqualified before they even got the chance to talk about their background. Um, and then I think also um, some other feedback, and it's very specific to industry. Um, if you're an engineer, know engineering. If you're in accounting, make sure that you know Excel and some, you know, SAP, for example. Um, it just really depends on what your specific field is, making sure that you've got the right skill sets um, for those jobs. Okay. Yeah. Honor, anything on your side there? Um, one of the biggest feedback points I receive is culture-based or personality-based. And a lot of this can be pressure going into interviews, right? Like Juan said, a lot of us are inter interview nervous. It's, it's a weird thing for us to be doing is putting ourselves on a show, basically, and displaying for everyone else. And interviews can feel like you're being grilled, like you're being interrogated. Um, a lot of times this is a chance for you to let your personality show, let, let all of this out and really show the interviewers who you are, how your experience relates to the job. Um, so feedback that I've heard sometimes is, you know, this candidate looks great on paper, but in, in reality, their experience didn't really come through in the interview. They weren't able to talk through their experience. They couldn't tell me examples of when they made this happen. Um, and so just don't be afraid to like once I do your, do your research, know yourself, know the company, know the role and have that confidence. The more you practice these things, the more that confidence is going to come out and you'll really put your best before in interviews. Okay, okay. Um, I did wanna, oh, I'm just making sure that we're not missing any comments here. I think we're gonna work on the community side. Okay, um, let's, let's revisit resumes because I know we touched on it a bit. We might have some new people joining us um, who didn't get their questions. And so once again, folks who are just popping on here, um, ask, ask questions of our experts. I mean, they can be resume related. I know that's kind of the headline that we put here on this post, but we've also been talking about interviews. Um, I'm sure anything job related is, is fair game here. Um, yeah. So Ashley commenting again, saying being a college graduate a few years back, looking for something that I don't have a degree in. I mean, I feel like that's, 
that's that's the thing right now. I mean, people are rethinking, they're rethinking life. They're rethinking, you know, how they want to be spending a good portion of their weekday do, doing so. Um, <laughs> Yeah, all I can say is is best of luck to you and in, in whatever you're looking for. And yeah, this is this is the story that we are hearing um, from so many people. But yeah, I wanted to revisit the resume situation. Um, I feel like, at least when I was like first applying to to jobs in in news, there was like you had to have like a cover letter and then your resume. And, and in news, it's like you got to highlight certain things. Um, is it safe to say that, like, depending on different industries, you might be stacking your resume differently and or maybe like education might be at the top for some and maybe for others, education's at the bottom. And like, I guess, how do you kind of uh, explain that to folks who come come to advice about that? So I think with resumes, again, it goes back to tailoring it, right? So if it's a position that is highly skilled that requires a very specific degree, of course, put it at the top of the resume. Um, if it's something where your degree maybe doesn't tie into what it, the job actually entails, but your professional experience does, put that at the top and move your education to the bottom. Um, I think the other thing, too, is, is making sure that um, really the, the main point is skill sets have to show on the resume um, at the end of the day. That's, that's the biggest thing. Got it. Got it. So putting your best stuff up near the top, is it safe to say that? <laughs> Correct. <laughs> okay. And it, um. I'm also going to guess you probably, and I, I know you touched on it, but you want to kind of keep it, you know, as, I don't want to say brief, but <laughs> as concise as possible. You don't have to put everything on there, right? Right. Absolutely not. And especially if you're someone who's been working for quite some time. I mean, I've even talked to candidates who have taken several years experience off their resume and said more experience if, if required to see, like, you can always put that on there and expand later. Um, what I would rather do is keep it short, succinct, you know, get what you need to get on there and then have that conversation down the road if they want, if they want to discuss that. Um, because I know a lot of people are very, very concerned about being disqualified based on years of experience. And so just nip that in the bud. Don't even include it if you're worried about it. Just focus on the relevant experience. Like you said, put the, the best stuff at the top and then yeah. the rest will come. I love the question from Ashley about having a cover letter. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I would say, you know, have a cover letter if it's something that one, if the ATS system that you're applying through asks for a cover letter letter spot, please include one. Um, if you have one, go ahead and attach it to the resume. But the biggest thing here is it doesn't have to be a novel. Um, it, it can be just, you know, three short paragraphs, one, touching on, you know, why you want the job, two, why you're qualified for the job, and then three, why you're excited about the opportunity and what the next steps are. Um, so again, it doesn't have to be a long written, you know, three page thing, just a short, you know, maybe 45, you know, a couple little things there. Um, one thing too, that I would always say too, about the cover letters is people always forget to change the companies that are listed in their cover letter or their resume. Um, it, it's really, really easy when you're applying through Indeed and LinkedIn to just click apply, click apply, click apply, but you forget to change what company you're applying to. <laughs> it makes me do the cringe face. Yeah. I, I can totally get how that would happen. I, I mean, not not in a judging way, just more like, like <laughs> pictured like doing that. Right. Um, okay, so we addressed the cover letter. Are we still doing um, to who it may concern, dear sir slash madam? <laughs> Are we like trying to be like specific, like we know like who we're writing to? <laughs> I think that depends. If you know who you're writing to, definitely address them. Um, I will say. I've seen comments on both sides of the fence. I personally am very anti cover letter. Um, I think, especially in this day and age, I think they are a waste of time. Um, I will say that working with a recruiter is a benefit because we, one of my coworkers says this every day and I think it's funny, but I'm running with it. He says that we are your cover letter as a recruiter. We're representing you. We're letting this client know who you are, what you've done, why you want the job. So you don't have to send that cover letter. It's, it's unnecessary. So I think that's always interesting. Yeah. And that's a good point there. Um, this is kind of a, a different um, tangent here, but Karen is asking again another question. Are new hires having difficulty transitioning to virtual training versus brick and mortar training? I don't know if you have, are you able to provide insight on that? I don't know if that's in your wheelhouse. I think it depends on the person. Um, I know a lot of our clients have had to adjust, right? As of 2020, they had to make everything virtual. Um, a lot of candidates had been onboarded and fully hired remotely, and they had never met their coworkers. As we're transitioning more into back in office and, like Karen said, brick and mortar, people are seeing a little bit of a shift where orientations can be in person. A lot of this is still remote, though. So um, depends on kind of your adaptability and your 
capability with technology and how familiar you are with that and if you're comfortable doing those online programs. But a lot of companies have this set up and they've been doing it for several years and I'd say they're pros by now. So they, they make it really easy to get into that system. Yeah. Earlier, y'all had mentioned um, how you can also assist with, um, you know, like salary negotiation type mm -hmm. stuff. And that just makes me wonder, and I don't know if it's changed at all. I mean, are we, is it okay to talk money in that initial interview? Um, like what are, I, I guess, you know, have the boundaries changed? in the past couple of years <laughs> i think it's important to be prepared if it does come up but don't be the one to bring it up especially in a first interview um it's not appropriate to start asking about money um it kind of shows that you're going in for the wrong reasons um yeah. you know employers want to know that you're there for them and for the actual position not for the dollar signs yeah okay so things have not changed <laughs> i just wanted to make sure because you know we, we are dealing i feel like with an evolving um marketplace if you will where you know people are looking for different things. And in some ways they're putting their foot down more for the things that they want from their employer. Um, Ashley's asking again, a question that I'm sure y'all would love to answer because um, she missed the beginning. Um, Ashley, they work for Talent Bridge. Do you guys want to talk about Talent Bridge and what you do just for the folks who are just hopping on now? Ooh, Connor, would love to. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I see my eyes light up. Um, so Talent Bridge has been in Charlotte since 2002. We essentially are a staffing partner. We connect people with their purpose in life and, and have meaningful conversations in the area. So our job is to act as a partner to folks that are looking for new jobs or folks that are looking to hire talent for their team. And we really are a resource on both sides of the house. Um, so whether you know somebody who wants to make a change in their career, whether you want to make a change yourself, whether you know somebody who maybe needs to add someone to their team in the next couple of weeks, we are here to help you. So we can be a resource for you in all ways through interview preparation, interview debriefs, salary negotiation, resume feedback and tips. We are here as a resource for you. All right. So there you go, Ashley. Now you are in the know. Um, I feel like we're starting to wind down with some of the comments that we're getting. Um, I figured I'll just throw this out there for just like a nice, well-rounded discussion. Um, we talked about a lot about perhaps what employers are looking from, from their applicants. I mean, what are you hearing on the other side? You know, the employers who are like, I'm trying to get someone to come and they're not coming. Like, what are you hearing from the, the candidates who are passing on these companies? So that's a great question. I think one of the biggest things that we see, uh, as candidates really want to feel included and be a part of something that is growing to something bigger. Um, and, and a lot of times employers don't relay that message properly to the candidates, maybe through an interview or mm -hmm. through the whole process. Um, we always, you know, tell clients, be excited about bringing someone on and show them why they want to be there. Um, you know, obviously you can't necessarily hide a bad culture per se, or you can't hide, you know, flaws in the organization, but if there are bad reviews about your organization, talk about them, bring them up, you know, face them head, head first so that that candidate feels like they can trust what you're saying and what the job they're going into is. Anything on your side, Connor? I agree hundred percent. I think that's probably the main focus. And I think as with all things, address it with transparency and, and get it, get, get ahead of that when you can, you know, don't let that come around and nip, you know, bite you in the butt later. Just talk about it right now, nip it in the bud, address those concerns and talk about what you're doing to change that, to change the culture and, and be forward thinking and talk about that progressive nature. Yeah. Um, Matthew, <laughs> Matthew is on here talking about hybrid workspaces. Speaking of things that I guess like, you know, employees nowadays might be looking for something hybrid. Um, are businesses looking at, he's calling it hot desking, um, sharing desks among different people and different shifts. And is that a good middle ground for employers and employees? Is that something you've heard talked about? Personally, I, in my industry, have not seen that come up yet. What I have seen is kind of the shift to a hybrid schedule, whether it's, you know, come into the office three days a week and work from home twice a week. Um, we're seeing a good bit of that now as employers recognize that they have to adjust to keep their talent and retain talent and attract talent in this marketplace where a lot of companies are moving fully remote and they have been for a while. That's a big attractive piece for some candidates. You know, there, there are still some folks that want to work in office five days a week, which is totally fine. But um, I just think that's not the way that things are progressing. And so people have to be competitive to get that, get that talent. Yeah. Um, Ashley wanted to know, um, speaking of talent bridge, do you guys usually work with mostly like remote jobs or hands-on jobs, um, any industry? 
So that's an excellent question. We actually work um, primarily here in the Charlotte market. We have other markets as well. Um, we okay. just opened up a, a Denver office, for example. Um, but we're very much a local recruiting firm. And then we also have a national arm. Um, so it really depends on what you're going after. Um, for us here locally in Charlotte, so Connor and I are on our local recruiting team. Um, we have human resources and recruiting. Um, we have accounting and finance, which is what I support, engineering, construction, mm -hmm. um, professional support services, and IT. Did okay. I miss any, Connor? <laughs> I think I, I think I got them all. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So there you go, Ashley, and um, you're very welcome. And thank you. Thank you for asking so many questions. Great questions that are going to um, give some wonderful insight to folks who are also tuning in. Um, so yeah, I think we are kind of getting to a winding down point. Um, do y'all want to leave us with any parting tips here? Any parting comments? We can go one at a time or however you want to do it. Hmm. I think looking for a new job and changing careers can be very scary. Uh, don't let that intimidate you. I think finding a partner, number one, is going to be helpful, whether it's us as recruiters, another recruiting firm, have someone that you can bounce ideas off of, have a couple. Um, it always helps to have different eyes on things, situations that can give you advice and kind of consult you in different ways. And just be open with people you're talking to. Be transparent. Talk about what you want, what you don't want. Those are equally important factors. And just be open-minded to whatever comes your way. All right. Juan, That's anything? excellent advice from Connor. Um, one thing I will add, you know, a lot of people have misconceptions about staffing firms. Um, you know, particularly with Talonbridge, for example, we don't charge our candidates anything for coming to us. Um, same thing with clients. We, we, of course, have a fee, but it doesn't actually get charged until we find you the right person. And so that's something that's really, really important. Um, don't give yourself, give yourself all the resources that you can, um, especially if there's someone out there that's willing to help and kind of assist you in that career search. Um, apply and have a conversation that it never hurts to talk to people. All right. Ashley is just the question queen. Do you have like a, a link to talent bridge that you can offer to us? Is it like an easy, can we remember it easy? Talentbridge.com. There you go. <laughs> Talentbridge.com. Well, we've got some interest for you. So that is great to hear. Um, I think that's going to do it for us. I'm not seeing um, really any other questions coming in. So Thank you, Juan, and thank you, Connor, from Talent Bridge for joining us for this very robust coming from, okay. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> actually, it's just, <laughs> I like it. Engagement. He's very engaged. Um, thank you all for coming on here and having this robust conversation about resumes and job hunting and all that. And um, thanks to everyone who joined in for the stream. We had some great questions, and I enjoyed it a lot. Did y'all enjoy? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. Fabulous. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm Vanessa Rufus, by the way, with WCNC Charlotte. We are going to sign off the stream for now. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Vanessa. So just to recap, uh, we're going to do a severe weather spotter training course as well as talk about severe weather tonight. Uh, the National Weather Service, Clay, from the GSP office is actually on the stream as well. He's listening in. He's kind of going to be my check person to make sure I cover everything uh, because you're not only helping me, you're going to be helping the National Weather Service. So if you're not familiar with what the National Weather Service does, our local office actually isn't very local. Um, it's down in Greer, South Carolina. Uh, Greer, South Carolina office covers Mecklenburg County, but the Columbia office actually covers uh, Lancaster County, Chesterfield County to the southeast. Our eastern counties are covered by the Raleigh office, and a couple of my counties that are up in the mountains are actually covered by Blacksburg. So we have four separate offices, and not one of them is actually located in the TV market that I'm in right here in Charlotte. So it makes it kind of, a, I would say, difficult, but it makes it interesting because we have to communicate with a lot of offices outside the area, but they monitor a lot of, of what we do here in Charlotte. Um, and just to show you, if, if you're looking at the graphics across the, the country, these weather service offices are the ones that are primarily going to be issuing your warning. So the warnings, I know a lot of folks think I'm responsible for that. <laughs> I can't take that responsibility. That would be, a, you know, I, would I wouldn't take the blame or the, or the praise for that. But it actually comes from the National Weather Service. And the reason that is important, it's a government agency. They're the ones that are able to trigger all the EAS, the alerts, sirens, anything like that. So when your phone goes off, those wireless emergency alerts, it's because they issued it and it was able to go out. And just to kind of recap, that's the, uh, the coverage area for the Greenville-Spartanburg area. 
here's a look at our TV market. So if you're not familiar with the TV business, the Charlotte TV market covers 22 counties. So if you've ever wondered or yelled at me for breaking into programming, um, it's because one of these counties had a tornado warning. And it's kind of our responsibility to cover these counties. And we'll get yelled at a lot because we're covering a county that might be an hour and a half, two hour drive away. And a lot of folks will say, Brad, why are you cutting in? Nothing's happening in Charlotte. Well, I'm the TV station for Statesville, for Boone, for Hickory, for Rockingham, for Rock Hill, for all those cities. They rely on us for severe weather information. So as much as people in Charlotte might be upset I'm cutting in, they're glad. And vice versa, think about it. There's a tornado warning in, in Charlotte. They're probably wondering, why are you breaking into my program? Because nothing's happening here. But this is broken up between the four forecast offices. You can see I kind of color-coded them there. I'll zoom in. And the biggest problem here, and I know Clay is listening, he, he can probably relate to this, is that little panhandle of Lancaster County, which shoots up 521. Believe it or not, we've had warnings for... York County, no warning for Lancaster County, and then a warning for Union County, because those are actually two separate offices responsible. So they're working hard to coordinate these warnings. But a lot of times, if you watch my coverage, you might hear me say, just treat this like a warning. That's why I say that, because a lot of times, um, it, it, obviously, tornadoes don't stop at the county line. <laughs> they, they'll, they'll go wherever they want. Um, some of the tools we use for severe weather um, believe it or not, I think people are always uh, mystified by this. We still launch weather balloons twice a day, and they're not all from China. They're actually here, <laughs> okay? Um, we actually launch two times a day. The closest sounding location is in Greensboro, and the next closest is, in, is down in Atlanta. So what these weather balloons do is twice a day, we call it 0Z and 12Z. If you're familiar with Zulu time or uh, UTC time, that's in the morning and in the evening. For us, Eastern time right now. That's a, approximately a 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., okay? And so on this balloon is a little package. It's like a weather station and a shoebox. It's called a radio sign. It measures the air temperature, dew point, pressure, and wind speed and direction from the ground up until that balloon pops. And as we got, as we got to see with the Chinese spy balloon, these balloons go up to the stratosphere. Uh, they will make it all the way up to 90, maybe 100,000 feet before they uh, pop. They're made of latex, so what happens is um, as you go up, the pressure decreases, right? So the balloon will get bigger and bigger and bigger until it explodes. It also gets a little flatter as it gets bigger, which makes it look like what? A UFO. Um, so over time, <laughs> these things get higher up there. Um, eventually, they'll explode. And they can be in the air for like two, two and a half, three hours. And they'll get carried a long way in the jet stream. Sometimes uh, they'll end up out in the Atlantic from here um, and go even farther. What's interesting is the radio song, which is the instrument pack, actually has a self-addressed stamped um, postage on the outside of it. And if you find one of these, because it eventually will fall back to earth with a parachute, uh, you throw it in a mailbox, it gets mailed back to the National Weather Service, and they recycle it. Um, it actually says it's not a bomb on it as well, because a lot of people see this, and they, <laughs> they see government writing, and they think it's something uh, you know bad. But I, I can't remember. Clay could probably tell me. I wish he could, he could hear me. Yeah, like how many do you, did they get returned? He might know. I think it's like maybe 25 or 30 percent. I have to turn my audio up. Whoa. I'm going to move this a little farther away. I'm going to move this a little farther away. There we go. All right, Clay, I don't know if you can hear me, but. How many of the radio songs do you guys get returned? Do you know offhand the weather service? Yeah, so actually it's a really no, low number. Um, we were under the impression it was kind of like 10% really get returned. Um, we were under the impression it was kind of like 10% um, we were under the impression it was So it's about, he says it's about 10%, so it's even lower than I thought. And my guess would be that because a lot of them end up in areas where there's nobody to find them. Because um, you think about it, especially in North Carolina, they're probably ending out over the Atlantic. So those are really important. Obviously, you know about Doppler radar. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Satellite data has become really, really important. Our satellite data has become, to me, that's one of the biggest advancements in my 25 years of doing that, is that um, satellite data now can come in at 30 seconds to one-minute intervals. So sometimes the satellite data comes in more frequently than the radar data because the satellite, the geostationary satellite, 
continuously anchored over the US, it can take a picture every 30 seconds to a minute in its high res capability. And the resolution is now down to tens of meters. So you can see a cumulus cloud, a thunderstorm developing on a satellite image before the rain actually shows up on the radar. Pretty impressive. Um, this morning, how many of you guys saw the Starship blow up down in Texas? <laughs> okay, SpaceX launched the Starship this morning and tested it. It blew up. First thing I did, I went to the GOES satellite data, and sure enough, I could see the plume, and I could see the explosion on the satellite data. That's how good the satellite did. In fact, the satellite data thought it was a lightning strike because it, the, the flash to the satellite looks like a, a, a flash of lightning. So it shows up. We sometimes see meteors that way as well. Um, we use a lot of, of weather models. Um, you know, weather models, I think everyone's heard of weather models and people are like, what is a weather model? Um, it's basically a giant math problem. <laughs> it's, a, it's a numerical model. These are simulations of the atmosphere into the future. They're not forecasts. Uh, I think that's the biggest misnomer. Um, I think if you think it's a forecast, it's not. It's a tool. We call them guidance for a reason. They help us build a forecast. To me, it's like going to Lowe's or Home Depot. Just because you have a bunch of tools doesn't mean you can build a house. Okay, you still got to put the thing together. There's lumber, there's nails, there's stuff. That's the stuff we use to put the forecast together. So these are tools. They don't, you just don't go there and pick out a house at Lowe's. You got to put the thing together. Um, and so that's what we do. Um, one of the great things about the weather service is, and you may have heard me refer to this on air as we're doing storm coverage, is we're in constant communication with emergency managers, the National Weather Service, even other meteorologists in the Charlotte TV market. We have a private chat. And we're chatting with them all the time. And we're sharing information about where storms are, where they could be going, if there's going to be a warning. If not, like, hey, I'll, I'll tell Clay and the guys down at GSP and Trish, I'm like, hey, I see this storm on radar. It looks like it's rotating. Are you guys thinking about warning on it? And we'll have that kind of communication a lot through them. Doppler radar. Um, everybody's got Doppler radar on their phone. It looks cool. Not everybody knows how it works. Um, I love Doppler radar. But I think the biggest thing that uh, people misunderstand about it is it's got huge drawbacks. Doppler radar is essentially a tool like a cell phone tower. They are sporadically placed around the country. They don't have uniform coverage. So just like a cell phone tower, if you're not really close to it, your signal isn't really good, the farther you get away from the radar, the worse the data is. And that's why spotters become really important. So one of the things about Doppler radar is it shoots a pencil, pencil uh, width beam of energy out, and it goes out in a straight line from the radar. But obviously the Earth is a, is a is not flat. It's breaking news in case you guys thought it was. Um, it is it is a sphere. So because it's a sphere, the beam starts going higher and higher in the sky because it goes out in a straight line. The Earth actually curves away from it. So by the time the radar beam from Greer hits up here depending on what part of town you are, it could be between five and 10,000 feet above our head, okay? That's great, that's way up there. I guess where all the severe weather happens down here near the ground. So like things like tornadoes, downbursts, even hail size, you need to see closer to the ground. So spotters become really, really important. And that's why I really rely on spotters because I can see the rotation at 10,000 feet, but I don't know if that's creating a tornado down at the surface. So somebody reporting or send me a picture um, or sending me video is really, really valuable, especially if you know what you're looking at. The thing about Doppler radar that makes it so cool to me is it doesn't just tell us where things are, it tells us which direction they're going. So the Doppler effect is what Doppler radar uses. And you probably are familiar with the Doppler effect and you don't even know it. If you've been at a train crossing or you've been at a light and a, a fire truck comes by, the frequency of the sound coming towards you is different as it goes away. So imagine being at the train tracks and the train is coming in, it goes, it makes that change in sound and frequency. Well, we use that in the Doppler radar. When raindrops or targets are coming towards the radar, they have a different a frequency than they go away. So not only can we tell where raindrops are on the map, we can tell if it's coming towards or away from the radar. And why is that important? Well, if uh, raindrops going towards the radar and away are really close together, guess what's happening in between? You have rotation, you have things moving. So it's really important to know where that stuff is. Now, the Doppler radar doesn't just scan at one level. It goes through what's called a volume scan. It rotates around, tilts up, rotates around again, tilts up, rotates around. 
and it can do several slices of the atmosphere. And if you put them all together, you can get a 3D image of what a storm looks like. And if you're watching on the stream, you can see this is a, a, a 3D image of the velocity data of the Pilger tornadoes in Nebraska just like six years ago. Two tornadoes next to each other. And that's what it looks like. We can see things like hail cores. Um, it's pretty cool. Having chased storms, looking at these 3D images, kind of what the structure of a storm looks like. So here's a look at what the radar sees. Um, you can see the radar scans different levels, as I mentioned, but below, it doesn't really see really well, and that's where the spotter becomes really important. So what we're looking for, what we want people to give us information, is what, what is happening at the cloud base and below. This is a really, really important part. Uh, the farther away you get from the radar, we get even less classification. So um, in Charlotte, it's really helpful to have spotters, but I'll tell you what, spotters up in Statesville, Salisbury area is even more important because the radar beam there can be 12, 13,000 feet above the ground. So the spotters actually have a program called Skywarn. They're the ones that help, you know, kind of give ground truth to what's happening. Um, and in some cases actually can lead to warnings being issued. If we know there are trained spotters in the area and they spot a wall cloud or a possible tornado, if we know these are trained spotters, the National Weather Service will issue a warning. They will count that as like an observed tornado. So that's how vital it is. We know it's a trained professional, basically not professional, I get paid, unfortunately, <laughs> but you're trained amateurs, I guess, in this case, that would help issue a warning. A lot of trained spotters also include first responders. So think of most law enforcement, firefighters, medics, they're all trained on this as well. They would count those as the sky warning beams as well. So what is a severe thunderstorm warning? Okay. So severe thunderstorm warning. What, what was one you get issued for? Well, believe it or not, it's not because of dark clouds and loud thunder and lightning. <laughs> a lot of times I think we think it's because a storm has a ton of lightning and it's really loud or scary looking. It's severe. Sometimes I think it's, it, it's a bad storm, but what makes it severe is actually specific criteria. 58 mile per hour winds or higher. Okay. Um, that's usually the threshold to break a branch or cause damage. Um, one inch diameter hail. One inch diameter is the, the hail that's just below golf ball size, very close to that. That's the kind that will cause damage to your roof and your car, even if you can't see it. If you ever get golf ball size hail at your house, get your roof checked out. It's because you may not notice damage, but the next time you rain, it rains, we'll, we'll find out pretty quickly. And then obviously tornadoes. But there's other hazards like lightning and flooding. Flooding does have a warning system, obviously, and flash flood warnings. But lightning, as dangerous as lightning is, there's no criteria for a warning for amount, the amount of lightning. I wish there was, but there really isn't. So... You know, one storm that has more lightning than the other is definitely, I think, in my opinion, a more violent storm because that, that means a lot of updraft is going on. We've got a lot of things going on, but there's no criteria for lightning that would trigger a warning, even though we want you to take all lightning very seriously. So the risk levels, you probably have seen these in other locations. Um, the Storm Prediction Center puts these out way ahead of time. We call these severe weather outlooks. They go from one to five. I'll be honest with you, and I know Clay's listening, so he might not know what the hell we know the public doesn't really understand this very well. <laughs> um, we have colors and names that people don't associate with bad weather. Things like marginal, slight, enhanced, moderate. People don't always relate to bad weather. So what we have done, and this is what we do as broadcasters and, and to help communicate it better, is we've kind of grouped them into more simplistic terms and more simplistic colors. We use low, medium, high, and Pretty straightforward. It's yellow, orange, red, and then kind of a, a, a pink color. Um, and that's kind of the thresholds we use. And again, this is just a heads up. Think of a, a, a severe weather outlook as a heads up, days and days ahead of time. So oftentimes you'll see me use this graphic on air, the five day severe weather outlook. I'll say maybe Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday on there. You know, we'll say one of those days there's a potential, a low, medium, or high risk weather. This is kind of the beginning, like, hey, heads up, this is not going to be a normal day. There's not just going to be regular thunderstorms. And this is what it looks like. If you go to the storm prediction site, the center site, they actually go out to eight days. 
So believe it or not, we get eight days into the future, we kind of have a general idea where there could be severe weather. And the way this works, think of it as a forecast funnel. Eight days out, the area is really broad. We think somewhere in the Carolinas there's going to be severe weather. Three to four days out, we might narrow it down to the western Carolinas. And then the day of, there might be a watch issued for just some of the counties in there. And then if there's a warning, it's down to the county level. So it, it, it starts broad in the time scale and a geographic standpoint and gets closer and closer to you know a, a, a town or a home. Um, but the thing to remember too is you can get severe weather in any risk level. Some of the worst tornado days here have been in what is considered low to medium risk days. Um, it's you know we'd love to say every high risk day produces a ton of severe weather, but some of the low end days produce it as well. That's why any risk level you got to take it seriously. Watch first warning. How many people know what a watch and a warning are? All right, most of you do, but this is still the most confusing thing. <laughs> that we talk about. I have people I work with that get it confused, you know, and, and sometimes you'll see, I'll see a horrible headline or we'll put a super up and it'll say, tornado warning from 1 to 5 p.m. And I'm like, what? How is there a four-hour tornado warning? It was meant to be a tornado watch. Okay, a watch is up for hours. It's, it's the ingredients are there. The warning is a more immediate, like in the next 20 to 30 minutes. So I, um, you know, I can't, I let me go forward here. Oh, I left that. So you might have seen my cupcake analogy, right? So I like <laughs> I like to use the cupcake analogy. The watch is like having all the ingredients for the cupcakes on the counter. The warning is the cupcakes made. Okay. So when a watch is issued, that means the ingredients for that thing is on the table. Once we get a warning, that means it's put together. So a flood watch means conditions are favorable for flooding. Tornado watch means conditions are favorable for tornadoes. A winter storm watch means conditions are favorable for winter weather. Once the warning is issued, that means, guess what? They, the ingredients came together, it got baked, and it's sitting on the table. It's there. So the warning is the more immediate threat. There are several types of warnings now. We have base warnings, considerable warnings, and destructive warnings. So severe thunderstorms even have different criteria. Um, and the considerable means 70 mile per hour winds are higher. So this means it's not just a regular severe thunderstorm, this is going to be pretty severe. And if we get a destructive tag on there, which is 80 mile per hour winds or a baseball size hail, this will actually set your phone off. You'll get one of those wireless emergency alerts. And if you're not familiar with these wireless emergency alerts, it's not an app on your phone. It's built into your phone and it comes from the cell phone carrier. It's like the EAS on our, on our TV station. It comes across whether you want it or not. Now you can turn them on and off in the operating system, iOS and in Android. I would recommend not doing that um, because these are, these are the most severe of severe. We don't push these out for regular severe thunderstorm warnings, even considerable. They have to be destructive. They have to be flash flood warnings or a tornado warning. And the way they work, um, I wish they were totally GPS based. They're really not. They're based on the cell phone tower you're hitting. So I see two cell phone towers over here. Imagine, you know, we're pretty close, but imagine that cell phone tower is in a tornado warning but for some reason over here at lower left, we weren't, we would get the tornado warning because the cell phone tower we're hitting is inside the tornado. So it's based off the cell phone tower that your phone is receiving from. So there tends to be a little bit of overwarning, but not as much as there would be if we just issued the whole county. Um, these, this is a really loud alert, and I'm not gonna mimic on here because we can't, but we've had them go off in vacation before while we've been on TV and it is super loud. Um, there's also amber alerts on there as well, um, and those will go off quite a bit. Um, Got to be careful of those because those are issued on the statewide level. And I'll be honest with you, I'm I, I want to find every kid, but sometimes you get an amber alert for somewhere that's not anywhere near you. And for a lot of reasons, that's how people end up turning all their alerts off because the amber alerts set them off all the time. And so you can distinguish. You can turn just amber alerts off and leave the weather alerts on. So there is the option, at least in iOS, I know. I'm not sure about Android. I haven't looked. I don't know, James, you know. Do you have option in Android, too? I know in iOS you do. So that being said, I think everybody should have three ways to get warnings, okay? Um, severe weather warnings should have, you should have three sources. Wireless emergency alerts built into your phone. Weather apps like ours, WCNC, but there are a bevy of other apps that will warn you. 
um, watching TV or monitoring TV or live streaming. I'll be honest with you, and James can attest to this because he's my streaming guy. We get more people that watch the stream. <laughs> and the, re the reason is, is we can send a notification to your phone and you're more likely to click that link and watch the live stream immediately and not go over to the TV nearby. Um, social media is great. As we know, Twitter is kind of getting wonky now for warnings. Um, there's limits on the API now, so I would not rely on Twitter as much as I would in the past, but it is a source. You can turn notifications on for certain warnings. Um, same thing with Facebook, um, Instagram. There's some other sources that aren't bad. Um, social media tends to be better for the heads up days ahead of time than the actual warning. Um, other things, NOAA weather radio. Does anyone here have a NOAA weather radio? Yeah. NOAA weather radios are great. Um, they're kind of, the phone's kind of making them obsolete, but they are great for especially areas where you don't have cell phone coverage because you can usually get radio coverage. Um, the other thing, this is surprising, we find in research, People calling, texting, family and friends actually work. And believe it or not, they're more likely to believe their family and friends tell them there's a tornado warning than me. Um, that's just human nature. And so I will say this on the air all the time. You guys, I know you watch a lot of your avid um, viewers of mine. Um, you may have friends, family, colleagues that don't watch me. But if I can warn you and then you can warn them, then the process is working. So if you know, like, hey, my buddy lives in Gastonia or Somebody I go to church with lives in Statesville, and there's a tornado warning. I can easily pick up my phone and text them or call them and say, hey, do you know there's a tornado warning right now for your for where you are? They may not, and it might be your text or call that actually gives them a heads up. So don't ever hesitate to do that. That is a valuable tool. What you do is amplify our message. It goes out to a few people. You tell your friends. They tell their friends, and it becomes – it just spreads the message much more. So here's, I heard, this is the graphic I was looking for earlier. This is my cupcake watch and cupcake warning. I'll leave that up for a second because <laughs> I made this like seven years ago just on a whim. I think I was running and I thought of this. And um, I had so many emergency managers reach out to me and say, hey, can we use your graphic? I'm like, sure, whatever makes people understand. And so many people saw it and got it right away. So if this helps at all, um, the watch and warning thing is really, really is difficult. So tornadoes. Um, we're in that season right now. Tornado average by month for the U.S. April, May, and June are the three biggest months. May is by far the biggest. Let's talk about North Carolina. The average tornado by month, March, April, May, and then September. Does anyone know why September would be a big month for the Carolinas? Exactly. Landfalling, tropical storms, and hurricanes. So we have a secondary season in the fall. And we also get pretty strong cold front that coming. But for us, we're kind of in the heart of tornado time, April and May. The biggest tornado outbreaks I've seen here have been in April, May, and then October, September. Hurricane Fred, Francis, some of these landfalling hurricanes that come up from the Florida Panhandle tend to be big tornado producers for us. But we do get tornadoes here. How many have ever how many people ever told you that we don't get tornadoes? I don't know. Is it like a real estate agent thing that like you get to sell house or I mean, because I, I newcomers all the time will say, oh, I heard we didn't get tornadoes here. And I'm like, who told you that? Um, and just to show you, and, and it, it's not that I try to scare people. I'm like, they think somehow that they don't happen here. They do happen quite a bit. Um, so you may have heard recently, you know, where is Tornado Alley? You know, Tornado Alley, is it in the middle of the country or the southeast? Well, Tornado Alley, there's really not one. There's lots of and if anything, the tornado pattern is shifting east of the time. And unfortunately, it's shifting in our direction. So I wanted to show North Carolina tornadoes. I, I love this website. If you're really into tornadoes, if you're really geeked out like me, this tornado archive site is amazing. It shows every tornado that they can document since 1680. And you're like, how do they know tornadoes from 1680? They went back and they looked at like stories, writings, newspaper articles of people talking about twisters or cyclones, and they try to document tornadoes that occurred in the past, and then all the ones that have been documented documented by the Weather Service. But look at North Carolina and South Carolina. We have a ton of tornadoes, and I want to zoom in on Mecklenburg County. I'm going to leave this graphic up because it'll take a second to load on your phones, but look at all of those tornadoes in the Met. Did you guys know there was an EF4 that went through Western Union County in the early 90s? I looked at that tornado track quite a bit. 
back in the early 90s, Western Union County was just one. If that same tornado occurred today, it would be taking out quarter and a half million dollar homes, shopping centers, and several schools. Our area is growing rapidly. The tornadoes that occurred in the past, which we have documentation of, if they occur today, there's millions and millions of dollars of property and now people living in areas where there would be nothing 20, 30 years ago. So as our urban sprawl continues to move out, we become bigger targets for these tornadoes. It's not that tornadoes don't hit cities. You hear that quite a bit from people. Um, it's just that cities are small points on a map. They're hard to hit. But as they get bigger, they become easier. So we actually, there's a tornado that went not too far from here back in, it was the early 2000s. Actually came through the airport, hit Johnson C. Smith, and then went into Dilworth and um, just north of here in South Bend. So there's, the, the reason I say this is there's a history of tornadoes occurring here. It's just sometimes you go through lulls in the activity and people don't remember them and they think they don't happen anymore. So severe thunderstorms, let's talk a little bit about them. How do they, how do they form? The biggest thing you think about severe weather, we need lift and you need instability or thunderstorm fuel. Thunderstorm fuel is just warm, moist air near the surface. The lift is a cold front, low pressure, heating of the day, something like that, that lifts the storm. There's thunderstorm stages. Um, well, hopefully we get this to work. But if you can see this image on your phone, this is a really important image. I think the one thing I could tell people about thunderstorms is they're not static things. Like a lot of times in the summer, I'll get countless messages about why do storms always go around my house? I get this all the time. And everyone thinks that they live in a bubble, like the storms never go. And the thing is, I would say maybe that's true, but I get that same question from literally every single location in our area. So it's got a storm somewhere. But the reason I, I often say that when a storm is mature, when it's going crazy, that's in its mature stage. So when you hear or see a storm in the distance and think, oh, it's coming this way, guess what? It's already falling apart before it's moving in direction. So storms have to be at their mature, mature stage over your house. They're either growing, they're mature, or they're weakening. They're not, they're not static. So what happens over time is people will hear, especially in the summer, or see the lightning off in the distance, or they'll pull out their phone and see it on the, on the radar, and then it'll never come to their house, and I think it missed them. But the problem was when they were looking at it, it was in the mature stage. And when it was coming, it, it dissipated. What's more likely is that storm will collapse, push out out, and a new storm will pop up over and over. This is a cool little graphic I'll play about how these thunderstorms work. So oftentimes in the summer in particular, we'll wake up, it'll be a day like this. It'll be beautifully sunny in the morning, and people will wonder, why is there a chance for severe weather? Because above our heads, we've got wind shear, we've got warm, humid air. We just haven't lifted the air to get up there yet. So what happens in the heating of the day, about three, four, five o'clock in the afternoon, those storms start to bubble up and we start tapping into those streams above our head. Certain types of storms, uh, we can even really see that. There's something there at least. There's a couple different types of storms. We have single cell and multi-cell storms. A lot of times around here, we get what's called multi-cell. We get a bunch of little storms that all kind of form together. Single cells are pretty, you know, pretty, you know, pretty straightforward a single storm. But one of the biggest things we see around here from damage isn't really from tornadoes, it's from downbursts. So downbursts happen quite a bit. Downbursts in the summertime in particular, we lift that warm, humid air up to a part of the atmosphere where the temperature could be 30, 40 below zero. That air gets cold and it becomes dense. And so it wants to come crashing back to the ground. And so what happens is it comes down at a wind speed of 70, 80, 100 miles an hour, hits the ground and spreads out in all directions. These downbursts or wet microbursts cause 90% of our wind damage. So every time I, I see damage and people say, it's a tornado, it's a tornado, nine times out of 10, it's not. It's straight line wind damage. And the thing to remember, straight line wind damage, we have a saying, wind is wind. Wind is gonna break things. It doesn't matter if it's rotating or straight, <laughs> okay? If your house, your structure, this tree, can only withstand a 70 mile an hour wind. It doesn't care if it's a rotating wind or a straight line. It just cares it's 70 miles an hour. And trust me, airline pilots don't care either. <laughs> uh, these downbursts, before the advent of Doppler radar, believe it or not, planes used to 
crash all the time trying to land in thunderstorms because the thunderstorm would push the plane down into the ground as it was trying to land or take off. And so if you ever wonder why there's so many delays in the summer because of thunderstorms, it's probably the worst time to travel because what happens is when these storms are anywhere near the airport, they're not a plane taking off and landing. And the other thing is when there's thunderstorms near the airport, if there's lightning, think about all the ground crews. Are you going to be out filling a plane up with fuel when there's thunder and lightning on the tarmac? <laughs> Probably not. So what do they got to do? All the baggage carriers and the fuelers, they all have to seek shelter until the lightning stops. So that will also shut the airport. So if you ever get frustrated with thunderstorms in the summer and travel, it's because we kind of learned our lesson in the past. They do not master thunderstorms. So downburst, I think there's this video works. I'll play it. You'll probably hear some audio on your end. There's a cool animation I'm going to play here of a downburst. Um, it shows a thunderstorm development. And from a spotter standpoint, downbursts are really cool because when they come down to the ground, you can actually see them hit the ground and you'll see things curl up on either end. It looks like a bell. And when you see that curling, you know the wind is actually pulling out. So there's a picture up there, but on your phone you'll see it as well, of, of that downburst happening. It looks like a waterfall. The rain just crashes to the ground and causes the wind to push out in all directions. We, we kind of like jokingly call these flats because on the radar, it looks like someone just took a bunch of wind and threw it straight down on the flat. It's just flat and it goes all over. And the direction on there is a great picture right here, this, this animation here. It actually just looks like air is crashing to the ground. And you'll see these little curly cues on the end. It's a really good example of, of a downburst. The other type of storms we get here quite a bit, uh, quite a bit are squall lines. This is what we like to call the straight line storms. It looks like a long line of storms. This is more typical of what people see on the radar and they go, uh oh, something's coming. <laughs> because this is the kind of thing that'll go on for, for a long time. You'll see these over in Tennessee or come out of the mountains. And you'll you can track these hours into the future. Um, these are basically clusters of storms that form on cold fronts or outflows, and they will go they go for hours, but they produce a lot of strong wind. Um, the squall line structure is basically, there's still that mature stage going on. What's happening when storms are maintaining themselves, new storms are forming on the front as the old ones die in the back. They're going through a cycle where new storms are continually building and old ones are dying out. Storm motion kind of looks like that. You've got a, a nice little flow. The other type of squall line, which you've probably heard, is called a derecho. Um, the derecho is a long-lived wind event. Uh, we've seen some of these in the Carolinas. There's been many more in the Midwest. They're very common in the summer season, um, and they kind of ride around those big ridges of heat and high pressure in the summer. Uh, a derecho, by definition, means it has a large area of wind damage of 58 mile per hour winds or higher over a 250 mile long path. So these things, when I lived in the Midwest, you would see these come through the Great Lakes, and um, they would just knock down huge swaths. The big one in Iowa, I think it was now three years ago, um, was basically the equivalent of the inland hurricane. It produced 140, 150 mile an hour winds all through Iowa and caused all kinds of damage. These can happen in the middle of the night too, which makes them kind of scary because they just go forever. And the probably most famous type of thunderstorm, which is the one that gets all the publicity and gets all the glamour, is the supercell. The supercell is the storm that produces tornado. This is your classic hook echo and the cells we see most often in the plains. We do see them here in the Carolinas, um, but they look a little different. They're not always classic. They are individual storms all by themselves. And what makes them supercells is they have rotating updraft. The rota rotating updraft is what makes them dangerous. Uh, the structure of a supercell is, to me, it's actually a really beautiful structure. Uh, and when if you ever get a chance to go storm chasing, just seeing one of these out in the plains is pretty spectacular because you can see everything in this graphic, I've seen it in real life. It's like something out of a textbook. And when you see it in the sky, it all makes sense because you can see the updraft, the downdraft, the mesocyclone, which is the rotating updraft. You can see the leading edge. Um, sometimes you'll see the wall cloud and the tornado coming out of the back. But the structure is really, really easy to see. Um, see if we can get this to work. So if you're on the phone, this is an amazing animation I pulled up. And I'm going to let it play out here. It'll play. There it goes. 
So this is a, a simulation of an EF5 tornado um, forming as a computer animation of real data. And it's probably not going to play now. <laughs> So this really shows kind of the formation of a supercell and it's been ensuing tornado. Um, supercells can be the size of the whole county. So imagine a storm that's the size of, of all Mecklenburg County. Um, the supercells updraft can not only drive wind into the high atmosphere, sometimes into the stratosphere. We'll get what's called stratospheric intrusion with the updraft. And that can actually bring down really strong winds to the surface. So think about that's that's sometimes 80, 90,000 feet of sky. Um, and then the mesocyclone will produce the tornado. The tornado is really tiny in comparison to this big storm. The tornado is only maybe a half a football field wide, and the storm is taking up the whole county. Um, so you can see on, on the graphic, it's pretty impressive to see that, that little tornado kind of forming underneath the mesocyclone. Now, the way tornadoes really get their power is they take broad circulations and they shrink them. That vorticity shrinking drives the speed of the tornado. So if you've ever, anyone ever played tetherball? Okay. The other cool thing about, oh yeah, you played tetherball. What happens when the, when the rope gets really short on the pole? It goes faster, doesn't it? Right? Okay. This happens in mother nature as well. If you take a broad circulation and start shrinking it down, it spins faster and faster. This is how figure skaters do those incredible spins. You might see them. They'll start their spin and they'll pull their arms in and they'll get really narrow and it'll make them spin faster and faster. This is the convert, the conservation of uh, angular momentum it causes things to spin faster. So in Mother Nature, the whole thunderstorm is rotating, and if it shrinks that rotation down to the size of the tornado, it spins at 100 to 150 miles per hour. So that kind of rotation can be pretty, you know, pretty intense. And that's when you see these violent tornadoes. Types of supercells, low precipitation supercells. We don't get many of those here in the Carolinas, just because it's so humid. These happen in the high plains, like think of eastern Colorado. New Mexico, Wyoming. Um, these are beautiful storms to photograph because there's no, there's not much rain. There's just this beautiful structure. The tornado might be all by itself, and there not might not be any rain. Sometimes I've just seen hail and a tornado and no rain because the air is so dry. We typically get what's called high precipitation supercells. Those are pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> I think if you've ever driven in a summer thunderstorm, everything feels like a high precipitation supercell because. Um, these are the types that have that tremendous rainfall rate, and usually the tornadoes are wrapped in rain. You can't see a thing, um, and that's why tornadoes here, I mean, I love to chase tornadoes, but here in the Carolinas, they're impossible to see because, first of all, there's trees and hills, and then they're all rain-wrapped. So sometimes it looks like, oh, it looks like a dark cloud, and all of a sudden you realize it's a tornado by the time it's over. So chasing here is really hard. It's, these are very common. Classic supercells, we do get these here in the Carolinas, but sometimes we get supercells embedded in squall lines. This is way more frequent. There will be a squall line, and within the squall line will be an embedded supercell. This can make for some really tough forecasts because you might have a big severe thunderstorm warning, and then inside you might have a tornado warning because uh, we're starting to see these individual rotations. Sometimes on the leading edge of these squall lines, we'll actually have a couplet or a tornado. So just because it's a squall line doesn't mean we couldn't see rotation within it. And it does happen quite a bit. I've seen these quite a bit here in the Carolinas, mini low top supercells. These are small little storms that don't look like they're doing anything and they'll produce tornadoes. This happens a lot this time of year in the spring and in the fall. We'll get these mini, mini little supercells. So here's a graphic that kind of shows all of these different types of supercells. Um, I wish it was straightforward. We could just tell you, here's one type of storm. Now, these are all the kinds that we get. And all of them, you really don't know if they're a supercell unless you look at the radar data and the velocity data together, and you can see that's rotating. What makes it a supercell is a rotating of that. And you can't really tell that without looking at radar. Here's some actual pictures of supercells from some chasers, and then the tornadoes they produce. So they're they are pretty amazing. If you've ever seen like the mothership kind of view, this looks like a giant spacecraft landing. That's usually a supercell thunderstorm. And it's got that, that, that mothership is actually the mesocyclone. That's the rotating updraft. There actually will be striations in it sometimes. 
here's a little diagram kind of shows what it looks like. The other thing about these supercells is they have this phenomenon on the back side called the RFD or the rear flank downdraft. When you take all that warm, humid air and push it up to the top of the storm, it's got to come back down. And sometimes it comes out of the back because it has a very strong downburst called the rear flank downdraft or RFD. And that can cause more damage than the tornado later on. Too. So a wall cloud, these are things I would want you guys to spot if you ever see one of these. What's a wall cloud? Well, a wall cloud is kind of a lowering underneath that rotating updraft. Um, sometimes wall clouds are tough to see. Um, you can't really tell if it's just a low hanging cloud, but usually it's because it's persistent that you know it's a wall cloud. It's not transient, which means it's not there for a while and goes away. It's there. And it kind of, it's the only thing. The base of the cloud is flat, except for this little thing hanging down. Wall clouds are important because that's the precursor to a tornado. So when we see, or I get a report of a wall cloud, I'm going to be hyper-focused on that storm immediately. So a funnel cloud. Um, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, a funnel cloud is obviously, it's a rotating column of air, but it's not in contact with the storm. Um, I think when you see Funnel clouds, it's not necessarily a tornado yet, but it could be. It could be reached, it could be touching the ground eventually. But if it's not, it's a funnel cloud. And the only way you know it's not touching the ground, you've got to see all the way to the, the ground. So the other problem around spotting here, I might see a funnel cloud and uh, trees are blocking my view of the ground. I have no idea if it's touching the ground. So if you were to report that, say, be honest, say, hey, I see a funnel cloud, but I can't tell if it's touching the ground. This Tornado, pretty self-explanatory. It's got to be in contact with the ground. It's redundant to say a tornado is on the ground <laughs> because but that's the definition of tornado. <laughs> it's on the ground. Um, there's, if, there, if it's not on the ground, then it's a funnel cloud. So they're two different things. Sometimes tornadoes, though, don't look like they're on the ground, except that you look down at the surface and you see debris swirling around. One of the first tornadoes I ever saw was in Ohio, and we didn't even know it was a tornado at first. We saw the wall cloud. I saw it was in one of those mini supercells coming at us. The base of the wall cloud was rotating. We're like, oh, this thing's going to produce a tornado. And it was coming right at us. We were idiots. We are in the wrong spot. But it was coming at us because we're thinking, oh, this thing might produce a tornado. But it was in the spring, so we had a freshly plowed soybean field. It was just dirt. But when it moved over this field, all of a sudden, there was a funnel there, and it filled, through the door. it filled full of dirt. It became this big, dark tornado. The thing is, remember, a tornado is just a rotating column of air. If there's nothing in the air to see, you can't see it. So if it's really dry, you don't get a condensation funnel. Sometimes it takes debris to go into there for you to see it. So we realized what, right away that was a tornado the whole time. It just didn't have any debris to make it visible. So always look at the ground. I've seen tornadoes that are rotating up here. It's invisible. And then at the ground, you see a bunch of stuff. That's a tornado. They can be detached. Rotating wall cloud usually comes first. Funnel cloud, and then tornado. It's usually the process. So that's why the wall cloud and funnel cloud are important. The whole point of us warning for tornadoes, um, you know, is to tell you before they form. <laughs> Tornado warnings, believe it or not, there's like a 70 to 75% false alarm. And that sounds really bad, right? The problem is you're trying to forecast that the tornado is happening. You don't always know for sure. That's sometimes a reflection of we don't have good data near the ground because of the radar but also because we see one, the rotating storm, we see a wall cloud. And so we issue a warning in anticipation that there's going to be a tornado and sometimes it doesn't. So the whole point is to forecast the tornado. So you're gonna warn, you're gonna overwarn for tornadoes in most cases. You'd much rather have a false alarm rate than have the probability of detection being low, which means you didn't warn for actual tornado. So we have a high false alarm rate, but most tornadoes do not go on to warn. It still happens, but it's pretty rare, especially in this day and age. So just some tornado genesis um, process animations here to kind of show you how it works. So the way tornadoes typically form is we have a lot of strong wind shear. And wind shear is wind changing direction with height. So at the ground where we are on a, on a day where I think there's going to be tornadoes, the winds could be coming from the south. But if you go up to 10,000 feet, the winds could be coming from the southwest or the west. So the wind is changing direction with height. Now, if it's clear, that's not a big deal. But if you get one of these thunderstorms to go up to 30,000 feet, now the thunderstorm is impacted by that changing wind direction. It causes the whole thunderstorm to rotate. And that's what creates the updraft that rotates into 
creates a super cell. And then you get the whole process of that rotation getting tighter and tighter and working its way down to the surface. So here's a quick animation of how that process works. Down at the ground, we might have strong surface winds aloft. We get these horizontal rolls developing, and then the updraft comes in and rotates that column on its end, and we get a wall cloud and then a tornado. So the two main ingredients, if there's a big tornado day, I can tell you two ingredients that will be off the chart. Wind shear and that thunderstorm fuel, because that's the updraft. Those two things, those are the days we have the worst tornado winds. So in the spring, that's the worst time of year because the jet stream is really strong still. So we've got a ton of wind shear, and then we're starting to see these days like today where it's 85, 86 degrees. The only thing we didn't have today is humidity. <laughs> There's no, it's really dry. It's beautiful out right now. It's not muggy. So if it was a really hot, humid day, we had wind shear with a cold front approaching, then tornadoes would be the big issue, which actually happened last night in Oklahoma City. That storm produced like nine tornadoes south of Oklahoma. So the way a radar looks on radar, you can see the rotation on radar, but with modern Doppler radar, we can actually confirm a tornado's on the ground. How do we do that? The radar, unfortunately, can actually pick up the debris that's being picked up by the tornado. So oftentimes, the worst, like it's like me watching the radar camera, sometimes it's really scary. Uh, back in Mississippi last month, I was watching this rotation on the radar, and it went through the town of um, Armour. And I could see the reflectivity jump up. And I just, you know, the reason you could see it was because parts of houses were showing up on the radar. Um, because the radar beam bounces effectively off the two by four sheet insulation. And you can see that on the radar. And you know right away that there's stuff being picked up. And that's a scary sight on the radar. And sometimes you can see the debris lofted to 15, 20, 25,000 feet, um, which tells you how strong the tornado is. So, yeah, you can confirm a tornado with modern Doppler radar. Unfortunately, that doesn't do a lot of good because, you know, the people it's hitting, it's impacting. But you can warn people in the next county or the next town over. And so a lot of times people are like, you know, why do you want damaged pictures and videos? Or why do you want these reports? Well, yeah, you might not be able to help the people that were impacted there, but this is going to help somebody the next county over seek shelter. Because human nature is we like to confirm your threat. And confirmation isn't me on TV saying there's a tornado warning. I wish it was. It, it honestly isn't. What is more confirmation is somebody seeing a picture of a house destroyed, the tornado actually on the screen, or something happened. Then it becomes real to people. Otherwise, it looks like the radar looks like a little pink on the map. And let's be honest, if you don't know what you're looking at, you don't know what to be scared about. <laughs> it's like looking at an x ray, your doctor has to tell you, this is bad. And it's like, well, yeah, this is not looking good. I'm going to skip this one because it's not. What's that? It's tornado? So, yeah, it basically what happens on the radar when you get a tornado, um, you get red and green bright colors next to each other. That's the velocity. But the reflectivity gets really bright, like really heavy rain, because it's not heavy rain or sleet or hail. It's actually objects. So it'll have a really bright return. Um, so the, the tornadoes are rated um, on the EF scale. From zero to five. So the weakest tornadoes are EF zero, the strongest are EF five. Thank goodness EF five tornadoes only make up 1% of all tornadoes. So those monster tornadoes that you see, you know, that are devastating towns, those are horrible, but they're very, very rare. Um, those are the type of storms that are on the ground for two or three hours. Uh, think of Moore, Oklahoma, Xenia, Ohio, um, Joplin, Missouri, Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I could on. Most of ours are the zero, one, two scale. Um, and the, it's important to know that the EF scale is not something you can do in real time. It's, it's a damage assessment. You have to look at the damage after the fact to rate the tornado. And the way they're rated is they use a combination of engineering and meteorology. So you go out and you look at storm damage and you see, okay, this was a, you know, a cedar tree. It was debarked or it's a oak tree and it was bent over. We know structurally and engineering-wise the physics of what it takes to do that to a tree. You do calculations on that. You look at a building. Is it a cinder block building? Is it a mobile home? Is it a frame building? Then you know what kind of damage it does. Is there scarring of the ground? 
So there's these damage indicators that help us figure out what the actual damage was. Here's a, a, an image that shows a, a large tornado. Even within a large tornado, there might be different damage indicators within it. You might have EF0 damage and EF5 damage all in the same map. Tornadoes are really interesting because we get 1,300 a year in the United States on average, which is more than any other country in the world combined. We live in the tornado capital of the world. In fact, people from other countries come here to study tornadoes because we get so much. So it's, it's, it's unique to the United States. Um, we don't get these many tornadoes in any other country. And it's just because our geography. If you think about the geography of North America, we have continuous land to the Arctic. We have continuous land to a tropical body of water, the Gulf of Mexico. And in between, we have two mountain chains on either side of the country. And it funnels everything into the middle of the continental United States with this tornado. So tornado safety. Um, I preach this all the time. I do this every school talk I go to, I preach this. Where's the best place to be in a tornado? Well, the most interior room in the middle of your house. Okay, as many walls between you and the outside. This is a weird statement, but it's not the wind that we're worried about. It's what the wind picks up and throws at you. So unlike Wizard of Oz and Twister, it's very unlikely you're going to get sucked up by the tornado <laughs> and carried to Kansas. What is more likely is something is going to get picked up and hit you in the head. 80% okay, of fatalities in tornado are head time. It means you get hit in the head with something. So what we want to do, those walls block the debris from hitting you. If you're in the lowest floor of your house, think of, people don't think of this, but the ceilings and floors above you are walls as well. They protect you from above. So there are layers of protection. And then lastly, we want you to have a, a helmet. Okay? Bike helmet, skateboard, I don't care, motorcycle, any kind of hard hat, doesn't matter. Whatever protects your head from falling is going to protect your head from stuff hitting you. And that's where my job comes in. So days ahead of time, when I say, you know, Thursday's a day to be weather aware, right? You hear me say that. That means it's a day to go get the helmet, clean out the closet, and put them in there. That's kind of what we do in our house. I mean, I'll go clean the closet out. We might have tornadoes. Just in case, throw the helmets in there. And that way, when the average tornado warning is only about 11 minutes, in 11 minutes, you don't want everyone to look around and what do we do or where do we go? You should already know. You should just go and do it. Um, so that interior room. And, and the reason that interior room is really important is it's not just something we say. If you're looking at the graphic, um, this happened with the storms that just occurred in Mississippi as well. I see the damage and it's devastating. My eye is completely drawn to a, to a, a, a building where the interior room is the only room still standing. And I see it all the time. Here's a picture right here. This is from Oklahoma. Interior room, the only one standing. That's a survivable room. Bathrooms are great, half bath because the plumbing in that room is usually anchored into the foundation or the slab or the basement. And those pipes will actually keep that room intact more so than another room. So half baths on the first floor are really good. Staircases are really well done in the middle of the house. All those load bearing walls, the more of them you have in the middle, the better. Because those are the most protective in the middle. So definitely do that. Other things to bring in there, um, Bring your charger and your phone because you're going to want to watch the coverage. And I'm a, hopefully, I'm going to do this more and more. This is something we don't do enough. Tell you when to leave. <laughs> Go to that room and then, okay, coast is clear. Come out. We don't do that well enough. That's been my goal for the last couple of years is to give people more of the all clear. Because when we had the tornado back in 2020, um, in that February one, you guys remember that one from like Pineville to Matthew? Actually went through my backyard. I heard these horror stories of people in Uptown, like in the stairwell for two hours. Like, what were you in the stairwell for? They heard a tornado warning and just stood in there and waited and waited. I'm like, well, at some point, you know, it's over, right? Um, but I guess because there's not enough all clear signals, right? Schools, some of the schools, they were in there doing their right thing. They were in, the, in their safety location, but they were there like an hour and a half. Tornado was gone like an hour ago. It's people. So we're going to do more of that. One of the things to think about, too, and I, I think more and more, is make sure you have a pair of shoes in there. And you're like, why do I need a pair of shoes? Well, if your house is damaged or destroyed, you're going to be climbing out through nails, broken glass, whatever, don't be embarrassed. <laughs> Have a pair of shoes, because a lot of injuries happen after the tornado because of debris. People get electrocuted, they step on nails, they cut themselves. And remember, those things may not seem that serious, but first responders are not going to be able to come and stitch you up right away. They're going to be responding to a lot of other things. So getting help for a simple injury might be a much bigger task after a tornado. So don't put
put yourself in a situation where you that could happen. So this is a big thing I want to focus on, our tornado lookalikes. Okay. I get so many pictures of tornadoes that are just stuck. <laughs> Everyone thinks every low-hanging dark cloud is, is, a, is, a, is a tornado. And 90% of the time, it's not. Um, I like to call them SLCs, scary-looking clouds. Um, scary-looking clouds are all what they really are. There's low-hanging clouds. you got to remember when it's really hot and humid and there's thunderstorms, there's a lot of up-and-down motion in that storm. So clouds are always going to be moving up and down. That's kind of, we call thunderstorms convection because it's a convection current. You expect that. What we're looking for is things rotating horizontally very close together and rapidly. So things slowly moving around aren't that really big a deal. Think about it. If it's moving slow, that's not, that, that what's the wind speed? 10, 15 miles an hour? It's not, if it's, if it's dangerous, it's going to be moving at highway speeds or so think about that. And some of the things we see, um, a lot of the steam from the nuclear power plants, on certain days when the steam cloud gets up and connects to a cloud, we'll get tons of reports. There's a tornado at the lake. It's been there for four hours. <laughs> it's like, um, yeah, yeah, I guess it's a steam cloud coming from the cooling towers. And the other thing, it's like, oh, it's, a it's, just, it's just water. <laughs> it's just a cooling tower. So it's not, it's not all that dangerous. Um, the other thing is sometimes smoke from a fire will go up and people will see the smoke from it. We call them smoke natives because people think it's a tornado. Um, but you see stuff like that a lot. In the mountains, you see sometimes those wispy clouds coming off the mountains after a heavy rain. Those little fracas clouds are calm sometimes you can take a tornado. So the biggest thing is to watch it. Is it rotating violently? And then you know it's a tornado. Um, and the best thing to do is in that situation, video is much more valuable than a still picture because I can't see movement in a still picture. I could see a cloud that looks like a wedge and it's gone like a second later. You can't detect that in a, in a picture. Any still picture can look like a tornado pretty easily. The, the thing that helps is the, is the video. So if you can, send video clips so people can see if it's rotating or not. The other thing is things need to, not that it doesn't happen, it's pretty rare. All tornadoes typically rotate clockwise or counterclockwise. So think of a counterclockwise spin. If it's spinning, if it's spinning clockwise, which is rare, we call that you know, um, anti-cyclonic, that's kind of rare. Um, but if you see that, that's probably not a tornado. Some other things that are pretty cool, and you see a lot of these here, shelf clouds. These shelf clouds are amazing. Right? And you've seen these. It looks like a giant wall of clouds coming. This comes with these big thunderstorms in the summer where cool air rushes out and meets warm air, which lifts up. It looks like a wave coming at you. This really looks like an Independence Day cloud, right? If we saw the movie. It's this giant wall. These can be really scary looking, and sometimes they can be severe. They can be an indication of really strong straight line winds, but a lot of times they're not. It's really not all that bad. Um, you've seen a lot of viral videos online of these. Sometimes they produce these little fingers. Um, for some reason, grocery stores, you know, parking lots tend to be a popular location for scary clouds, but um, I, I, you know, you people who spend most time chasing in the planes, you just got to go to the local Publix and take pictures of scary clouds because. That's apparently where they all are. Um, but these shelf clouds are pretty, pretty ominous looking. Um, and this is how they form. I, I think I animated this. So a shelf cloud is essentially cool, dry air coming out of the back and the warm, humid air going up and over. So that's the process that's forming. Um, it's basically the cool, cool air is forcing the warm air up and it's creating a cloud. And that happens quite a bit. Other clouds to look at, downbursts. Shelf clouds, wall clouds, stud. Believe it or not, that, that one on the corner there, I, I would that's the kind of picture I get where people like to be tornado. Like, no, it's not a tornado. Scud cloud. Just a scud. Those things will be moving all over the place sometimes too. And even even train spotters can be tricked. The whole point of that is like, don't look at it for first glance. Take some time to watch it. And then you'll know, like, oh, it might dissipate in three or four seconds, and then you're like, oh, that was but scud clouds are the most common thing I see around here where people just mistake them. So hail, I was going to do a hail demonstration. Um, maybe I can do it now. So hail is pretty cool. Um, hey, can you hold this mic for me? That's what I'm here for. All right. <laughs> I'm going to yell really loud so you guys can hear me. 
You're, you, everyone who wondered why this leaf blower was here, this is why it's here. Okay. So, hail is Am pretty. Get hurt? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You have liability. No. Um, yeah. So thanks. So the way hail forms is pretty cool. I'm always fascinated by hail, and that the fact that it only can happen in the summertime. Really. But think about that. It could be 90 degrees at the ground, and you could have hail coming down. It, it kind of blows people's minds. But the way it happens is you need moisture that's liquid at the bottom of the cloud to get blown up to a part of the storm where it's cold enough to freeze. So if the ice will freeze, it'll fall down and get wet again, get blown back up, hit another layer of ice, come down, get wet again, and get blown back up, hit another layer of ice. It'll go through this convection current as many times until the hail's big enough where the updraft can't hold it up there, okay? And then it'll fall to the ground. But there's a key thing about that updraft. The updraft can't be vertical. So think about it. if something goes straight up and gets cold and comes back down, they'll cancel each other out. The updraft and down. So you want to tilt. So I do this little experiment all the time to show us. I'm going to put the mic down again. Unless you want to hold it. So if you have a piece of hail and you push it straight up, it'll come back down pretty quickly. But the key to getting big hail like this, this is softball size hail, is to have a tilt to the updraft. So watch as I tilt the updraft, how it stays up there for long enough until it falls. So we'll make it go up and I'm gonna tilt the updraft and it still stays up there, okay? And there's a very fine line until it falls out. That tilt, it has to be just right where it's enough to keep the current going, but not let it fall out. Now what hail does, and this is huge hail. This hail is gigantic. It's like softball. This would be four and a half inch in diameter. Uh, this is the biggest hail ever recorded in North Carolina. It's like four and a half inches. Okay? To get hail this big, you need an updraft that's like 100 miles an hour going up. Keep that up. But what's cool about hail, don't ever go out in the hailstorm because this hurts. Uh, trust me. <laughs> um, I've been chasing and been pelted by baseball sized hail, and it is not fun. Um, but this hail, once it's on the ground, if you go outside and break it open, you'll see rings in the hail. So each ring will tell you how many cycles that it went through. So it does, if there's four or five rings, it went through that cycle four or five times. It's like a tree ring. It tells you the life cycle of that hail. So real small hail may not have a ring at all. It might just be one. But big hail, will it'll look like a gob top on the inside because it'll have those rings. It's really cool. Um, but hail's the worst thing. When I'll tell you a story, when I was chasing in college, we were in the middle of like Wichita Falls, Texas, in the middle of nowhere, um, and this giant hailstorm, which you're in the wrong spot chasing it through the middle, and I was. And the car's getting pummeled. The windows are shattering. The side mirrors are getting blown off. It's kind of like someone had a sledgehammer in their car beating it. And the whole time this is happening, it's just deafening in the car. And there's a, there's next to us is a field full of cattle. All the cattle are just getting bludgeoned. Right, they're falling over left and right, and um, the crazy thing was, after the hailstorm was over, I would say about seventy-five percent of those cows got back up and walked away. But <laughs> the crazy thing was, it was a rental car, um, <laughs> which I highly recommend getting the coverage if you ever do this. But it, it's funny; a lot of chasers are blackballed by the, by the rental car companies for this reason. But it, it obliterated the car. It's just a helpless feeling to be in the middle of nowhere. There's no protection, and your car just gets destroyed. And so I hate hail for that reason because the sound and the just the helplessness of being in that hailstorm. Because there's nowhere to go. You can't drive. You can't see. Uh, out there, there's very few trees. There's no overpasses. We're in a rural part of, the, of, of Texas, you know. And so it's just it's 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 a horrible thing. And if you ever if you have a nice car, there's nothing worse than watching that nice car just get dinged up by baseball or golf balls or whatever. So here's a little animation of how the hail works. Hopefully it plays. There we go. So you get that updraft. You get those pieces of ice that keep going up and down, and you see the rings that form as it goes up and down over time. And there's a direct proportion to how big the hail is and the, the strength of the updraft. So, for instance, the baseball, you know, would be more like in the 70 to 80 mile per hour up. And as I mentioned, this is over 100 miles an hour. I don't have my golf ball. Golf ball is close to 50 to 60, but pea size hail can form like 835. So it, it really can be pretty small hail. 
And so a good comparison, a comparison chart, I should say, for hail chart here kind of shows you if you don't know what a quarter inch means or a good size, three quarter inch pennies, one inch is about a quarter. Um, ping pong ball is about an inch and a half. Golf ball is about an inch and a half to inch and three quarters. So a lot of people don't have measuring tools when you're giving us hail reports. Just tell me what it looks like. I've gotten like crazy things like an egg. And, you know, somebody like gave me one time there was a big hail somewhere and someone said it looked like a CD and nobody knew what a CD was. And so <laughs> it was really confusing. Um, so something that we can compare it to, usually balls are really effective or fruit or vegetables, something that's pretty, you know, and also money, coins work really well. Um, and remember that the weather service and us, even though if it's not one inch, which is severe, I like knowing about any hail because usually big hail starts small <laughs> and it gets bigger as the storm develops. So even reporting pea size hail is really important. So there's a, there's a good example of reporting. Hail spikes on radar are pretty cool. You can actually, obviously we can detect hail in the storm, but what happens sometimes when there's really big hail, because this, you're talking about a big piece of ice, it'll bend the radar beam and you'll get these hail spikes, it's kind of an artifact of the radar. And when you see them on the radar, it's like, it's like a glitch, but it's a glitch that tells you there's big hail in that storm. Um, so it's a really effective tool. I'm almost out of time, so I got 15 minutes. I want to leave time for questions, so I'm trying to blow through this. Okay, so we talked about a lot of severe weather. Probably not the most important thing though, flooding is. Uh, flooding is the number one killer of all weather, right behind heat. Um, and my daughter was asking me the other night, I think we were studying for Catholic school. She was like, Dad, what do you think is like the most dangerous natural disaster? She was trying to say like earthquakes or whatever. And I said, you know what? It's two, it's a two opposites. I said, it's probably gonna be drought <laughs> and flooding. Because if you think about how many people it impacts, drought impacts agriculture and kills millions of all in, in parts of Southeast Asia all the time, and flooding kills way more people. And then heat's up there. People don't think about heat. Heat waves are really dangerous. You think about all the other severe weather, but those are the things that do uh, cause a lot of damage. So flooding is a big issue. Lightning, uh, even though there's no technical severe criteria for lightning, lightning is a really dangerous thing. Every thunderstorm, by definition, has lightning. Um, and one thing, and I know you guys all know this, but I just say this. I know you're an umpire, so you was. I've been at some baseball games where I've heard dads, oh, I heard thunder. There's no lightning yet. Like, what do you think the thunder came from? <laughs> <laughs> uh, because people don't see the lightning. They'll hear the thunder and go, I didn't see no light. It was just thunder. They're one in the same. Thunder is the sound that lightning makes. <laughs> so if you hear thunder, there's lightning. It's not one or the other. So the safety thing is if you hear thunder, you're way too close. The sound travels much slower and travels shorter distances. Like, so if you hear thunder, you're way too close. So the saying is, if you hear thunder roar, go indoors. That's, that's, that's exactly what you do. The other thing to remember about lightning is it strikes far from the storm. Most people that get hit by lightning happen before and after the storm. You know why? Because when it's raining, people know to go inside. When it's not raining, they're outside. And that's when they get hit by lightning. And the thing to remember, lightning can strike up to 20 to 30 miles from because if you think about these storms, we talked about how high they can get. They can be 60,000 feet tall. So if lightning comes out of a 60,000 foot storm down in Pineville right now, and it's clear here at lower left, that lightning bolt would come way out here and hit here, and they could be completely blue skies. They call that a bolt from the blue, and it happens a lot. So if you see a storm in the distance and you're like, oh, it's clear up here, you still should be inside because that lightning can get you from here. Now, if it's way, way in the distance, like at the beach, when you see them offshore, that's far enough. But if you hear that thunder, you're way too close. The other thing inside, it is not an old wives' tale. You can't get hit by lightning in the tub or shower, okay? Um, because think about it. The pipes coming into your house go outside into the ground, out to the street. If that pipe gets hit out there, that electricity travels through the pipe, which is full of water, by the way. It doesn't matter if it's PVC. <laughs> the water still conducts electricity. It comes in and then gets you in the tub or shower if you're connected. So holding the sink or in the shower or tub during a thunderstorm is probably not the greatest idea. And then back in the day when we had video games that weren't cordless, I would tell my kids, you know, that we used to have to not, we couldn't play our video games when there's a thunderstorm because you were connected to the game console, which is plugged into the wall. Anything that's connected to the electrical lines, which also, guess what, bring electricity in your house, can bring lightning into your house as well. 
So anything connected to the outside, the scary thing about that is your house doesn't have to get hit, just the lines that are coming into your house. And so oftentimes the power pole or the plumbing or the water main gets hit and the, the lightning will spout. Is it really that common? It's not super common, but it's just another thing that can put lightning in your house. So it's just better, like, you know, stay off of corded devices and stay out of the shower and tub and keep your warm towel. Um, it's also why if, you've ever, if you're a swimmer, why if you have an indoor pool, they still evacuate the pool during thunderstorms for that reason. Because if the lightning gets into the water line, the whole pool becomes electrified. So even indoor pools will be evacuated during, during thunderstorms. So how do you report this stuff? I've told you all this stuff. Well, the best way for us is to use our app. And the reason, and again, it's just a bug for our app, but it's also, it is a cool feature. We have a thing called the Near Me feature. And the, what that is, is if you go to our app and submit something, like a picture or video, it knows your location and it gives us the location of where you are with that message. Because one of my biggest pet peeves is I'll get a picture or a text or a DM or a tweet and it'll say, Brad, I got four inch hail at my house. And I'm sitting there going, where's your house? <laughs> I, 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 I know we all think like we're best friends and I love you, but I don't know where everybody lives. Um, so I need like a town <laughs> or a neighborhood. And I also would love like a, a, a location uh, and timestamp and also like a direction. You know what direction you're looking. Like I saw this or this happened on the east, west side. The more information you can give me, but probably the most important thing is just the location. Because it's natural. Because you're like, sometimes I'm tweeting back and forth with people and you think, okay, we know each other. And it's like, hey, I just had this. And I'm like, I'm talking to a lot of people. I just like, I don't know where you are. Where are you? Um, and so, it, or if it happened then or two hours ago or that kind of thing. So that's important. You can tag us on social media. Um, I'll tell you this, the weather service, you can tag them as well. But one of the things that I do, I retweet every damage report or picture I get because I know the weather service is following my Twitter feed and they'll see it as well. My goal of resharing everything is not just to reshare it for myself, it's so that other people see it and then get the information. But if you tag um, us, you tag GSP on there, you can you can help us out tremendously. Um, what do we need you to report? Here's the thing, wind damage or wind speeds. If you have the ability to give us a wind speed, like you have an anemometer at your house, um, if not, if you can, if you're good at guessing winds, I mean, like, I, hey, I think it's 30 miles an hour. I mean, I'm not a big fan of that, but one way you can really gauge it is tell me about the branches or what kind of damage. Because then I can kind of gauge, well, I know it takes this type of wind to bring down a two-inch branch, four-inch branch. Branches, um, any kind of structure damage, even if it's like shingles or gutters or like a trampoline or something loose, those kind of things are important. Hail size, any hail size. Are you seeing hail at all? It, like I said, there, just because one inch is the criteria, I don't really care. Do it as a weather service. Tell us about any hail at all. Flooding, um, flooding is a big thing. Is it in areas that don't normally flood? Like is a creek flooded? Is a creek overflowing? These things are really important as well. Remember, the flood gauges are not everywhere. So sometimes this auto reports are what prompt flood warning. Oftentimes in Charlotte, it's because we got creek flooding that the weather service doesn't know about until the emergency manager or one of us says something like, hey, there's water rescues going on, you know, on Queens Road West or whatever, they won't know that's happening until somebody helps. And they'll issue a flood warning for Mecklenburg County. And then obviously any kind of wall clouds, rotating wall clouds, funnel clouds, or tornadoes. There's ways to report, obviously, you can, you can tag us or the weather service on. Um, and then, you know, the biggest thing, and I should have said this at the beginning, but safety first. I don't want you putting yourself at risk um, going out there to give us a report. If you can do it from the safe, safety of your house or after the fact or before a storm, that's great. I know, I mean, if you're like me, I was a kid, I wanted to go out and every single day. Um, but, you know, that's the kind of thing I do. So it's okay to do that. Um, just be safe. And be really descriptive of what you're seeing. Think about the kind of report. If you see a lowering, be descriptive, like, hey, I don't know it's touching the ground. Don't assume it is. Just, I mean, the thing is, the weather service and, and other meteorologists, we can have even a little bit piece of information. It might be a piece along with the radar data or something else I see that could put it all together. And even if you say, I don't know it's touching the ground, but maybe there's somebody on the other side of that tree line that does see it as well and says, hey, it is. A combination of those two reports could tell us that, hey, it's a tornado. 
So you don't have to like assume like you, if you can't see the ground, just say, hey, Brad, I see a rotating cloud. It's down to the trees, but I can't see below the tree line. That's great. That's all I need to know because then I might get a report from somewhere else or I might see on the radar there's rotation. And just the fact that you saw rotation too would be like a light bulb to me. Like, hey, this is a serious situation. Um, just some examples of things you might see. Time of year is important too. Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, if it's if it's a cool day and you're seeing something weird that looks like rotation, I always think we got to think about the environment. Like, what's the environment we're seeing this in? Is it is a tornado possible? Um, you know, scary looking clouds are a big thing. I don't mind hearing about wall um, scud clouds or even shelf clouds because they are pretty spectacular. It does tell me a lot of what's going on. And the biggest thing I would say when reporting. If you can, do video as much as possible. I think that would be my biggest thing, because still pictures, sometimes they look awesome, but because there's no movement, I don't really know what's going on. Like a lot of times I'll get a picture and someone will say, hey Brad, this, this looks like a tornado, what do you think? And I'm like, it's still. By definition, a tornado is what? A rotating column of air. If I can't see rotation in a still picture. So it doesn't really help me. So video is great. So. I know it seems weird because we pull our phones out all the time. We just snap, snap, snap. Video is probably the way to go. Is, is video. Because it, it will be more telling. Uh, and even time lapses. Time lapses are amazing because you can see motion over a long period of time. And everybody's got security cameras and stuff now, too. I have, I have four on my roof. They're really just looking at the sky. But, um, but I have four up there for that reason. It's great because you might be able to check, like, a camera at your house and see something. And that's another safe way to observe the weather because you're not outside. You can let the camera put itself at risk. So that's the other thing I do a lot of times. I have those cameras on my roof because I can go check them and not have to worry about being outside. So think about those as well if you have security cameras. Uh, those help out as well. So I'm going to go right to the end because most of the other stuff is just looking at stuff. If you've got any questions or comments for me, um, I'm always available on social media. As you know, WX Brad on all my social media. This is my personal email address. Because I'll be honest, I get so much email at work and stuff. Just spam. I probably will miss an email, so please email me at Gmail. That's a much better platform, especially if it's a storm report, because I'm more likely going to get that in real time. The other thing in real time, when I'm doing severe weather, um, I don't mind DMs, and private messages, but if I'm in wall-to-wall -wall severe weather coverage, I'm not likely checking that in real time. I'm more likely going to check something that's just tagged or in my. Um, and the other nice thing about that is other people that I work with can see that even if I can't, because they'll be following my feed and grab that picture or video. So it helps more people get eyeballs on it, because here's what happens in every every time we have a tornado warning. I'll go back after two hours of being on the air. I'll take a break, and I'll start going through my Facebook messages, and I'll see a picture of the tornado from two hours ago. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, wh why didn't I look? Because I didn't think to go into my messages in the middle of the tornado warning. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I wish I had this like two hours ago. And it's amazing picture or video. And I'm like, so tagging me or tagging the station um, or just putting it in the public feed where I would see it or somebody in my staff would see it. Because here's what happens, and James can speak to this. All our producers have learned just to bring up my Twitter feed and my Facebook page and look for stuff that's posted publicly. And they'll grab it and they'll, they'll, they'll call my ear like, hey, Brad, we just got something tweeted at you. And they'll be like on my Facebook page or something. And we'll use it on the air almost immediately. And the reason that's really important is not just for us. It's because, like I said, the stuff you're sharing with us is going to help somebody else in the next county over see this picture. Because that video, picture, image is what makes somebody seek shelter or take the corrective action they need. So it's really valuable. So with that, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave time for questions. Hopefully, I got enough time. Wait, what's that? And Clay, yeah, and Clay's on there too. He's with the weather service. I can ask him. It's kind of a delay, but um, if you relay it to me, I can ask. Yep, go ahead, Rob. Yeah. I have a couple of questions. They were talking about lowering and looking like a ball, and then they, how does that form into a a funnel, or how does how does a wall cloud become a all that? That's the, that little. In between, the yeah, don't like great question. So the wall cloud. So the first thing that starts is the whole storm is rotating. Before a tornado forms, a wall cloud is going to be a lowering that drops below the rotating cloud. What makes a wall cloud unique is usually it's the only lowering in the whole cloud. 
if you see a whole bunch of little fragments and things hanging down, that's probably nothing. But if it's by itself, and sometimes itself will be rotating slowly, it's called a rotating wall cloud. That's how you know it's something different. If it's out of the ordinary, like if I'm looking at a cloud face and it's flat as could be, and all of a sudden, boom, there's this little droppage and that goes back up and it's flat again, that's a wall cloud. But if it's a bunch of fragments, like it looks like a bunch of teeth or whatever, that's probably less of an issue. So that's what you're looking for. And there is usually some subtle movement to it. That's a good question. That's good. This is going back home by Glenn Bay. Like one of the uh oh, we got a radar question. <laughs> um, yeah, so. Well, we no, it's only 8.30. This is, could have been a whole other topic. So, yes, to answer your first question, we are the biggest metro area in the U.S. without a radar, which is the Um And I'm talking about next year, I probably will. Um, it is a big problem. We've been trying to fix it for, like, 15 years, trying to get the government installed. I trust it. <laughs> um, I feel like we've jinxed every politician we asked to help us with this has lost their election. Um, so I don't know, but we do have some new people on board that are kind of getting on board and it's actually bipartisan, believe it or not, um, support to help try to get a radar net. Now the problem is, in the past, the National Weather Service, and I won't speak to say, but I will in this group because I kind of know, the problem they were worried about was like legislation to say, put a radar in, and not funding for that, and then having to draw funding from an already existing program. And then that meant laying people off or hurting you know, it, it's kind of like, hey, we built the radar, but guess what? Now we have less people to work with the radar. <laughs> it was like, so it was like a catch-22. The goal that now is, and we've been working with the state emergency manager, is to try to build a private-public partnership where we would use either a grant or even private donors, um, corporate people in Charlotte, to build the radar and have the emergency management in North Carolina run it, and then the data would be given to everybody, including the weather service, stations you on your phone app everyone would be able to look at it. this has happened in other parts of the country in fact um, Grant County um, Oklahoma just put one in for county emergency manager bought it and allows everyone to look at it so it, I think we're getting close but it is a frustrating thing we do have a smaller terminal Doppler radar that the FAA put in for the airport to look for those downbursts so that airplanes can take off and land in Charlotte Douglas it's a weaker smaller radar but right now it's for a bigger problem. So I'm hoping that in the future we'll have a um, call. We're getting close. It, there's legislation in the state right now to help get this enacted. Um, Jeff Jackson is, is involved, Ted Budd. Yeah. I said it's like there is a lot of people that, like I said, across the political spectrum that are really, they know it's a problem. It's an easy sell to anybody because weather safety is so important. It's one of the few things that I think people want to spend time because it helps us and it saves lives and keeps us important. So I hope we're close. I hope we're close. Good question. Yep. Tornado without It does happen. Um, I've seen it maybe two or three times here. And usually it's because we've had two air mass thunderstorms and their outflow boundaries have collided. And we've seen quick spin up tornadoes. So it, it's rare. But it does happen when you have two times sliding boundaries. Um, and those are the ones that really catch you off guard because you're like, what do you mean? I'll get a report of a tornado. I don't even know where it's coming. And then you look at the radar and you see these two outflow boundaries collide and sometimes the quick spin ups are happening. So it does happen. Um, but usually it's pretty rare. Um, you usually have at least a severe thunderstorm to warn your team before we get to it. Um, and the thing is, there's not always a tornado watch before a tornado warning. Sometimes the environment just comes. Together, um, and we get to do it. Yep. What do we need milk and bread? <laughs> I don't mean, I, that's a good question. I don't even know why we need milk and bread for anything. Um, but apparently, every storm you got to go buy it all and the toilet paper. But that seems to be a common thing. The thing about water around here, I remember when the hurricanes, everyone's buying bottled water. I'm like, the water's not going to go out. And the other thing is, your water works now. Why don't you just fill up jugs if you're buying bottled water? Um, it, it's People do weird things. What happens is it's, that's a psychological thing. People feel like they have to do something. So 
So buying bulk items feels like you're when in reality you're just buying. I'd much rather people have a plan and have a kit. Like for me personally, yeah, having some canned food and stuff around, I've been in Charlotte for 20 years. I haven't lost power for more than a day. I've never lost water. Uh, it, some of these things, it's short term. You need two to three days to buy. And most of you probably already have that in your house. You're not going to be stuck at home for like, that's, that's pretty rare. We're not at the coast where that's going to happen. But it is, that is, there's other ways to do it. Yep. Sounds like you're running the why is it so hard to confirm tornadoes? Why is it so hard to confirm tornadoes if you were online? Um, a good question. Like, what do they mean by that? Like, confirm. Oh, okay, like in real time. Um, most likely it's because we don't have spotters in that area. It's at night where the visibility is bad. A lot of times um, radar data is lacking, so you don't know what's on the ground for sure. Um, so, yeah, confirmed tornadoes are kind of hard in real time. And the other thing I, I always have to confirm to people is that the point of a tornado warning is to forecast the tornado before it happens. If we waited to warn until the tornado touched down, that would be kind of too late. It's like you got to give people a heads up before it happens. That's why the false alarm rate is so elevated because the goal is to give you a heads up. I always, I always equate it to like a cancer diagnosis. How many times do you go get something checked out just in case? And most of the time it's going to be benign or not a big deal, but it's one of those things you've got to check out anyways because it could be. So that's what we do with tornadoes. It's like you better just err on the side of caution instead of just saying, oh, well, it might or may not be. We'll wait and find out. It's just, it's one of those things, a life and death situation. So you're going to take um, the chance and just put the warning. Good question. Yep. That's a very good observation, believe it or not. I am pretty sure still North Carolina leads the nation. In um, we get a lot of them around. And it just so happens our environment here tends to be what we call high shear low cape. Remember those ingredients I talked about, a lot of wind shear and a lot of thunderstorm fuel? Well, one way you can overcome a lack of thunderstorm fuel is to have like five times the amount of wind shear. <laughs> it's like you overwhelm with wind shear. And that happens at night because at night, think about it, there's no heat. So you don't have a ton of fuel, but the wind shear can be so intense here that we'll get tornadoes in the darkness of the night. And for me, those are, that's, literally a nightmare for me because it's impossible to warn people because one, they're not paying attention. They're not expecting them. They're asleep and nobody, even spotters, you can't see them. So those are the worst ones. Those are the most difficult things. And I've had, you know, I've been, I remember in 2012, a tornado touched down in Reed Creek, 236 in the morning, BF And I remember doing a story about the family that was impacted. Two kids were actually blown onto 485. Um, they were pushed out of their house in their beds. They were fine. They were, they all, they were no injury. But the story blew me away because we knew there was severe weather that day. They had all slept downstairs because they were worried about severe weather. It got to 11 o'clock at night. And they thought, oh, it's night. It, it's not going to happen. They went back upstairs and went to bed thinking it was over. And the storm hit in the middle of the night. And to me, that was like a case of like, that's just, that's human nature. Like, it didn't happen during the day, so it must not be happening. I'm going to go to sleep. And 236. Um, so that does happen a lot. That is a very Carolina specific threat, and it happens because of the environment that we have in North Carolina. What causes the freight train sound? So the freight train sound, I would I would argue there it really isn't. Having chased tornadoes, I don't think it sounds like a freight train. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think it's more of like a jet engine or wind or like sure. have you ever been to like a big waterfall? That I roaring went, sound. We were, we were in Florida. We were in a winter storm. Yeah. We heard the sound. Yeah. Half the power went out the whole thing. And people that are from Florida said, What is the record? <laughs> yeah. It was a noise. Yeah. It's no, it's, it is a noise. Trust me. Yeah. It is like a roar. But I think it's more if you've been to like Niagara Falls or a big waterfall or even like the sound of big jet engines. It is a it's a wind sound. The thing I associate with a freight train, I live near a train tracks growing up, it's like up to going over the the tornado does not sound like that. It never has a horn. Um, so I, I always think it sounds like more like a wind or a jet engine or a waterfall. But that's because there's so much air being pulled in and the wind can 
um, work around. And then when it picks up the breed, you've got the sound of all that stuff getting blown around. So it is definitely, it is a deep, deep roar. It is, it is and the big tornadoes have a very deep sound. You can feel them through the vibration and the pressure fall. Um, the big tornadoes definitely are not, I mean, they are scary. They, they sound like they're roaring. Ooh, that's a good question. So the strongest tornado that we know of, there's, there's kind of a tie. We think it's the Moore 1999 tornado, Moore, Oklahoma. It had winds of 319 miles per hour. But we think the El Reno, El Reno Oklahoma tornado might have surpassed that because we have Doppler data that shows it might, might have been even stronger. The, the, the El Reno tornado was the widest tornado, two and a half miles wide. Um, and we just, we think that might be the widest. The longest track tornado is still the tri-state tornado, uh, which went over three states early in this century. Um, but the Mayfield, remember the Mayfield Kentucky tornado that happened in December two years ago, three years ago now, um, that traveled almost the same distance. So some of those long track tornadoes are just, uh, just crazy to think about. But that's why tornadoes have the strongest winds on the face of the earth. We've been able to detect the strongest winds recordable in a tornado. Um, and mainly that was from radar data bouncing off a of debris that was spinning around at that time. It's pretty crazy to think about. But that's probably, you know, you bounce the radar beam off of a two by four or shingle going at 300. It's just crazy to think about that. Yep. Online viewer wants to know why does the phone line pick up by 85? <laughs> that's, that's another common thing. So I get that quite a bit. I almost brought that up in the squall line thing. A lot of times, squall lines, remember remember about our radar coverage talk, the radars are only in specific locations. So what looks like splitting up and getting stronger and weaker, maybe that it's going closer or farther from the radar. Um, it's not necessarily doing that in real time. The other thing is sometimes it's just timing of the day. If a squall line is in the peak heating of the day and it gets to us and it's after sunset or near sunset, it's losing its energy, so it's going to fall apart. It's like that. It's like the thunderstorm thing. Is it at the mature stage or dissipating stage? Um, and the other thing is, let's be honest. We're all very biased about where we live. We only notice things that happen to us. <laughs> we don't notice that it happens in other spots because we don't live there. And so we only tend to remember the stuff. But we have a lot of confirmation bias, basically. <laughs> it's a good question, though. We are. If, if you were to t if you were to ask me the are the biggest thing we're susceptible from from climate change here in Charlotte, it would be flooding, um, and it's it's a twofold reason. One, we have seen heavier rainfall events in Charlotte, and two, because of our growth, um, we are growing rapidly. I don't think anybody would argue that, and that causes a lot of problems. One, it's more impervious surface, so the water runs off of it. It also means our stormwater system. They do a great job. They can't keep up. The pipes that are moving stormwater that were built in the 50s and 60s cannot handle rainfall from 2026. So it's more of an infrastructure issue where they didn't think they would ever have to do two, four, five inches of rain in three hours. They were built for like an inch and a half. Uh, so to me, that is a big problem. We are we're already a flash flood prone city because we have a lot of creeks and streams. There's a lot of elevation change in Mecklenburg County. We have so many streams and creeks. If you think about Uptown, the reason it's called Uptown, it's just not a marketing thing. It's built on a ridge between Irwin Creek and Sugar Creek. Trade and Tryon is the highest point in Uptown Charlotte. So if you've ever walked or rode your bike up there, you don't have to. I can tell you it's uphill. <laughs> you hit the Trade and Tryon, and then it's downhill on the other side. That water runs off of those creeks quickly. And so when we get heavy rain over an urban setting like this, flash flooding is going to naturally scale. So I do think it is going to be a big problem. In my time here, that's the one thing I've noticed is that, you know, four or five inch rainfalls are more common. And the one inch and two inch rainfalls are becoming more and more common. So flash flooding is, is that's a crazy event. That's uh, 25 inches of rain in one day. I mean, it's insane. And what their problem is you're so close to the ocean already, there's no elevation. So the water just sits there. There's no, there, you're too close to the ocean. It's a cave. That's why it took days for the 
right in Fort Lauderdale, Fort Lauderdale Airport. Those kind of things. Because like, the water just had to slowly seep away until it freezes. It's a good question, though. I have the same question. Yep. I've heard Charlotte over the years has lost a lot of the housing local environment. Yeah, we're a model for doing that. Yeah. And I've seen a lot more near Cedar Creek actual yeah. residential budget. Yeah. Are we doing a good job? Are we doing a We're doing job? much better than a lot of places. The one thing at Charlotte is kind of like I said, leads the nation is we've bought a lot of land in areas that used to flood. Um the little sugar creek, most of the greenways here are built on land that is in floodplain anyway. The reason the greenway is there is to enjoy the greenway, but also to let that area flood and not flood the other way. That's where we go. So one a prime example of this is behind a Park Road Shopping Center. If you've been behind Park Road Shopping Center, there used to be homes on that road. They bought them all up and made it into a green space. It could flood naturally and not um, flood homes. So the city has been doing more and more of that. The problem is, and if you have a house and your house is just assessed, it's hard to buy property in Mecklenburg County because it's super expensive. And for them to buy, they, can, they used to be able to buy a lot more. Now they have to give fair market value. So to buy more of that property is what they do. But they do spend a lot of money doing that because in the long run, it's better to buy that property and let it sit and bank it than replace and keep that home four or five times over the next decade because of what ends up costing the taxpayers more money in the long run. So, yeah, we, we do a good job. Yeah. yeah, so the pressure does drop dramatically. In fact, last night I was looking at the mesonet in Oklahoma. The tornado came within, I think, a half mile of the Shawnee Airport, and their pressure dropped like crazy low. Because what's happening, if you think about what a tornado is doing, it's sucking air up into the storm. It's when you suck air up, you don't think about this, the pressure, it makes the pressure fall dramatically. And that's what's creating the wind. So you're pulling so much air off the surface that air is rushing in to take, take the place of that vacuum of air. And so that pressure will fall dramatically. Your ears will pop. Um, it will be really dramatic. Every time you've been near a thunderstorm like that, the one that went through our backyard, that's the thing my wife said, that her ears hurt so bad when the tornado was passing the backyard. It popped because of how, how low the but you're, you're evacuating so much air from the surface of the earth that it's lowering the pressure. Because that's what pressure is. It's literally less air over you than when there's high pressure, which is a whole bunch of air. So when you get those big storms like that, there's very little air above you and it creates low pressure. That's a good question. That's a, that's a thing a lot of people do. A couple more questions and we're almost out of time. Any more? All right, so if, you, if, if there was a question I didn't get to, more than welcome to DM me or email me. I'd love to answer them at any time. Um, thanks again for coming out. I'm going to stick around for a little bit. So if you want to come up and say hi, take a picture, or ask me something not in front of everybody, I can do that as well. Uh, thanks again for coming out, and thanks to Lower Left for hosting us again. That's it. Wait, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. All right, go ahead. So Clay is going to say something real quick from the weather service. Hey, everyone. I'm Clay Cheney, meteorologist here at the National Weather Service office. Um, just wanted to say that was a great presentation by Brad. I um, just wanted to follow up just really quick in terms of, uh, you know, what we're looking for in terms of spotters. So, of course, we want you to report any types of weather, um, severe winter weather, flooding, um, those sorts of things, as Brad had mentioned in his presentation. Um, the best way to get that to us is to submit a report. Um, we have a website that you can go to. Um, you can also go to our Facebook page, Twitter page. Um, you can also send us an email. Um, guessing the email may be, be gsp.spotter at noaa.gov. Um, you can also use your mobile app as well for um, MPing alerts. So MPing alerts, if you have, you know, radar scope or if you download the MPing app um, on your smartphone, you can actually give us reports that way as well. Um, so, yep, thanks for joining, you know, Brad Spotter Talk.
it was a really good one. And the I know down at the bottom left there, you can actually see um, the form that you can fill out to actually get certified as a spotter. We do not do certifications for um, spotters. We do spotter IDs now. Um, so whenever you apply, you will get a spotter ID, but you will not get a certificate. Um, get our contact information, um, and you do run into a report that you want to give to either Brad or us here at the National Weather Service office. Um, we definitely appreciate that. And um, we also, as Brad had mentioned in his presentation, um, to give us as full description as you can. Um, these help us to verify our alerts that we put out, so the severe thunderstorm warnings, tornado warnings, and such. Um, those help to verify, and um, like Brad had mentioned as well, the people downstream or upstream from those warnings also get the uh, spotter reports, and they're able to kind of take heed and, uh, you know, rely on those reports and let them know that the storm that's ongoing can impact you and possibly will impact you if you are in the track of it. But uh, thank you guys for joining the Spotter Talk. And with that, I'm out unless there are any questions. I'm out unless there are any questions. Thanks, Clay. All right, guys, as you can see, GSP's website is pretty easy. Go to weather.gov backslash GSP. There's a lot of great information there. If you want to contact them if you need a spotter ID as well. Um, we're the great partners with us. We work in tandem with the Weather Service, like Clay said. Um, Clay's actually up from this area, so he, he grew up in, uh, I think grew up in Cleveland County, if I'm not mistaken, so Clay's from this area. So um, we like work with those guys, and, and Trish down there, they're, they're MIC, which is great. So thanks again to Clay, and thanks everyone coming out today. Oh, these are Brooks. Having him every time. Um, it's our second time he's been here, and maybe we'll get him again. Um, but thank Yay. you again, Brad. Thank you, everybody. Hi everyone, Vanessa Rufus here with WCNC Charlotte. Thank you so much for joining this town hall today. As we've been previewing on air and online, just letting folks know leading up to this town hall, we're gonna be talking about National Suicide Prevention and Awareness Month. This is a really important topic that a lot of folks in our community um, are grappling with right now. We've talked about the impact of um, mental health issues on our young people, um, on our veterans. So we are hoping to start the dialogue today, maybe get some great resources out there, answer some questions for folks. And we've got some very um, knowledgeable panelists who will be joining us um, this afternoon to talk about this. You know, we've witnessed a record spike really in suicide deaths um, last year. We had more than 49,000 people uh, take their own lives in 2022, and that is an increase of nearly 3% from 2021. So we know that um, any any death by suicide is, is too many, one too many. So we want to talk about just awareness of this issue and what folks can do to either help themselves or help loved ones in their circle who might be dealing with these struggles. Uh, so we do want to go ahead and bring in our panelists here with us today. Um, if that's possible, we've got folks standing by. We've got two people. We have Lisa DeShantis, who is a crisis services team lead with North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. And we also have Matt Simon, who is a licensed family therapist, with New Hope Treatment Center. So I do want to thank both of you for joining us today. And um, just a reminder for folks, once again, who are watching at home, we have folks tuning in on WCNC Plus. We have folks who are on the YouTube channel for WCNC Show. We have folks who are joining us on social media as well. So please, um, anyone who is watching at home, feel free to ask questions. We have the experts here to help you, and uh, we will get to your questions uh, as soon as we can. But we want to actually just start here with some of um, the main questions that we've been getting from folks leading up to this, um, and really just... Um, wanting to talk about maybe the warning signs, things that people should be looking out for in their loved ones. Uh, it, it feels like it could be a tricky situation to maybe try to discern 
um, comments that a loved one might be making, you know, at what point do I need to start to be concerned? So um, Nat or Lisa, whoever feels comfortable jumping in first, let's talk about warning signs. So, hi, thanks for having me. Um, so, yeah, we want to be able to help people in really recognizing that. And one thing is that there is never just one warning sign, usually, when someone is uh, thinking about suicide or experiencing uh, a behavioral health crisis. Um, there are history, you know, there may be a history of depression or mental illness, though, in with that person, um, there might be a recent crisis that they have experienced, and that could be personal, that could be work-related, uh, that you know could be family, friends, social. A uh, person can be isolating socially. Uh, a previous attempts at suicide can be a warning sign. Also, if someone has had a previous attempt, uh, substance misuse is another common one, and. Uh, Interpersonal or family difficulties or conflicts uh, can can definitely be a warning sign. Um, Matt, did you want to add to that at all? No, yeah, I think that's um, that's great, and I, I want to say thank you as well, and thanks for everybody who's tuning into this um, really important topic. So, yeah, at least I think you got. I mean, there's it's such an individualized thing. Obviously, there are some trends and things to look for. What I would tell folks is if you have a loved one that you're even have an inkling of concern about is to not ignore that. Um, don't minimize it. I think that's that's honestly what I would caution against. I think sometimes we're we're really quick to believe that well that that could never happen to my aunt or my sister or my brother or my my child. Um, that's that that thing happens to other people and they're just going through a phase and they'll bounce. Some of those things might be true, but I, I would just urge folks um, right now to to not take that for granted and not take things lightly. And if you have a concern um, to really, really lean into those people, um, I think if anybody is dealing with suicidal thoughts and feeling that level of hopelessness, that that isolation is one, one of the overriding feelings that they're feeling. And even if part of their brain kind of wants to stay isolated, a huge, huge part of them, I think, is really craving um, connection. So. Yeah, there's so many warning signs, it's hard to go through all of them. And so, so, you know, my warning signs might look different than Lisa's warning signs, but people who love people and who are concerned about people typically know, have a gut feeling if something's off. And then sometimes we override that and minimize it and go on with our day. And that's what I would caution people not to do. You know, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that, you know, not wanting to minimize things because we have done countless reports over you know recent months and of course recent years particularly with the pandemic kind of bringing to light and maybe even exacerbating some mental health concerns for folks but um you know one report actually that was fairly recent that sticks out in my mind is a mother who worked from home who didn't even know that her daughter had tried to take her own life i believe it was actually mm -hmm. twice and she's mm -hmm. in that home you know with her with her child and had no idea that this was going on and that her child was struggling and i guess you know if we could turn the spotlight now to talk about young people and um, we know that suicide is one of the leading causes of death for young people within you know 2021 we saw it being the second leading cause of death for those um the ages of 10 to 14. and um how do you even start that conversation um it just feels like such a heavy topic to maybe try to broach with a child do you have any advice for what you know how parents can start a dialogue with their kids just to kind of check in and see how they're doing? Yeah, I, I can try. And again, you know, um, and Vanessa, I appreciate you calling us experts, but I think Lisa and I would probably both acknowledge we're also just people and parents trying to navigate our ways through through really tough situations too. I think there's not not always a, a perfect way to do things. Um, there's probably a lot of wrong ways to do it, but not always a perfect way. What I would say is to be direct. I'd encourage parents to be really, really direct. Again, I think sometimes you you so badly do not want your kid to be struggling at that level um, that it's easy to beat around the bush and even ask leading questions to say, hey, you know, um, you doing okay? If you if you say you're doing okay, that sounds like you want them to answer yes and then move on with your day and move on with your life. Um, and that might give you kind of a false sense of security um, instead of actually saying, you know, I'm, I'm really, really concerned about you. I've noticed you're being in your room more. 
are you having any thoughts of hurting yourself? Are you having any thoughts of suicide? I, th I think it's really hard actually just to say the word, um, but it has power and, and it could be an invitation for a young person to actually kind of unburden themselves when again, actually um, that, that story highlights a lot of kids and a lot of people suffer in silence and they actually don't want to be a burden on their loved ones. And so these attempts are not something that are usually kind of big public displays. Um, so I would encourage folks to be really, really um, direct without being, you know, punitive or coming across as you're angry or mad or disappointed, but you do have to be, I would encourage folks to be direct and actually use the word suicide or suicidal thoughts or something in that ballpark, as opposed to just kind of a, a vague check-in, because you could miss, you could miss the mark with that. I have to agree. Um, absolutely, Matt, when you, when you say that, um, you have to be direct when talking to your, your kids. Um, and I would encourage that, um, you know, talk to other parents, talk to school counselors about having those conversations as well. If you don't know how to have those conversations, because there is support out there for parents as well to be able to have those conversations, use those words, um, and make sure that you're really addressing what needs to be addressed. Yeah, that, that, that jumped out to me too, Lisa. Uh, Vanessa, the story that you were just saying, I think it's so important again as parents and not easy, especially for parents of adolescents, but um, obviously at some level, they're being raised by a village of people who aren't you and there's some developmental norms there. There's certainly a time in my life where um, I was more apt to talk to some of my um, youth workers or coaches or something like that faster than I would ever share something with my parents. Um, and that's not because they necessarily did anything. That was just, that was the stage of life I was at. So there were other adults in my life that potentially were gonna be more dialed in um, to my day-to-day -day feelings than my parents were, but my parents usually knew who those people were. So they kind of knew who my circle was and my circle of adult influence. And if you're a parent out there raising a kid, you, you gotta know the other adults who are in and around your kid's life. Um, that could be a, make a world of difference. You know, I guess I'm just wondering, you know, in, in doing these stories and in, in talking about this um, really important topic, I feel like a lot of folks might have the question of why, you know, like, why are we seeing so much more um, highlighting of mental health concerns and, and unfortunately, you know, suicide? Um, and I, I just go back to, you know, and I'm sure there's not one particular answer, right? But, you know, social media, and I just think about yeah. kids these days growing up with that really heavy element that's a big part of their lives. Um, not a lot of us grew up with that as like a constant, steady influence in our lives. I don't know if you have any thoughts on, you know, maybe just like why we're seeing this right now. Yeah, Lisa, I'll, I'll jump in for a second, and you can you can clean me up anything I get wrong, and I could probably do a five-hour town hall about um, the damages of social media on young people. But yeah. I, I do, you know, the re there it is. It's not been around long, but it has been around long enough for some pretty solid research to show, particularly its negative impact on young girls and 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 their uh, rates of anxiety and depression. It's um, it's incredibly damaging. Um, now it's a reality we have to figure out. It's not going away. So we do have to figure out a way to navigate it, but it is having an absolutely detrimental impact on young people's um, mental health, particularly young women's mental health. Absolutely, and and the I think as as parents um, and trying to navigate that with your kids and knowing what they're doing online is is really important and what they're connecting, uh, who they're connecting with, because social media um, and uh, phones and, and that that connection to so many people, um, you know, there's not only the, there, there is, there is definitely some good out there. There's some positive influence out there um, as well, but there is a lot of negative too. And a lot of that is held inside and there's mm -hmm. that lack, you know, sometimes of communication and talking with people and talking those, what they just saw online out. Um, when I, when I think about it as, you know, when we used to watch TV or watch shows, it was all in front of everybody. It was in the living room. It was with everybody. And now there's just that isolation that you can also see with just the social media 
and not having that outlet sometimes to have those conversations about what they just saw, what they just experienced um, on, on social media or online. Is that to say that maybe it is worth doing more regular check-ins, just having general conversations with your kids about, you know, what are you seeing online and how does that make you feel? Is it worth for some folks, and I know, you know, kind of the genie's out of the bottle with some kids, um, but maybe I know some parents, for example, who have delayed as long as possible getting that, getting that smartphone for their kid and getting them access, mm. like they just push it as long as they can go before um, letting their kids loose online. Um, I, I guess what sort of recommendations do you have for parents trying to navigate social media? I know it's hard, you know, there are positives to social media too. I know you, you mentioned sure. that, Lisa, but how do you kind of mitigate the negative stuff in the best way? Yeah, it's, I, have, I have an eight-year-old and a five-year-old, um, eight-year-old and five-year-old daughters, and my five-year-old asked, when is my eight-year-old going to get her first phone? And I said, I think like 2045, maybe like 2040. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, and because I, I, I honestly, because some of it, I, I don't. It's really hard. I mean, I would say just because something's hard doesn't mean you can't try. You don't try, and you have to try. So you do have to try to monitor. You do try to have to put, I think, some boundaries. And, and again, that is, that's the case for any parent raising any young person in any time, right? Around anything is like we have to put up some boundaries. We have to understand that there's going to be resistance to those boundaries. We have to understand that there's going to be resistance if you're not the cool parent who is permitting everything under the sun. Um, but I would not encourage folks to be the cool parent when it comes to unbridled social media access. I think what's challenging now is it just, it's more likely than ever, uh, or more uh, able than ever for a kid to be just, your kid to be having a completely different parallel life than what you are aware of. Um, completely different persona, completely different groups of friends and peers and influences and information. The, the, the ability to control what's coming into your kids um, you know, brain and heart on a daily -day basis is just harder than ever. So yeah, you do have to try. I do think it starts fun, like foundationally with the relationship you have with your child, um, the level of transparency, the level of openness. Um, if you encourage your child to be open and then the first time that they're open, you snap at them or you come down hard on them or you judge them, that is informing, you just told them actually that you don't want them to be open with you. Um, so again, there's some I don't know if there's a perfect playbook out there yet because this is all so, so new on the landscape, but trying to have an open, trusting, uh, non judgmental relationship. Um, and then again, trying to not, you know, trying to understand that we all, in different ways, we didn't have social media, but we all had some behaviors and some lives and some dynamics and some relationships that we didn't want our parents to know about growing up. So there's also some of this falls within the, the range of just normal adolescence. Um, but again, being so dialed in that you can tell the difference or again, really just monitoring, is my child's mood and behavior changing? Are they starting to regress in school? The thing that they love doing, are they all of a sudden stop? Have they stopped doing that? That can be signs, again, that we're not dealing just with normal teenage angst, but we're actually dealing with something that's getting into dangerous territory. Lisa, any thoughts? I, no, I, I agree. I think, you know, it is it is a whole, there is no playbook on this, right? We're all navigating this. But uh, again, um, I, I agree with everything that Matt said. I'm wondering, I mean, as, as mental health professionals, are you noticing more families reaching out for help than before? Um, and, and if so, I guess, um, what is your take on that? Because I know more people reaching out might not necessarily mean more mental health crises than we were dealing right. with before, but maybe just more people feeling comfortable reaching out for help. So I'd like to take that and I'll, I'll bring that back to um, the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline um, here in North Carolina. And I want to highlight just that about 10% of the calls that actually come into the call center um, are on behalf of somebody else. So that is calling for a family member, calling because they're facing some kind of, um, you know, friend or family or, or even, a, you know, a coworker, colleague, um, that they're noticing that, you know, how do I get this person some help because I see something different happening. Um, so I, I think that's, that highlights that we are seeing people that are reaching out on behalf of others. Yeah, and I think, I think Vanessa, you're kind of 
what we've noticed in, at New Hope and um, other organizations I've been a part of, especially since the since COVID, is conversation around mental health seems to have been normalized nationally more than it ever had been before. The conversation even around things like trauma, childhood trauma, um, that's all good stuff. I think that's really, really good stuff. So we're like we're, we're normalizing. So I think there are probably folks who suffered in silence who are now more apt to speak. Um, and then I do think there was truly some detrimental. Um, some, some harm uh, that happened over the last few years of, of, of isolation and fear and anxiety and, and th all things COVID related, particularly on young people um, that did have an in actual impact on that generation that went through it. Um, and then you add in social media. So I think, yes, there is probably some things that are worse today than they were. And then there's also awareness. So it's kind of two pronged. So the answer to the short, you know, the short answer is yes, we are getting more calls than ever before. It can feel like there's more mental health um, need than ever before. The optimist part of me though says there's more resources than there's ever been. There's more dialogue, there's more training, there's more access to care than there's ever been. Um, so that that's the, we can couple those things together. Um, so if, if folks want help, I truly believe that folks want help. Um, if you reach out for it and you're persistent and you get plugged into the right organization or at least this point, you know, you put some call, you know, 988 is a really new thing in our country. Uh, it's a great new resource, and that 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 didn't come. That came from recognition that um, mental health is a real thing, and it needs to be dealt with differently than other types of crises. And um, that's awesome stuff. At the end of the day, that's going to be really good for us. Speaking of um, resources and nine eight eight, you know, obviously we've talked about that. We've alluded to how you can call, you can text, and and you can get help either for yourself or or for a loved one in in a crisis, but. I guess I'm just, I'm wondering, as far as preventative stuff, I mean, what would you recommend folks do before we get to the point where we're calling 988 and we, like, need help right now? Yeah, go ahead, Lisa. So I say have the conversations. Again, it all goes back to those conversations. And if you notice that something is, yeah, you know, off a little bit, if, if there's, there are some signs, some of those signs, some of those awareness, um, you know, some of those, uh, you know, things that we talked about in the beginning about um, you're noticing changes, then you're really looking at, you know, talk to somebody, talk to a primary care doctor, talk to anyone. Um, there are resources out there in every community. Uh, there are, you know, there are also, you know, some of those other prevention um, uh, things that, you know, are being, done across the state are um, by our sister agency, um, Division of Public Health, they're, they're working a lot on um, making sure that there's awareness out there on, on uh, making sure that you're locking up firearms, that you're making sure that drugs are out of, uh, out of um, like narcotics or prescription medications are not easily accessible. So these are things that we can do as prevention. It's also, um, there's a lot of community trainings out there that are, you know, out for the public. There's mental health first aid that anyone can take and really start to understand what those signs and symptoms are. Um, and those are usually offered in every community and they're usually free of charge, um, you know, to really help everyone understand so that when somebody is facing that, they know how to get the help in the and the resources in their communities. Yeah, that's, that's, those are fantastic specific resources. The, the kind of broad statement I would maybe make is just, I think you treat mental health like any other type of health. And the earlier you can get support for challenges at the lowest possible level, the better chance of success. So there are counselors out there that are trained to work with youth as young as three, four, five years old. There's models of counseling that work for youth as, as that young. Um, like anything, like in, in health, if I, I have a heart issue and I let that go untreated for 15 years, the likelihood that that's going to need to be treated in an ER is really, really high, and my chances of, of success is much lower than if I did more preventative maintenance. Um, so that goes for individuals, that goes for couples doing preventative work. We're, we're just, you know, we're not great at that as human beings. We're really good at rallying when something's really about to break. Um, we're not so great at, at doing the investments in the small things. So 
Yeah, I think again for parents, I, I focus a lot on parents and kids just at the earliest signs of, of challenges. Um, you know, get them to see a counselor, and not just them to see a counselor, have the family go see a counselor, try to open some lines of dialogue. And you're not committing for your whole life. You're not saying that my, me and my family are going to be in counseling forever. Um, but maybe just during that chapter it might be the most important thing that you did. And you'd rather do it now than, I promise you'd rather do it then than 10 years later. So true. Yeah, I guess, and I'm, we, we've mentioned the pandemic a few times now, how that has likely added to maybe what has been existing for some folks or brought to light, maybe something that people didn't know that they could feel or deal with. Do you think it's normal for folks, even as, you know, we're getting pretty removed from the pandemic at this point, you know, the lockdowns and the isolations, et cetera. Do you think it's normal for folks to still feel not quite right, even after, you know, we've, we've gone months at this point, um, years, really, since, since we've had to deal with, like, some of the heavy stuff of, of lockdown and isolation? I would say absolutely. Um, I, you know, everybody is, everybody handled um, that, that, and it was trauma for some people. Um, it was, it was definitely a trauma um, to be all of a sudden a very social person and be told that you have to stay home or youth um, that, you know, I, I can't go see my friends. I can't go play with them. I can't, I can't have a birthday party. You know, I can't, you know, all of those, all of those things that, um, uh, you know, and, and really we were told to be afraid and not stand next to people and not do that. So especially for our youth that were, were you know, they were told those things. Um, there definitely can be that, uh, con that can continue. Um, you know, not only that, but I don't know, it, you know, occasionally, you know, you hear somebody coughing a lot and you're like, Ooh, I better back up, you know? Um, you know, those are not things that I think that a, a lot of people really thought of before um, the pandemic. So it, especially when we talk about this with, with our kids and, and our young adults now that are trying to navigate that and um, trying to regain those social years, um, especially, yeah. you know, when they missed so much of that um, and, and now say, oh, it's OK, go back and do it all again it's it's a it's a weird dynamic to put them in yeah that's a good point yeah i think the impact the impact of it usually la lags behind and sometimes it can lag behind 12 to 18 months yes yeah, you know somebody lost somebody during the pandemic and wasn't able to go get their hospital bed there's just i mean just a lot of stuff and then people who actually lost you know people to um covet and then just you know who passed away because of that so that's it's there's just a lot there, um, it's a, and it, I think it impacted our, our social fabric a little bit. I think it impacted our communities a little bit. I think just the tension kind of ratcheted up across a lot of communities. So, um, yeah, and again, like to Lisa's point, I think some people were able to just like flip it off like a switch and kind of go back to normal and just say, hey, that was a weird thing, you know, let's just move on. But I think for some folks, it is completely normal for, uh, I think Lisa pointing out there's kind of a um, trauma response, and, and a lot of times, the symptoms of trauma lag behind the actual traumatic event itself, which is why sometimes people have a hard time, you know, putting those things together. So, you know, my child's kind of depression and isolation, the fact that that might be related to something he experienced 18 months ago is, is hard to connect, but it can be for sure. I think that's important for folks to know. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, we've been talking a lot about children and, and young people and, and how, you know, they're dealing um, with this, and this is a particularly important group to talk about, but I feel like another important group is veterans. Um, we know, according to the VA, that an average of 16 to 17 veterans died by suicide every day in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, this is a group that needs, needs the resources. I, I don't know if you are able to speak on that, um, maybe just some of the trauma that our veterans deal with and, and the resources that they need when they come home or, you know, try to reintegrate into civilian life. Yeah, Lisa, I'd be, I'd be, I'd love to hear in terms of state. Yeah. Um, so again, yes, I mean, veterans in, in North Carolina, um, definitely, you know, we have a lot of veterans here. Um, you know, we have, uh, not only the veterans crisis line, 
that is available um, to individuals that want to reach out. Uh, there is um, lots of, of resources and community um, support usually around that, but it's it's getting it's getting people into there, right? Um, again, you know, like, like Matt just mentioned, you know, trauma is not immediate. Sometimes it goes. Sometimes it's a little bit longer of a process, and and it's not just when somebody um, you know comes comes home from being in the military that they need that support that's ongoing for, for long periods of time. Um, our, our veterans work um, is very robust. Um, and I think that there still needs to be more because we have more and more um, uh, individuals that are uh, you know, needing that support in the community. Again, trying to make sure that we're treating it right at the beat. You know, it, we have resources available when someone is starting to experience symptoms rather than letting it get uh, very, uh, get to a crisis situation. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, again, I think the state of North Carolina, like Lisa said, actually does have a lot of resources. It can be frustrating, I think, at times to try to navigate the systems. Um, so I, again, I just encourage folks don't, don't give up. Keep calling. I promise there's probably, there's really, really good case managers and care managers out there that want to help. Um, and again, I think the way we talk about these issues is important, particularly for like the veterans community. That is, you know, this is not a weakness. Um, this is not something that makes you weak. And again, I think the way that we sometimes view PTSD as, um, a, you know, as a debilitating thing, it is a really serious thing, but it's a, it's also something that if, you're living with and you're navigating that just shows how strong you are shows how resilient you are um so i, I think some of the language that we use around this is really important because although i think we move the needle a little bit probably around mental health stigma within um our military community there's still a lot of room to go i think there's a lot of folks who don't want to admit um just how traumatic their experience was which i i think just by nature the whole thing is traumatic um, it doesn't make it bad it doesn't make it and it, it, it doesn't make it less honorable it's actually it's unbelievably honorable that you would willingly sign up for something that is basically almost by default a traumatic experience. Um, so we should be inclined to really take, try to take care of everybody and almost assume, assume trauma as opposed to waiting for the symptoms to show up. Um, I think we need to assume that this was like a traumatic experience and, and register at some level on the head or on the heart um, in a way that we need to care for. But again, not pathologize and not make somebody feel strange or weird or weak or, um, you know, less of a soldier, um, that, that's not the case at all. I'm wondering if there are things um, that folks at home could do to help. Um, many of us watching are not mental health professionals, but when you hear about kids who are in mental anguish, you hear about veterans who are in mental anguish. I mean, is there anything that the everyday person can do help with that? Sure, yeah, I, I can, oh, go ahead, Lisa. I, I, no, no, please go back, please. Um, I mean, I think the answer is yes, Vanessa, and, I, and I'll, try to, I'll try to keep this in, um, I'll try to keep it short. But yeah, I think the average, because I think, I think, yeah, we're mental health professionals, but we're also, we're just normal people too, who live in our lives and go to the grocery store and trying to raise kids and trying to go to jobs and do all those things. So I think, again, the way that we, this is going to be hokey, maybe, but again, I think it starts and ends with how we treat each other um, as people, as neighbors, as citizens, as communities. Um, that, that's, that's a big part, I think, of what we've lost. I think that's a big reason why some of the mental health stuff has been exacerbated. I just don't think we talk to each other like we used to. I don't think we care for each other the way we used to. I don't think we look out for each other the way we used to. Um, you know, when, I, when I grew up as a kid, and this makes me sound like an old man, but it's like, you know, I think my neighbors, they, they looked out for me just as much as my parents did. You know, they, they, they monitored, they monitored what was going on. They kind of knew what was going on. There's just more of a communal sense. And um, now I think people go into their homes and they stare at their iPhones and they binge Netflix, which is all good. I stare at my, my iPhone and I binge Netflix too, but we have to get out and we have to keep connecting with each other. I think so much of this um, mental health crisis is really a crisis of a lack of connection and a lack of relationships, a lack of meaningful relationships. Um, and I think whether you're a mental health professional or not, that we all crave that as human beings. And I think no amount of technology is going to supplement that. So I think we all just need to keep on 
doing the best we can in our individual lives. Um, so that, that's my kind of hokey answer, but I think that's true. If people actually want to really just involve themselves in the mental health space, I think plugging into organizations like NAMI is a really great way um, to do things. There's, there's phenomenal local chapters and state chapters of NAMI basically everywhere um, that have awesome uh, awareness campaigns, places you can give money and time and volunteer. That's a way to like just you know directly connect if mental health is something that really draws people. Absolutely, and I would also add to that, and I know I mentioned it just briefly, but mental health first aid. A lot of us are CPR, first aid trained. Well, you know what? There's a mental health first aid course out there um, that really just, it, it gives you the resources to understand. It gives the education on, on mental, basic mental health and uh, substance use disorders. Um, and it can be, you know, I mean, we all, Many of us, I should say, not all, but many of us have to do like a first aid or a uh, CPR training. Well, it's important to get that mental health first aid training as well. That's a great point. Yep, great point. And there's a youth specific one and a regular one. That's so great to know. I mean, I, I had no idea. I mean, personally, I had no idea that there was something like that out there. So I think folks would be um, interested to learn that and hopefully maybe take part in, in one of these courses. Um, we've talked about 988 and um, how that's obviously pretty new, relatively new. That's something that really came as policymakers really got behind something that they thought would be beneficial to the public. We know that some lawmakers are looking into something called a suicide safety plan. And I didn't know if either of you or both of you could talk about what a suicide safety plan is and how that would work. For folks? So a, a suicide safety plan is, is really just thinking about, um, uh, you know, when someone is not in crisis, that's the time that you make a safety plan. So when you're really thinking about, um, you know, it, when things don't look good for me, what does that look like? Um, what happens when I'm in a crisis or what sign, what, what are some things um, that might be different? And really looking also at not only that, but what are some things that have helped me in the past? If someone has um, experienced behavioral health or, or substance use crisis in the past, or um, you know, that's something that they can work on and understand what helps them and really have a plan in place before a crisis goes into play, it, you know, before someone ends up in crisis to help alleviate that maybe, you know, lack of a better term, like, it, you know, get somebody into the help or the treatment or the services or the support that they need faster rather than letting it continue to escalate. Um, and it's really about getting that person's buy-in and that person is really making their own plan for when they're unable to make a plan. Wow. Okay. So it's a it's almost like a self self made plan that m maybe a person would clue loved ones into. This is this is right. what I want you to do for me. If right. you start to notice X Y Z. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What makes me feel better isn't necessarily what makes Lisa feel better. How somebody should approach me on my worst day isn't the same as how somebody should approach Lisa on their first day. So I'll. You know, the, the kids we serve in my, one of my programs um, is every every kid has a safety plan that's individualized to them that basically says, hey, these are the three things that you don't do when I'm when I'm uh, in a bad way, and these are the three things that you should do when I'm in a bad way. Um, and that's that's different for every kid, and usually their their success um, hinges on their own aware their own self awareness of those things, and then the people around them their ability to kind of navigate that. Um, yeah, it's a great thing, and I, I don't, I've not I've not heard about the legislation piece around that. But if there's some way to again keep trying to scale that or normalize that, or um, that that sounds like nothing but a good thing. Um, as we kind of get towards the tail end here of this town hall, I wanted to see if I could ask both of you um, if there's anything specific that you were hoping to talk about, or just something that initially came to mind when we came to you and said, "Hey, let's let's." 
have this town hall and suicide prevention month. Is there anything that you were like, I really wish that we could have the opportunity to say this? And um, I'll let whoever wants to go first take that. Lisa, I defer to you. Go for it. So, uh, you know, again, I think it all, it all comes back to is we can't be afraid to ask the questions. We need to start talking about this more. Um, I, I really thank you for having this and really talking about this um, because I, I really, uh, I was just, I, I, I was happy to be a part of this. I was excited to be able to talk about this. Um, you know, my, my kids know that I talk about prevention um, pretty much all the time. My family knows about that. Like that's, that's what I do. I'm, I'm here into any forum that I can have to talk about um, resources that are out there and supports for people. Uh, I'm really just glad to, to get the word out and spread the word and um, know, I, I just, I think the biggest thing is that we want everybody to know that there is always someone there to talk to. If you're having a bad day, if things are not going right, there is always someone there to talk to. And that, you know, where, you know, we always have someone that can respond if you need somebody in, per, in you know, um, out in the community, that there are places that people can go. So you're never alone. And I think that's the biggest message that we want to just get out there is that there are supports and there are, there is help out there. Yeah, I love that. I don't think I can make that much better, but I'll just reiterate again, North Carolina has a ton of resources. I actually just got back from a trip down to um, Texas, and I think North Carolina is a resource-rich state when it comes to mental health. We can always do better, but there are thousands of extremely talented therapists and mental health workers, and um, I promise there's a therapist out there for you. And therapy is not an exact science. I'm a therapist myself, and um, it's, it's not an exact science. It's more of an art than anything else, and it's really about that connection and that relationship. So you might not get it right the first time, um, it might not be the right fit the first time, but I promise there is a, a helping professional out there that was put on this earth to help you through your thing. Um, and, and we all have a thing, and we all have chapters of our life where we need that person. So again, um, the reason I wanted to be a part of this is just because I think anytime we can be normalizing that life is a roller coaster, and we're all holding, there's all times where we're just holding on for dear life, and um, it's okay, and it's, it's normal to go through times of hopelessness, and it's hard to see a light at the end of the tunnel that again there is light um, life is worth living you are meant to be here um so anybody out there who is struggling please please reach out again I'll, you know the 988 thing i'm hoping in 10 years when my when my girls are becoming adults that that's just a normal part of their you know daily existence and they know that they've got this this lifeline anytime they need it but it's existing now so please please use it if you need it wonderful um well i think that we've tackled a lot of great questions here and hopefully given some folks some good resources and some hope too, right? Because I mean, like both of you said, it, it can sometimes feel hopeless for folks. Like maybe this is never going to end and this is just how they're going to feel forever. And I mean, obviously, as, as both of you have reiterated, that is simply not true. I mean, there's help for folks out there and um, there's, there's, there's someone waiting, as you mentioned, Matt, to, uh, to connect you to the help and the resources that you need, a good fit for folks um, looking for, you know, a guiding hand here. So uh, we'll just, once again, let folks know 988, that's a great resource, uh, call or text. If you do feel like you are in a crisis and you need the help, um, reach out to a loved one, reach out to a mental health professional. Please don't suffer in silence. We want to thank Lisa DeShantis once again with North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services and Matt Simon uh, with New Hope Treatment Centers for joining us. And we do thank you for joining us at home or wherever you are joining us from um, on WCMC Plus, the YouTube channel, and on social media. Um, continue the dialogue at home, folks, and we hope that you are well and have a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody.
Now to Gastonia, where the city is making plans after getting a $250,000 donation from an anonymous donor. However, that donor says the money must go towards improving the aesthetics of some busy roadways. WCNC Charlotte's Jesse Pierre shares more about how this money will be used. Yes, the city of Gastonia received a very generous gift and the money will be used to make the area surrounding several interchanges more appealing to the eye. Anything to do to beautify this area, it's going to be seen. Along US 321 and just under a mile from I-85 is Allen's Mobile Home and RV Supplies. Owner Billy Linhart says one thing he can count on seeing outside his doors is a flow of cars. Just probably almost doubling how much traffic I've seen out here in just the nine years that I've been here. But now, due to a generous donation, drivers can expect a more pleasant drive into Gastonia. Thanks to an anonymous $250,000 donation, three busy interchanges along I-85 will be freshened up. Those interchanges are at Cox Road, New Hope Road, and US 321. The first step, starting with some simple cleanup. The trash, the underbrush, the vine, I mean, just right. to, to clean that, and then the next step would be to uh, spruce it up. The money will also go towards replacing aging and broken fencing, planting grass and low maintenance shrubs. City leaders gave the green light for the beautification project to begin, despite some concerns of wasting money ahead of the I-85 widening project set to begin in a few years. Just hate to see them put a lot of landscaping plans in place, you know, plantings and things like that to have them yanked out in a matter of a short period of time. Mm -hmm. I think the conversation was had with the anonymous donor Yes, that that project would impact, and they said, go forth and do good things. City leaders hoping to save some of the money until after the widening project is done. Linhart says this will be a good look for the city. To give people an impression of Gastonia, to make them want to come back, to make them want to shop, stop, eat. He hopes it will make the congestion in the area more bearable and hopefully attract more foot traffic in. Jesse Pierre, WCNC Charlotte. In just a few hours, the ACC men's basketball tournament is set to tip off. This is one of several major tournaments going on this week. It all comes ahead of Selection Sunday when we'll get our first look at March Madness brackets. NC State plays Louisville this afternoon at 430. Duke and UNC have their first games of the tournament on Thursday. Well, these intense games sometimes lead to fans storming the court in excitement. But WCNC's Megan Bragg explains why that might not be a great idea in today's Verify. Buzzer beater moments are what the madness is all about. But sometimes those moments can cause harm to the players. This year, a Duke player was hurt after Wake Forest fans stormed the court after their win. So can fans be civilly liable if they injure a player while storming the court? Let's verify. Our sources, attorney Eric Hayes with James Scott and Farron Law Firm, the NCAA, and the ACC. The NCAA does not have a policy on storming the court and leaves punishment up to each conference. Duke and Wake Forest are in the ACC conference. Currently, the ACC does not have rules against it. However, NCAA spokesperson David Warlock told NBC News court storming is not allowed during NCAA tournament games, and they work with venues to develop a security plan to try and prevent it. They don't go into it thinking that they could be hurt during an after-game court storming incident. Attorney Eric Hayes says if a player is hurt by a fan because of court storming, they could be held liable for that injury. Fans are... Um, if not just negligent, maybe grossly negligent or reckless, whatever they are taking the court like that if they were to cause an injury to someone. What would the argument be for a fan who rushed the court, ran into a player and hurt them? I didn't mean to do it. Well, then you should have stayed in your seat. As for schools being held liable, that's still an open question. A player who was injured did sue the school and did settle the case. Whether or not a school could be held liable, I think that that is an open question and certainly one that schools would be concerned about. So we can verify that yes, fans can be held civilly liable if they injure a player while storming the court. With your Verify, I'm Megan Bragg. If you have something you would like verified, just email us at verify at wcnc.com. With your help, WCNC Charlotte is making a difference in our community. 
beautiful day, so many people helping. This is incredible. Let's spread that love tonight. Here is a $5,000 check that you guys can use to further the mission. There is nothing on earth like the feeling of giving back with your hands. $5,000 to you and uh, Block Love Charlotte for what you guys do. If you'd like to make a difference, go to wcnc.com slash make a difference now. Time now to connect the dots when we make the news make sense. Lots of kids hearing back from colleges and universities this week as schools release their decisions. But a few a new form has colleges and families asking, where's the money? Problems with a new financial aid system have both colleges and families waiting for answers. Let's connect the dots. Before families can make a decision on college, finances are often a huge factor. But colleges are in limbo as they still wait to receive information about applicants' finances. The root of the problem comes from the FAFSA website. That's where students can see if they qualify for aid. The Department of Education has been trying to overhaul the form for years. The changes use a new calculation called the Student Aid Index to determine how much a family should get. It's meant to benefit low-income students, but it hasn't been a smooth process. Some families say they're not getting as much aid as they should. Now, experts say you may want to consider appealing your case to try and get more money, hopefully in time to make a choice by College Decision Day on May 1st. And that is Connecting the Dots. Well, tomorrow is Canvas Day, where every county election board inside North Carolina will vote to officially certify the primary election results. The primary was the first election under a new state law saying mail-in ballots must be in by election day rather than getting that grace period. Yes, WCNC Charlotte's Julia Kaufman shows us how voting activists say this change discounts uh, legitimate or discounts legitimate votes, but supporters call it common sense. When North Carolinians voted by mail in previous elections, their ballots had a three day grace period to get to the county election office. That grace period is gone and now ballots marked as returned after deadline are piling up. 31. Under new state laws, absentee ballots need to get to the election office by 730 PM on election day to count. It was very unnecessary, very unfair to voters. The State Board of Elections tells WCNC Charlotte in the 2020 presidential primary, which had a higher voter turnout than in 2024, 800 ballots were returned after the three day grace period and not counted this year. 999 absentee ballots have been received so far that will not count due to missing the new deadline. There are people right now who did everything right and through no fault of their own, but the mail service not getting their ballot in time to the County Board of Elections, their vote won't count. Bob Phillips with Common Cause argues the new deadline hurts all absentee voters regardless of party affiliation. This law, I think, is going to contribute to that feeling that something is wrong with our elections. Supporters like the North Carolina Republican Party argue the new voting laws restore trust in elections. A spokesperson says, quote, the changes enacted by the General Assembly to strengthen election integrity and create one singular deadline worked as intended. These laws are reasonable, common sense efforts to create certainty and transparency in the election process. County election offices are required to notify voters if their vote did not count and explain why. That process will begin after the election is certified. Julia Kaufman, WCNC Charlotte. Verify, WCNC Charlotte. Verify is all about trying to make a difference in the community by making sure that the community has the correct information. This is what we know. And hey, this is what we don't know. Sometimes you're actually surprised by the answer. Verify the difference. Verify is a great way to combat that misinformation, making sure that people know the process of the reporting. Time now to connect the dots. When we make the news make sense, thousands of drivers are reporting their insurance rates are going up, and it could be thanks to data collected behind the scenes. A report shows cars made by GM, Ford, Honda, and other popular manufacturers are sending your data to insurance companies, and you may not even know about it. Let's connect the dots. In most of these vehicles, there's software tracking how you drive. It keeps data about 
when you're on the road, how fast you drive, and how quickly you brake. It's all thanks to the ability of newer cars to connect to the internet. And the New York Times reports all that data gets sent off to your insurance company for a personalized rate. And automakers say it's all legal, thanks to all those papers you sign when you buy a new car. That is Connecting the Dots. To this, another push to provide mental health resources to Carolina's most vulnerable students. We do thank you for sticking with us this evening for the news at six. I'm Vanessa Rufus and I'm Colin Mayfield. Now in the aftermath of a deadly school shooting in Uvalde, Texas, Congress dedicated money to help prevent future school violence and improve student mental health. But our where's the money investigation found new schools in the Carolinas are actually putting that money to use. Yeah, not many schools tonight, nearly yeah. two months after our Nate Morbido exposed this problem. South Carolina is making a second effort to deliver millions of federal dollars to students who are most at risk. When we discovered South Carolina had only awarded this money to a dozen school districts, the Department of Education said it would find a way to spend the rest of the money. Well, now if everything goes as planned, more than twice as many school districts could receive this potentially life saving money in round two. In Uvalde, Texas, a gunman murdered two teachers and 19 children. Almost two years later, millions of dollars in grants sit unused. Funds elected leaders approved to prevent another Robb Elementary School shooting. It makes no sense to me for these dollars to be offered by the federal government to be sitting in coffers while our schools are not as safe as they can be. We, we need to do better. It's a revelation WCNC Charlotte took all the way to the top. First with the Secretary of Education and then with the vice president herself. Well, that's part of why I'm here, to make sure that the money gets to where it needs to be going. These so-called Stronger Connections grants are meant to help school districts with high rates of poverty, bullying, absenteeism, and exclusionary discipline. Sometimes I just think I'm not sure how some of these children kind of survive their life. But York School District 1 is the only school system in the Charlotte area that's received a grant so far. The district is using the money to ensure every school has its own mental health therapist. My mission is to help these children who are struggling so much. South Carolina is hoping others will take notice of York's efforts. If you are eligible, please, please apply. The Department of Education opened a second round of applications this month. Records show more than 50 South Carolina districts are eligible and they have two months to submit their applications. We just want to make sure that this gets out there and we don't have to send any of it back. While South Carolina is moving on to round two, North Carolina has still not spent a single cent of this money. You can blame that on bureaucracy and delays in communication. Nate Morbido, WCNC Charlotte. Now to go further here, we asked some of the districts that did not apply in round one why not? The Lancaster County School District told us the timing was not good back then, but assured us if there was a second round, it would apply. So we alerted those district leaders earlier today that this opportunity is available to them. And so as you can see, Nate and our Where's the Money team are very hard at work. They are tracking those federal dollars. They're keeping receipts here. They're checking those. They're holding those in power accountable, really all in an effort to give you answers. So that being said, if you have something out there you think our team should be looking into, please let us know. You can send us an email to money at WCNC.com or reach out to our team on social media. Let's turn now to a look at your weekend forecast as we take a live look this morning from Dallas out in Gaston County. Good morning to you all. Larry, it's a bit of a foggy start today. Mm -hmm. We'll fog out the area here on the St. Patrick's Day weekend. Got your green on mm -hmm. in honor of the Irish, you know, because we have to work in the green environment over there. No it green. Makes it a little hard. But we do have a lot of green that we can show, and that's what we're talking about is this St. Patrick's weekend. You know, there's so many times in this time of the year you, you can get rainy condition, you get cold and misty, but not, not this weekend. We're right on 74 degrees, so perfect for the big parade in uptown and for the festival that's going on all through the morning into the afternoon. And for St. Patrick's Day, tomorrow near 70. 
70 degrees, not bad at all. We take a live view from our, our Mr. Sparky Carolina Camera Network. That's right there, downtown Blowing Rock, North Carolina. Looking very nice there. A few fair weather clouds. Now, this is, <laughs> this is our camera from Ballantyne looking towards uptown. You can still see some, some uh, fog there. So you got some patchy and dense fog in a couple of spots, but not any issues out there from Monroe. Things looking okay. The old courthouse there looking off the distance. Just fair weather clouds. Should be a nice day across the region, but... We are still dealing with all of this amazing amount of pollen. It's the time of the year, so it's off the charts tomorrow and again on Monday. So high pollen count again today. Blame the trees. We love the trees, but they certainly could cause some issues out there. No issues once again with our forecast. 11 a.m., 62 degrees. Once again, that's when the parade starts in uptown Charlotte. Expecting thousands of people up there for the festival as well. Should be a fun time. And between about 4 and 6 today, we'll be in the low 70s. I would say there may be many, many spots that actually get into the mid-70s this afternoon, but I would say averaging about 70, 71 degrees across the area today. Not expecting rain. Rain, no storms. We scanned the skies. Rain is storm free. We did have the showers that moved across the area yesterday. It will expand the view. That system is off the Carolina coastline. Some showers off there and then way to the south of us across Florida. Once again, we're about 71 degrees right in the middle of the afternoon across the two state area today. The hot spot's going to be Charleston, South Carolina, 83 degrees out there and another coastal community, Cape Hatteras on the outer banks. 59. The cool reading will be in the mid 70s in Greenville, Spartanburg, Columbia, about 79 degrees. We got travel plans down there. The capital of South Carolina, the capital city of North Carolina, Raleigh at 70, 64 at Boone, over in Asheville at 71 degrees. In case you're heading to Biltmore, now watch this change in temperatures. We got nice weather this weekend. Look at those drops in the temperatures Monday and Tuesday. We see a rebound for the middle of the weekend towards the end of next week. Next weekend we'll see temperatures drop a few degrees below average for today. Boone hits about 64, blowing rock tops out about 63. Up around Jefferson, West Jefferson, low to mid 60s there. Morganton, Lenore, Tailsville, Hickory, Maiden, all much like we see here in our area. It'll be in the low to mid 70s and about the same from Monroe to Wadesboro to Rockingham and Chesterfield down there in South Carolina. Checking the guy roofing 70 forecast through the weekend and beyond. Low to mid 70s today. Tomorrow we'll look for mostly sunny skies. We put that 20% chance in. Most of the year has will not have a chance to rain at all. And then we see 58. That's right. That's not a mistake. That's 58 for high temperature on Monday. Tuesday morning, a frosty morning, cold at 32, high 59. Then we see a rebound Wednesday and Thursday. It looks like by next Friday, here we go, another Friday with a chance of showers with temperatures in the low 60s. That's your forecast this morning. WCNC Charlotte. Weather is a, a kind of science that you get to see and experience every day. And I think some people don't even realize how much it affects them. That weather has a huge impact on how it threatens your family, your livelihood, or your home. So I think it really is one of those defining things we do that really affects everybody in our community. See the difference. That process of giving you a warning ahead of time and keeping you and your family safe is really important to me because I live here too. It's my family, it's my friends, it's my neighbors. Well, an 11 year old boy with dreams of starting up his own landscaping business is getting some big help. We first told you about Quentin Hines earlier this week. Now he's getting a big boost, getting some fresh new tools. WCNC Charlotte's Miles Harris gives us a closer look. To see him at 11 with adult equipment um, is scary for me as a mom. <laughs> but it's just what he loves to do. By far one of our best mowers. Who would have thought an 11 year old would love to cut grass so much? That's exactly where Quentin Hines' passion lies, making a difference inside his community one lawn at a time. What do you like about cutting grass most or doing yard work, huh? I don't know, I just enjoy it, probably just beautifying lawns and yeah, making lawns look beautiful. We'll help you out all we can. He's getting a helpful hand from Cenex. The company caught Quentin's story and wanted to assist his service. Easier we can make that on him, whether it's lighter tools, uh, tools that move on our own uh, with just the squeeze of a handle, uh, whatever that is, uh, and then providing him with all the tools uh, that he needed. Not only adding more tools in the shed for Quentin, but also adding $1,000 to his GoFundMe. The fact that we're helping a young kid at a young age um, mold into what's going to be a very, very productive uh, and positive role model 
uh, in his community and in our community. Life lessons on generosity that his family surely appreciates. I think you know, this is really just showing Quentin now that people will stand behind you and support you know, saying your dream when you let it be known. Yeah. So I think that's very big for him at this early age. His next step might include getting more space. And with all the stuff that they're giving now, we're definitely going to need additional space to yeah. put this stuff. Yeah, oh, wow. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. Our garage is now gone. <laughs> <laughs> space to continue his dreams. What do you hope, big picture? What do you want to do? Um, just give like free services to senior citizens, help out other people, and just beautify lines. In Huntersville, Miles Harris, WCNC Charlotte. Unemployment rate is going in the right direction. There are many still struggling to find a job with a livable wage. Yeah, it is tough out there for many folks. The Charlotte Cooking School is helping people get ahead and get into the workforce, particularly by training them to prepare five star meals. Our Larry Sprinkle has been asking, where's the money? And for some folks, it's right there in the kitchen. 21 year old Courtney Allen, also known as Cam, moved to Charlotte a few months ago. Growing up, she always had the dream of playing basketball. I love basketball. But she also liked to cook. A few bad work experiences in the kitchen had her feeling like cooking was not a good fit, especially when combined with some difficult life experiences she was going through at the time. I was going through a lot before I came down here. Then she heard about the community culinary school. So I was able to see how it felt to be in a position that a real chef would be in. We are a 501c3 nonprofit that works with adults who've experienced barriers to long-term employment. Since 1997, skilled and professional chefs like Chef Ron have been helping students reach the goal of earning a living wage, creating delicious meals. The Community Culinary School of Charlotte gives back. We offer folks an opportunity to touch the success that they envision for themselves. And there is a hunger for the chefs who learn their craft here. As we emerge from COVID, the hospitality industry needs help and they need trained professionals. This training is just what Cam needs to give her the confidence to get back into the kitchen. My knife skills, yes. That prove you so much on your knife skills. Giving her the cutting edge, just like on the hardwoods. It's a passion. <laughs> I love basketball, so I made this a passion as well. So Cam is putting on a full court press to complete the training and take her victory lap. It's like you won a championship when you graduate. You get what I'm saying? It's like you won a medal. So hopefully I get my medal because I'm almost there. We are training hospitality folks so they have the ability to grow and, and uh, take care of themselves, their families, their community. Earning the title of chef isn't the end. It's just the beginning for Cam, who has a very big dream. It's hopefully in 10 years I have my own restaurant, my own staff, me working under me. Chopping it up on the east side of Charlotte, Larry Sprinkle, back to you. What's that old? WCNC Charlotte. Good morning, Carolinas. Tune in to the team that's preparing you for your day. The one and only Larry Sprinkle. See the difference in your morning. It is bitter cold just about anywhere you look. Here's a look right here at I-77 northbound. Trying to make your dollar stretch a little bit further. Responsible reporting, community focused, unique content. It's so good to see you. you too. Oh, y'all are having and too much like fun. This. See the difference weekday mornings on WCNC Charlotte. Now, burnout in nursing is on the rise, and this is an issue we've seen only get worse since the pandemic. There's no doubt. Right now, the American Nurses Association says it's more important than ever to understand how to manage and then prevent the condition. WCNC Charlotte's Lexi Wilson introduces us to a local nurse who is using comedy as her outlet. In uptown Charlotte, it's a real big deal to be invited here. The Bloomingthal Arts Stage Door Theater is a place with passion for local productions. The lighting, the sounds, the tech crew, uh, there's ushers here. We love the ushers. Debbie Millwater has a love for comedy. Comedy has played a huge part in my life. Even though I like to think that I'm funny, uh, my kids assure me that I am not. While she spent time on stage, she enjoys being a comedy show producer even more. <laughs> 
helping create shows like the 2024 March Mania Comedy Tournament, where 32 local comedians battle it out until there's one winner. It just lights them up inside. It's very validating. It's a light <laughs> Debbie also needs. I just celebrated my sixth anniversary as an overnight bedside nurse. These days, there's an urgent warning about the shortage of health care workers. Research shows burnout and fatigue are prevalent. It's something Debbie has felt, especially during the pandemic. Staffing numbers had dropped and uh, the complexity of the patients didn't change. She's worked in the COVID unit and now works with cancer patients, most of them fighting for their life. That's why the laughs made here are so important. Comedy definitely helped me push through I, not only the pandemic, but nursing in general. A love for comedy, rewarding on and off the stage. And the March Mania Comedy Tournament finale is this Friday here at Stage Door Theater at 7 p.m. Tickets are $10. Reporting in Uptown for WCNC Charlotte, I'm Lexi Wilson. What an empowering way, you know, to find a, a medium to get all of that out. It's not good to keep in either. So true, and, and it is a tough job. Man. Someone who comes from a family, mom's a nurse, yeah. cousins, nurses, yeah. aunts, nurses, those are special people. Humanity has to be <laughs> thankful, and uh, so I think sometimes we take them for granted. So. Good Wednesday morning. Now Zillow, which is a real estate market company, is doing some research on how much we need to make to afford a home without stretching the budget at least so much. Now the report can be very numbers heavy, but we broke it down like this. First, Zillow is finding that the income needed to comfortably afford a home is up 80% since 2020. Now keep in mind the median income has only risen 23% in that same amount of time. For those shopping for homes today, you need to be well in the six figure range. Zillow says you need to be making, taking home rather more than $106,000 a year. Then those researchers took that, those numbers and made a ranked list. They took 50 metro areas across the country and compared how much is needed to afford a house in each one. Charlotte came in at number 23. Now the ranking shows you would have to save for about nine years just to afford a 10% down payment. And as for possible solutions, well, the article points to an interesting trend. So it's called house hacking. It just means being able to rent out all or part of a home so you can get some extra cash. Zillow says at least 21% of last year's buyers reported co-buying with either a friend or a relative in order to save some money. So it's why we're asking if you'd be willing to take the same route this morning. Here's the question. Would you co-buy your house with a friend or a relative? Make sure you text us 704-329-3600. Wake up to the news that matters most with meteorologist and traffic reporter Chris Mulcahy. And we're all clear. We're keeping you smarter, safer, and on time. Start your day the Mulcahy way. See the difference. 430 to 7 on WCNC Charlotte. If you've ever received a bill or bought a ticket for a concert and noticed the price was a lot higher than you anticipated, you may have gotten hit with junk fees. But what exactly are they and can you combat them? WCNC Charlotte's Megan Bragg looks into it in today's Verify. So let's get the facts. Our sources are the Biden administration, a bill filed in the Senate, and Sarah Rathner with NerdWallet. Rathner says many people don't know this, but we're spending a lot of money each year on junk fees. These individual fees on their own might not seem like much, but added up all together, junk fees are costing American families tens of billions of dollars a year. A bill filed in the U.S. Senate known as the Junk Fees Prevention Act would make merchants disclose these hidden fees up front instead of hiding them at the very end of the transaction. Rathner says while this won't make these hidden fees any lower, it's still a step in the right direction. But it is going to make it easier for consumers to comparison shop knowing the final price and not just the initial price that's being advertised. This means if you're deciding between, let's say, two hotel rooms under the Junk Fees Prevention Act, both places would have to disclose any hidden fees before you get to the end of the checkout process. You can then choose which hotel works best for you. Rathner says since junk fees aren't going away, you'll need to include them in your budget. It is unfortunate that you can't always tell what something's going to cost until the very end. But really what might be helpful is just budgeting an additional amount of money. So if you think something's going to cost you $50, maybe budget $75 just in case. With your Verify Fact Check, I'm Megan Bragg. And if you have something you would like verified, just email us at verify at wcnc.com.
Meantime, right now at 6, learning can be a challenge for many students for a lot of different reasons. For students who are hard of hearing, though, those hurdles can be tougher to overcome. Now, a Charlotte family is pushing for CMS to change the way their child who is deaf is taught, saying the current system is too isolating. The state provides extra funding for each student who is deaf in public schools. However, the parents argue those dollars are not going to their child's education the way it's supposed to. That has our Michelle Bowden asking, where's the money? Up until a few years ago, there were several different options for teaching deaf students in Mecklenburg County. Now, though, the parents we talked to say there's only one option, and they say it's setting their kids up for failure. Afternoons in this house look a little different than most. There's all the hubbub of after school energy, but not a lot of noise. Mom and dad are deaf, and so are four of their seven kids. Three of the kids who are deaf are at University Meadows Elementary School where they are mainstreamed in a class with all hearing kids and have an interpreter. It's nice for my deaf children to be in a challenging environment where they're stimulated to learn and around other hearing children, that's fine, but there isn't communication and association with other deaf children. Besides their siblings, they need to be around with other children who are like them. We worked with an interpreter to do this interview where mom told us how frustrated she is with the way her kids are being taught. So all day long, the only person that they're interacting with is the interpreter. So they don't get to learn vicariously from other students. They don't get the opportunity to uh, help other students. They don't get the opportunity to be helped by other students. They don't get to talk about what's cool and what's not cool. She says the only people that know sign language at her kids' school are the interpreters assigned to each of them. So when the kids go to school, they literally can only communicate with the interpreter and that's it? Yes, just the interpreter. It hasn't always been this way. Until 2016, CMS had a special program for deaf students in Mecklenburg County where the kids were taught under one roof at Cotswold Elementary. In fact, that's where Carolyn went to school and it's what she wanted for her own kids. To see what's happening and to hear from the interpreters. Donna McCord Smolik is a deaf advocate who also grew up here in Charlotte and sent her kids to Cotswold. You know, the hearing students are in such a uh, for them, an integrated classroom, but it is such not an integrated classroom for the deaf student. They're left out, they're placed on an island, and all of the hearing people around them who don't know any different think they're doing the right best thing because they've got them so integrated that they've erased them, and there they are sitting alone, and it just breaks my heart. We checked with the state and learned every North Carolina school district decides how they want to approach teaching deaf students. Wake County, the school district most comparable to Mecklenburg, told us most of the students who are hearing impaired in their district attend their home schools with an interpreter if needed. But Wake County also offers regional programs or cluster programs for deaf students at three schools. We also checked in with the National Association for the Deaf, NAD, who told us as of 2020, 70% of deaf students were mainstreamed across the country, but pointed to the 2004 Federal Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act, or IDEA. That requires options for deaf children, including cluster schools that serve large groups of deaf students at selected schools. A spokesman for NAD told us, quote, deaf schools are an important placement opportunity mandated by IDEA that can be very beneficial for deaf children in providing education and community. Because right now, all of the deaf children are dispersed. And it is hard for deaf children to be around other deaf children. The state gives each school district an extra $5,600 per deaf student to make sure they have the tools they need. But Carolyn says money meant for her kids is being lumped in with money for all kids with special needs. To use the money that is allocated for the deaf student and then subsume it into a larger budget that's paying for ramps and for other forms of access isn't fair. That money was allocated to the deaf student. It makes me wonder about their future. I see a lack of resources. I see a lack of education for the deaf children. I see them not being set for success. The family we talked to say they're working with several advocates in town looking into the possibility of bringing a charter school for deaf students here in Mecklenburg County. They tell us right now they're in the exploratory phase. Reporting in Charlotte, Michelle Bowden, WCNC Charlotte.
Now our Where's the Money team works hard to hold those in power accountable, including the school systems and government agencies that use your taxpayer dollars. That being said, most of the time, it's your tips that really prompt us to start digging into those receipts. So if you have something you think we should investigate, please let us know. You can send an email to money at WCNC.com or reach out to us on social media. When it comes to WCNC's Chief Meteorologist Brad Panovich, our viewers tell the whole story. Hey, if you're new to the area, this meteorologist is awesome. I always stick with Brad Panovich when it comes to severe weather. He's rarely wrong. You should follow Brad if you don't already. He's usually right on the money with his forecast. I don't look at anything else besides what Brad says. We are fortunate to have him here. Brad Panovich, experience the difference with WCNC Charlotte Weather. Well, many people in North Carolina are trying their hand at mobile sports betting. Of course, there are going to be some wins and some losses, but are you allowed to deduct your losses from your taxes? WCNC Charlotte's Megan Bragg spoke to the experts in today's Verify. Are you getting lucky or are you seeing more losses than wins on these bets? It's okay, you can be honest. So if you do lose, can you deduct gambling losses on your taxes? Let's verify. Our source is Mark Stieber, tax information officer with Jackson Hewitt Tax Services, the IRS, and Intuit TurboTax. According to the IRS, winnings from any gambling are taxable. Stieber says if you win over $600, that's when you will get a form to fill out to record those winnings. If you win more than $600, you're going to get a W-2G with the amount, where you want it, how much you want, and those details and the IRS will get it too. Now, if you win $5,000 or more, there's a mandatory withholding, and the government will take 24% of their taxes up front. But what if you lose? Fast answer is yes. If you have losses while gambling, you may be able to take a tax deduction. May is the key word here because there are certain conditions you'd have to meet. According to TurboTax, you can deduct your gambling losses, but only to offset the income from your gambling winnings. You can't just deduct losses without reporting winnings. And the dollar amount of losses you can deduct can never exceed the winnings you report as income. To report losses, says you must itemize income tax deductions on a Schedule A form. Also, the IRS doesn't permit you to subtract your losses from your winnings and only report the difference on your tax return. Overall, if you have winnings, you can deduct same day, same types of losses to the extent you have winnings, but not a net loss and not all different types of bets, one at the casino, one at the dog track, and then one playing poker, and then the other one in the March Madness pool. Same types of bets can offset same types of income and losses. So we can verify that, yes, you can deduct gambling losses on your taxes. However, there are rules you must follow so that those deductions pass muster with the IRS. With your Verify, I'm Megan Brown. When did you know what you wanted to be? Hey, Mom, the weather's on. WCNC Charlotte's chief meteorologist Brad Panovich always knew what he was meant to do. All right, don't forget your umbrella. In fact, he joined the American Meteorological Society when he was 13. Now Brad is all grown up. And you can see him right here on WCNC Charlotte, making sure you're informed and safe. Hey, where did all my hair go? Experience the difference. Let's turn now to a look at your weekend forecast as we take a live look this morning from Dallas out in Gaston County. Good morning to you all. Larry, it's a bit of a foggy start today. Mm, a little fog out there uh, here on the St. Patrick's Day weekend. Got your green on mm -hmm. in honor of the Irish, you know, because we have to work in the green environment over there. No Makes green. Makes it a little hard. But we do have a lot of green that we can show, and that's what we're talking about is this St. Patrick's weekend. You know, there's so many times on this time of the year you, you can get rainy condition, you get cold and misty, but not, not this weekend. We're right on 74 degrees, so perfect for the big parade in uptown and for the festival that's going on all through the morning into the afternoon. And for St. Patrick's Day, tomorrow near 70. 
70 degrees, not bad at all. We take a live view from our, our Mr. Sparky Carolina Camera Network. That's right there, downtown Blowing Rock, North Carolina. Looking very nice there. A few fair weather clouds. Now, this is, <laughs> this is our camera from Ballantyne looking towards uptown. You can still see some, some uh, fog there. So you got some patchy and dense fog in a couple of spots, but not any issues out there from Monroe. Things looking okay. The old courthouse there looking off the distance. Just fair weather clouds. Should be a nice day across the region, but... We are still dealing with all of this amazing amount of pollen. It's the time of the year, so it's off the charts tomorrow and again on Monday. So high pollen count again today. Blame the trees. We love the trees, but they sort of could cause some issues out there. No issues once again with our forecast. 11 M, 62 degrees. Once again, that's when the parade starts in uptown Charlotte. Expecting thousands of people up there for the festival as well. Should be a fun time. And between about 4 and 6 today, we'll be in the low 70s. I would say there may be many, many spots that actually get into the mid-70s this afternoon, but I would say averaging about 70, 71 degrees across the area today. Not expecting any Rain, no storms. We scanned the skies. Rain and storm free. We did have the showers that moved across the area yesterday. It will expand the view. That system's off Carolina coastline. Some showers off there, and then way to the south of us across Florida. Once again, we're about 71 degrees right in the middle of the afternoon. Across the two state area today, the hot spot's going to be. Charleston, South Carolina, 83 degrees out there. And another coastal community, Cape Hatteras on the Outer Banks, 59. The cool reading will be in the mid-70s at Greenville, Spartanburg, Columbia, about 79 degrees. We've got travel plans down there. The capital of South Carolina, the capital city of North Carolina, Raleigh at 70, 64 at Boone over in Asheville at 71 degrees in case you're heading to go up more. Now watch this change in temperatures. We've got nice weather this weekend. Look at those drops in the temperatures Monday and Tuesday. We see a rebound for the middle of the weekend towards the end of next week. Next weekend we'll see temperatures drop a few degrees below average for today. Boone hits about 64, blowing rock tops out about 63. Up around Jefferson, West Jefferson, low to mid 60s there. Morganton, Lenore, Tailsville, Hickory, Maiden, all much like we see here in our area. It'll be in the low to mid 70s and about the same from Monroe to Wagesburg, Rockingham and Chesterfield down there in South Carolina. Checking the guy roofing 70 forecast through the weekend and beyond. Low to mid 70s today. Tomorrow we'll look for mostly sunny skies. We put that 20% chance in. Most of the year has will not have a chance to rain at all. And then we see 58. That's right. That's not a mistake. That's 58 for high temperature on Monday. Tuesday morning, a frosty morning, cold at 32, high 59. Then we see a rebound Wednesday and Thursday. It looks like by next Friday, here we go, another Friday with a chance of showers with temperatures in the low 60s. That's your forecast this morning. And is continuing to fight for his life tonight after a triple shooting in Mooresville left him hospitalized. A suspect and two victims dead. The Iredell County Sheriff's Office responded to a call, shots fired call on Home Drive Saturday night. When they arrived, they say they found three people tied up, two victims already dead. Another person in critical condition was taken to the hospital. Shortly after, deputies then got information leading them to another home on Oswald Amity Road in connection to the suspect in the incident. And that's where an hours long standoff took place before coming to a deadly end. WCNC Charlotte's Anna King has the latest on the investigation. Neighbors in Iredale County say they were jolted out of their sleep to the sound of multiple gunshots Saturday. Those shots were coming from a home on Oswald Amity Road. Deputies with Iredale County Sheriff's Office say they were trying to take 39 year old Justin Strawyer into custody. They say Saturday night he tied three people up at a home on Home Drive in Mooresville. Officials say Strawyer killed two of those victims, 22 year old Eduardo Cordova and 24 year old Caleb Loper. The third victim is in the hospital in Charlotte. Officials say shortly after the shooting, Strawyer barricaded himself inside the home on Oswald and Mitty Drive. They say he was shooting his AR-15 when they arrived on scene. For hours, there were negotiations to get him out, as well as four juveniles who deputies say were in the home and refused to come out as well. Deputies eventually used gas to get everyone out of the home, and they say Strawyer followed the juveniles out while shooting at deputies. Officers then returned fire, shooting and killing Strawyer. The Iredell County Sheriff says the crimes that took place on the home were not random and notes drugs and robbery are possible motive. In Mooresville, Anna King, WCNC Charlotte. The North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation will now lead the investigation. And as per protocol, three deputies are on administrative leave.
Thanks, Brad. There's an ongoing study, though, in Gastonia analyzing barriers to housing and then recommending how to remove them. The goal here is to implement policies that create more affordable housing and then address the disparities. But it does seem like the city is falling short in some places and has been for years. WCNC Charlotte's Julia Kaufman takes a closer look. A third party analysis found five main issues that are making it harder for people to find fair housing in Gastonia and the barriers go beyond affordability. The Gastonia City Council's Housing Committee received an update Monday on the federally required housing study that's done every five years. Of course, there's a limited supply of affordable housing. City data says rent prices have nearly doubled since 2015. But Director of Housing Danette Dyes says the analysis also found there's limited housing supply for those persons with disability. The same problem was found in 2019, and the study says the city has not implemented anything yet to try to address it. Making sure that our most vulnerable citizens and those people who have the least voice are not left behind and don't fall through the cracks. Um, and I think that the, the study definitely showed that some of that does happen. Housing Committee Chairman Robert Kellogg says the city is working to update its zoning codes so it can be more inclusive with development. As we implement more ways to build and more ways to include different zoning opportunities, that that would also help individuals who are disabled. Gastonia leaders adopted an affordable housing plan in fall 2023. Goals in the 10 year plan include creating a housing trust fund and building a housing resource center. I think there's definitely room to improve, but I think we're on the right track. Researchers want your feedback on the fair housing analysis and recommendations before they present them to the city council next month. We have details on how you can participate on WCNC.com. WCNC Charlotte. Good morning, Carolinas. Tune in to the team that's preparing you for your day. We are following two major breaking news stories this morning. See the difference in your morning. We can see clear skies out there off of the distance. Everything is flowing just fine. We're asking where's the money so you can get ahead in 2024. Responsible reporting, community focused, unique content. Good morning, Savannah. Hi, Sarah. Great to see you. See the difference. Weekday mornings on WCNC Charlotte. Living in a neighborhood run by a homeowners associations association has its upsides and downsides. A Mooresville family found themselves asking where's the money after discovering some of their HOA's approved colors didn't even exist anymore. The family picked a color they liked only to be hit with a thousand dollar fine until neighbors stepped in. Kenneth Threed and his wife, Tisha, say most of the time they've enjoyed their house at the end of a quiet cul-de-sac in the meadows at Reed Creek Community. They've always taken pride in its upkeep. I'm a peaceful guy, you know, in this neighborhood I've been 18 years. Um, we never had no problems. But things started stirring up last fall when the couple decided to refresh their home's exterior paint. Threet admits it was almost completely painted before he learned he needed to fill out a request for architectural approval. So I went to the HOA representative and she said to me, this color you have is not an approved color. After requesting a hearing in which the Threets were denied permission to keep their darker shade of gray, Threet says the board told them they'd have to change the color. We want to be in compliance um, with, with the HOA rules and regulations. So we was trying to work with them. Three then took a drive around his neighborhood. I found out that there was other colors in the neighborhood that was not approved colors. So to be clear, Threed says other neighbors had homes painted in colors that were not approved. We were not able to determine whether those neighbors requested and received HOA permission before painting. Either way, Threed says he was told to change theirs or else. They charged us $1,000 fine for not having the right color. Another neighbor, Mark Lepard, says he could empathize. The personal feeling was that uh, not everyone on the board had complete empathy with a lot of the requests that were being made. And it just so happened last month, homeowners voted in new HOA board members, including Lepard. From what I've heard personally, there was an overwhelming amount of people that did want to see a difference in the way that the, the rules are enforced on them. Three is one of them. Thank God for Mark and 
the ones that came on. The new board has signed off on the, the paint colors that they chose, and so they don't have to paint their house. Um, they were assessed some fines, and we've waived those, and so they're good to go. It worked out for the Threats, but he says the last several months have been stressful. It also serves as a reminder if you live in a neighborhood run by an HOA to read the guidelines when it comes to changing or adding to the appearance of your house. Homeowners usually have to fill out an application for an architectural review for major changes. It'll save time and aggravation knowing if you can proceed with any kind of construction or remodeling work. Well, if you've been here in Charlotte for a couple of years or maybe longer, you've seen Charlotte continue to grow. But as businesses come and go, there's one local business that is standing the test of time. Dilworth Mattress Factory has been in Charlotte for 92 years, opening up in 1931 during the height of the Depression. WCNC Charlotte's Jesse Pierre spoke to the owners about how they have helped folks rest easy for decades. Mm -hmm. Dilworth Mattress Factory has been in the Dilworth South End community for over 90 years, and there are generations of history behind this door. The photo of Dilworth Mattress Factory founder Thomas Philbeck firmly mounted to the wall. When he started it as a um, as a mattress refurbish business, he would. It was right after the Great Depression. Since 1931, the company has evolved from a mattress repair shop to handmade custom orders helping folks rest easy. We start with a traditional spring right like this on some mattresses. Scott Hirsch picked up the family business and is the current owner where the work is all about the feels. We can make this side soft and this side firm. Along with his wife, Dory Hirsch, who showed off a mattress fit for a queen. This is the only mattress that we actually do not make in our factory. It holds the royal warrant, and this is actually what the entire royal family sleeps on. The factory, in its third location in 92 years, is surrounded by new development. Hurst says he's been around to see a lot of the changes. Plenty of mattress stores have come and gone since we've been here, and, and plenty of businesses in the South End area have come and gone. He says referrals and repeat customers keep their operations from taking a snooze. And the pandemic came along, and people weren't really going out. So it kind of introduced us into uh, mattress sale by appointment only. Adapting with the times, Dilworth Mattress Factory is springing forward to a century and beyond. Sold to generations to generations and kids of, ki kids of parents and, and, th and their kids now. So um, I think it's important for us to continue this uh, tradition. Jesse Pierre, WCNC Charlotte. I'm astonished by the bed for you the Royals. About that. Yeah, I mean, I know it's not the exact bed that they sleep on, but I want, yeah, I want to know more about that. I'm gonna have to ask Jesse. Ask the Royals. Or yeah, they'll, they'll dish on how it feels. Is I'm it just, angelic, I'm just like sleeping on a cloud? Yeah, like yeah. how do they get in touch with them anyway? That caught my eye too. Yeah. All right. Well. When I think about the community, I think about the time that I've been here. I've been in this community almost my entire adult life, so I, I, you, know, you get to know the people. When you know what they care about, then that's what you care about. This community looks at all of us who do weather here at WCNC Charlotte as part of their family. And uh, when you're part of their family, you want to make sure you do it just for them. Time now to connect the dots. When we make the news, make sense. President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris is set to campaign here in North Carolina later this month once again. And Democrats think he has a real shot at winning the state come November. Down ballot races could help President Joe Biden pull out a win in the Tar Heel state. Let's connect the dots. The president lost North Carolina in 2020 by just under a percentage point. But the New York Times reports Republican candidate for governor Mark Robinson could push voters to a Democratic ticket. Robinson has a history of anti-Semitic comments and opposes abortion and gay rights, which may even turn away some conservative voters. With the governor's race getting even national attention, outgoing Democratic Governor Roy Cooper believes it's a battleground state that could give a slight edge to the president over former President Donald Trump. Biden's campaign making the state a top priority as North Carolina quickly grows, many new residents are coming from blue states. But it won't be easy. A Democratic presidential candidate hasn't won the state since 2008. And that is Connecting the Dots. 
A Charlotte nonprofit is asking for your help tonight after receiving some generous donations. Yeah, Beds for Kids is looking for volunteers to help families get ahead, starting with a good night's rest. Our Larry Sprinkle takes us to the warehouse and tells us how you can make a difference here. I'm going to take this over to the trash. Lauren Patterson is volunteering to help out and get her hands dirty at the same time. It's not very glamorous, but it needed to be done. For the past two years, Lauren has helped kids across the Mecklenburg and Cabarrus County areas get a good night's sleep by lending a helping hand. I am from Charlotte, born and raised, and I feel like it's very easy to grow up in a, in a bubble here, but there is so much need just 10 to 15 minutes down the road. And, you know, one hour, one volunteer can do so much. She's just one of a handful of volunteers with beds for kids, helping families get everything from a chair to a dining room table. Every single volunteer that we receive and have at this warehouse is essential and really important to our mission. So without volunteers, we could not operate. And their work is critical. I think that a child who feels safe in their home and gets a good night's sleep is only going to be um, more successful in school, and that's only going to continue to carry them um, to be successful. Beds for Kids usually delivers to 30 families per week. But next week, with the help of several suppliers, they want to try and furnish 60 to 70 family homes. There's only 12 of us, so we definitely need more volunteers for that. Volunteers making a difference, getting together and cleaning furniture, and the reward for their work is often seen firsthand. To see the kids come home and to be so excited to have a bed to sleep on that night. In West Charlotte, I'm Larry Sprinkle. Back to you. So if you can help and you don't mind lifting and moving some furniture, get in touch with Beds for Kids through our website, WCNC.com or our mobile app. Hey YouTube, this is Chief Meteorologist Brad Panovich here at WCNC Charlotte. We want you to head over to our Weather IQ YouTube page, where we're making you smarter and safer. We have a passion for weather science, and we want you to understand what's happening when the weather changes, because in the end, that's what keeps you safe. It's not about being scared, it's about being informed. Browse our collection of fun and informative clips and look for new segments every week. We're here to raise your weather IQ. Experience the difference on WCNC Charlotte. Let's turn now to a look at your weekend forecast as we take a live look this morning from Dallas out in Gaston County. Good morning to you all. Larry, it's a bit of a foggy start today. Mm -hmm. We'll fog out the area here on the St. Patrick's Day weekend. Got your green on mm -hmm. in honor of the Irish, you know, because we have to work in the green environment over there. No Makes green. It a little hard. But we do have a lot of green that we can show, and that's what we're talking about is this St. Patrick's weekend. You know, there's so many times on this time of the year you, you can get rainy condition, you can get cold and misty, but not, not this weekend. We're right on 74 degrees, so perfect for the big parade in uptown and for the festival that's going on all through the morning into the afternoon. And for St. Patrick's Day, tomorrow near 70. 70 degrees, not bad at all. We take a live view from our, our Mr. Sparky Carolina Camera Network. That's right there, downtown Blowing Rock, North Carolina. Looking very nice there. A few fair weather clouds. Now, this is, <laughs> this is our camera from Ballantyne looking towards uptown. You can still see some, some uh, fog there. So you got some patchy and dense fog in a couple of spots, but not any issues out there from Monroe. Things looking okay. The old courthouse there looking off the distance. Just fair weather clouds. Should be a nice day across the region, but... We are still dealing with all of this amazing amount of pollen. It's the time of the year, so it's off the charts tomorrow and again on Monday. So high pollen count again today. Blame the trees. We love the trees, but they certainly could cause some issues out there. No issues once again with our forecast. 11 a.m., 62 degrees. Once again, that's when the parade starts in uptown Charlotte. Expecting thousands of people up there for the festival as well. Should be a fun time. And between about 4 and 6 today, we'll be in the low 70s. I would say there may be many, many spots that actually get into the mid-70s this afternoon, but I would say averaging about 70, 71 degrees across the area today. Not expecting a Rain, no storms. We scanned the skies. Rain is storm free. We did have the showers that moved across the area yesterday. It will expand the view. That system's off Carolina coastline. Some showers off there, and then way to the south of us across Florida. Once again, we're about 71 degrees right in the middle of the afternoon across the two state area today. The hot spot's going to be Charleston, South Carolina, 83 degrees out there, and another coastal community, Cape Hatteras, on the outer banks. 59. The cool reading will be in the mid 70s at Greenville, Spartanburg, Columbia, about 79 degrees. We got travel plans down there. The capital of South Carolina, the capital city of 
North Carolina, Raleigh at 70, 64 at Boone, over in Asheville at 71 degrees in case you're heading to go up more. Now watch this change in temperatures. We've got nice weather this weekend. Look at those drops in the temperatures Monday and Tuesday. We see a rebound for the middle of the weekend towards the end of next week. Next weekend we'll see temperatures drop a few degrees below average for today. Boone hits about 64, blowing rock tops out about 63. Up around Jefferson, West Jefferson, low to mid 60s there. Morganton, Lenore, Tailsville, Hickory, Maiden, all much like we see here in our area. It'll be in the low to mid 70s and about the same from Monroe to Wadesboro to Rockingham and Chesterfield down there in South Carolina. Checking the guy roofing 70 forecast through the weekend and beyond. Low to mid 70s today. Tomorrow we'll look for mostly sunny skies. We put that 20% chance in. Most of the year has will not have a chance to rain at all. And then we see 58. That's right. That's not a mistake. That's 58 for high temperature on Monday. Tuesday morning, a frosty morning, cold at 32, high 59. Then we see a rebound Wednesday and Thursday. It looks like by next Friday, here we go, another Friday with a chance of showers with temperatures in the low 60s. That's your forecast this morning. Governor Rory Cooper has announced an executive action striking down the state's rules on name, image, and likeness compensation that were issued back in 2021. They, he says these rules are no longer needed, adding they set the standard for colleges and universities to come up with their own NIL policies. Go, uh, Governor Cooper also says his executive action plays a key role in leveling the playing field for student athletes across North Carolina so they have the same access to NIL as athletes in any other state. Time now to connect the dots. When we make the news make sense. A new study says air pollution is hurting the performance of North Carolina students in class and in sports. And it turns out a new statewide initiative could help reduce those numbers. Electric buses are coming to North Carolina, and that could help keep your kids healthy. Let's connect the dots. Yale researchers looked at test scores and pollution exposure for every public school student in North Carolina over 17 years. They found the more time a child was exposed to pollution, there was a direct correlation to failing test scores. While pollution in the Tar Heel State has improved over the last 20 years, kids are still exposed to lots of pollution. The study suggests this is in large part because of cars and buses. And there is a program looking to change that. The state is currently in the process of using more than $25 million to buy 114 electric buses. 27 of those will be deployed here in Mecklenburg County. Experts say these buses could significantly reduce kids' exposure to pollution and potentially help their performance in school. And that is Connecting the Dots. At WCNC Charlotte, we believe it is crucial to make a difference in our communities. That's why we go beyond just reporting the news. We ask, where's the money to hold the powerful accountable and get money back into your pockets? Our verified team takes claims, finds sources, and gets you answers. And we're keeping you weather aware, making you safer and smarter. I'm Vanessa Rufus. And I'm Colin Mayfield. Join us weeknights at 5, 6, and 11 and see the difference for yourself. Only on WCNC Charlotte. Now at 6, we have a quick warning for you before we really dive into this story. You're about to see and hear something that really no one wants inside their home, apartment, or business. We are talking about raw sewage. A Where's the Money investigation found that the city of Charlotte has paid nearly $2 million to help people deal with damages tied to the city's sewer system. And our Nate Norabito discovered the problem is only getting worse. With enough miles of sewer to make it from here to Alaska, Charlotte Water has said logistically crews just cannot proactively inspect the entire system. So the city tends to be reactive, paying up when a failure is found in their lines. Leaders even increased the maximum payout in recent years. But some believe the city needs to make prevention a bigger priority. Oh man, this is going everywhere. The sight. I literally heard her scream. The sound. It's raw. It was disgusting. The smell. Like Of sewage. It was everywhere. Like it, there was like no stopping it. Overpowered Dwayne and Catherine Pennant. This was all flooded. All as their infant and toddler slept nearby. And it was flown in that room, which is our children's room. More than a year later. It interrupted our lives. The parents still feel overwhelmed. 
I'm tired. <laughs> I'm tired and, and I'm over it. Left with a bad taste about why. We just don't want this to happen to anyone else. In the hours before the penance toilets and bathtubs spewed sewage, they heard gurgling noises. So they called out a plumber who found a clog in the city's sewer line. But when Charlotte Cruz came out to clean it, the you know what. I said, hey, hey, what are you guys doing? Hit the fan. It blew back. The penance say Cruz pushed sewage back into their home. A failure in cleaning and they believe prevention. One that forced the family to spend the next month in a hotel. This is something that could be avoided with better maintenance. Public records show since 2018, almost 900 people have filed sewer blowback and blockage claims against the city. It seemed like everything was just destroyed. Where, where are we going to live? Last year alone, Charlotte water records show blockages nearly doubled. It's a real thing. It's happening all the time. Seth Wyatt says his small family plumbing business receives three to four calls a day, often tied to problems on the city side of the sewer, routinely caused by thirsty tree roots rupturing the lines. And they will do just about anything to get water. Especially worse when there's a drought. When there's a lack of rain, the, the call volume goes up. Tree roots are only part of the problem, though. This is preventable. Most blockages are at the kitchen drain. Charlotte Water spokesperson Cam Coley says customers are also clogging the lines over time when they dump grease and wipes. The goal is to keep all the wastewater in the pipe. Regardless of the cause, it's the city's responsibility to keep the lines clean. Is the city doing enough to prevent this? That is worked on every day. We are doing preventive maintenance when we're not responding to emergencies or sewer related uh, concerns. Coley says Charlotte Water dedicates a team to inspect 600 of the city's highest priority lines, is on pace this year to clean 20% of its sewer system, up from the prior year, and uses technology to monitor its lines, so crews' limited time is used efficiently. We're looking to clean where it's needed most. He says it all comes down to a balancing act between resources and priorities. What can the city do? I mean, the first step is admitting you have a problem. Councilmember Tariq Bakari believes leaders have failed to prioritize basic services. Those non-sexy but critically important things. That's why he's calling for a strategic committee that can focus on infrastructure needs. We don't even know the size of the problem yet, so we have to size things out. That's all broken. Dependents say they now know the full scope of their problem. She was breastfeeding at the time, and the level of stress, she couldn't do it. She couldn't yeah, my produce. supply just like and cut off. After months of back and forth with the city. Still, some days are, are not good. They finally agreed on a price to cover the cost and installation of a backwater valve to prevent this in the future, leaving them finally with a sense of relief. If you don't want to take any chances, a plumber can install a backwater valve, but that will cost several thousand dollars. Either way, don't ignore the warning signs. If you hear gurgling noises or notice that your drains are slow to drain, call 311 immediately. Nate Morabito, WCNC Charlotte. Well, we know this, Nate, in our Where's the Money team, they really work hard to take these story tips and dig into every avenue possible to get you answers. Yeah, tonight on WCNC Plus, actually, Nate's going to sit down with our Nate Stur uh, Nick Sturdivant, that is, to talk more about the investigation process. Nate and Nick, from how the story started, the questions we've asked, and the answers we're still waiting to get. You can get that in-depth perspective only on WCNC Plus, starting at 6.30 on your preferred streaming device. Seven now in this Women's History Month, we're focusing on the stories that highlight the difference and disparities between men and women. Good morning and happy Tuesday. Now, here's what we've got from Wallet Hub this morning. A site came up with this ranked list on the best and worst states for women. Now, before we get to the big reveal, I want to break down some of the methodology here. Researchers looked at some key metrics when they were making this list. The data ranges from median earnings for female workers to women's health care, even the female homicide rate. Now, as for that big reveal, both Carolinas are in that bottom half of the list. North Carolina came in at number 30. South Carolina is about 10 spots lower at number 40. 
And some numbers before we let you go. Women represent more than two-thirds of all minimum wage workers. And the U.S. political representation is also suffering. Even though women make up about 51 percent of the population, we're only making up about 25 percent of the Senate and then 29 percent of the House of Representatives. It's numbers like those that led writers to create this list in the first place. Ben? WCNC Charlotte. Weather is a, a kind of science that you get to see and experience every day. And I think some people don't even realize how much it affects them. That weather has a huge impact on how it threatens your family, your livelihood, or your home. So I think it really is one of those defining things we do that really affects everybody in our community. See the difference. That process of giving you a warning ahead of time and keeping you and your family safe is really important to me because I live here too. It's my family, it's my friends, it's my neighbors. Maternal health care continues to be a problem in North Carolina. The latest March of Dimes report found for every 100,000 births in the state, 26 people giving birth die from complications of pregnancy or childbirth within six weeks. That's higher than the national number. And for women of color, the numbers are even worse. Now a nonprofit called Queen City Cocoa Beans is trying to help. WCNC Charlotte's Lexi Wilson shows us how they help guide families of color through the birthing process. It is a blessing, truly, that um, Jackson and I are here today. <laughs> the gift of motherhood is something the Dean family doesn't take for granted. We, um, like so many people, experienced a pretty traumatic birth. Their original birth plan didn't go as expected, eventually leading Rachel Dean to be readmitted into the hospital. She says it was the support of her team at Queen City Cocoa Beans that helped her get through the ordeal. Everyone deserves those troops to rally for them. Having a team in place really does make a difference. Making a difference in the lives of Charlotte Black families is the goal of this organization by helping them achieve better birth outcomes. According to the CDC, Black women are three times more likely to die from pregnancy-related conditions. My mom died very early after giving birth to me, as well as I've had many stillborns and miscarriages. For assistant director Lugina Grinder, this work is personal. She says her mother was unheard and unseen, later finding out she had a brain aneurysm from birth that was never diagnosed. It was just assumed that she was using drugs or that she was doing uh, something that was harmful to her. She now uses her story to change the narrative, turning sorrow into support. It's kind of like I was born to do this work. <laughs> it's work that's seen here with 16-month-old Jackson. We focus on the whole person, the whole family. There you go. A healthy and happy <laughs> baby where life isn't taken for granted. Reporting in West Charlotte for WCNC Charlotte, I'm Lexi Wilson. Thank you. College kids and incoming freshmen across our area, they are stressing out. Many of them are waiting on the FAFSA to see how much it'll cost to have to go to school. The federal financial aid program got a big overhaul this year, and to put it bluntly, it's been a mess. Mm. We are talking major delays in the process, leaving students and schools in limbo asking where's the money. Our Michelle Bowden talked to some who say they are now scrambling. This is so hard on so many families and the schools are struggling too. So far, there are 30% fewer applications this year than in the past, meaning the result of this whole mess could be tons of students who simply don't go to college. Johnny Darling is a senior at Philip O'Berry High. He got into his dream school for next year, but might not get to go. Although I wanna go there, it's very expensive and I'm not sure how I'm going to pay for it as of right now. Darling is the oldest of four kids and the son of two school teachers. I don't know which school I'm going to choose because I don't know how much I'm going to get from FAFSA. FAFSA is the free application for student aid, the federal government program that was revamped this year, causing major delays. These changes affect everybody who is in college or thinking about pursuing higher education in the upcoming year. Students fill out the application, the government processes it and sends it back to the schools that then determine how much financial aid a student is eligible for. We typically begin notifying students in November. And when are you expecting now to be able to do that? Realistically, April. So there are some students that are literally waiting to find out now if they can afford to go to college next Correct. year. Correct. Adrian Amador Odi is the vice president of strategic enrollment at Queens University and says she worries some students won't go to college this year at all because of the difficulties. I can't even count how many times we've been delayed. My biggest concern, they'll just give up. It's very stressful because FAFSA is one of those things that 
once you know what that dollar amount is, you can navigate what else do we need to do? And right now with the delay, it's really putting a strain because we can't make a decision on, well, it's gonna be this school or that school. Alan Davis works with high school seniors as part of Road to Hire, a nonprofit that helps underrepresented high school students on the path to corporate jobs. He's working to help students avoid taking out costly long-term loans to pay for schools, and says the FAFSA delays are making that tough. We have learned from many of our folks who have gone through this uh, historically that the challenge of financial uh, aid and loans and what that looks like. And we want we understand, particularly for families of color, uh, that that represents a barrier to wealth. How worried are you that some of your kids may not go to school because they just don't know how they're going to pay for it and this delay is really a problem? Yeah, it's a real reality for many of our students. Uh, 47% of our students are first gen, so they are trying to figure this thing out. This is the first time this process has had a complete overhaul in 50 years, and critics say the government simply didn't put enough money or resources into making the change. Once they work everything out, all these kinks, it is supposed to make things easier for students and their families. Back to you. It can be so frustrating, too. So the price of higher education is expensive. There's really no other way to say it. Yeah, we know there are plenty of students and families who are struggling to pay for it. We do want to help you get ahead. So tonight on our streaming app, WCNC Plus, we are sitting down with an expert who shared some strategies to help parents and students save for college. You can watch our latest Your Money episode to hear some accounts that can help your money grow and also understand the changes happening with financial aid. So tune in at 8 o'clock tonight. It is available on your favorite streaming device. Connect the dots and let us clear up the confusion. We're here to make sure the news makes sense. And with Connect the Dots, you'll understand how the headlines impact your family. See the difference on WCNC Charlotte. New at 430, a neighborhood's battle against proposed development continues to get a lot of attention. A current change.org petition centered around a Piper Glen development has nearly 20,000 signatures against a rezoning petition. WCNC Charlotte's Julia Kaufman shows us why some neighbors are against the plan. We're on the four mile greenway here in Piper Glen and on the other side of these woods, developers want to build apartments and a retirement community, but homeowners are against the development. Even on a rainy day, people in South Charlotte love the four mile greenway. Long, spacious greenways, lots of nature. Charlotte native Chris McIntyre and his neighbors are fighting to preserve that nature. 70% of the trees will be wiped out on 53 acres. The proposed Sutherland at Piper Glen development calls for 640 rental units on the other side of this creek. That's just really dense. McIntyre understands the land will be developed, but he'd prefer to see houses for sale. Some neighbors want the land untouched. Councilman Ed Driggs says that's not an option. The county expressed an interest at one point to the owner uh, in buying the site for a park. The owner said, I don't want to talk about that. It's under contract. Under the land's current zoning, the developer can build about 470 homes, but no apartments. Driggs says rezoning the property for higher density could save more trees and improve roads, but more negotiations need to happen. Unless some sort of an understanding can be arrived at with that group and with residents uh, in a larger scale, I won't support it. The project has a public hearing Monday at the Charlotte City Council meeting, and it's expected to be a packed house. In Piper Glen, Julia Kaufman, WCNC Charlotte. WCNC Charlotte, this is Flashpoint, where power and politics collide, and the tough questions get asked and answered. Thanks for joining us here on Flashpoint. I'm Ben Thompson. Well, after years of debate on Monday, mobile sports betting will finally be legal here in North Carolina. And between all the ads featuring your favorite celebrity, promotional deals, and big bucks for the state, it's very easy to get excited. But there is a downside. Coming up in a few minutes, how the state is preparing for the very real issue of gambling addiction that comes with this news. But first, joining us now is sports betting regulation expert and editor of Sports Betting Dime, Robert Linehan. Robert, thanks for coming on. We appreciate it. No, thanks for having me on. I know it's a busy time uh, down there in North Carolina. It is. Lots of folks are really excited about this. Listen, you've watched this play out 
in states across the country. You write about it. Um, give us, with that context, give us some perspective about how big of a deal it is to have sports betting roll out here in North Carolina uh, in the next week. Sure. Well, North Carolina is, is expected to be a very healthy sports betting market in the country, not to mention that it's likely going to be the only state to launch sports betting in 2024. Um, right now, there are no other states that have any scheduled launches. Uh, a few states are considering legislation to legalize sports betting, um, but even if they do get something done, they're likely not going to launch this year. So North Carolina could be the only state and, and will likely be the only state to launch this year. Um, I know operators, I know uh, sports betting companies are very excited for North Carolina. Uh, it, it, it's not going to be, you know, North Carolina is not going to be a, a top five market in the country. It, it's not going to be a New Jersey or a New York. Uh, those two states dominate the sports betting landscape. But there's a lot to be excited about uh, for North Carolina. Uh, it's it's a populous state. Um, you, you have some 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 crazy sports fans down there. Uh, a, a lot of residents that have been clamoring for sports betting legalization over the last couple of years, as this has been discussed. Uh, you have a very healthy college sports fandom down there, uh, and it's perfect that this is launching a week before. Um, the March Madness tournaments begin. So there's a lot to be excited about in North Carolina, and there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic that the North Carolina sports betting market is going to be a very healthy one for that. You mentioned a revenue. How much revenue are we talking about here in this uh, first year? Well, I mean, of course, uh, you know, these are just estimates, but, you know, the first, actually, for these estimates, for the first fiscal year, the 2023-2024 fiscal year, uh, the estimate is there is going to be no tax revenue coming in for this. But but that's just basically how the calendar falls. Uh, during the first full year of sports betting, the fiscal estimates say that the state could bring in nearly $65 million of additional tax revenue. By year five, when, you know, typically year five is when the sports betting market has um you know basically aged and 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 is, is topping out and and is a mature sports betting market by year five north carolina according to these fiscal estimates when the bill was passed could be seeing an additional 100.6 million dollars in annual revenue you know this is revenue that the state was losing out on you know for in years past when people were sports betting in north carolina because as you know sports betting was going on in the state before it was legalized sure. it was you know being handled by offshore regulators offshore sports betting operators um north carolina wasn't getting any tax dollars from it so this should be you know 100 million in terms of a state budget it's it's not 100 million seems like a lot but in terms of a state budget it, it's not a ton of money but this is revenue that the state was missing out on that could have gone to supporting, you know, higher education, youth athletics, all of the good things that the bill has earmarked the tax revenue for. So it, it's going to be a nice uh, drop in the bucket for the state. And uh, it's just going to be money that they were losing out on in past years. Yeah, you're talking about state budget. That's billions and billions. And, and, but still, money's money <laughs> and, and everybody likes money. Um, you mentioned this a second ago, but there's a lot of folks already betting using VPNs, dark websites to bet in other states. So based on your reporting, do, do you think there are folks who want to bet, haven't been doing that, and haven't cur currently found a way to do it that are now going to be jumping on the bandwagon? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, this this provides North, Carolin North Carolinians or North Carolina residents with a safe and legal way to bet on sports in the state. Um, you know, with some of these offshore regulators, you're basically giving your private information to, you know, this an offshore regulator that, you know, who knows what they're doing with what you're giving them. You know, you're basically giving them your bank account information and who knows who's handling it, who knows who's seeing it. Uh, so this absolutely will give people peace of mind, you know, people that might have been hesitant 
to, you know, throw $25 into an account and, you know, bet on UNC uh, uh, in, in the upcoming March Madness tournament. So absolutely, this is going to bring in more people to the sports betting market in North Carolina. Um, like I said, uh, these these legal legally licensed operators in the state will, you know, they're going to provide the services uh, that the offshore books don't. Um, there's going to be more responsible gaming. They're, they're going to be paying you know, certainly more attention to responsible gaming issues uh, as opposed to you know some of the unlicensed regulators. So this is a, certainly a way, a safer way, and a more responsible way for residents in the state to uh, participate in sports betting. And you're going to see that certainly uh, when it launches on the 11th, and you'll see how how many people are uh, going to be enjoying this as the state moves forward. Um, any common problems that you've seen in rollouts across the state that, that, that folks should be wary of in this first year? You know, not really. This is old hat for a lot of these operators right now. Um, you know, DraftKings and FanDuel are licensed each in more than 20 states apiece at this point. So, they know what they're doing. Um, there's tip, t t typically not a lot of technical difficulties uh, in the state. I mean, you do have some, you do have some newer operators in the state, like ESPN Bet, Underdog, Underdog. Uh, this is actually going to be the first state where they launch sports betting, uh, but they've been around for years, offering daily fantasy sports contests. I, I know for a fact that. They likely will have a good platform uh, for customers to use and a great app to use. So I don't think you're going to be seeing too much in the way of difficulties. I mean, there's always, you know, there could always be some people that may not get a bonus that they're offered or, or, or something may happen along those lines when they sign up. But, you know, all these operators have uh, a great customer service representatives. Um, you know, if you do run into a problem, contact the number that they have prominently displayed in their sports book apps and on their websites. And I, I think it's going to be smooth sailing in North Carolina. This, this is too big of a state. It's too big of a market for these operators not to be on top on the top of their game when this launches and that you don't want to be the one operator. You know, you don't want to be the one operator that's down for a couple hours on opening day when the others are, are, are raking in the cash and, and, you know, registering new users. So I, I would not imagine that there's going to be too much that could go wrong. I'll knock on wood when I say that. I, I'm saying that right now. And then, you know, maybe a, a seven out of the eight will have problems on the first day. But typically, it's usually pretty smooth sailing. They've all been here before. This is old hat for them. I really don't think there's going to be too much that could go wrong. On Monday, March 11th, on when Monday. North Carolina yeah. launches online sports betting. Listen, it's very exciting. Uh, and uh, Robert Linan, you have given us a great lay of the land here. We, we, we do appreciate it. Thank you, sir. And thank you very much for having me. Up next on Flashpoint, how the state is beefing up resources to help battle gambling addiction. Let's turn now to a look at your weekend forecast as we take a live look this morning from Dallas out in Gaston County. Good morning to you all. Larry, it's a bit of a foggy start today. Mm -hmm. We'll fog out the area here on the St. Patrick's Day weekend. Got your green on mm -hmm. in honor of the Irish, you know, because we have to work in the green environment over there. No Makes green. It a little hard. But we do have a lot of green that we can show, and that's what we're talking about is this St. Patrick's weekend. You know, there's so many times on this time of the year you, you can get rainy condition, you get cold and misty, but not, not this weekend. We're right on 74 degrees, so perfect for the big parade in uptown and for the festival that's going on all through the morning into the afternoon. And for St. Patrick's Day, tomorrow near 70. 70 degrees, not bad at all. We take a live view from our, our Mr. Sparky Carolina Camera Network. That's right there, downtown Blowing Rock, North Carolina. Looking very nice there. A few fair weather clouds. Now, this is, <laughs> this is our camera from Ballantyne looking towards uptown. You can still see some, some uh, fog there. So you got some patchy and dense fog in a couple of spots, but not any issues out there from Monroe. Things looking okay. The old courthouse there looking off the distance. Just fair weather clouds. Should be a nice day across the region, but... We are still dealing with all of this amazing amount of pollen. It's the time of the year, so it's off the charts. 
tomorrow and again on Monday. So high pollen count again today. Blame the trees. We love the trees, but they certainly could cause some issues out there. No issues once again with our forecast. 11 a.m., 62 degrees. Once again, that's when the parade starts in uptown Charlotte. Expecting thousands of people up there for the festival as well. Should be a fun time. And between about 4 and 6 today, we'll be in the low 70s. I would say there may be many, many spots that actually get into the mid-70s this afternoon, but I would say averaging about 70, 71 degrees across the area today. Not expecting any rain, no storms. We scanned the skies. Rain is storm free. We did have the showers that moved across the area yesterday. It will expand the view. That system's off Carolina coastline. Some showers off there and then way to the south of us across Florida. Once again, we're about 71 degrees right in the middle of the afternoon across the two state area today. The hot spot's going to be Charleston, South Carolina, 83 degrees out there and another coastal community, Cape Hatteras on the outer banks. 59. The cool reading will be in the mid 70s at Greenville, Spartanburg, Columbia, about 79 degrees. We got travel plans down there. The capital of South Carolina, the capital city of North Carolina, Raleigh at 70, 64 at Boone, over in Asheville at 71 degrees. In case you're heading to Biltmore, now watch this change in temperatures. We got nice weather this weekend. Look at those drops in the temperatures Monday and Tuesday. We see a rebound for the middle of the weekend towards the end of next week. Next weekend we'll see temperatures drop a few degrees below average for today. Boone hits about 64, blowing rock tops out about 63. Up around Jefferson, West Jefferson, low to mid 60s there. Morganton, Lenore, Tailsville, Hickory, Maiden, all much like we see here in our area. It'll be in the low to mid 70s and about the same from Monroe to Wadesboro to Rockingham and Chesterfield down there in South Carolina. Checking the guy roofing 70 forecast through the weekend and beyond. Low to mid 70s today. Tomorrow we'll look for mostly sunny skies. We put that 20% chance in. Most of the air has will not have a chance to rain at all. And then we see 58. That's right. That's not a mistake. That's 58 for high temperature on Monday. Tuesday morning, a frosty morning, cold at 32, high 59. Then we see a rebound Wednesday and Thursday. It looks like by next Friday, here we go, another Friday with a chance of showers with temperatures in the low 60s. That's your forecast this morning. Some North Carolinians who owe millions of dollars in back taxes will have their debt forgiven after 10 years. And that's thanks to a new law that passed last year, adding to the state's existing tax forgiveness legislation. Now, if you haven't heard about the law, you're not alone here. Yeah, a viewer actually told us about it after mm. our Where's the Money investigation exposed that state tax on illegal drugs. The so-called drug tax has cost North Carolinians more than $100 million over the last 15 years, even though some of them were never convicted. Our Nate Morabito discovered those taxpayers and others facing longstanding state tax debt now have a better chance of getting ahead in 2024. If knowledge is power. I don't have to worry about Uncle Sam. <laughs> the word about Uncle Sam. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Uncle Sam. Antonio Mosley finally has the currency he needs. No more debt. No more Uncle Sam. To control his destiny. Boy, like a burden off my back. It was a burden. The small business owner recently learned the state lightened a heavy load. He spent decades hauling. You gotta realize it's 1993. Tied to a teenage mistake that not only sent him to prison. Yes, I owned it. Did my time for it. But also saddled him with thousands of dollars in taxes tied to illegal drugs. They found some cocaine. A debt that for years stood in the way of Mosley's attempts to make the most of his second chance. I don't think it's fair. Just months after we first amplified his plight, he learned the state had already written off his remaining drug tax debt. It was a victory for me. Turns out others are likely unaware they too are now debt free. The lack of knowledge can be just as harmful as the assessment itself. Laura Webb has spent years fighting to end North Carolina's unauthorized substance tax and get the state to forgive all debt. We saw where multiple people were being assessed for the same amount of drugs. The director of the North Carolina Justice Center's Fair Chance Criminal Justice Project says the tax discourages people from getting jobs and forces them to make other major life decisions. They might decide not to go and buy the house based on their tax debt. And it's very hard to overcome these. This amended state law passed in 2023 will help.
It forgives all state tax debt, not just tied to drugs, after 10 years. And it's retroactive, a major change that's received no public attention until now. It is a step in the right direction. Um, we hope that the law will still go further. You feeling good? I'm feeling great. Okay. No more debt. Antonio Mosley didn't know about the law until we told him. It was a big relief. We didn't know until a viewer taught us. It's been a blessing. Now others have this same knowledge. And that is powerful. This new law is just the latest step toward more tax forgiveness in North Carolina. It was actually an existing law that wiped away Mosley's debt. All of this was news to him and to us. The lesson here is to reach out to the Department of Revenue to see whether any of these laws might affect your back taxes. Nate Morabito, WCNC Charlotte. So our work is never done, truly, right? Nate and our team work hard to dig into the receipts, double check those numbers, and then ask those in power, where's the money? Yeah, this story originally came to us from a viewer tip, and as you can see, it's really taken off from there with multiple folks in the community weighing in. And it really just goes to show that your tips can lead to answers and to real change. We do invite you to tune in tonight on WCNC Plus. There you can see our Nate Morbido explaining the behind the scenes of this investigation, how it started, the questions we asked, who we asked, and the answers we are still waiting to get. You can catch that tonight at 8.30 on your favorite streaming device. While there is a lot of excitement right now from some folks, there are also some concerns about gambling addiction becoming more prevalent. Yeah, because of this, as part of the legislation to make betting legal, additional state resources were put in place to help those who might struggle. WCNC Charlotte's Nick Sturdivant talks to some licensed clinical uh, addiction specialists specifically about the risks and what you should look out for. I, I want to throw this out there. I mean, I, I just saw an ad for online sports betting. Mm -hmm. I feel like I run across them every day. You, you can't avoid them either. If you're watching a podcast on YouTube or whatever content on YouTube, you're streaming something on your TV. It's concerning. Uh, you know, they're they're saturating the market, obviously. Um, and, and like you said, they're they're exploring all avenues to do so. Bright lights, big celebrities. This is fun. This is exciting. And then at the very end of those commercials, just real quick, 1-800-GAMBLERS. Art and Christina Close are both licensed clinical addiction specialists. They run Coastal Therapy Center, LLC. And now we have sports betting that is just in your fingertips, uh, which makes it difficult to walk away from. So there's no, oh, I have to leave here and go home or I have another responsibility. It's just in my hands at all times. People tend to de de detach themselves because it is online. It's on an app on your phone, but you're you're losing real money. Mm -hmm. um, and and th there's, you know, there's that high that you feel when you are winning. And what I'm hearing is just be aware of like your personal finances and Again, what you're spending, right? There's thousands of people that can that can safely gamble, um, but but the awareness, like like we said, is key. Anybody can fall victim to gambling. Um, it, it, there, there's no boundaries. Art and Christina tell us, don't be afraid to reach out for help. Here's that number for the North Carolina Gambling our Problem Gambling Helpline, 877-718-5543. That resource is free to anyone who needs it. We also have this online at WCNC.com. You can reach that whenever you need it. And there's a lot of... Time now to connect the dots. When we make the news make sense, there's a new way to order everything from vodka to tequila here in Mecklenburg County, and it's all possible thanks to the online ordering that surged during the pandemic. You can now order some of your favorite liquor from the palm of your hand. Let's connect the dots. Mecklenburg County is bringing beverage sales into the 21st century. The county's ABC board is launching the ABC to go mobile app. It'll allow folks to order ahead and then pick up their purchases in stores. All you have to do is enter a zip code and then browse the inventory of your nearest store. The idea first came together following the pandemic. Thousands used online ordering to avoid going into stores. 
It's just part of the latest push to modernize a dated system. For years, lawmakers have considered privatizing the sale of liquor to help modernize a system that dates back to the Prohibition era. And that is Connecting the Dots. All new tonight, a Charlotte-based company is leading the country in hiring those who are neurodivergent, essentially folks whose brains work differently than most. Yeah, Wells Fargo has hired hundreds of applicants who might otherwise have struggled to find jobs. WCNC Charlotte's Michelle Bowden shows us how the program is seeking solutions and then paying off for both the workers and Wells Fargo. The bank says this isn't about charity. In fact, they say it is a win-win because they're able to tap into a top-notch talent pool. When I came here, I was 27. I had a master's degree. I was a published author, and I had never held down a full-time job for more than about a month. Alex Lieberman admits he was living with his parents with not much on the horizon when he got his job at Wells Fargo three years ago. It feels good to have a future. After a while, I didn't see myself doing anything. And this gave me a chance to build something for myself, to build a way forward, to help other people build their futures too. And it's a privilege I never thought I would get. Lieberman, who is autistic and has ADHD, is a tech consultant at the company, part of the Wells Fargo Neurodiversity Program that launched in 2020. It's a really a talent play. It's not charity. It is gaining access to an incredibly deep, richly diverse, highly skilled talent pool. Stephen DeStefani runs the program that has so far placed almost 300 workers at Wells Fargo in everything from tech jobs to data analytics roles, finance and more. We see the return on investment and I say that a little reluctantly because I because I often say you, you shouldn't need a business case to do the right thing, but there is a business case. We are closing skills gaps and employee satisfaction, particularly for those who have participated or are impacted by the program, is through the roof. DeStefani says one of the keys is making sure the interview process isn't a stumbling block, letting people be themselves. Vivian Wen is a software engineer who is autistic and says that was a challenge at previous jobs where she was often told to change the way she interacted with people. But things like that have happened throughout my life, whether in the interview process or actually at work. Do you think maybe they just didn't understand that you were a little bit different? Absolutely, I agree with that. Because I was different, because I wasn't like them, because I wasn't holistic and I didn't follow what we call social pro protocols and the, all the scripts that you do. Or it sounds like you feel more comfortable in your own skin here and that they actually value your skill set. Oh, absolutely. Yes, they do, because we're here to do work and we're here to make things better. And I'm empowered to do all of those things without letting those social protocols get in the way. We are all people. We think differently than most but we don't have any more or less inherent value than anyone else. In a program that acknowledges that and accommodates that, we have a chance to contribute in ways that people generally don't think that we can. And the Wells Fargo team running the Neurodiverse program says they're actually sharing their best practices with other companies in hopes that other companies will follow their lead. Reporting in Uptown Charlotte, Michelle Bowden, WCNC Charlotte. And now part of our effort with our Seeking Solutions brand is to highlight the companies and individuals and groups making a difference and giving a voice to those who might not always be heard. So if you know a group or maybe a person who's doing just that, we want to hear about them and get the ball rolling towards those solutions. We can't say it enough. A lot of our great stories come from you at home. So send us an email to newstips at WCNC.com. You can see your story on our air. Let's go to a murder investigation, though, in Lancaster County tonight. Yeah, we have learned a 23 year old is now in jail in connection to that case. Lloyd, Lloyd Caldwell Jr. We're told is facing murder and burglary charges. He's accused of killing 65 year old Harriet Mahaffey. WCNC Charlotte's Anna King spoke to neighbors tonight who say they are shocked. Well, neighbors described us as incredibly sad and say with the neighborhood so quiet and tucked away, they're more confused than anything else. With the things that are going on in the world today, you don't never know what's going to happen where. So it's, you know, it was, it was just more or less a surprise. 
Neighbors along Stewart Place Road and Heath Springs say they're shocked after 65 year old Harriet Mahaffey was found murdered in her home Monday. We live in a quiet neighborhood, don't nobody bother nobody, and just for something like that to happen, just uh, a tragic thing for somebody to do something like that. Mahaffey lived alone, and relatives had not heard from her. Lancaster County Sheriff says family members went to check on her Tuesday and they found her unresponsive next to 11 bullet castings. Guys, this was a horrible crime uh, with, with no explanation for it. A uh, uh, lady sitting in her home defenseless, not bothering anybody. Someone walks in and, and shoots her multiple times. During the investigation, officials noticed her 2004 Jeep Cherokee was missing. The same one that was seen in Chester and Charlotte. Investigators eventually traced the car back to 23-year-old Lloyd Caldwell Jr., who was arrested in Chester County. After searching his home, deputies found evidence connecting Caldwell to the murder. We live in a different world today. It's not like it was 20 years ago. And, and, and you know, years ago, people could leave the doors unlocked and things like that. Now you have cameras everywhere. Now you have to keep your doors locked have to be aware of your surroundings all the time. Caldwell is now in the Lancaster County Detention Center charged with murder, first degree burglary, grand larceny, and possession of a firearm during the commission of a violent crime. The Lancaster County Sheriff says there's no clear motive for why this happened, noting the suspect and victim did not know each other. In Lancaster County, Anna King, WCNC Charlotte. 637 now, and we're asking where's the money for college students and graduates? Good early Thursday morning and thanks for watching. A new report from the outlet Study Finds is trying to answer a pretty timely question. Is that four year degree still worth it? Now we want to hear from y'all in a second, but here are the details in this article. There were three main takeaways. First, the short answer is yes. Researchers say investing in a college degree still pays off financially. Now the second takeaway is this. Certain degrees lead to a better return. The money makers are going to be engineering and computer science degrees. And then moving on to three, just in time for Women's History Month, the research shows women benefited slightly more than men by earning that degree. On the numbers, here they are. The data covers about 10 years. It compares earnings and tuition costs of about 6 million students and graduates. Then analysts came up with a percentage. That return of investment came in around 9%. But I want to explain the reasoning behind this number, which explains more than the number itself. If you consider more than just how much you make after school, like the cost of tuition after books and even the lost wages from not entering the workforce sooner, they all point to one factor that's gaining more importance. It's the field that you're able to work in. Researchers in this article say while the degree still pays off, well, that bottom line is college keeps getting pricier. So the recommendation is that students should choose a degree that's going to pay more. It's what has us asking this morning. Do you think a four year degree is still valuable? Make sure you text us 704-329-3600. Let's turn now to a look at your weekend forecast as we take a live look this morning from Dallas out in Gaston County. Good morning to you all. Larry, it's a bit of a foggy start today. Mm -hmm. We'll fog out the area here on the St. Patrick's Day weekend. Got your green on mm -hmm. in honor of the Irish, you know, because we have to work in the green environment over there. No Makes green. It makes a little hard. But we do have a lot of green that we can show, and that's what we're talking about is this St. Patrick's weekend. You know, there's so many times on this time of the year you, you can get rainy condition, you get cold and misty, but not, not this weekend. We're right on 74 degrees, so perfect for the big parade in uptown and for the festival that's going on all through the morning into the afternoon. And for St. Patrick's Day, tomorrow near 70 70 degrees, not bad at all. We take a live view from our, our Mr. Sparky Carolina Camera Network. That's right there, downtown Blowing Rock, North Carolina. Looking very nice there. A few fair weather clouds. Now, this is, <laughs> this is our camera from Ballantyne looking towards uptown. You can still see some, some uh, fog there. So you got some patchy and dense fog in a couple of spots, but not any issues out there from Monroe. Things looking okay. The old courthouse there looking off the distance. Just fair weather clouds. Should be a nice day across the region, but... We are still dealing with all of this amazing amount of pollen. It's the time of the year, so it's off the charts tomorrow and again on Monday. So high pollen count again today. Blame the trees. We love the trees, but they certainly could cause some issues out there. No issues once again with our forecast. 11 a.m., 62 degrees. Once again, that's when the parade starts in uptown Charlotte. Expecting thousands of people up there for the festival as well. Should be a fun time. And between about 4 and 6 today, we'll be in the low 70s. I would say there may be many, many spots that actually get into the mid-70s this afternoon, but I would say averaging about 70, 71 degrees across the area today. Not expecting a 
rain, no storms. We scanned the skies. Rain is storm free. We did have the showers that moved across the area yesterday. It will expand the view. That system is off the Carolina coastline. Some showers off there and then way to the south of us across Florida. Once again, we're about 71 degrees right in the middle of the afternoon across the two state area today. The hot spot's going to be Charleston, South Carolina, 83 degrees out there and another coastal community, Cape Hatteras on the outer banks. 59. The cool reading will be in the mid 70s at Greenville, Spartanburg, Columbia, about 79 degrees. We got travel plans down there. The capital of South Carolina, the capital city of North Carolina, Raleigh at 70, 64 at Boone, over in Asheville at 71 degrees. In case you're heading to go up more. Now watch this change in temperatures. We got nice weather this weekend. Look at those drops in the temperatures Monday and Tuesday. We see a rebound for the middle of the weekend towards the end of next week. Next weekend we'll see temperatures drop a few degrees below average for today. Boone hits about 64, blowing rock tops out about 63. Up around Jefferson, West Jefferson, low to mid 60s there. Morganton, Lenore, Tailsville, Hickory, Maiden, all much like we see here in our area. It'll be in the low to mid 70s and about the same from Monroe to Wadesboro to Rockingham and Chesterfield down there in South Carolina. Checking the guy roofing seven day forecast through the weekend and beyond. Low to mid 70s today. Tomorrow we'll look for mostly sunny skies. We put that 20% chance in. Most of the year has will not have a chance to rain at all. And then we see 58. That's right. That's not a mistake. That's 58 for high temperature on Monday, Tuesday morning, a frosty morning, cold at 32, high 59. Then we see a rebound Wednesday and Thursday. It looks like by next Friday, here we go. Another Friday with a chance of showers with temperatures in the low 60s. That's your forecast this morning. What's near me? If you're out and see news, open the WCNC News app and go to near me on the bottom right. Then tap share with us. Upload your photo or video and tell us about it. Hit submit and your news has reached our team at WCNC Charlotte. Happy Friday, everybody. Yay. We have made it. TGIF. Yeah. This week flew by for me. I don't know about you guys. Uh, you know what? It'd fly back even faster if it was a four day week. That's right. Yes. <laughs> I'm all uh, for it. Can we do this? Uh, well, didn't Larry David have something to say? I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Bernie Sanders. <laughs> he wow. did. Funny you should say. Yes. <laughs> Often confused for one another. Uh, that's what we're talking about this morning. A four day work week could be one step closer to becoming the norm. So let us know this morning, what do you think? Do you think that, that uh, that's just as good as five days and you can be just as productive? So Bernie Sanders introducing a bill that would reduce the standard work week to 32 hours without a pay cut. The bill would mandate workers get overtime pay anything after 32 hours of work instead of, you know, most people work an average of 40 hours a week. A recent survey found nearly 90% of workers said they'd be interested in the idea of a shorter work week. I'm sure, especially if you right. get the same pay. So this morning we want to hear from you. What do you think? Do you think it is time we make a four day work week the standard or do you think five days is just fine? Let us know. Uh, some people commenting this morning saying everyone deserves more weekend and less work week. I am all for the four day schedule. I'd love a four day work week, but it will increase costs for employers, especially small businesses, because you have to hire more people to cover the hours that they aren't open. And babysitters and things like oh, that. Oh yeah, four day work sure. week would be a dream, but becomes unfair when you also want the school week to stay at five days a week, yep. uh, four days, but work nine hour days. So there you go, lots of people. Chime in. Joy already, already says she, she'd go for it. Would you guys, what, what, what do you guys think? I'm with you. Yeah. Working <laughs> five days to get two days off, it's just, it's, I'm not a fan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for me, it's almost less about the working four days as much as it is about having three days off. It's, <laughs> that's just such a nice, I feel like. Oh, uh, yeah, for perk. sure. Um, but Larry, you wouldn't take that extra day, would you? <laughs> if it was Monday, I probably would. I don't like I'll Friday being the day. I think Monday. Because yeah. everyone's happy. We like Friday. Happy is Friday, yeah. But then yeah, wouldn't yeah, everybody agree. be happy that it's, it's Thursday? Yeah. Thursday. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Thursday is. Uh, <laughs> well, hey, it's speaking. not going to happen. Yeah, so. Melissa, yeah, Melissa yeah, says she's uh, she's <laughs> down already log off early on Fridays. I think a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. Though, Joy I feel Mott like, saying she, she'd go for it, too. Yeah, I, I think um, I think there's a couple of things here. Okay. Same thing as our, the AI conversation the other day and whatever else. We're, I, I feel like we're sort of behind the eight ball on, on these conversations. I feel like we've evolved so much and the work week as it is right now evolved decades ago and I feel like we're, we're not staying up on things because I think sure there's a conversation to be had about four day work weeks. I also think if you have that conversation, perhaps more importantly, is bringing people up to a pay scale that is appropriate. Yeah. I mean, you have a lot of people making 
less than they would have in the 1950s for the mm -hmm. same job once mm -hmm. you once you adjust mm -hmm. for inflation. And they're working harder. And they're working harder. And that, and that just doesn't make sense with technology and everything mm -hmm. else. And I, and I feel like there's issues like that. R retiring, I feel like we have some antiquated ideas of retiring and when to retire and what's the official retirement age. Have you ever thought about I feel being like, an agent? I need to hire you. Uh-uh. Oh, <laughs> Ben would be a great agent. Yes. yes. I would hate but that. But please don't leave the news No, desk I would hate that. Because I, who's going to do flash? Uh, yeah, right, right, <laughs> you. <laughs> um, so I, I think I'm, of course, open to the idea of working four days, but I feel like there's other big conversations to have around that as well that we're not having. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. All right, well, hey. Speaking of the weekend, yes. mm. it is going to be a two-day two day weekend, right. but, but there's still a lot going That's on right. this weekend. So we're talking about three big events happening around the Queen City, uh, kicking off your weekend with the Charlotte Hornets. The team plays their first of two games tonight against the Phoenix Suns. Tickets still available. The game starts at 7 at the Spectrum Center. Also, take a look at this. Celebrating all things green, of course. The St. Patrick's Day party yeah. returns to Uptown. Look at those Irish step dancers. Uh, the beloved parade kicks off Saturday at 11 a.m. You know, technically it's St. Patrick's Day Sunday, but the parade Saturday. Yep, yep. Uh, the parade starts at East 9th Street and Tryon Street. If you can't make it to the parade, a festival will take place before and after the parade from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. So lots going on. Also, uh, grab your green and get ready for more fun at Charlotte's annual bar crawl event for St. Patrick's Day. Uh, they have discounted drinks, free entry at participating bars. The crawl starts at tattoos and booze at 2 p.m. on about the Sunday. End of the people crawling? I've always wondered about mm. that. Is no, that... you're just going from oh, okay. place to place, ah, right? Yeah, some are. Yeah, yeah. I some bet of them are some will probably be crawling, <laughs> unfortunately. They need yes. to go yeah, home. Yeah, right. uh, tickets start at $12. So, um, Lots going on, Larry, mm, but there might on. be some well, some rain. What right? about the weather for yeah. St. Patrick's Day? There you My go. Friend, Leap and Larry's not here. I don't know where he is. He's in the basement, I, maybe. But I thought no. he would make an appearance. I, I he made thought, an appearance this morning. I know. I don't know where the guy is. Uh, today, yes, I would say there's a chance of a few showers and storms, particularly from about noon until four. But tomorrow, for all the big events, the parade uptown, the uh, the festival that's going on, uh, looking for temperatures in the, the mid 70s. And then on St. Patrick's Day, that's as perfect as it gets. I mean, that? yeah, that's unseasonally warm. Luck the Irish. Wonderful. 70, a green Luck 72. Of the wearing of the green. But I did want to, let's see, we push this button right here. And I was going to show you what's going to happen next week, but it just not it working for me. <laughs> and by next Tuesday, it's only good. There it there is. All go. right. You can see next Tuesday, a low of 32, a high of only 56. Mm -hmm. Take it back. You're going to look well, green. That's <laughs> right. Uh -uh. <laughs> uh, we still got some people chiming in yeah. about working from home. John Kelly saying, I think the ability of working from home, hybrid or modified work week is long overdue. The old five day in the office is outdated when we're talking about going to four day work weeks. Yeah. Uh, Melissa chiming in saying, John Kelly, I've been working from home for six years. I would take seven figures to get me. <laughs> oh, it would take yeah. seven figures yeah. to get me back into the office. Yeah, well, people. I think, that's what, what, I think that's what made the pandemic so hard is that people got a taste of that life. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then they were told, nah, I mean, got to come back. I mean, people here, they left uh, because they were I just like, I admire I work people from home. who can work from home because I would be the lazy, I still am la lazy anytime I'm home anyway. Um, I would not describe I would, you as lazy I, at no, all. No, at home, no, home, I would be, I would not be able to work. That's why I have to come to work. That's why, yeah. like Ben and myself, maybe one of the, we were here during the, during the pandemic. Well, so was I. I know, but you weren't with us at the time. Oh, yeah, I was at night. We were talking about us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just it was, it's like having to come in and work. And if I stayed at home, I would be really I would be lazy. I'd be they'd go. He's out of here. Well, our job <laughs> is kind of different because it's like it's easier here because all the equipment's here. Yes, that's exactly you know. Right. But depending on what your job yeah. is, if you have everything at home and almost have that like that separate mm. space, yeah, which is totally. hard because I do think people yeah. you know. If your kids are home or you got laundry, you get distracted easily. That's I was about sure. to say, now I didn't sure. have no kids to distract me. Yeah. But when I was just reporting, I had to work from home and I was much more efficient. So I don't know. I think it just depends on what kind of person you are. Like, I, always so, yeah. Well, yeah. A couple of, I know a couple of our reporters uh, did say that they did not like being home. One in particular really? used to work on a morning show. She yeah. said she did not like working yeah. at home. So it's, every, it's up to Depends it's on the person. person. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 All right. Right. May you be so lucky as to get the decision at some point. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of us I, don't. I doubt it's going to uh, happen. That's right. That's right. That's right. All right. Let us know what you think. Have a great weekend. We'll see you back here on Monday. Bye. Bye.
Now to Gastonia, where the city is making plans after getting a $250,000 donation from an anonymous donor. However, that donor says the money must go towards improving the aesthetics of some busy roadways. WCNC Charlotte's Jesse Pierre shares more about how this money will be used. Yes, the city of Gastonia received a very generous gift and the money will be used to make the area surrounding several interchanges more appealing to the eye. Anything to do to beautify this area, it's going to be seen. Along US 321 and just under a mile from I-85 is Allen's Mobile Home and RV Supplies. Owner Billy Linhart says one thing he can count on seeing outside his doors is a flow of cars. Just probably almost double how much traffic I've seen out here in just the nine years that I've been here. But now, due to a generous donation, drivers can expect a more pleasant drive into Gastonia. Thanks to an anonymous $250,000 donation, three busy interchanges along I-85 will be freshened up. Those interchanges are at Cox Road, New Hope Road, and US 321. The first step, starting with some simple cleanup. The trash, the underbrush, the vine, I mean, just right. to, to clean that, and then the next step would be to uh, spruce it up. The money will also go towards replacing aging and broken fencing, planting grass, and low maintenance shrubs. City leaders gave the green light for the beautification project to begin, despite some concerns of wasting money ahead of the I-85 widening project set to begin in a few years. Just hate to see them put a lot of landscaping plans in place, you know, plantings and things like that to have them yanked out in a matter of a short period of time. Mm -hmm. you know. I think the conversation was had with the anonymous donor Yes, that that project would impact, and they said, go forth and do good things. City leaders hoping to save some of the money until after the widening project is done. Linhart says this will be a good look for the city. To give people an impression of Gastonia, to make them want to come back, to make them want to shop, stop, eat. He hopes it will make the congestion in the area more bearable and hopefully attract more foot traffic in. Jesse Pierre, WCNC Charlotte. In just a few hours, the ACC men's basketball tournament is set to tip off. This is one of several major tournaments going on this week. It all comes ahead of Selection Sunday when we'll get our first look at March Madness brackets. NC State plays Louisville this afternoon at 430. Duke and UNC have their first games of the tournament on Thursday. Well, these intense games sometimes lead to fans storming the court in excitement. But WCNC's Megan Bragg explains why that might not be a great idea in today's Verify. Buzzer beater moments are what the madness is all about. But sometimes those moments can cause harm to the players. This year, a Duke player was hurt after Wake Forest fans stormed the court after their win. So can fans be civilly liable if they injure a player while storming the court? Let's verify. Our sources, attorney Eric Hayes with James Scott and Farron Law Firm, the NCAA, and the ACC. The NCAA does not have a policy on storming the court and leaves punishment up to each conference. Duke and Wake Forest are in the ACC conference. Currently, the ACC does not have rules against it. However, NCAA spokesperson David Warlock told NBC News court storming is not allowed during NCAA tournament games and they work with venues to develop a security plan to try and prevent it. They don't go into it thinking that they could be hurt during an after game court storming incident. Attorney Eric Hayes says if a player is hurt by a fan because of court storming, they could be held liable for that injury. Fans are um, if not just negligent, maybe grossly negligent or reckless, whatever they are taking the court like that if they were to cause an injury to someone. What would the argument be for a fan who rushed the court, ran into a player and hurt them? I didn't mean to do it. Well, then you should have stayed in your seat. As for schools being held liable, that's still an open question. A player who was injured did sue the school and did settle the case. Whether or not a school could be held liable, I think that that is an open question and certainly one that schools would be concerned about. So we can verify that, yes, fans can be held civilly liable if they injure a player while storming the court. With your Verify, I'm Megan Bragg. If you have something you would like verified, just email us at verify at wcnc.com. With your help, WCNC Charlotte is making a difference in our community. 
beautiful day, so many people helping. This is incredible. Let's spread that love tonight. Here is a $5,000 check that you guys can use to further the mission. There is nothing on earth like the feeling of giving back with your hands. $5,000 to you and uh, Block Love Charlotte for what you guys do. If you'd like to make a difference, go to wcnc.com slash make a difference now. Time now to connect the dots when we make the news make sense. Lots of kids hearing back from colleges and universities this week as schools release their decisions. But a few a new form has colleges and families asking, where's the money? Problems with a new financial aid system have both colleges and families waiting for answers. Let's connect the dots. Before families can make a decision on college, finances are often a huge factor. But colleges are in limbo as they still wait to receive information about applicants' finances. The root of the problem comes from the FAFSA website. That's where students can see if they qualify for aid. The Department of Education has been trying to overhaul the form for years. The changes use a new calculation called the Student Aid Index to determine how much a family should get. It's meant to benefit low-income students, but it hasn't been a smooth process. Some families say they're not getting as much aid as they should. Now experts say you may want to consider appealing your case to try and get more money, hopefully in time to make a choice by College Decision Day on May 1st. And that is Connecting the Dots. Well, tomorrow is Canvas Day, where every county election board inside North Carolina will vote to officially certify the primary election results. The primary was the first election under a new state law saying mail in ballots must be in by election day rather than getting that grace period. Yes, WCNC Charlotte's Julia Kaufman shows us how voting activists say this change discounts uh, legitimate or discounts legitimate votes, but supporters call it common sense. When North Carolinians voted by mail in previous elections, their ballots had a three day grace period to get to the county election office. That grace period is gone and now ballots marked as returned after deadline are piling up. 31. Under new state laws, absentee ballots need to get to the election office by 7.30 p.m. on election day to count. It was very unnecessary, very unfair to voters. The State Board of Elections tells WCNC Charlotte in the 2020 presidential primary, which had a higher voter turnout than in 2024, 800 ballots were returned after the three-day grace period and not counted. This year, 999 absentee ballots have been received so far that will not count due to missing the new deadline. There are people right now who did everything right and through no fault of their own, but the mail service not getting their ballot in time to the County Board of Elections, their vote won't count. Bob Phillips with Common Cause argues the new deadline hurts all absentee voters regardless of party affiliation. This law, I think, is going to contribute to that feeling that something is wrong with our elections. Supporters like the North Carolina Republican Party argue the new voting laws restore trust in elections. A spokesperson says, quote, the changes enacted by the General Assembly to strengthen election integrity and create one singular deadline worked as intended. These laws are reasonable, common sense efforts to create certainty and transparency in the election process. County election offices are required to notify voters if their vote did not count and explain why. That process will begin after the election is certified. Julia Kaufman, WCNC Charlotte. Verify, WCNC Charlotte. Verify is all about trying to make a difference in the community by making sure that the community has the correct information. This is what we know. And hey, this is what we don't know. Sometimes you're actually surprised by the answer. Verify the difference. Verify is a great way to combat that misinformation, making sure that people know the process of the reporting. Time now to connect the dots. When we make the news make sense, thousands of drivers are reporting their insurance rates are going up, and it could be thanks to data collected behind the scenes. A report shows cars made by GM, Ford, Honda, and other popular manufacturers are sending your data to insurance companies, and you may not even know about it. Let's connect the dots. In most of these vehicles, there's software tracking how you drive. It keeps data about 
when you're on the road, how fast you drive, and how quickly you brake. It's all thanks to the ability of newer cars to connect to the internet. And the New York Times reports all that data gets sent off to your insurance company for a personalized rate. And automakers say it's all legal, thanks to all those papers you sign when you buy a new car. That is Connecting the Dots. To this, another push to provide mental health resources to Carolina's most vulnerable students. We do thank you for sticking with us this evening for the news at six. I'm Vanessa Rufus and I'm Colin Mayfield. Now in the aftermath of a deadly school shooting in Uvalde, Texas, Congress dedicated money to help prevent future school violence and improve student mental health. But our where's the money investigation found new schools in the Carolinas are actually putting that money to use. Yeah, not many schools tonight, nearly yeah. two months after our Nate Morbido exposed this problem. South Carolina is making a second effort to deliver millions of federal dollars to students who are most at risk. When we discovered South Carolina had only awarded this money to a dozen school districts, the Department of Education said it would find a way to spend the rest of the money. Well, now if everything goes as planned, more than twice as many school districts could receive this potentially life saving money in round two. In Uvalde, Texas, a gunman murdered two teachers and 19 children. Almost two years later, millions of dollars in grants sit unused. Funds elected leaders approved to prevent another Robb Elementary School shooting. It makes no sense to me for these dollars to be offered by the federal government to be sitting in coffers while our schools are not as safe as they can be. We, we need to do better. It's a revelation WCNC Charlotte took all the way to the top. First with the Secretary of Education and then with the Vice President herself. Well, that's part of why I'm here, to make sure that the money gets to where it needs to be going. These so-called Stronger Connections grants are meant to help school districts with high rates of poverty, bullying, absenteeism, and exclusionary discipline. Sometimes I just think I'm not sure how some of these children kind of survive their life. But York School District 1 is the only school system in the Charlotte area that's received a grant so far. The district is using the money to ensure every school has its own mental health therapist. My mission is to help these children who are struggling so much. South Carolina is hoping others will take notice of York's efforts. If you are eligible, please, please apply. The Department of Education opened a second round of applications this month. Records show more than 50 South Carolina districts are eligible and they have two months to submit their applications. We just wanna make sure that this gets out there and we don't have to send any of it back. While South Carolina is moving on to round two, North Carolina has still not spent a single cent of this money. You can blame that on bureaucracy and delays in communication. Nate Morbido, WCNC Charlotte. Now to go further here, we asked some of the districts that did not apply in round one why not? The Lancaster County School District told us the timing was not good back then, but assured us if there was a second round, it would apply. So we alerted those district leaders earlier today that this opportunity is available to them. And so as you can see, Nate and our Where's the Money team are very hard at work. They are tracking those federal dollars. They're keeping receipts here. They're checking those. They're holding those in power accountable, really all in an effort to give you answers. So that being said, if you have something out there you think our team should be looking into, please let us know. You could send us an email to money at WCNC.com or reach out to our team on social media. Let's turn now to a look at your weekend forecast as we take a live look this morning from Dallas out in Gaston County. Good morning to you all. Larry, it's a bit of a foggy start today. Mm -hmm. We'll fog out the area here on the St. Patrick's Day weekend. Got your green on mm -hmm. in honor of the Irish, you know, because we have to work in the green environment over there. No it green. Makes it a little hard. But we do have a lot of green that we can show, and that's what we're talking about is this St. Patrick's weekend. You know, there's so many times on uh, this time of the year you, you can get rainy condition, you get cold and misty, but not, not this weekend. We're right on 74 degrees, so perfect for the big parade in uptown and for the festival that's going on all through the morning into the afternoon. And for St. Patrick's Day, tomorrow near 70. 
70 degrees, not bad at all. We take a live view from our, our Mr. Sparky Carolina camera network. That's right there, downtown Blowing Rock, North Carolina. Looking very nice there. A few fair weather clouds. Now, this is, <laughs> this is our camera from Ballantyne looking towards uptown. You can still see some, some uh, fog there. So you got some patchy and dense fog in a couple of spots, but not any issues out there from Monroe. Things looking okay. The old courthouse there looking off the distance. Just fair weather clouds. Should be a nice day across the region, but... We are still dealing with all of this amazing amount of pollen. It's the time of the year, so it's off the charts tomorrow and again on Monday. So high pollen count again today. Blame the trees. We love the trees, but they certainly could cause some issues out there. No issues once again with our forecast. 11 a.m., 62 degrees. Once again, that's when the parade starts in uptown Charlotte. Expecting thousands of people up there for the festival as well. Should be a fun time. And between about 4 and 6 today, we'll be in the low 70s. I would say there may be many, many spots that actually get into the mid-70s this afternoon, but I would say averaging about 70, 71 degrees across the area today. Not expecting a Rain, no storms. We scanned the skies. Rain is storm free. We did have the showers that moved across the area yesterday. It will expand the view. That system's off Carolina coastline. Some showers off there, and then way to the south of us across Florida. Once again, we're about 71 degrees right in the middle of the afternoon. Across the two state area today, the hot spot's going to be. Charleston, South Carolina, 83 degrees out there, and another coastal community, Cape Hatteras on the Outer Banks, 59. The cool reading will be in the mid 70s at Greenville, Spartanburg, Columbia, up about 79 degrees. We got travel plans down there, the capital of South Carolina, the capital city of North Carolina, Raleigh at 70, 64 at Boone, over in Asheville at 71 degrees. In case you're heading to Biltmore, now watch this change in temperatures. We got nice weather this weekend. Look at those drops in the temperatures Monday and Tuesday. We see a rebound for the middle of the weekend towards the end of next week. Next weekend we'll see temperatures drop a few degrees below average for today. Boone hits about 64, blowing rock tops out about 63. Up around Jefferson, West Jefferson, low to mid 60s there. Morganton, Lenore, Tailsville, Hickory, Maiden, all much like we see here in our area. It'll be in the low to mid 70s and about the same from Monroe to Wadesboro to Rockingham and Chesterfield down there in South Carolina. Checking the guy roofing 70 forecast through the weekend and beyond. Low to mid 70s today. Tomorrow we'll look for mostly sunny skies. We put that 20% chance in. Most of the year has will not have a chance to rain at all. And then we see 58. That's right. That's not a mistake. That's 58 for high temperature on Monday. Tuesday morning, a frosty morning, cold at 32, high 59. Then we see a rebound Wednesday and Thursday. It looks like by next Friday, here we go, another Friday with a chance of showers with temperatures in the low 60s. That's your forecast this morning. WCNC Charlotte. Weather is a, a kind of science that you get to see and experience every day. And I think some people don't even realize how much it affects them. That weather has a huge impact on how it threatens your family, your livelihood, or your home. So I think it really is one of those defining things we do that really affects everybody in our community. See the difference. That process of giving you a warning ahead of time and keeping you and your family safe is really important to me because I live here too. It's my family, it's my friends, it's my neighbors. Well, an 11 year old boy with dreams of starting up his own landscaping business is getting some big help. We first told you about Quentin Hines earlier this week. Now he's getting a big boost, getting some fresh new tools. WCNC Charlotte's Miles Harris gives us a closer look. To see him at 11 with adult equipment um, is scary for me as a mom. <laughs> but it's just what he loves to do. By far one of our best mowers. Who would have thought an 11 year old would love to cut grass so much? That's exactly where Quentin Hines' passion lies, making a difference inside his community one lawn at a time. What do you like about cutting grass most or doing yard work, huh? I don't know, I just enjoy it, probably just beautifying lawns and yeah, making lawns look beautiful. We'll help you out all we can. He's getting a helpful hand from Cenex. The company caught Quentin's story and wanted to assist his service. Easier we can make that on him, whether it's lighter tools, uh, tools that move on our own uh, with just the squeeze of a handle, uh, or whatever that is, uh, and then providing him with all the tools uh, that he needed. Not only adding more tools in the shed for Quentin, but also adding $1,000 to his GoFundMe. The fact that we're helping a young kid at a young age um, mold into what's going to be a very, very productive uh, and positive role model 
uh, in his community and in our community. Life lessons on generosity that his family surely appreciates. I think you know, this is really just showing Quentin now that people will stand behind you and support you know, your dream when you let it be known. Yeah. So I think that's very big for him at this early age. His next step might include getting more space. And with all the stuff that they're giving now, we're definitely going to need additional space to yeah. put this stuff. Yeah, oh, wow. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. Our garage is now gone. <laughs> <laughs> space to continue his dreams. What do you hope, big picture? What do you want to do? Um, just give like free services to senior citizens, help out other people, and just beautify lines. In Huntersville, Miles Harris, WCNC Charlotte. Unemployment rate is going in the right direction. There are many still struggling to find a job with a livable wage. Yeah, it is tough out there for many folks. The Charlotte Cooking School is helping people get ahead and get into the workforce, particularly by training them to prepare five star meals. Our Larry Sprinkle has been asking, where's the money? And for some folks, it's right there in the kitchen. 21 year old Courtney Allen, also known as Cam, moved to Charlotte a few months ago. Growing up, she always had the dream of playing basketball. I love basketball. But she also liked to cook. A few bad work experiences in the kitchen had her feeling like cooking was not a good fit, especially when combined with some difficult life experiences she was going through at the time. I was going through a lot before I came down here. Then she heard about the community culinary school. So I was able to see how it felt to be in a position that a real chef would be in. We are a 501c3 nonprofit that works with adults who've experienced barriers to long-term employment. Since 1997, skilled and professional chefs like Chef Ron have been helping students reach the goal of earning a living wage, creating delicious meals. The Community Culinary School of Charlotte gives back. We offer folks an opportunity to touch the success that they envision for themselves. And there is a hunger for the chefs who learn their craft here. As we emerge from COVID, the hospitality industry needs help and they need trained professionals. This training is just what Cam needs to give her the confidence to get back into the kitchen. My knife skills, yes. That prove you so much on your knife skills. Giving her the cutting edge, just like on the hardwoods. It's a passion. <laughs> I love basketball, so I made this a passion as well. So Cam is putting on a full court press to complete the training and take her victory lap. It's like you won a championship when you graduate. You get what I'm saying? It's like you won a medal. So hopefully I get my medal because I'm almost there. We are training hospitality folks so they have the ability to grow and, and uh, take care of themselves, their families, their community. Earning the title of chef isn't the end. It's just the beginning for Cam, who has a very big dream. It's hopefully in 10 years I have my own restaurant, my own staff, me working under me. Chopping it up on the east side of Charlotte, Larry Sprinkle, back to you. What's that old? WCNC Charlotte. Good morning, Carolina. Tune in to the team that's preparing you for your day. The one and only Larry Sprinkle. See the difference in your morning. It is bitter cold just about anywhere you look. Here's a look right here at I-77 northbound. Trying to make your dollar stretch a little bit further. Responsible reporting, community focused, unique content. It's so good to see you. Uh, Y'all are having too much like fun. This. See the difference weekday mornings on WCNC Charlotte. Now, burnout in nursing is on the rise, and this is an issue we've seen only get worse since the pandemic. There's no doubt. Right now, the American Nurses Association says it's more important than ever to understand how to manage and then prevent the condition. WCNC Charlotte's Lexi Wilson introduces us to a local nurse who is using comedy as her outlet. In uptown Charlotte, it's a real big deal to be invited here. The Bloomingthal Arts Stage Door Theater is a place with passion for local productions. The lighting, the sounds, the tech crew, uh, there's ushers here. We love the ushers. Debbie Millwater has a love for comedy. Comedy has played a huge part in my life. Even though I like to think that I'm funny, uh, my kids assure me that I am not. While she spent time on stage, she enjoys being a comedy show producer even more. <laughs> 
helping create shows like the 2024 March Mania Comedy Tournament, where 32 local comedians battle it out until there's one winner. It just lights them up inside. It's very validating. It's a light <laughs> Debbie also needs. I just celebrated my sixth anniversary as an overnight bedside nurse. These days, there's an urgent warning about the shortage of health care workers. Research shows burnout and fatigue are prevalent. It's something Debbie has felt, especially during the pandemic. Staffing numbers had dropped and uh, the complexity of the patients didn't change. She's worked in the COVID unit and now works with cancer patients, most of them fighting for their life. That's why the laughs made here are so important. Comedy definitely helped me push through uh, not only the pandemic, but nursing in general. A love for comedy, rewarding on and off the stage. And the March Mania Comedy Tournament finale is this Friday here at Stage Door Theater at 7 p.m. Tickets are $10. Reporting in Uptown for WCNC Charlotte, I'm Lexi Wilson. What an empowering way, you yes. know, to find a, a medium to get all of that out. It's not good to keep in either. So true, and, and it is a tough job. Man. Someone who comes from a family, moms, a nurse, yeah. cousins, nurses, yeah. aunts, nurses, those are special people. Humanity has to be <laughs> thankful, and uh, so I think sometimes we take them for granted. So. Good Wednesday morning. Now Zillow, which is a real estate market company, is doing some research on how much we need to make to afford a home without stretching the budget at least so much. Now the report can be very numbers heavy, but we broke it down like this. First, Zillow is finding that the income needed to comfortably afford a home is up 80% since 2020. Now keep in mind the median income has only risen 23% in that same amount of time. For those shopping for homes today, you need to be well in the six figure range. Zillow says you need to be making, taking home rather more than $106,000 a year. Then those researchers took that, those numbers and made a ranked list. They took 50 metro areas across the country and compared how much is needed to afford a house in each one. Charlotte came in at number 23. Now the ranking shows you would have to save for about nine years just to afford a 10% down payment. And as for possible solutions, well, the article points to an interesting trend. So it's called house hacking. It just means being able to rent out all or part of a home so you can get some extra cash. Zillow says at least 21% of last year's buyers reported co-buying with either a friend or a relative in order to save some money. So it's why we're asking if you'd be willing to take the same route this morning. Here's the question. Would you co-buy your house with a friend or a relative? Make sure you text us 704-329-3600. Wake up to the news that matters most with meteorologist and traffic reporter Chris Mulcahy. And we're all clear. We're keeping you smarter, safer, and on time. Start your day the Mulcahy way. See the difference. 430 to 7 on WCNC Charlotte. If you've ever received a bill or bought a ticket for a concert and noticed the price was a lot higher than you anticipated, you may have gotten hit with junk fees. But what exactly are they and can you combat them? WCNC Charlotte's Megan Bragg looks into it in today's Verify. So let's get the facts. Our sources are the Biden administration, a bill filed in the Senate, and Sarah Rathner with NerdWallet. Rathner says many people don't know this, but we're spending a lot of money each year on junk fees. These individual fees on their own might not seem like much, but added up all together, junk fees are costing American families tens of billions of dollars a year. A bill filed in the U.S. Senate known as the Junk Fees Prevention Act would make merchants disclose these hidden fees up front instead of hiding them at the very end of the transaction. Rathner says while this won't make these hidden fees any lower, it's still a step in the right direction. But it is going to make it easier for consumers to comparison shop knowing the final price and not just the initial price that's being advertised. This means if you're deciding between, let's say, two hotel rooms under the Junk Fees Prevention Act, both places would have to disclose any hidden fees before you get to the end of the checkout process. You can then choose which hotel works best for you. Rathner says since junk fees aren't going away, you'll need to include them in your budget. It is unfortunate that you can't always tell what something's going to cost until the very end. But really what might be helpful is just budgeting an additional amount of money. So if you think something's going to cost you $50, maybe budget $75 just in case. With your Verify Fact Check, I'm Megan Bragg. And if you have something you would like verified, just email us at verify at wcnc.com.
Meantime, right now at six, learning can be a challenge for many students for a lot of different reasons. For students who are hard of hearing, though, those hurdles can be tougher to overcome. Now, a Charlotte family is pushing for CMS to change the way their child who is deaf is taught, saying the current system is too isolating. The state provides extra funding for each student who is deaf in public schools. However, the parents argue those dollars are not going to their child's education the way it's supposed to. That has our Michelle Bowden asking, where's the money? Up until a few years ago, there were several different options for teaching deaf students in Mecklenburg County. Now, though, the parents we talked to say there's only one option, and they say it's setting their kids up for failure. Afternoons in this house look a little different than most. There's all the hubbub of after school energy, but not a lot of noise. Mom and dad are deaf, and so are four of their seven kids. Three of the kids who are deaf are at University Meadows Elementary School, where they are mainstreamed in a class with all hearing kids and have an interpreter. It's nice for my deaf children to be in a challenging environment where they're stimulated to learn and around other hearing children. That's fine, but there isn't communication and association with other deaf children. Besides their siblings, they need to be around with other children who are like them. We worked with an interpreter to do this interview where mom told us how frustrated she is with the way her kids are being taught. So all day long, the only person that they're interacting with is the interpreter. So they don't get to learn vicariously from other students. They don't get the opportunity to uh, help other students. They don't get the opportunity to be helped by other students. They don't get to talk about what's cool and what's not cool. She says the only people that know sign language at her kids' school are the interpreters assigned to each of them. So when the kids go to school, they literally can only communicate with the interpreter and that's it? Yes, just the interpreter. It hasn't always been this way. Until 2016, CMS had a special program for deaf students in Mecklenburg County where the kids were taught under one roof at Cotswold Elementary. In fact, that's where Carolyn went to school and it's what she wanted for her own kids. To see what's happening and to hear from the interpreters. Donna McCord Smolik is a deaf advocate who also grew up here in Charlotte and sent her kids to Cotswold. You know, the hearing students are in such a uh, for them, an integrated classroom, but it is such not an integrated classroom for the deaf student. They're left out, they're placed on an island, and all of the hearing people around them who don't know any different think they're doing the right best thing because they've got them so integrated that they've erased them, and there they are sitting alone, and it just breaks my heart. We checked with the state and learned every North Carolina school district decides how they want to approach teaching deaf students. Wake County, the school district most comparable to Mecklenburg, told us most of the students who are hearing impaired in their district attend their home schools with an interpreter if needed. But Wake County also offers regional programs or cluster programs for deaf students at three schools. We also checked in with the National Association for the Deaf, NAD, who told us as of 2020, 70% of deaf students were mainstreamed across the country, but pointed to the 2004 Federal Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act, or IDEA. That requires options for deaf children, including cluster schools that serve large groups of deaf students at selected schools. A spokesman for NAD told us, quote, deaf schools are an important placement opportunity mandated by IDEA that can be very beneficial for deaf children in providing education and community. Because right now, all of the deaf children are dispersed. And it is hard for deaf children to be around other deaf children. The state gives each school district an extra $5,600 per deaf student to make sure they have the tools they need. But Carolyn says money meant for her kids is being lumped in with money for all kids with special needs. To use the money that is allocated for the deaf student and then subsume it into a larger budget that's paying for ramps and for other forms of access isn't fair. That money was allocated to the deaf student. It makes me wonder about their future. I see a lack of resources. I see a lack of education for the deaf children. I see them not being set for success. The family we talked to say they're working with several advocates in town looking into the possibility of bringing a charter school for deaf students here in Mecklenburg County. They tell us right now they're in the exploratory phase. Reporting in Charlotte, Michelle Bowden, WCNC Charlotte.
And now our Where's the Money team works hard to hold those in power accountable, including the school systems and government agencies that use your taxpayer dollars. That being said, most of the time, it's your tips that really prompt us to start digging into those receipts. So if you have something you think we should investigate, please let us know. You can send an email to money at WCNC.com or reach out to us on social media. When it comes to WCNC's Chief Meteorologist Brad Panovich, our viewers tell the whole story. Hey, if you're new to the area, this meteorologist is awesome. I always stick with Brad Panovich when it comes to severe weather. He's rarely wrong. You should follow Brad if you don't already. He's usually right on the money with his forecast. I don't look at anything else besides what Brad says. We are fortunate to have him here. Brad Panovich, experience the difference with WCNC Charlotte weather. Well, many people in North Carolina are trying their hand at mobile sports betting. Of course, there are going to be some wins and some losses, but are you allowed to deduct your losses from your taxes? WCNC Charlotte's Megan Bragg spoke to the experts in today's Verify. Are you getting lucky or are you seeing more losses than wins on these bets? It's OK, you can be honest. So if you do lose, can you deduct gambling losses on your taxes? Let's verify. Our source is Mark Stieber, tax information officer with Jackson Hewitt Tax Services, the IRS, and Intuit TurboTax. According to the IRS, winnings from any gambling are taxable. Stieber says if you win over $600, that's when you will get a form to fill out to record those winnings. If you win more than $600, you're going to get a W-2G with the amount, where you want it, how much you want, and those details and the IRS will get it too. Now, if you win $5,000 or more, there's a mandatory withholding and the government will take 24% of their taxes up front. But what if you lose? Fast answer is yes. If you have losses while gambling, you may be able to take a tax deduction. May is the key word here because there are certain conditions you'd have to meet. According to TurboTax, you can deduct your gambling losses, but only to offset the income from your gambling winnings. You can't just deduct losses without reporting winnings. And the dollar amount of losses you can deduct can never exceed the winnings you report as income. To report losses, says you must itemize income tax deductions on a Schedule A form. Also, the IRS doesn't permit you to subtract your losses from your winnings and only report the difference on your tax return. Overall, if you have winnings, you can deduct same day, same types of losses to the extent you have winnings, but not a net loss and not all different types of bets, one at the casino, one at the dog track, and then one playing poker, and then the other one in the March Madness pool. Same types of bets can offset same types of income and losses. So we can verify that, yes, you can deduct gambling losses on your taxes. However, there are rules you must follow so that those deductions pass muster with the IRS. With your Verify, I'm Megan Brown. When did you know what you wanted to be? Hey, Mom, the weather's on! WCNC Charlotte's chief meteorologist Brad Panovich always knew what he was meant to do. All right, don't forget your umbrella. In fact, he joined the American Meteorological Society when he was 13. Now Brad is all grown up. You can see him right here on WCNC Charlotte, making sure you're informed and safe. Hey, where did all my hair go? Experience the difference. Let's turn now to a look at your weekend forecast as we take a live look this morning from Dallas out in Gaston County. Good morning to you all. Larry, it's a bit of a foggy start today. Mm, a little fog out there uh, here on the St. Patrick's Day weekend. Get your green on mm -hmm. in honor of the Irish, you know, because we have to work in the green environment over there. No Makes green. It a little hard. But we do have a lot of green that we can show, and that's what we're talking about is this St. Patrick's weekend. You know, there's so many times on this time of the year you, you can get rainy condition, you can get cold and misty, but not, not this weekend. We're right on 74 degrees, so perfect for the big parade in uptown and for the festival that's going on all through the morning into the afternoon. And for St. Patrick's Day, tomorrow near 70 
70 degrees, not bad at all. We take a live view from our, our Mr. Sparky Carolina Camera Network. That's right there, downtown Blowing Rock, North Carolina. Looking very nice there. A few fair weather clouds. Now, this is, <laughs> this is our camera from Ballantyne looking towards uptown. You can still see some, some uh, fog there. So you got some patchy and dense fog in a couple of spots, but not any issues out there from Monroe. Things looking okay. The old courthouse there looking off this is just fair weather clouds. Should be a nice day across the region, but... We are still dealing with all of this amazing amount of pollen. It's the time of the year, so it's off the charts tomorrow and again on Monday. So high pollen count again today. Blame the trees. We love the trees, but they sort of could cause some issues out there. No issues once again with our forecast. 11 M, 62 degrees. Once again, that's when the parade starts in uptown Charlotte. Expecting thousands of people up there for the festival as well. Should be a fun time. And between about 4 and 6 today, we'll be in the low 70s. I would say there may be many, many spots that actually get into the mid-70s this afternoon, but I would say averaging about 70, 71 degrees across the area today. Not expecting rain. No storms. We scanned the skies. Rain and storm free. We did have the showers that moved across the area yesterday. It will expand the view. That system is off Carolina coastline. Some showers off there. And then way to the south of us across Florida. Once again, we're about 71 degrees right in the middle of the afternoon. Across the two state area today, the hot spot is going to be. Charleston, South Carolina, 83 degrees out there. And another coastal community, Cape Hatteras on the outer banks, 59. The cool reading will be in the mid-70s at Greenville, Spartanburg, Columbia, up about 79 degrees. we got travel plans down there. The capital of South Carolina, the capital city of North Carolina, Raleigh at 70, 64 at Boone, over in Asheville at 71 degrees. In case you're heading to go up more. Now watch this change in temperatures. We've got nice weather this weekend. Look at those drops in the temperatures Monday and Tuesday. We see a rebound for the middle of the weekend towards the end of next week. Next weekend we'll see temperatures drop a few degrees below average for today. Boone hits about 64, blowing rock tops out about 63. Up around Jefferson, West Jefferson, low to mid 60s there. Morganton, Lenore, Tailsville, Hickory, Maiden, all much like we see here in our area. It'll be in the low to mid 70s and about the same from Monroe to Wadesburg, Rockingham and Chesterfield down there in South Carolina. Checking the guy roofing 70 forecast through the weekend and beyond. Low to mid 70s today. Tomorrow we'll look for mostly sunny skies. We put that 20% chance in. Most of the year has will not have a chance to rain at all. And then we see 58. That's right. That's not a mistake. That's 58 for high temperature on Monday. Tuesday morning, a frosty morning, cold at 32, high 59. Then we see a rebound Wednesday and Thursday. It looks like by next Friday, here we go, another Friday with a chance of showers with temperatures in the low 60s. That's your forecast this morning. And is continuing to fight for his life tonight after a triple shooting in Mooresville left him hospitalized. A suspect and two victims dead. The Iredell County Sheriff's Office responded to a call, shots fired call on Home Drive Saturday night. When they arrived, they say they found three people tied up, two victims already dead. Another person in critical condition was taken to the hospital. Shortly after, deputies then got information leading them to another home on Oswald Amity Road in connection to the suspect in the incident. And that's where an hours long standoff took place before coming to a deadly end. WCNC Charlotte's Anna King has the latest on the investigation. Neighbors in Iredale County say they were jolted out of their sleep to the sound of multiple gunshots Saturday. Those shots were coming from a home on Oswald Amity Road. Deputies with Iredell County Sheriff's Office say they were trying to take 39 year old Justin Strawyer into custody. They say Saturday night he tied three people up at a home on Home Drive in Mooresville. Officials say Strawyer killed two of those victims, 22 year old Eduardo Cordova and 24 year old Caleb Loper. The third victim is in the hospital in Charlotte. Officials say shortly after the shooting, Strawyer barricaded himself inside the home on Oswald and Mitty Drive. They say he was shooting his AR-15 when they arrived on scene. For hours, there were negotiations to get him out, as well as four juveniles who deputies say were in the home and refused to come out as well. Deputies eventually used gas to get everyone out of the home, and they say Strawyer followed the juveniles out while shooting at deputies. Officers then returned fire, shooting and killing Strawyer. Iredell County Sheriff says the crimes that took place on the home were not random and notes drugs and robbery are possible motive. In Mooresville, Anna King, WCNC Charlotte. The North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation will now lead the investigation and as per protocol, three deputies are on administrative leave.
Thanks, Brad. There's an ongoing study, though, in Gastonia analyzing barriers to housing and then recommending how to remove them. The goal here is to implement policies that create more affordable housing and then address the disparities. But it does seem like the city is falling short in some places and has been for years. WCNC Charlotte's Julia Kaufman takes a closer look. A third party analysis found five main issues that are making it harder for people to find fair housing in Gastonia and the barriers go beyond affordability. A resource manager. The Gastonia City Council's Housing Committee received an update Monday on the federally required housing study that's done every five years. Of course, there's a limited supply of affordable housing. City data says rent prices have nearly doubled since 2015. But Director of Housing Danette Dye says the analysis also found... There's limited housing supply for those persons with disability. The same problem was found in 2019, and the study says the city has not implemented anything yet to try to address it. Making sure that our most vulnerable citizens and those people who have the least voice are not left behind and don't fall through the cracks. Um, and I think that the, the study definitely showed that some of that does happen. Housing Committee Chairman Robert Kellogg says the city is working to update its zoning codes so it can be more inclusive with development. As we implement more ways to build and more ways to include different zoning opportunities, that that would also help individuals who are disabled. Gastonia leaders adopted an affordable housing plan in fall 2023. Goals in the 10 year plan include creating a housing trust fund and building a housing resource center. I think there's definitely room to improve, but I think we're on the right track. Researchers want your feedback on the fair housing analysis and recommendations before they present them to the city council next month. We have details on how you can participate on WCNC.com. WCNC Charlotte. Good morning, Carolina. Tune in to the team that's preparing you for your day. We are following two major breaking news stories this morning. See the difference in your morning. We can see clear skies at the off of the distance. Everything is flowing just fine. We're asking where's the money so you can get ahead in 2024. Responsible reporting, community focused, unique content. Good morning, Savannah. Hi, Sarah. Great to see you. See the difference weekday mornings on WCNC Charlotte. Living in a neighborhood run by a homeowners associations association has its upsides and downsides. A Mooresville family found themselves asking where's the money after discovering some of their HOA's approved colors didn't even exist anymore. The family picked a color they liked only to be hit with a thousand dollar fine until neighbors stepped in. Kenneth Threed and his wife Tisha say most of the time they've enjoyed their house at the end of a quiet cul-de-sac in the meadows at Reed Creek Community. They've always taken pride in its upkeep. I'm a peaceful guy, you know, in this neighborhood I've been 18 years. Um, we never had no problems. But things started stirring up last fall when the couple decided to refresh their home's exterior paint. Threet admits it was almost completely painted before he learned he needed to fill out a request for architectural approval. So I went to the HOA representative and she said to me, this color you have is not an approved color. After requesting a hearing in which the Threets were denied permission to keep their darker shade of gray, Threet says the board told them they'd have to change the color. We want to be in compliance um, with, with the HOA rules and regulations. So we was trying to work with them. Three then took a drive around his neighborhood. I found out that there was other colors in the neighborhood that was not approved colors. So to be clear, Threed says other neighbors had homes painted in colors that were not approved. We were not able to determine whether those neighbors requested and received HOA permission before painting. Either way, Threed says he was told to change theirs or else. They charged us $1,000 fine for not having the right color. Another neighbor, Mark Lepard, says he could empathize. The personal feeling was that uh, not everyone on the board had complete empathy with a lot of the requests that were being made. And it just so happened last month, homeowners voted in new HOA board members, including Lepard. From what I've heard personally, there was an overwhelming amount of people that did want to see a difference in the way that the, the rules are enforced on them. Three is one of them. Thank God for Mark and 
the ones that came on. The new board has signed off on the, the paint colors that they chose, and so they don't have to paint their house. Um, they were assessed some fines, and we've waived those, and so they're good to go. It worked out for the Threats, but he says the last several months have been stressful. It also serves as a reminder if you live in a neighborhood run by an HOA to read the guidelines when it comes to changing or adding to the appearance of your house. Homeowners usually have to fill out an application for an architectural review for major changes. It'll save time and aggravation knowing if you can proceed with any kind of construction or remodeling work. Well, if you've been here in Charlotte for a couple of years or maybe longer, you've seen Charlotte continue to grow. But as businesses come and go, there's one local business that is standing the test of time. Dilworth Mattress Factory has been in Charlotte for 92 years, opening up in 1931 during the height of the Depression. WCNC Charlotte's Jesse Pierre spoke to the owners about how they have helped folks rest easy for decades. Mm -hmm. Dilworth Mattress Factory has been in the Dilworth South End community for over 90 years, and there are generations of history behind this door. The photo of Dilworth Mattress Factory founder Thomas Philbeck firmly mounted to the wall. When he started it as a um, as a mattress refurbish business, he would. It was right after the Great Depression. Since 1931, the company has evolved from a mattress repair shop to handmade custom orders helping folks rest easy. We start with a traditional spring right like this on some mattresses. Scott Hirsch picked up the family business and is the current owner where the work is all about the feels. We can make this side soft and this side firm. Along with his wife, Dory Hirsch, who showed off a mattress fit for a queen. This is the only mattress that we actually do not make in our factory. It holds the royal warrant, and this is actually what the entire royal family sleeps on. The factory, in its third location in 92 years, is surrounded by new development. Hirsch says he's been around to see a lot of the changes. Plenty of mattress stores have come and gone since we've been here, and, and plenty of businesses in the South End area have come and gone. He says referrals and repeat customers keep their operations from taking a snooze. And the pandemic came along, and people weren't really going out. So it kind of introduced us into uh, mattress sale by appointment only. Adapting with the times, Dilworth Mattress Factory is springing forward to a century and beyond. Sold to generations to generations and kids of, ki kids of parents and, and, th and their kids now. So um, I think it's important for us to continue this uh, tradition. Jesse Pierre, WCNC Charlotte. I'm astonished by the bed for you the Royals. Think about that. Yeah, I mean, I know it's not the exact bed that they sleep on, but I want, yeah, I want to know more about that. I'm gonna have to ask Jesse. Ask the Royals. Or yeah, they'll, they'll dish on how it feels. Is I'm it just, angelic, I'm just like sleeping on a cloud? Yeah, like yeah. how do they get in touch with them anyway? That caught my eye too. Yeah. All right. Well. When I think about the community, I think about the time that I've been here. I've been in this community almost my entire adult life, so I, I you, know, you get to know the people. When you know what they care about, then that's what you care about. This community looks at all of us who do weather here at WCNC Charlotte as part of their family. And uh, when you're part of their family, you want to make sure you do it just for them. Time now to connect the dots. When we make the news, make sense. President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris set to campaign here in North Carolina later this month once again. And Democrats think he has a real shot at winning the state come November. Down ballot races could help President Joe Biden pull out a win in the Tar Heel state. Let's connect the dots. The president lost North Carolina in 2020 by just under a percentage point. But the New York Times reports Republican candidate for governor Mark Robinson could push voters to a Democratic ticket. Robinson has a history of anti-Semitic comments and opposes abortion and gay rights, which may even turn away some conservative voters. With the governor's race getting even national attention, outgoing Democratic Governor Roy Cooper believes it's a battleground state that could give a slight edge to the president over former President Donald Trump. Biden's campaign making the state a top priority as North Carolina quickly grows, many new residents are coming from blue states. But it won't be easy. A Democratic presidential candidate hasn't won the state since 2008. And that is Connecting the Dots.
A Charlotte nonprofit is asking for your help tonight after receiving some generous donations. Yeah, Beds for Kids is looking for volunteers to help families get ahead, starting with a good night's rest. Our Larry Sprinkle takes us to the warehouse and tells us how you can make a difference here. I'm going to take this over to the trash. Lauren Patterson is volunteering to help out and get her hands dirty at the same time. It's not very glamorous, but it needed to be done. For the past two years, Lauren has helped kids across the Mecklenburg and Cabarrus County areas get a good night's sleep by lending a helping hand. I am from Charlotte, born and raised, and I feel like it's very easy to grow up in a, in a bubble here, but there is so much need just 10 to 15 minutes down the road. And, you know, one hour, one volunteer can do so much. She's just one of a handful of volunteers with beds for kids, helping families get everything from a chair to a dining room table. Every single volunteer that we receive and have at this warehouse is essential and really important to our mission. So without volunteers, we could not operate. And their work is critical. I think that a child who feels safe in their home and gets a good night's sleep is only going to be um, more successful in school, and that's only going to continue to carry them um, to be successful. Beds for Kids usually delivers to 30 families per week. But next week, with the help of several suppliers, they want to try and furnish 60 to 70 family homes. There's only 12 of us, so we definitely need more volunteers for that. Volunteers making a difference, getting together and cleaning furniture, and the reward for their work is often seen firsthand. To see the kids come home and to be so excited to have a bed to sleep on that night. In West Charlotte, I'm Larry Sprinkle. Back to you. So if you can help and you don't mind lifting and moving some furniture, get in touch with Beds for Kids through our website, WCNC.com or our mobile app. Hey YouTube, this is Chief Meteorologist Brad Panovich here at WCNC Charlotte. We want you to head over to our Weather IQ YouTube page, where we're making you smarter and safer. We have a passion for weather science, and we want you to understand what's happening when the weather changes, because in the end, that's what keeps you safe. It's not about being scared, it's about being informed. Browse our collection of fun and informative clips and look for new segments every week. We're here to raise your weather IQ. Experience the difference on WCNC Charlotte. Let's turn now to a look at your weekend forecast as we take a live look this morning from Dallas out in Gaston County. Good morning to you all. Larry, it's a bit of a foggy start today. Mm -hmm. We'll fog out the area here on the St. Patrick's Day weekend. Got your green on mm -hmm. in honor of the Irish, you know, because we have to work in the green environment over there. No makes green, it a little hard. but we do have a lot of green that we can show and that's what we're talking about is this St. Patrick's weekend. You know, there's so many times on in this time of the year you, you can get rainy condition. You get cold and misty, not not this weekend we're right on 74 degrees. So perfect for the big parade and uptown and for the festival that's going on all through the morning into the afternoon and for St. Patrick's Day tomorrow near 70. 70 degrees, not bad at all. We take a live view from our, our Mr. Sparky Carolina Camera Network. That's right there, downtown Blowing Rock, North Carolina. Looking very nice there. A few fair weather clouds. Now, this is, <laughs> this is our camera from Ballantyne looking towards uptown. You can still see some, some uh, fog there. So you got some patchy and dense fog in a couple of spots, but not any issues out there from Monroe. Things looking okay. The old courthouse there looking off the distance. Just fair weather clouds. Should be a nice day across the region, but... We are still dealing with all of this amazing amount of pollen. It's the time of the year, so it's off the charts tomorrow and again on Monday. So high pollen count again today. Blame the trees. We love the trees, but they certainly could cause some issues out there. No issues once again with our forecast. 11 a.m., 62 degrees. Once again, that's when the parade starts in uptown Charlotte, expecting thousands of people up there for the festival as well. Should be a fun time. And between about 4 and 6 today, we'll be in the low 70s. I would say there may be many, many spots that actually get into the mid-70s this afternoon, but I would say averaging about 70, 71 degrees across the area today. Not expecting rain. Rain, no storms. We scan the skies. Rain is storm free. We did have the showers that moved across the area yesterday. It will expand the view. That system's off Carolina coastline. Some showers off there, and then way to the south of us across Florida. Once again, we're about 71 degrees right in the middle of the afternoon across the two state area today. The hot spot's going to be Charleston, South Carolina, 83 degrees out there, and another coastal community, Cape Hatteras, on the outer banks. 59. The cool reading will be in the mid 70s in Greenville, Spartanburg, Columbia, about 79 degrees. We got travel plans down there. The capital of South Carolina, the capital city of 
North Carolina, Raleigh at 70, 64 at Boone, over in Asheville at 71 degrees in case you're heading to Biltmore. Now watch this change in temperatures. We've got nice weather this weekend. Look at those drops in the temperatures Monday and Tuesday. We see a rebound for the middle of the weekend towards the end of next week. Next weekend we'll see temperatures drop a few degrees below average for today. Boone hits about 64, blowing rock tops out about 63. Up around Jefferson, West Jefferson, low to mid 60s there. Morganton, Lenore, Tailsville, Hickory, Maiden, all much like we see here in our area. It'll be in the low to mid 70s and about the same from Monroe to Wadesboro to Rockingham and Chesterfield down there in South Carolina. Checking the guy roofing 70 forecast through the weekend and beyond. Low to mid 70s today. Tomorrow we'll look for mostly sunny skies. We put that 20% chance in. Most of the year has will not have a chance to rain at all. And then we see 58. That's right. That's not a mistake. That's 58 for high temperature on Monday. Tuesday morning, a frosty morning, cold at 32, high 59. Then we see a rebound Wednesday and Thursday. It looks like by next Friday, here we go, another Friday with a chance of showers with temperatures in the low 60s. That's your forecast this morning. Governor Rory Cooper has announced an executive action striking down the state's rules on name, image, and likeness compensation that were issued back in 2021. They, he says these rules are no longer needed, adding they set the standard for colleges and universities to come up with their own NIL policies. Go, uh, Governor Cooper also says his executive action plays a key role in leveling the playing field for student athletes across North Carolina so they have the same access to NIL as athletes in any other state. Time now to connect the dots. When we make the news make sense. A new study says air pollution is hurting the performance of North Carolina students in class and in sports. And it turns out a new statewide initiative could help reduce those numbers. Electric buses are coming to North Carolina, and that could help keep your kids healthy. Let's connect the dots. Yale researchers looked at test scores and pollution exposure for every public school student in North Carolina over 17 years. They found the more time a child was exposed to pollution, there was a direct correlation to failing test scores. While pollution in the Tar Heel State has improved over the last 20 years, kids are still exposed to lots of pollution. The study suggests this is in large part because of cars and buses. And there is a program looking to change that. The state is currently in the process of using more than $25 million to buy 114 electric buses. 27 of those will be deployed here in Mecklenburg County. Experts say these buses could significantly reduce kids' exposure to pollution and potentially help their performance in school. And that is Connecting the Dots. At WCNC Charlotte, we believe it is crucial to make a difference in our communities. That's why we go beyond just reporting the news. We ask, where's the money to hold the powerful accountable and get money back into your pockets? Our verified team takes claims, finds sources, and gets you answers. And we're keeping you weather aware, making you safer and smarter. I'm Vanessa Rufus. And I'm Colin Mayfield. Join us weeknights at 5, 6, and 11 and see the difference for yourself. Only on WCNC Charlotte. Now at 6, we have a quick warning for you before we really dive into this story. You're about to see and hear something that really no one wants inside their home, apartment, or business. We are talking about raw sewage. A Where's the Money investigation found that the city of Charlotte has paid nearly $2 million to help people deal with damages tied to the city's sewer system. And our Nate Norabito discovered the problem is only getting worse. With enough miles of sewer to make it from here to Alaska, Charlotte Water has said logistically, crews just cannot proactively inspect the entire system. So the city tends to be reactive, paying up when a failure is found in their lines. Leaders even increased the maximum payout in recent years. But some believe the city needs to make prevention a bigger priority. Oh man, this is going everywhere. The sight. I literally heard her scream. The sound. It's raw. It was disgusting. The smell. Like Of sewage. It was everywhere. Like it, there was like no stopping it. Overpowered Dwayne and Catherine Pennant. This was all flooded. All as their infant and toddler slept nearby. And it was flown in that room, which is our children's room. More than a year later. It interrupted our lives. The parents still feel overwhelmed. 
I'm tired. <laughs> I'm tired and, and I'm over it. Left with a bad taste about why. We just don't want this to happen to anyone else. In the hours before the penance toilets and bathtubs spewed sewage, they heard gurgling noises. So they called out a plumber who found a clog in the city's sewer line. But when Charlotte Cruz came out to clean it, the you know what. I said, hey, hey, what are you guys doing? Hit the fan. It blew back. The penance say Cruz pushed sewage back into their home. A failure in cleaning and they believe prevention. One that forced the family to spend the next month in a hotel. This is something that could be avoided with better maintenance. Public records show since 2018, almost 900 people have filed sewer blowback and blockage claims against the city. It seemed like everything was just destroyed. Where, where are we going to live? Last year alone, Charlotte water records show blockages nearly doubled. It's a real thing. It's happening all the time. Seth Wyatt says his small family plumbing business receives three to four calls a day often tied to problems on the city side of the sewer, routinely caused by thirsty tree roots rupturing the lines. And they will do just about anything to get water. Especially worse when there's a drought. When there's a lack of rain, the, the call volume goes up. Tree roots are only part of the problem, though. This is preventable. Most blockages are at the kitchen drain. Charlotte Water spokesperson Cam Coley says customers are also clogging the lines over time when they dump grease and wipes. The goal is to keep all the wastewater in the pipe. Regardless of the cause, it's the city's responsibility to keep the lines clean. Is the city doing enough to prevent this? That is worked on every day. We are doing preventive maintenance when we're not responding to emergencies or sewer related uh, concerns. Coley says Charlotte Water dedicates a team to inspect 600 of the city's highest priority lines, is on pace this year to clean 20% of its sewer system, up from the prior year, and uses technology to monitor its lines, so crew's limited time is used efficiently. We're looking to clean where it's needed most. He says it all comes down to a balancing act between resources and priorities. What can the city do? I mean, the first step is admitting you have a problem. Council member Tariq Bakari believes leaders have failed to prioritize basic services. Those non-sexy but critically important things. That's why he's calling for a strategic committee that can focus on infrastructure needs. We don't even know the size of the problem yet, so we have to size things out. That's all broken. The penance say they now know the full scope of their problem. She was breastfeeding at the time, and the level of stress, she couldn't do it. She yeah, my produce. supply just like and cut off. After months of back and forth with the city. Still, some days are are not good. They finally agreed on a price to cover the cost and installation of a backwater valve to prevent this in the future, leaving them finally with a sense of relief. If you don't want to take any chances, a plumber can install a backwater valve, but that will cost several thousand dollars. Either way, don't ignore the warning signs. If you hear gurgling noises or notice that your drains are slow to drain, call 311 immediately. Nate Morabito, WCNC Charlotte. Well, we know this, Nate, in our Where's the Money team, they really work hard to take these story tips and dig into every avenue possible to get you answers. Yeah, tonight on WCNC Plus, actually, Nate's going to sit down with our Nate Stur uh, Nick Sturdivant, that is, to talk more about the investigation process. Nate and Nick from how the story started, the questions we've asked and the answers we're still waiting to get. You can get that in-depth perspective only on WCNC Plus starting at 630 on your preferred streaming device. And now in this Women's History Month, we're focusing on the stories that highlight the difference and disparities between men and women. Good morning and happy Tuesday. Now, here's what we've got from Wallet Hub this morning. The site came up with this ranked list on the best and worst states for women. Now, before we get to the big reveal, I want to break down some of the methodology here. Researchers looked at some key metrics when they were making this list. The data ranges from median earnings for female workers to women's health care, even the female homicide rate. Now, as for that big reveal, both Carolinas are in that bottom half of the list. North Carolina came in at number 30. South Carolina is about 10 spots lower at number 40. 
and some numbers before we let you go. Women represent more than two-thirds of all minimum wage workers, and the U.S. political representation is also suffering. Even though women make up about 51 percent of the population, we're only making up about 25 percent of the Senate and then 29 percent of the House of Representatives. It's numbers like those that led writers to create this list in the first place. Ben? WCNC Charlotte. Weather is a, a kind of science that you get to see and experience every day. And I think some people don't even realize how much it affects them. That weather has a huge impact on how it threatens your family, your livelihood, or your home. So I think it really is one of those defining things we do that really affects everybody in our community. See the difference. That process of giving you a warning ahead of time and keeping you and your family safe is really important to me because I live here too. It's my family, it's my friends, it's my neighbors. Maternal health care continues to be a problem in North Carolina. The latest March of Dimes report found for every 100,000 births in the state, 26 people giving birth die from complications of pregnancy or childbirth within six weeks. That's higher than the national number. And for women of color, the numbers are even worse. Now a nonprofit called Queen City Cocoa Beans is trying to help. WCNC Charlotte's Lexi Wilson shows us how they help guide families of color through the birthing process. It is a blessing, truly, that um, Jackson and I are here today. <laughs> the gift of motherhood is something the Dean family doesn't take for granted. We, um, like so many people, experienced a pretty traumatic birth. Their original birth plan didn't go as expected, eventually leading Rachel Dean to be readmitted into the hospital. She says it was the support of her team at Queen City Cocoa Beans that helped her get through the ordeal. Everyone deserves those troops to rally for them. Having a team in place really does make a difference. Making a difference in the lives of Charlotte Black families is the goal of this organization by helping them achieve better birth outcomes. According to the CDC, Black women are three times more likely to die from pregnancy-related conditions. My mom died very early after giving birth to me, as well as I've had many stillborns and miscarriages. For Assistant Director Lugina Grinder, this work is personal. She says her mother was unheard and unseen, later finding out she had a brain aneurysm from birth that was never diagnosed. It was just assumed that she was using drugs or that she was doing uh, something that was harmful to her. She now uses her story to change the narrative, turning sorrow into support. It's kind of like I was born to do this work. <laughs> it's work that's seen here with 16-month-old Jackson. We focus on the whole person, the whole family. There you go. A healthy and happy <laughs> baby where life isn't taken for granted. Reporting in West Charlotte for WCNC Charlotte, I'm Lexi Wilson. Thank you. College kids and incoming freshmen across our area, they are stressing out. Many of them are waiting on the FAFSA to see how much it'll cost to have to go to school. The federal financial aid program got a big overhaul this year, and to put it bluntly, it's been a mess. Mm. We are talking major delays in the process, leaving students and schools in limbo asking where's the money. Our Michelle Bowden talked to some who say they are now scrambling. This is so hard on so many families and the schools are struggling too. So far, there are 30% fewer applications this year than in the past, meaning the result of this whole mess could be tons of students who simply don't go to college. Johnny Darling is a senior at Philip O'Berry High. He got into his dream school for next year, but might not get to go. Although I want to go there, it's very expensive and I'm not sure how I'm going to pay for it as of right now. Darling is the oldest of four kids and the son of two school teachers. I don't know which school I'm going to choose because I don't know how much I'm going to get from FAFSA. FAFSA is the free application for student aid, the federal government program that was revamped this year, causing major delays. These changes affect everybody who is in college or thinking about pursuing higher education in the upcoming year. Students fill out the application, the government processes it and sends it back to the schools that then determine how much financial aid a student is eligible for. We typically begin notifying students in November. And when are you expecting now to be able to do that? Realistically, April. So there are some students that are literally waiting to find out now if they can afford to go to college next Correct. year. Correct. Adrian Amador Odi is the vice president of strategic enrollment at Queens University and says she worries some students won't go to college this year at all because of the difficulties. I can't even count how many times we've been delayed. My biggest concern, they'll just give up. It's very stressful because FAFSA is one of those things that once you know 
what that dollar amount is, you can navigate what else do we need to do. And right now with the delay, it's really putting a strain because we can't make a decision on, well, it's gonna be this school or that school. Alan Davis works with high school seniors as part of Road to Hire, a nonprofit that helps underrepresented high school students on the path to corporate jobs. He's working to help students avoid taking out costly long-term loans to pay for schools, and says the FAFSA delays are making that tough. We have learned from many of our folks who have gone through this uh, historically that the challenge of financial uh, aid and loans and what that looks like. And we want we understand, particularly for families of color, uh, that that represents a barrier to wealth. How worried are you that some of your kids may not go to school because they just don't know how they're going to pay for it and this delay is really a problem? Yeah, it's a real reality for many of our students. Uh, 47% of our students are first gen, so they are trying to figure this thing out. This is the first time this process has had a complete overhaul in 50 years, and critics say the government simply didn't put enough money or resources into making the change. Once they work everything out, all these kinks, it is supposed to make things easier for students and their families. Back to you. It can be so frustrating, too. So the price of higher education is expensive. There's really no other way to say it. Yeah, we know there are plenty of students and families who are struggling to pay for it. We do want to help you get ahead. So tonight on our streaming app, WCNC Plus, we are sitting down with an expert who shared some strategies to help parents and students save for college. You can watch our latest Your Money episode to hear some accounts that can help your money grow and also understand the changes happening with financial aid. So tune in at 8 o'clock tonight. It is available on your favorite streaming device. Connect the dots and let us clear up the confusion. We're here to make sure the news makes sense. And with Connect the Dots, you'll understand how the headlines impact your family. See the difference on WCNC Charlotte. New at 430, a neighborhood's battle against proposed development continues to get a lot of attention. A current change.org petition centered around a Piper Glen development has nearly 20,000 signatures against a rezoning petition. WCNC Charlotte's Julia Kaufman shows us why some neighbors are against the plan. We're on the four mile greenway here in Piper Glen and on the other side of these woods, developers want to build apartments and a retirement community, but homeowners are against the development. Even on a rainy day, people in South Charlotte love the four mile greenway. Long, spacious greenways, lots of nature. Charlotte native Chris McIntyre and his neighbors are fighting to preserve that nature. 70% of the trees will be wiped out on 53 acres. The proposed Sutherland at Piper Glen development calls for 640 rental units on the other side of this creek. That's just really dense. McIntyre understands the land will be developed, but he'd prefer to see houses for sale. Some neighbors want the land untouched. Councilman Ed Driggs says that's not an option. The county expressed an interest at one point to the owner uh, in buying the site for a park. The owner said, I don't want to talk about that. It's under contract. Under the land's current zoning, the developer can build about 470 homes, but no apartments. Driggs says rezoning the property for higher density could save more trees and improve roads, but more negotiations need to happen. Unless some sort of an understanding can be arrived at with that group and with residents uh, in a larger scale, I won't support it. The project has a public hearing Monday at the Charlotte City Council meeting, and it's expected to be a packed house. In Piper Glen, Julia Kaufman, WCNC Charlotte. WCNC Charlotte. This is Flashpoint, where power and politics collide, and the tough questions get asked and answered. Thanks for joining us here on Flashpoint. I'm Ben Thompson. Well, after years of debate on Monday, mobile sports betting will finally be legal here in North Carolina. And between all the ads featuring your favorite celebrity, promotional deals, and big bucks for the state, it's very easy to get excited. But there is a downside. Coming up in a few minutes, how the state is preparing for the very real issue of gambling addiction that comes with this news. But first, joining us now is sports betting regulation expert and editor of Sports Betting Dime, Robert Linehan. Robert, thanks for coming on. We appreciate it. No, thanks for having me on. I know it's a busy time uh, down there in North Carolina. It is. Lots of folks are really excited about this. Listen, you've watched this play out in states across the country. You write about it. 
Um, give us, with that context, give us some perspective about how big of a deal it is to have sports betting roll out here in North Carolina uh, in the next week. Sure. Well, North Carolina is, is expected to be a very healthy sports betting market in the country, not to mention that it's likely going to be the only state to launch sports betting in 2024. Um, right now, there are no other states that have any scheduled launches. Uh, a few states are considering legislation to legalize sports betting, um, but even if they do get something done, they're likely not going to launch this year. So North Carolina could be the only state and, and will likely be the only state to launch this year. Um, I know operators, I know uh, sports betting companies are very excited for North Carolina. Uh, it, it, it's not going to be, you know, North Carolina is not going to be a, a top five market in the country. It, it's not going to be a New Jersey or a New York. Uh, those two states dominate the sports betting landscape. But there's a lot to be excited about uh, for North Carolina. Uh, it's it's a populous state. Um, you, you have some 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 crazy sports fans down there. Uh, a, a lot of residents that have been clamoring for sports betting legalization over the last couple of years, as this has been discussed. Uh, you have a very healthy college sports fandom down there, uh, and it's perfect that this is launching a week before. Um, the March Madness tournaments begin. So there's a lot to be excited about in North Carolina, and there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic that the North Carolina sports betting market is going to be a very healthy one for that. You mentioned a revenue. How much revenue are we talking about here in this uh, first year? Well, I mean, of course, uh, you know, these are just estimates, but, you know, the first, actually, for these estimates, for the first fiscal year, the 2023-2024 fiscal year uh the estimate is there is going to be no tax revenue coming in for this but but that's just basically how the calendar falls uh during the first full year of sports betting the fiscal estimates say that the state could bring in nearly 65 million dollars of additional tax revenue by year five when you know typically year five is when the sports betting market has um you know basically aged and 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 is is topping out and and is a mature sports betting market by year five north carolina according to these fiscal estimates when the bill was passed could be seeing an additional 100.6 million dollars in annual revenue you know this is revenue that the state was losing out on you know for in years past when people were sports betting in north carolina because as you know sports betting was going on in the state before it was legalized. Sure. It was, you know, being handled by offshore regulators, offshore sports betting operators. Um, North Carolina wasn't getting any tax dollars from it. So this should be, you know, a hundred million in terms of a state budget. It's, it's not a hundred million seems like a lot, but in terms of a state budget, it, it's not a ton of money, but this is revenue that the state was missing out on that could have gone to supporting, you know, higher education, youth athletics, all of the good things that the bill has earmarked the tax revenue for. So it, it's going to be a nice uh, drop in the bucket for the state. And uh, it's just going to be money that they were losing out on in past years. Yeah, you're talking about state budget. That's billions and billions. And, and but still money's money <laughs> and, and everybody likes money. Um, you mentioned this a second ago, but there's a lot of folks already betting using vpns dark websites to bet in other states so based on your reporting do, do you think there are folks who want to bet haven't been doing that and haven't cur currently found a way to do it that are now going to be jumping on the bandwagon oh absolutely um you know this this provides north carolina north carolinians or north carolina residents with a safe and legal way to bet on sports in the state um you know with some of these offshore regulators you're basically giving your private information to, you know, this an offshore regulator that, you know, who knows what they're doing with what you're giving them. You know, you're basically giving them your bank account information and who knows who's handling it, who knows who's seeing it. Uh, so this absolutely will give people peace of mind, you know, people that might have been hesitant to, you know, throw $25 into an account and, 
you know, bet on UNC uh, uh, in the upcoming March Madness tournament. So absolutely, this is going to bring in more people to the sports betting market in North Carolina. Um, like I said, uh, these these legal legally licensed operators in the state will, you know, they're going to provide the services uh, that the offshore books don't. Um, there's going to be more responsible gaming. They're, they're going to be paying you know, certainly more attention to responsible gaming issues uh, as opposed to, you know, some of the unlicensed regulators. So this is a, certainly a way, a safer way and a more responsible way for residents in the state to uh, participate in sports betting. And you're going to see that certainly uh, when it launches on the 11th and you'll see how, how many people are uh, going to be enjoying this as the state moves forward. Um, any common problems that you've seen in rollouts across the states that, that, that folks should be wary of in this first year? You know, not really. This is old hat for a lot of these operators right now. Um, you know, DraftKings and FanDuel are licensed each in more than 20 states apiece at this point. So they know what they're doing. Um, there's tip, te te typically not a lot of technical difficulties uh, in the state. I mean, you do have some you do have some newer operators in the state, like ESPN Bet, Underdog, Underdog. Uh, this is actually going to be the first state where they launch sports betting, uh, but they've been around for years offering daily fantasy sports contests. I, I know for a fact that they likely will have a good platform uh, for customers to use and a great app to use. So I don't think you're going to be seeing too much in the way of difficulties. I mean, there's always... No, there could always be some people that may not get a bonus that they're offered or, or, or something may happen along those lines when they sign up. But, you know, all these operators have uh, a great customer service representatives. Um, you know, if you do run into a problem, contact the number that they have prominently displayed in their sports book apps and on their websites. And I, I think it's going to be smooth sailing in North Carolina. This, this is too big of a state. It's too big of a market for these operators not to be on top on the top of their game when this launches and that you don't want to be the one operator you know you don't want to be the one operator that's down for a couple hours on opening day when the others are are, are raking in the cash and and you know registering new users so I, I would not imagine that there's going to be too much that could go wrong i'll knock on wood when i say that I'm, I'm saying that right now and then you know maybe a, a seven out of the eight will have problems on the first day but typically it's usually pretty smooth sailing they've all been here before this is old hat for them i really don't think there's going to be too much that could go wrong on monday march 11th on when monday. north carolina yeah. launches online sports betting listen it's very exciting uh and uh robert linan you have given us a great lay of the land here we, we we do appreciate it thank you sir and thank you very much for having me up next on flashpoint how the state is beefing up resources to help battle gambling addiction Let's turn now to a look at your weekend forecast as we take a live look this morning from Dallas out in Gaston County. Good morning to you all. Larry, it's a bit of a foggy start today. We'll fog out the area here on the St. Patrick's Day weekend. Got your green on mm -hmm. in honor of the Irish, you know, because we have to work in the green environment over there. No Makes green. It a little hard. But we do have a lot of green that we can show, and that's what we're talking about is this St. Patrick's weekend. You know, there's so many times on this time of the year you, you can get rainy condition, you can get cold and misty, but not, not this weekend. We're right on 74 degrees, so perfect for the big parade in uptown and for the festival that's going on all through the morning into the afternoon. And for St. Patrick's Day, tomorrow near 70. 70 degrees, not bad at all. We take a live view from our, our Mr. Sparky Carolina Camera Network. That's right there, downtown Blowing Rock, North Carolina. Looking very nice there. A few fair weather clouds. Now, this is, <laughs> this is our camera from Ballantyne looking towards uptown. You can still see some, some uh, fog there. So you got some patchy and dense fog in a couple of spots, but not any issues out there from Monroe. Things looking okay. The old courthouse there looking off the distance. Just fair weather clouds. Should be a nice day across the region, but... We are still dealing with all of this amazing amount of pollen. It's the time of the year, so it's off the charts. 
tomorrow and again on Monday. So high pollen count again today. Blame the trees. We love the trees, but they certainly could cause some issues out there. No issues once again with our forecast. 11 a.m., 62 degrees. Once again, that's when the parade starts in uptown Charlotte. Expecting thousands of people up there for the festival as well. Should be a fun time. And between about 4 and 6 today, we'll be in the low 70s. I would say there are many, many, many spots that actually get into the mid-70s this afternoon, but I would say averaging about 70, 71 degrees across the area today. Not expecting rain, no storms. We scan the skies. Rain is storm free. We did have the showers that moved across the area yesterday. It will expand the view. That system's off the Carolina coastline. Some showers off there and then way to the south of us across Florida. Once again, we're about 71 degrees right in the middle of the afternoon across the two state area today. The hot spot's going to be Charleston, South Carolina, 83 degrees out there and another coastal community, Cape Hatteras on the outer banks. 59. The cool reading will be in the mid 70s at Greenville, Spartanburg, Columbia, about 79 degrees. We've got travel plans down there. The capital of South Carolina, the capital city of North Carolina, Raleigh at 70, 64 at Boone, over in Asheville at 71 degrees. In case you're heading to go up more. Now, watch this change in temperatures. We've got nice weather this weekend. Look at those drops in the temperatures Monday and Tuesday. We see a rebound for the middle of the weekend towards the end of next week. Next weekend, we'll see temperatures drop a few degrees below average for today. Boone hits about 64, blowing rock tops out about 63. Up around Jefferson, West Jefferson, low to mid 60s there. Morganton, Lenore, Tailsville, Hickory, Maiden, all much like we see here in our area. It'll be in the low to mid 70s and about the same from Monroe to Wadesboro to Rockingham and Chesterfield down there in South Carolina. Checking the guy roofing 70 forecast through the weekend and beyond. Low to mid 70s today. Tomorrow we'll look for mostly sunny skies. We put that 20% chance in. Most of the air has and will not have a chance to rain at all. And then we see 58. That's right. That's not a mistake. That's 58 for high temperature on Monday. Tuesday morning, a frosty morning, cold at 32, high 59. Then we see a rebound Wednesday and Thursday. It looks like by next Friday, here we go, another Friday with a chance of showers with temperatures in the low 60s. That's your forecast this morning. Some North Carolinians who owe millions of dollars in back taxes will have their debt forgiven after 10 years. And that's thanks to a new law that passed last year, adding to the state's existing tax forgiveness legislation. Now, if you haven't heard about the law, you're not alone here. Yeah, a viewer actually told us about it after mm. our Where's the Money investigation exposed that state tax on illegal drugs. The so-called drug tax has cost North Carolinians more than $100 million over the last 15 years, even though some of them were never convicted. Our Nate Morabito discovered those taxpayers and others facing longstanding state tax debt now have a better chance of getting ahead in 2024. If knowledge is power. I had to worry about Uncle Sam. <laughs> the word of Uncle Sam. <laughs> yeah, Uncle Sam. Antonio Mosley finally has the currency he needs. No more debt. No more Uncle Sam. To control his destiny. Boy, like a burden off my back. It was a burden. The small business owner recently learned the state lightened a heavy load. He spent decades hauling. You gotta realize it's 1993. Tied to a teenage mistake that not only sent him to prison. Yes, I owned it. Did my time for it. But also saddled him with thousands of dollars in taxes tied to illegal drugs. They found some cocaine. A debt that for years stood in the way of Mosley's attempts to make the most of his second chance. I don't think it's fair. Just months after we first amplified his plight, he learned the state had already written off his remaining drug tax debt. It was a victory for me. Turns out others are likely unaware they too are now debt free. The lack of knowledge can be just as harmful as the assessment itself. Laura Webb has spent years fighting to end North Carolina's unauthorized substance tax and get the state to forgive all debt. We saw where multiple people were being assessed for the same amount. Of drugs. The director of the North Carolina Justice Center's Fair Chance Criminal Justice Project says the tax discourages people from getting jobs and forces them to make other major life decisions. They might decide not to go and buy the house based on their tax debt. And it's very hard to overcome these. This amended state law passed in 2023 will help. 
It forgives all state tax debt, not just tied to drugs, after 10 years. And it's retroactive, a major change that's received no public attention until now. It is a step in the right direction. Um, we hope that the law will still go further. You feeling good? I'm feeling great. Okay. No more debt. Antonio Mosley didn't know about the law until we told him. It was a big relief. We didn't know until a viewer taught us. It's been a blessing. Now others have this same knowledge. And that is powerful. This new law is just the latest step toward more tax forgiveness in North Carolina. It was actually an existing law that wiped away Mosley's debt. All of this was news to him and to us. The lesson here is to reach out to the Department of Revenue to see whether any of these laws might affect your back taxes. Nate Morabito, WCNC Charlotte. So our work is never done, truly, right? Nate and our team work hard to dig into the receipts, double check those numbers, and then ask those in power, where's the money? Yeah, this story originally came to us from a viewer tip, and as you can see, it's really taken off from there with multiple folks in the community weighing in. And it really just goes to show that your tips can lead to answers and to real change. We do invite you to tune in tonight on WCNC Plus. There you can see our Nate Morbido explaining the behind the scenes of this investigation, how it started, the questions we asked, who we asked, and the answers we are still waiting to get. You can catch that tonight at 830 on your favorite streaming device. While there is a lot of excitement right now from some folks, there are also some concerns about gambling addiction becoming more prevalent. Yeah, because of this, as part of the legislation to make betting legal, additional state resources were put in place to help those who might struggle. WCNC Charlotte's Nick Sturdivant talks to some licensed clinical uh, addiction specialists specifically about the risks and what you should look out for. I, I want to throw this out there. I mean, I, I just saw an ad for online sports betting. Mm -hmm. I feel like I run across them every day. You, you can't avoid them either. If you're watching a podcast on YouTube or whatever content on YouTube, you're streaming something on your TV. It's concerning. Uh, you know, they're they're saturating the market, obviously. Um, and, and like you said, they're they're exploring all avenues to do so. Bright lights, big celebrities. This is fun. This is exciting. And then at the very end of those commercials, just real quick, 1-800-GAMBLERS. Art and Christina Close are both licensed clinical addiction specialists. They run Coastal Therapy Center, LLC. And now we have sports betting that is just in your fingertips, uh, which makes it difficult to walk away from. So there's no, oh, I have to leave here and go home or I have another responsibility. It's just in my hands at all times. People tend to de de detach themselves because it is online. It's on an app on your phone, but you're you're losing real money. Mm -hmm. um, and and th there's, you know, there's that high that you feel when you are winning. And what I'm hearing is just be aware of like your personal finances and, Again, what you're spending, right? There's thousands of people that can that can safely gamble, um, but but the awareness, like like we said, is key. Anybody can fall victim to gambling. Um, it, it, there, there's no boundaries. Art and Christina tell us, don't be afraid to reach out for help. Here's that number for the North Carolina Gambling our Problem Gambling Helpline, 877-718-5543. That resource is free to anyone who needs it. We also have this online at WCNC.com. You can reach that whenever you need it. And there's a lot of... Time now to connect the dots. When we make the news make sense, there's a new way to order everything from vodka to tequila here in Mecklenburg County, and it's all possible thanks to the online ordering that surged during the pandemic. You can now order some of your favorite liquor from the palm of your hand. Let's connect the dots. Mecklenburg County is bringing beverage sales into the 21st century. The county's ABC board is launching the ABC to go mobile app. It'll allow folks to order ahead and then pick up their purchases in stores. All you have to do is enter a zip code and then browse the inventory of your nearest store. The idea first came together following the pandemic. Thousands used online ordering to avoid going into stores. 
It is part of the latest push to modernize a dated system. For years, lawmakers have considered privatizing the sale of liquor to help modernize a system that dates back to the Prohibition era. And that is Connecting the Dots. All new tonight, a Charlotte-based company is leading the country in hiring those who are neurodivergent, essentially folks whose brains work differently than most. Yeah, Wells Fargo has hired hundreds of applicants who might otherwise have struggled to find jobs. WCNC Charlotte's Michelle Bowden shows us how the program is seeking solutions and then paying off for both the workers and Wells Fargo. The bank says this isn't about charity. In fact, they say it is a win-win because they're able to tap into a top-notch talent pool. When I came here, I was 27. I had a master's degree. I was a published author, and I had never held down a full-time job for more than about a month. Alex Lieberman admits he was living with his parents with not much on the horizon when he got his job at Wells Fargo three years ago. It feels good to have a future. After a while, I didn't see myself doing anything. And this gave me a chance to build something for myself, to build a way forward, to help other people build their futures too. And it's a privilege I never thought I would get. Lieberman, who is autistic and has ADHD, is a tech consultant at the company, part of the Wells Fargo Neurodiversity Program that launched in 2020. It's a really a talent play. It's not charity. It is gaining access to an incredibly deep, richly diverse, highly skilled talent pool. Stephen DeStefani runs the program that has so far placed almost 300 workers at Wells Fargo in everything from tech jobs to data analytics roles, finance and more. We see the return on investment and I say that a little reluctantly because I because I often say you, you shouldn't need a business case to do the right thing, but there is a business case. We are closing skills gaps and employee satisfaction, particularly for those who have participated or are impacted by the program is through the roof. DeStefani says one of the keys is making sure the interview process isn't a stumbling block, letting people be themselves. Vivian Wen is a software engineer who is autistic and says that was a challenge at previous jobs where she was often told to change the way she interacted with people. But things like that have happened throughout my life, whether in the interview process or actually at work. Do you think maybe they just didn't understand that you were a little bit different? Absolutely, I agree with that. Because I was different, because I wasn't like them, because I wasn't holistic and I didn't follow what we call social pro protocols and all the scripts that you do. Or it sounds like you feel more comfortable in your own skin here and that they actually value your skill set. Oh, absolutely. Yes, they do, because we're here to do work and we're here to make things better. And I'm empowered to do all of those things without letting those social protocols get in the way. We are all people. We think differently than most but we don't have any more or less inherent value than anyone else. In a program that acknowledges that and accommodates that, we have a chance to contribute in ways that people generally don't think that we can. And the Wells Fargo team running the Neurodiverse program says they're actually sharing their best practices with other companies in hopes that other companies will follow their lead. Reporting in Uptown Charlotte, Michelle Bowden, WCNC Charlotte. And now part of our effort with our Seeking Solutions brand is to highlight the companies and individuals and groups making a difference and giving a voice to those who might not always be heard. So if you know a group or maybe a person who's doing just that, we want to hear about them and get the ball rolling towards those solutions. We can't say it enough. A lot of our great stories come from you at home. So send us an email to newstips at WCNC.com. You can see your story on our air. Let's go to a murder investigation though in Lancaster County tonight. Yeah, we have learned a 23 year old is now in jail in connection to that case. Lloyd, Lloyd Caldwell Jr. We're told is facing murder and burglary charges. He's accused of killing 65 year old Harriet Mahaffey. WCNC Charlotte's Anna King spoke to neighbors tonight who say they are shocked. Well, neighbors described us as incredibly sad and say with the neighborhood so quiet and tucked away, they're more confused than anything else. With the things that are going on in the world today, you don't never know what's going to happen where. So it's, you know, it's, it was just more or less a surprise. 
Neighbors along Stewart Place Road and Heath Springs say they're shocked after 65 year old Harriet Mahaffey was found murdered in her home Monday. We live in a quiet neighborhood, don't nobody bother nobody, and just for something like that to happen, just uh, a tragic thing for somebody to do something like that. Mahaffey lived alone and relatives had not heard from her. Lancaster County Sheriff says family members went to check on her Tuesday and they found her unresponsive next to 11 bullet castings. Guys, this was a horrible crime uh, with, with no explanation for it. A uh, uh, lady sitting in her home defenseless, not bothering anybody. Someone walks in and, and shoots her multiple times. During the investigation, officials noticed her 2004 Jeep Cherokee was missing, the same one that was seen in Chester and Charlotte. Investigators eventually traced the car back to 23-year-old Lloyd Caldwell Jr., who was arrested in Chester County. After searching his home, deputies found evidence connecting Caldwell to the murder. We live in a different world today. It's not like it was 20 years ago. And, and, and you know, years ago, people could leave the doors unlocked and things like that. Now you have cameras everywhere. Now you have to keep your doors locked. Have to be aware of your surroundings all the time. Caldwell is now in the Lancaster County Detention Center charged with murder, first degree burglary, grand larceny, and possession of a firearm during the commission of a violent crime. The Lancaster County Sheriff says there's no clear motive for why this happened, noting the suspect and victim did not know each other. In Lancaster County, Anna King, WCNC Charlotte. 637 now and we're asking where's the money for college students and graduates. Good early Thursday morning and thanks for watching. A new report from the outlet Study Finds is trying to answer a pretty timely question. Is that four year degree still worth it? Now we want to hear from y'all in a second, but here are the details in this article. There were three main takeaways. First, the short answer is yes. Researchers say investing in a college degree still pays off financially. Now the second takeaway is this. Certain degrees lead to a better return. The money makers are going to be engineering and computer science degrees. And then moving on to three, just in time for Women's History Month, the research shows women benefited slightly more than men by earning that degree. On the numbers, here they are. The data covers about 10 years. It compares earnings and tuition costs of about 6 million students and graduates. Then analysts came up with a percentage. That return of investment came in around 9%. But I want to explain the reasoning behind this number, which explains more than the number itself. If you consider more than just how much you make after school, like the cost of tuition after books and even the lost wages from not entering the workforce sooner, they all point to one factor that's gaining more importance. It's the field that you're able to work in. Researchers in this article say while the degree still pays off, well, that bottom line is college keeps getting pricier. So the recommendation is that students should choose a degree that's going to pay more. It's what has us asking this morning. Do you think a four year degree is still valuable? Make sure you text us 704-329-3600. Let's turn now to a look at your weekend forecast as we take a live look this morning from Dallas out in Gaston County. Good morning to you all. Larry, it's a bit of a foggy start today. Mm, a little fog out there uh, here on the St. Patrick's Day weekend. Get your green on mm -hmm. in honor of the Irish, you know, because we have to work in the green environment over there. No Makes green. It a little hard. But we do have a lot of green that we can show, and that's what we're talking about is this St. Patrick's weekend. You know, there's so many times on this time of the year you, you can get rainy condition, you can get cold and misty, but not, not this weekend. We're right on 74 degrees, so perfect for the big parade in uptown and for the festival that's going on all through the morning into the afternoon. And for St. Patrick's Day, tomorrow near 70. 70 degrees, not bad at all. We take a live view from our, our Mr. Sparky Carolina Camera Network. That's right there, downtown Blowing Rock, North Carolina. Looking very nice there. A few fair weather clouds. Now, this is, <laughs> this is our camera from Ballantyne looking towards uptown. You can still see some, some uh, fog there. So you got some patchy and dense fog in a couple of spots, but not any issues out there from Monroe. Things looking okay. The old courthouse there looking off the distance. Just fair weather clouds. Should be a nice day across the region, but... We are still dealing with all of this amazing amount of pollen. It's the time of the year, so it's off the charts tomorrow and again on Monday. So high pollen count again today. Blame the trees. We love the trees, but they certainly could cause some issues out there. No issues once again with our forecast. 11 M, 62 degrees once again. That's when the parade starts in uptown Charlotte. Expecting thousands of people up there for the festival as well. Should be a fun time. And between about 4 and 6 today, we'll be in the low 70s. I would say there may be many, many spots that actually get into the mid-70s this afternoon, but I would say averaging about 70, 71 degrees across the area today. Not expecting 
rain, no storms. We scanned the skies. Rain and storm free. We did have the showers that moved across the area yesterday. It will expand the view. That system's off Carolina coastline, some showers off there, and then way to the south of us across Florida. Once again, we're about 71 degrees right in the middle of the afternoon across the two state area today. The hot spot's going to be Charleston, South Carolina, 83 degrees out there, and another coastal community, Cape Hatteras on the Outer Banks. 59. The cool reading will be in the mid 70s in Greenville, Spartanburg, Columbia, about 79 degrees. We got travel plans down there. The capital of South Carolina, the capital city of North Carolina, Raleigh at 70, 64 at Boone, over in Asheville at 71 degrees. In case you're heading to go up more. Now watch this change in temperatures. We got nice weather this weekend. Look at those drops in the temperatures Monday and Tuesday. We see a rebound for the middle of the weekend towards the end of next week. Next weekend we'll see temperatures drop a few degrees below average for today. Boone hits about 64, blowing rock tops out about 63. Up around Jefferson, West Jefferson, low to mid 60s there. Morganton, Lenore, Tailsville, Hickory, Maiden, all much like we see here in our area. It'll be in the low to mid 70s and about the same from Monroe to Wagesburg, Rockingham and Chesterfield down there in South Carolina. Checking the guy roofing 70 forecast through the weekend and beyond. Low to mid 70s today. Tomorrow we'll look for mostly sunny skies. We put that 20% chance in. Most of the year has will not have a chance to rain at all. And then we see 58. That's right. That's not a mistake. That's 58 for high temperature on Monday, Tuesday morning, a frosty morning, cold at 32, high 59. Then we see a rebound Wednesday and Thursday. It looks like by next Friday, here we go. Another Friday with a chance of showers with temperatures in the low 60s. That's your forecast this morning. What's near me? If you're out and see news, open the WCNC News app and go to near me on the bottom right. Then tap share with us. Upload your photo or video and tell us about it. Hit submit and your news has reached our team at WCNC Charlotte. Happy Friday, everybody. Yay. We have made it. TGIF. Yeah. This week flew by for me. I don't know about you guys. Uh, you know what? It'd fly back even faster if it was a four day week. That's right. Yes. <laughs> I'm all uh, for it. Can we do this? Uh, well, didn't Larry David have something to say? I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Bernie Sanders. <laughs> he wow. did. Funny you should say. Yes. <laughs> Often confused for one another. Uh, that's what we're talking about this morning. A four day work week could be one step closer to becoming the norm. So let us know this morning, what do you think? Do you think that, that uh, that's just as good as five days and you can be just as productive? So Bernie Sanders introducing a bill that would reduce the standard work week to 32 hours without a pay cut. The bill would mandate workers get overtime pay anything after 32 hours of work instead of, you know, most people work an average of 40 hours a week. A recent survey found nearly 90% of workers said they'd be interested in the idea of a shorter work week. I'm sure, especially if you right. get the same pay. So this morning we want to hear from you. What do you think? Do you think it is time we make a four day work week the standard or do you think five days is just fine? Let us know. Uh, some people commenting this morning saying everyone deserves more weekend and less work week. I am all for the four day schedule. I'd love a four day work week, but it will increase costs for employers, especially small businesses, because you have to hire more people to cover the hours that they aren't open. And babysitters and things like oh, that. Oh yeah, four day work sure. week would be a dream, but becomes unfair when you also want the school week to stay at five days a week, yep. uh, four days, but work nine hour days. So there you go, lots of people. Chime in. Joy already, already says she, she'd go for it. Would you guys, what, what, what do you guys think? I'm with you. Yeah. Working five <laughs> days to get two days off, it's just, it's, I'm not a fan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for me, it's almost less about the working four days as much as it is about having three days off. <laughs> That's just such a nice, I feel like. Oh, uh, yeah, perk. for sure. Um, but Larry, you wouldn't take that extra day, would you? It was Monday. I probably would. I don't like I'll Friday being the day. I think Monday. Because because yeah. everyone's happy. We like Friday. Happy is Friday. Yeah. But then yeah, wouldn't yeah, everybody exactly. be happy that it's, it's Thursday? Yeah. Thursday. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Thursday is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, hey. It's speaking, not going to happen. Yeah, so. Melissa. Yeah, Melissa yeah, says she's uh, she's <laughs> down already. Log off early on Fridays. I think a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing, though. Joy I feel Mott like saying she she'd go for it too. Yeah, I, I think. Um, <laughs> I think there's a couple of things here. Okay. Same thing as our, the AI conversation the other day and whatever else. We're, I, f I feel like we're sort of behind the eight ball on, on these conversations. I feel like we've evolved so much and the work week as it is right now evolved decades ago. And I feel like we're, we're not staying up on things because I think, sure, there's a conversation to be had about four day work weeks. I also think if you have that conversation, perhaps more importantly, is bringing people up to a pay scale that is appropriate. Yeah. I mean, you have a lot of people making 
less than they would have in the 1950s for the mm -hmm. same job once mm -hmm. you once you adjust mm -hmm. for inflation. And they're working harder. And they're working harder. And that, and that just doesn't make sense with technology and everything mm -hmm. else. And I, and I feel like there's issues like that. R retiring, I feel like we have some antiquated ideas of retiring and when to retire and what's the official retirement age. Have you ever thought about I feel being like, an agent? I need to hire you. Uh -uh. <laughs> oh, Ben would be a great agent. Yes. yes. I would hate but that. But please don't leave the news No, desk I would hate that. Because I, who's going to do flush? Uh, yeah, right, right. <laughs> you. <laughs> um, so I, I think I'm, of course, open to the idea of working four days, but I feel like there's other big conversations to have around that as well that we're not having. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, hey. Speaking of the weekend, yes. mm. it is going to be a two-day two day weekend, right. but, but there's still a lot going on right. this weekend. So we're talking about three big events happening around the Queen City, uh, kicking off your weekend with the Charlotte Hornets. The team plays their first of two games tonight against the Phoenix Suns. Tickets still available. The game starts at 7 at the Spectrum Center. Also, take a look at this. Celebrating all things green, of course. The St. Patrick's Day party yeah. returns to Uptown. Look at those Irish step dancers. Uh, the beloved parade kicks off Saturday at 11 a.m. You know, technically it's St. Patrick's Day Sunday, but the parade Saturday. Yep, yep. Uh, the parade starts at East 9th Street and Tryon Street. If you can't make it to the parade, a festival will take place before and after the parade from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. So lots going on. Also, uh, grab your green and get ready for more fun at Charlotte's annual bar crawl event for St. Patrick's Day. Uh, they have discounted drinks, free entry at participating bars. The crawl starts at tattoos and booze at 2 p.m. on Sunday. Does that mean by the end of the crawling? I've always wondered about mm. that. Is no, that... you're just going from oh, okay. place to place, ah, right? Yeah, some are. Yeah, yeah. I bet some, of them are some will probably be crawling, unfortunately. <laughs> they need yes. to go yeah, home. Yeah, right. uh, tickets start at $12. So, um, Lots going on, Larry, mm, but there might on. be some well, some rain. What right? about the weather for yeah. St. Patrick's Day? There you My go. Friend, Leap and Larry's not here. I don't know where he is. He's in the basement, I, maybe. But I thought no. he would make an appearance. I, I he made an appearance this morning. I know. I don't know where the guy is. Uh, today, yes, I would say there's a chance of a few showers and storms, particularly from about noon until four. But tomorrow, for all the big events, the parade uptown, the uh, the festival that's going on, uh, looking for temperatures in the, the mid 70s. And then on St. Patrick's Day, that's as perfect as it gets. I mean, that? yeah, that's unseasonally warm. Luck the Irish. Wonderful. 70, a green Luck 72. Of the wearing of the green. But I did want to, let's see, we push this button right here. And I was going to show you what's going to happen next week, but it just not it working for me. <laughs> and by next Tuesday, it's only good. There it there is. All go. right. You can see next Tuesday, a low of 32, a high of only 56. Mm -hmm. Take it back. You're going to look well, green. That's so, right. Uh -uh. <laughs> uh, we still got some people chiming in yeah. about working from home. John Kelly saying, I think the ability of working from home, hybrid or modified work week is long overdue. The old five day in the office is outdated when we're talking about going to four day work weeks. Yeah. Uh, Melissa chiming in saying, John Kelly, I've been working from home for six years. I would take seven figures to get me. <laughs> oh, it would take yeah. seven figures yeah. to get me back into the office. Yeah, well, people. I think, that's what, what, I think that's what made the pandemic so hard is that people got a taste of that life. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then they were told, nah, I mean, got to come back. I mean, people here, they left uh, because they were I just like, I admire I work people from home. who can work from home because I would be the lazy, I still am la lazy anytime I'm home anyway. Um, I would not describe would, you as lazy would, at all, No, at home, no, home, I would be, I would not be able to work. That's why I have to come to work. That's why, yeah. like Ben and myself, maybe one of the, we were here during the, during the pandemic. Well, so was I. I know, but you weren't with us at the time. Oh, yeah, I was at night. We were talking about us. <laughs> just it was, it's like having to come in and work. And if I stayed at home, I would be really I would be lazy. I'd be there. Go, he's out of here. Well, our job <laughs> is kind of different because it's like it's easier here because all the equipment's here. Yes, that's exactly you know. Right. But depending on what your job yeah. is, if you have everything at home and almost have that like that separate mm. space, yeah, which is totally. hard because I do think people yeah. you know. If your kids are home or you got laundry, you get distracted easily. That's I was about sure. to say, now I didn't sure. have no kids to distract me. Yeah. But when I was just reporting, I had to work from home and I was much more efficient. So I don't know. I think it just depends on what kind of person you are. Like, I, always so, yeah. Well, yeah. A couple of, I know a couple of our reporters uh, did say that they did not like being home. One in particular really? used to work on a morning show. She yeah. said she did not like working yeah. at home. So it's every, it's up to depends it's on the person. person. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 Right. May you be so lucky as to get the decision at some point. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of us I, don't. I doubt it's going to uh, happen. That's right. That's right. That's right. All right. Let us know what you think. Have a great weekend. We'll see you back here on Monday. Bye. Bye.
Now to Gastonia, where the city is making plans after getting a $250,000 donation from an anonymous donor. However, that donor says the money must go towards improving the aesthetics of some busy roadways. WCNC Charlotte's Jesse Pierre shares more about how this money will be used. Yes, the city of Gastonia received a very generous gift and the money will be used to make the area surrounding several interchanges more appealing to the eye. Anything to do to beautify this area, it's going to be seen. Along US 321 and just under a mile from I-85 is Allen's Mobile Home and RV Supplies. Owner Billy Linhart says one thing he can count on seeing outside his doors is a flow of cars. Just probably almost double how much traffic I've seen out here in just the nine years that I've been here. But now, due to a generous donation, drivers can expect a more pleasant drive into Gastonia. Thanks to an anonymous $250,000 donation, three busy interchanges along I-85 will be freshened up. Those interchanges are at Cox Road, New Hope Road, and US 321. The first step, starting with some simple cleanup. The trash, the underbrush, the vine, I mean, just right. to, to clean that, and then the next step would be to uh, spruce it up. The money will also go towards replacing aging and broken fencing, planting grass and low maintenance shrubs. City leaders gave the green light for the beautification project to begin, despite some concerns of wasting money. Ahead of the I-85 widening project set to begin in a few years. Just hate to see them put a lot of landscaping plans in place, you know, plantings and things like that to have them yanked out in a matter of a short period of time. Mm -hmm. I think the conversation was had with the anonymous donor. Yes. That that project would impact and they said go forth and do good things. City leaders hoping to save some of the money until after the widening project is done. Linhart says this will be a good look for the city. To give people an impression of Gastonia, to make them want to come back, to make them want to shop, stop, eat. He hopes it will make the congestion in the area more bearable and hopefully attract more foot traffic in. Jesse Pierre, WCNC Charlotte. In just a few hours, the ACC men's basketball tournament is set to tip off. This is one of several major tournaments going on this week. It all comes ahead of Selection Sunday when we'll get our first look at March Madness brackets. NC State plays Louisville this afternoon at 430. Duke and UNC have their first games of the tournament on Thursday. Well, these intense games sometimes lead to fans storming the court in excitement. But WCNC's Megan Bragg explains why that might not be a great idea in today's Verify. Buzzer beater moments are what the madness is all about. But sometimes those moments can cause harm to the players. This year, a Duke player was hurt after Wake Forest fans stormed the court after their win. So can fans be civilly liable if they injure a player while storming the court? Let's verify. Our sources, attorney Eric Hayes with James Scott and Farron Law Firm, the NCAA, and the ACC. The NCAA does not have a policy on storming the court and leaves punishment up to each conference. Duke and Wake Forest are in the ACC conference. Currently, the ACC does not have rules against it. However, NCAA spokesperson David Warlock told NBC News court storming is not allowed during NCAA tournament games, and they work with venues to develop a security plan to try and prevent it. They don't go into it thinking that they could be hurt during an after-game court storming incident. Attorney Eric Hayes says if a player is hurt by a fan because of court storming, they could be held liable for that injury. Fans are... Um, if not just negligent, maybe grossly negligent or reckless, whatever they are taking the court like that if they were to cause an injury to someone. What would the argument be for a fan who rushed the court, ran into a player and hurt them? I didn't mean to do it. Well, then you should have stayed in your seat. As for schools being held liable, that's still an open question. A player who was injured did sue the school and did settle the case. Whether or not a school could be held liable, I think that that is an open question and certainly one that schools would be concerned about. So we can verify that yes, fans can be held civilly liable if they injure a player while storming the court. With your Verify, I'm Megan Bragg. If you have something you would like verified, just email us at verify at wcnc.com. With your help, WCNC Charlotte is making a difference in our community. 
beautiful day, so many people helping. This is incredible. Let's spread that love tonight. Here is a $5,000 check that you guys wow. can use to further the mission. There is nothing on earth like the feeling of giving back with your hands. $5,000 to you and uh, Block Love Charlotte for what you guys do. If you'd like to make a difference, go to wcnc.com slash make a difference now. Time now to connect the dots when we make the news make sense. Lots of kids hearing back from colleges and universities this week as schools release their decisions. But a few a new form has colleges and families asking, where's the money? Problems with a new financial aid system have both colleges and families waiting for answers. Let's connect the dots. Before families can make a decision on college, finances are often a huge factor. But colleges are in limbo as they still wait to receive information about applicants' finances. The root of the problem comes from the FAFSA website. That's where students can see if they qualify for aid. The Department of Education has been trying to overhaul the form for years. The changes use a new calculation called the Student Aid Index to determine how much a family should get. It's meant to benefit low-income students, but it hasn't been a smooth process. Some families say they're not getting as much aid as they should. Now experts say you may want to consider appealing your case to try and get more money, hopefully in time to make a choice by College Decision Day on May 1st. And that is Connecting the Dots. Well, tomorrow is Canvas Day, where every county election board inside North Carolina will vote to officially certify the primary election results. The primary was the first election under a new state law saying mail-in ballots must be in by Election Day rather than getting that grace period. Yes, WCNC Charlotte's Julia Kaufman shows us how voting activists say this change discounts uh, legitimate or discounts legitimate votes, but supporters call it common sense. When North Carolinians voted by mail in previous elections, their ballots had a three-day grace period to get to the county election office. That grace period is gone, and now ballots marked as returned after deadline are piling up. 31. Under new state laws, absentee ballots need to get to the election office by 7.30 p.m. on election day to count. It was very unnecessary, very unfair to voters. The State Board of Elections tells WCNC Charlotte in the 2020 presidential primary, which had a higher voter turnout than in 2024, 800 ballots were returned after the three-day grace period and not counted. This year, 999 absentee ballots have been received so far that will not count due to missing the new deadline. There are people right now who did everything right and through no fault of their own, but the mail service not getting their ballot in time to the County Board of Elections, their vote won't count. Bob Phillips with Common Cause argues the new deadline hurts all absentee voters regardless of party affiliation. This law, I think, is going to contribute to that feeling that something is wrong with our elections. Supporters like the North Carolina Republican Party argue the new voting laws restore trust in elections. A spokesperson says, quote, the changes enacted by the General Assembly to strengthen election integrity and create one singular deadline worked as intended. These laws are reasonable, common sense efforts to create certainty and transparency in the election process. County election offices are required to notify voters if their vote did not count and explain why. That process will begin after the election is certified. Julia Kaufman, WCNC Charlotte. Verify, WCNC Charlotte. Verify is all about trying to make a difference in the community by making sure that the community has the correct information. This is what we know. And hey, this is what we don't know. Sometimes you're actually surprised by the answer. Verify the difference. Verify is a great way to combat that misinformation, making sure that people know the process of the reporting. Time now to connect the dots. When we make the news make sense, thousands of drivers are reporting their insurance rates are going up, and it could be thanks to data collected behind the scenes. A report shows cars made by GM, Ford, Honda, and other popular manufacturers are sending your data to insurance companies, and you may not even know about it. Let's connect the dots. In most of these vehicles, there's software tracking how you drive. It keeps data about 
when you're on the road, how fast you drive, and how quickly you brake. It's all thanks to the ability of newer cars to connect to the internet. And the New York Times reports all that data gets sent off to your insurance company for a personalized rate. And automakers say it's all legal, thanks to all those papers you sign when you buy a new car. That is Connecting the Dots. To this, another push to provide mental health resources to Carolina's most vulnerable students. We do thank you for sticking with us this evening for the news at six. I'm Vanessa Rufus. And I'm Colin Mayfield. Now, in the aftermath of a deadly school shooting in Uvalde, Texas, Congress dedicated money to help prevent future school violence and improve student mental health. But our Where's the Money investigation found new schools in the Carolinas are actually putting that money to use. Yeah, not many schools tonight, nearly yeah. two months after our Nate Morbido exposed this problem. South Carolina is making a second effort to deliver millions of federal dollars to students who are most at risk. When we discovered South Carolina had only awarded this money to a dozen school districts, the Department of Education said it would find a way to spend the rest of the money. Well, now, if everything goes as planned, more than twice as many school districts could receive this potentially life-saving money in round two. In Uvalde, Texas, a gunman murdered two teachers and 19 children. Almost two years later, millions of dollars in grants sit unused. Funds elected leaders approved to prevent another Robb Elementary School shooting. It makes no sense to me for these dollars to be offered by the federal government to be sitting in coffers while our schools are not as safe as they can be. We, we need to do better. It's a revelation WCNC Charlotte took all the way to the top. First with the Secretary of Education and then with the vice president herself. Well, that's part of why I'm here, to make sure that the money gets to where it needs to be going. These so-called Stronger Connections grants are meant to help school districts with high rates of poverty, bullying, absenteeism, and exclusionary discipline. Sometimes I just think I'm not sure how some of these children kind of survive their life. But York School District 1 is the only school system in the Charlotte area that's received a grant so far. The district is using the money to ensure every school has its own mental health therapist. My mission is to help these children who are struggling so much. South Carolina is hoping others will take notice of York's efforts. If you are eligible, please, please apply. The Department of Education opened a second round of applications this month. Records show more than 50 South Carolina districts are eligible and they have two months to submit their applications. We just wanna make sure that this gets out there and we don't have to send any of it back. While South Carolina is moving on to round two, North Carolina has still not spent a single cent of this money. You can blame that on bureaucracy and delays in communication. Nate Morbido, WCNC Charlotte. Now to go further here, we asked some of the districts that did not apply in round one why not? The Lancaster County School District told us the timing was not good back then, but assured us if there was a second round, it would apply. So we alerted those district leaders earlier today that this opportunity is available to them. And so as you can see, Nate and our Where's the Money team are very hard at work. They are tracking those federal dollars. They're keeping receipts here. They're checking those. They're holding those in power accountable, really all in an effort to give you answers. So that being said, if you have something out there you think our team should be looking into, please let us know. You can send us an email to money at WCNC.com or reach out to our team on social media. Let's turn now to a look at your weekend forecast as we take a live look this morning from Dallas out in Gaston County. Good morning to you all. Larry, it's a bit of a foggy start today. Mm, we'll fog out the area here on the St. Patrick's Day weekend. Got your green on mm -hmm. in honor of the Irish, you know, because we have to work in the green environment over there. No Makes green. It a little hard. But we do have a lot of green that we can show, and that's what we're talking about is this St. Patrick's weekend. You know, there's so many times on this time of the year you, you can get rainy condition, you can get cold and misty, but not, not this weekend. We're right on 74 degrees, so perfect for the big parade in uptown and for the festival that's going on all through the morning into the afternoon. And for St. Patrick's Day, tomorrow near 70. 
70 degrees, not bad at all. We take a live view from our, our Mr. Sparky Carolina camera network. That's right there, downtown Blowing Rock, North Carolina. Looking very nice there. A few fair weather clouds. Now, this is <laughs> this is our camera from Ballantyne looking towards uptown. You can still see some, some uh, fog there. So you got some patchy and dense fog in a couple of spots, but not any issues out there from Monroe. Things looking okay. The old courthouse there looking off of this is just fair weather clouds. Should be a nice day across the region, but... We are still dealing with all of this amazing amount of pollen. It's the time of the year, so it's off the charts tomorrow and again on Monday. So high pollen count again today. Blame the trees. We love the trees, but they certainly could cause some issues out there. No issues once again with our forecast. 11 a.m., 62 degrees. Once again, that's when the parade starts in uptown Charlotte. Expecting thousands of people up there for the festival as well. Should be a fun time. And between about 4 and 6 today, we'll be in the low 70s. I would say there are many, many, many spots that actually get into the mid-70s this afternoon, but I would say averaging about 70, 71 degrees across the area today. Not expecting rain. No storms. We scan the skies. Rain is storm free. We did have the showers that moved across the area yesterday. It will expand the view. That system's off the Carolina coastline. Some showers off there, and then way to the south of us across Florida. Once again, we're about 71 degrees right in the middle of the afternoon across the two state area today. The hot spot's going to be. Charleston, South Carolina, 83 degrees out there, and another coastal community, Cape Hatteras on the Outer Banks, 59. The cool reading will be in the mid 70s at Greenville, Spartanburg, Columbia, up about 79 degrees. We got travel plans down there, the capital of South Carolina, the capital city of North Carolina, Raleigh at 70, 64 at Boone, over in Asheville at 71 degrees. In case you're heading to build more. Now, watch this change in temperatures. We got nice weather this weekend. Look at those drops in the temperatures Monday and Tuesday. We see a rebound for the middle of the weekend towards the end of next week. Next weekend, we'll see temperatures drop a few degrees below average for today. Boone hits about 64, blowing rock tops out about 63. Up around Jefferson, West Jefferson, low to mid 60s there. Morganton, Lenore, Taylorsville, Hickory, Maiden, all much like we see here in our area. It'll be in the low to mid 70s and about the same from Monroe to Wadesburg to Rockingham and Chesterfield down there in South Carolina. Checking the guy roofing seven day forecast through the weekend and beyond. Low to mid 70s today. Tomorrow we'll look for mostly sunny skies. We put that 20% chance in. Most of the air has and will not have a chance to rain at all. And then we see 58. That's right. That's not a mistake. That's 58 for high temperature on Monday. Tuesday morning, a frosty morning, cold at 32, high 59. Then we see a rebound Wednesday and Thursday. It looks like by next Friday, here we go, another Friday with a chance of showers with temperatures in the low 60s. That's your forecast this morning. WCNC Charlotte. Weather is a, a kind of science that you get to see and experience every day. And I think some people don't even realize how much it affects them. That weather has a huge impact on you know, how it threatens your family, your livelihood, or your home. So I think it really is one of those defining things we do that really affects everybody in our community. See the difference. That process of giving you a warning ahead of time and keeping you and your family safe is really important to me because I live here too. It's my family, it's my friends, it's my neighbors. Well, an 11 year old boy with dreams of starting up his own landscaping business is getting some big help. We first told you about Quentin Hines earlier this week. Now he's getting a big boost, getting some fresh new tools. WCNC Charlotte's Miles Harris gives us a closer look. To see him at 11 with adult equipment um, is scary for me as a mom. <laughs> but it's just what he loves to do. By far one of our best mowers. Who would have thought an 11 year old would love to cut grass so much? That's exactly where Quentin Hines' passion lies, making a difference inside his community one lawn at a time. What do you like about cutting grass most or doing yard work, huh? I don't know, I just enjoy it, probably just beautifying lawns and yeah, making lawns look beautiful. We'll help you out all we can. He's getting a helpful hand from Cenex. The company caught Quentin's story and wanted to assist his service. Easier we can make that on him, whether it's lighter tools, uh, tools that move on our own uh, with just the squeeze of a handle, uh, whatever that is, uh, and then providing him with all the tools uh, that he needed. Not only adding more tools in the shed for Quentin, but also adding $1,000 to his GoFundMe. The fact that we're helping a young kid at a young age um, mold into what's going to be a very, very productive uh, and positive role model 
uh, in his community and in our community. Life lessons on generosity that his family surely appreciates. I think you know, this is really just showing Quentin now that people will stand behind you and support you know, your dream when you let it be known. Yeah. So I think that's very big for him at this early age. His next step might include getting more space. And with all the stuff that they're giving now, we're definitely going to need additional space to yeah. put this stuff. Yeah, oh, wow. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. Our garage is now gone. <laughs> <laughs> space to continue his dreams. What do you hope, big picture? What do you want to do? Um, just give like free services to senior citizens, help out other people, and just beautify lines. In Huntersville, Miles Harris, WCNC Charlotte. Unemployment rate is going in the right direction. There are many still struggling to find a job with a livable wage. Yeah, it is tough out there for many folks. The Charlotte Cooking School is helping people get ahead and get into the workforce, particularly by training them to prepare five star meals. Our Larry Sprinkle has been asking, where's the money? And for some folks, it's right there in the kitchen. 21 year old Courtney Allen, also known as Cam, moved to Charlotte a few months ago. Growing up, she always had the dream of playing basketball. I love basketball. But she also liked to cook. A few bad work experiences in the kitchen had her feeling like cooking was not a good fit, especially when combined with some difficult life experiences she was going through at the time. I was going through a lot before I came down here. Then she heard about the community culinary school. So I was able to see how it felt to be in a position that a real chef would be in. We are a 501c3 nonprofit that works with adults who've experienced barriers to long-term employment. Since 1997, skilled and professional chefs like Chef Ron have been helping students reach the goal of earning a living wage, creating delicious meals. The Community Culinary School of Charlotte gives back. We offer folks an opportunity to touch the success that they envision for themselves. And there is a hunger for the chefs who learn their craft here. As we emerge from COVID, the hospitality industry needs help and they need trained professionals. This training is just what Cam needs to give her the confidence to get back into the kitchen. My knife skills, yes. That prove you so much on your knife skills. Giving her the cutting edge, just like on the hardwoods. It's a passion. <laughs> I love basketball, so I made this a passion as well. So Cam is putting on a full court press to complete the training and take her victory lap. It's like you won a championship when you graduate. You get what I'm saying? It's like you won a medal. So hopefully I get my medal because I'm almost there. We are training hospitality folks so they have the ability to grow and, and uh, take care of themselves, their families, their community. Earning the title of chef isn't the end. It's just the beginning for Cam, who has a very big dream. It's hopefully in 10 years I have my own restaurant, my own staff, me working under me. Chopping it up on the east side of Charlotte, Larry Sprinkle, back to you. What's that old? WCNC Charlotte. Good morning, Carolinas. Tune in to the team that's preparing you for your day. The one and only Larry Sprinkle. See the difference in your morning. It is bitter cold just about anywhere you look. Here's a look right here at I-77 northbound. Trying to make your dollar stretch a little bit further. Responsible reporting, community focused, unique content. It's so good to see you. you too. Oh, y'all are having and too much like fun. This. See the difference weekday mornings on WCNC Charlotte. Now, burnout in nursing is on the rise, and this is an issue we've seen only get worse since the pandemic. There's no doubt. Right now, the American Nurses Association says it's more important than ever to understand how to manage and then prevent the condition. WCNC Charlotte's Lexi Wilson introduces us to a local nurse who is using comedy as her outlet. In uptown Charlotte, it's a real big deal to be invited here. The Bloomingthal Arts Stage Door Theater is a place with passion for local productions. The lighting, the sound, the tech crew, uh, there's ushers here. We love the ushers. Debbie Millwater has a love for comedy. Comedy has played a huge part in my life. Even though I like to think that I'm funny, uh, my kids assure me that I am not. While she spent time on stage, she enjoys being a comedy show producer even more. <laughs> 
helping create shows like the 2024 March Mania Comedy Tournament, where 32 local comedians battle it out until there's one winner. It just lights them up inside. It's very validating. It's a light <laughs> Debbie also needs. I just celebrated my sixth anniversary as an overnight bedside nurse. These days, there's an urgent warning about the shortage of health care workers. Research shows burnout and fatigue are prevalent. It's something Debbie has felt, especially during the pandemic. Staffing numbers had dropped and uh, the complexity of the patients didn't change. She's worked in the COVID unit and now works with cancer patients, most of them fighting for their life. That's why the laughs made here are so important. Comedy definitely helped me push through I, not only the pandemic, but nursing in general. A love for comedy, rewarding on and off the stage. And the March Mania Comedy Tournament finale is this Friday here at Stage Door Theater at 7 p.m. Tickets are $10. Reporting in Uptown for WCNC Charlotte, I'm Lexi Wilson. What an empowering way, you know, to find a, a medium to get all of that out. It's not good to keep in either. So true, and, and it is a tough job. Man. Someone who comes from a family, mom's a nurse, yeah. cousins, nurses, yeah. aunts, nurses, those are special people. Humanity has to be <laughs> thankful, and uh, so I think sometimes we take them for granted. So, Good Wednesday morning. Now Zillow, which is a real estate market company, is doing some research on how much we need to make to afford a home without stretching the budget at least so much. Now the report can be very numbers heavy, but we broke it down like this. First, Zillow is finding that the income needed to comfortably afford a home is up 80% since 2020. Now, keep in mind the median income has only risen 23% in that same amount of time. For those shopping for homes today, you need to be well in the six-figure range. Zillow says you need to be making, taking home rather more than $106,000 a year. Then those researchers took that, those numbers and made a ranked list. They took 50 metro areas across the country and compared how much is needed to afford a house in each one. Charlotte came in at number 23. Now, the ranking shows you would have to save for about nine years just to afford a 10% down payment. And as for possible solutions, well, the article points to an interesting trend. So it's called house hacking. It just means being able to rent out all or part of a home so you can get some extra cash. Zillow says at least 21% of last year's buyers reported co-buying with either a friend or a relative in order to save some money. So it's why we're asking if you'd be willing to take the same route this morning. Here's the question. Would you co-buy your house with a friend or a relative? Make sure you text us 704-329-3600. Wake up to the news that matters most with meteorologist and traffic reporter Chris Mulcahy. And we're all clear. We're keeping you smarter, safer, and on time. Start your day the Mulcahy way. See the difference. 430 to 7 on WCNC Charlotte. If you've ever received a bill or bought a ticket for a concert and noticed the price was a lot higher than you anticipated, you may have gotten hit with junk fees. But what exactly are they and can you combat them? WCNC Charlotte's Megan Bragg looks into it in today's Verify. So let's get the facts. Our sources are the Biden administration, a bill filed in the Senate, and Sarah Rathner with NerdWallet. Rathner says many people don't know this, but we're spending a lot of money each year on junk fees. These individual fees on their own might not seem like much, but added up all together, junk fees are costing American families tens of billions of dollars a year. A bill filed in the U.S. Senate known as the Junk Fees Prevention Act would make merchants disclose these hidden fees up front instead of hiding them at the very end of the transaction. Rathner says while this won't make these hidden fees any lower, it's still a step in the right direction. But it is going to make it easier for consumers to comparison shop knowing the final price and not just the initial price that's being advertised. This means if you're deciding between, let's say, two hotel rooms under the Junk Fees Prevention Act, both places would have to disclose any hidden fees before you get to the end of the checkout process. You can then choose which hotel works best for you. Rathner says since junk fees aren't going away, you'll need to include them in your budget. It is unfortunate that you can't always tell what something's going to cost until the very end. But really what might be helpful is just budgeting an additional amount of money. So if you think something's going to cost you $50, maybe budget $75 just in case. With your Verify Fact Check, I'm Megan Bragg. And if you have something you would like verified, just email us at verify at wcnc.com.
Meantime, right now at 6, learning can be a challenge for many students for a lot of different reasons. For students who are hard of hearing, though, those hurdles can be tougher to overcome. Now, a Charlotte family is pushing for CMS to change the way their child who is deaf is taught, saying the current system is too isolating. The state provides extra funding for each student who is deaf in public schools. However, the parents argue those dollars are not going to their child's education the way it's supposed to. That has our Michelle Bowden asking, where's the money? Up until a few years ago, there were several different options for teaching deaf students in Mecklenburg County. Now, though, the parents we talked to say there's only one option, and they say it's setting their kids up for failure. Afternoons in this house look a little different than most. There's all the hubbub of after school energy, but not a lot of noise. Mom and dad are deaf, and so are four of their seven kids. Three of the kids who are deaf are at University Meadows Elementary School where they are mainstreamed in a class with all hearing kids and have an interpreter. It's nice for my deaf children to be in a challenging environment where they're stimulated to learn and around other hearing children, that's fine, but there isn't communication and association with other deaf children. Besides their siblings, they need to be around with other children who are like them. We worked with an interpreter to do this interview where mom told us how frustrated she is with the way her kids are being taught. So all day long, the only person that they're interacting with is the interpreter. So they don't get to learn vicariously from other students. They don't get the opportunity to uh, help other students. They don't get the opportunity to be helped by other students. They don't get to talk about what's cool and what's not cool. She says the only people that know sign language at her kid's school are the interpreters assigned to each of them. So when the kids go to school, they literally can only communicate with the interpreter and that's it? Yes, just the interpreter. It hasn't always been this way. Until 2016, CMS had a special program for deaf students in Mecklenburg County where the kids were taught under one roof at Cotswold Elementary. In fact, that's where Carolyn went to school and it's what she wanted for her own kids. To see what's happening and to hear from the interpreters. Donna McCord Smolik is a deaf advocate who also grew up here in Charlotte and sent her kids to Cotswold. You know, the hearing students are in such a uh, for them, an integrated classroom, but it is such not an integrated classroom for the deaf student. They're left out, they're placed on an island, and all of the hearing people around them who don't know any different think they're doing the right best thing because they've got them so integrated that they've erased them, and there they are sitting alone, and it just breaks my heart. We checked with the state and learned every North Carolina school district decides how they want to approach teaching deaf students. Wake County, the school district most comparable to Mecklenburg, told us most of the students who are hearing impaired in their district attend their home schools with an interpreter if needed. But Wake County also offers regional programs or cluster programs for deaf students at three schools. We also checked in with the National Association for the Deaf, NAD, who told us as of 2020, 70% of deaf students were mainstreamed across the country, but pointed to the 2004 Federal Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act, or IDEA. That requires options for deaf children, including cluster schools that serve large groups of deaf students at selected schools. A spokesman for NAD told us, quote, deaf schools are an important placement opportunity mandated by IDEA that can be very beneficial for deaf children in providing education and community. Because right now, all of the deaf children are dispersed. And it is hard for deaf children to be around other deaf children. The state gives each school district an extra $5,600 per deaf student to make sure they have the tools they need. But Carolyn says money meant for her kids is being lumped in with money for all kids with special needs. To use the money that is allocated for the deaf student and then subsume it into a larger budget that's paying for ramps and for other forms of access isn't fair. That money was allocated to the deaf student. It makes me wonder about their future. I see a lack of resources. I see a lack of education for the deaf children. I see them not being set for success. The family we talked to say they're working with several advocates in town looking into the possibility of bringing a charter school for deaf students here in Mecklenburg County. They tell us right now they're in the exploratory phase. Reporting in Charlotte, Michelle Bowden, WCNC Charlotte.
Now our Where's the Money team works hard to hold those in power accountable, including the school systems and government agencies that use your taxpayer dollars. That being said, most of the time, it's your tips that really prompt us to start digging into those receipts. So if you have something you think we should investigate, please let us know. You can send an email to money at WCNC.com or reach out to us on social media. When it comes to WCNC's Chief Meteorologist Brad Panovich, our viewers tell the whole story. Hey, if you're new to the area, this meteorologist is awesome. I always stick with Brad Panovich when it comes to severe weather. He's rarely wrong. You should follow Brad if you don't already. He's usually right on the money with his forecast. I don't look at anything else besides what Brad says. We are fortunate to have him here. Brad Panovich, experience the difference with WCNC Charlotte Weather. Well, many people in North Carolina are trying their hand at mobile sports betting. Of course, there are going to be some wins and some losses, but are you allowed to deduct your losses from your taxes? WCNC Charlotte's Megan Bragg spoke to the experts in today's Verify. Are you getting lucky or are you seeing more losses than wins on these bets? It's okay, you can be honest. So if you do lose, can you deduct gambling losses on your taxes? Let's verify. Our source is Mark Stieber, tax information officer with Jackson Hewitt Tax Services, the IRS, and Intuit TurboTax. According to the IRS, winnings from any gambling are taxable. Stieber says if you win over $600, that's when you will get a form to fill out to record those winnings. If you win more than $600, you're going to get a W-2G with the amount, where you want it, how much you want, and those details and the IRS will get it too. Now, if you win $5,000 or more, there's a mandatory withholding, and the government will take 24% of their taxes up front. But what if you lose? Fast answer is yes. If you have losses while gambling, you may be able to take a tax deduction. May is the key word here because there are certain conditions you'd have to meet. According to TurboTax, you can deduct your gambling losses, but only to offset the income from your gambling winnings. You can't just deduct losses without reporting winnings. And the dollar amount of losses you can deduct can never exceed the winnings you report as income. To report losses, says you must itemize income tax deductions on a Schedule A form. Also, the IRS doesn't permit you to subtract your losses from your winnings and only report the difference on your tax return. Overall, if you have winnings, you can deduct same day, same types of losses to the extent you have winnings, but not a net loss and not all different types of bets, one at the casino, one at the dog track, and then one playing poker, and then the other one in the March Madness pool. Same types of bets can offset same types of income and losses. So we can verify that, yes, you can deduct gambling losses on your taxes. However, there are rules you must follow so that those deductions pass muster with the IRS. With your Verify, I'm Megan Brown. When did you know what you wanted to be? Hey, Mom, the weather's on! WCNC Charlotte's Chief Meteorologist Brad Panovich always knew what he was meant to do. All right, don't forget your umbrella. In fact, he joined the American Meteorological Society when he was 13. Now Brad is all grown up. You can see him right here on WCNC Charlotte, making sure you're informed and safe. Hey, where did all my hair go? Experience the difference. Let's turn now to a look at your weekend forecast as we take a live look this morning from Dallas out in Gaston County. Good morning to you all. Larry, it's a bit of a foggy start today. Mm, we'll fog up the area here on the St. Patrick's Day weekend. Got your green on mm -hmm. in honor of the Irish, you know, because we have to work in the green environment over there. No Makes green. It a little hard. But we do have a lot of green that we can show, and that's what we're talking about is this St. Patrick's weekend. You know, there's so many times on this time of the year you, you can get rainy condition, you can get cold and misty, but not, not this weekend. We're right on 74 degrees, so perfect for the big parade in uptown and for the festival that's going on all through the morning into the afternoon. And for St. Patrick's Day, tomorrow near 70. 
70 degrees, not bad at all. We take a live view from our, our Mr. Sparky Carolina Camera Network. That's right there, downtown Bowen Rock, North Carolina. Looking very nice there. A few fair weather clouds. Now, this is, <laughs> this is our camera from Ballantyne looking towards uptown. You can still see some, some uh, fog there. So you got some patchy and dense fog in a couple of spots, but not any issues out there from Monroe. Things looking okay. The old courthouse there looking off of this is just fair weather clouds. Should be a nice day across the region, but... We are still dealing with all of this amazing amount of pollen. It's the time of the year, so it's off the charts tomorrow and again on Monday. So high pollen count again today. Blame the trees. We love the trees, but they certainly could cause some issues out there. No issues once again with our forecast. 11 M, 62 degrees. Once again, that's when the parade starts in uptown Charlotte. Expecting thousands of people up there for the festival as well. Should be a fun time. And between about 4 and 6 today, we'll be in the low 70s. I would say there may be many, many spots that actually get into the mid-70s this afternoon, but I would say averaging about 70, 71 degrees across the area today. Not expecting rain, no storms. We scanned the skies. Rain and storm free. We did have the showers that moved across the area yesterday. It will expand the view. That system is off Carolina coastline. Some showers off there and then way to the south of us across Florida. Once again, we're about 71 degrees right in the middle of the afternoon across the two state area today. The hot spot is going to be Charleston, South Carolina, 83 degrees out there and another coastal community, Cape Hatteras on the outer banks. 59. The cool reading will be in the mid 70s at Greenville, Spartanburg, Columbia, up about 79 degrees. We've got travel plans down there. The capital of South Carolina, the capital city of North Carolina, Raleigh at 70, 64 at Boone, over in Asheville at 71 degrees. In case you're heading to Biltmore. Now, watch this change in temperatures. We've got nice weather this weekend. Look at those drops in the temperatures Monday and Tuesday. We see a rebound for the middle of the weekend towards the end of the next week. Next weekend, we'll see temperatures drop a few degrees below average for today. Boone hits about 64, blowing rock tops out about 63. Up around Jefferson, West Jefferson, low to mid-60s there. Morganton, Lenore, Tailsville, Hickory, Maiden, all much like we see here in our area. It'll be in the low to mid-70s and about the same from Monroe to Wadesburg, Rockingham, and Chesterfield down there in South Carolina. Checking the guy roofing 70 forecast through the weekend and beyond. Low to mid 70s today. Tomorrow we'll look for mostly sunny skies. We put that 20% chance in. Most of the year has will not have a chance to rain at all. And then we see 58. That's right. That's not a mistake. That's 58 for high temperature on Monday. Tuesday morning, a frosty morning, cold at 32, high 59. Then we see a rebound Wednesday and Thursday. It looks like by next Friday, here we go, another Friday with a chance of showers with temperatures in the low 60s. That's your forecast this morning. And is continuing to fight for his life tonight after a triple shooting in Mooresville left him hospitalized. A suspect and two victims dead. The Iredell County Sheriff's Office responded to a call, shots fired call on Home Drive Saturday night. When they arrived, they say they found three people tied up, two victims already dead. Another person in critical condition was taken to the hospital. Shortly after, deputies then got information leading them to another home on Oswald Amity Road in connection to the suspect in the incident. And that's where an hours long standoff took place before coming to a deadly end. WCNC Charlotte's Anna King has the latest on the investigation. Neighbors in Iredale County say they were jolted out of their sleep to the sound of multiple gunshots Saturday. Those shots were coming from a home on Oswald Amity Road. Deputies with Iredale County Sheriff's Office say they were trying to take 39 year old Justin Strawyer into custody. They say Saturday night he tied three people up at a home on Home Drive in Mooresville. Officials say Strawyer killed two of those victims, 22 year old Eduardo Cordova and 24 year old Caleb Loper. The third victim is in the hospital in Charlotte. Officials say shortly after the shooting, Strawyer barricaded himself inside the home on Oswald and Mitty Drive. They say he was shooting his AR-15 when they arrived on scene. For hours, there were negotiations to get him out, as well as four juveniles who deputies say were in the home and refused to come out as well. Deputies eventually used gas to get everyone out of the home, and they say Strawyer followed the juveniles out while shooting at deputies. Officers then returned fire, shooting and killing Strawyer. The Iredell County Sheriff says the crimes that took place on the home were not random and notes drugs and robbery are a possible motive. In Mooresville, Anna King, WCNC Charlotte. The North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation will now lead the investigation. And as per protocol, three deputies are on administrative leave.
Thanks, Brad. There's an ongoing study, though, in Gastonia analyzing barriers to housing and then recommending how to remove them. The goal here is to implement policies that create more affordable housing and then address the disparities. But it does seem like the city is falling short in some places and has been for years. WCNC Charlotte's Julia Kaufman takes a closer look. A third party analysis found five main issues that are making it harder for people to find fair housing in Gastonia and the barriers go beyond affordability. The Gastonia City Council's Housing Committee received an update Monday on the federally required housing study that's done every five years. Of course, there's a limited supply of affordable housing. City data says rent prices have nearly doubled since 2015. But Director of Housing Danette Dyes says the analysis also found there's limited housing supply for those persons with disability. The same problem was found in 2019, and the study says the city has not implemented anything yet to try to address it. Making sure that our most vulnerable citizens and those people who have the least voice are not left behind and don't fall through the cracks. Um, and I think that the, the study definitely showed that some of that does happen. Housing Committee Chairman Robert Kellogg says the city is working to update its zoning codes so it can be more inclusive with development. As we implement more ways to build and more ways to include different zoning opportunities, that that would also help individuals who are disabled. Gastonia leaders adopted an affordable housing plan in fall 2023. Goals in the 10 year plan include creating a housing trust fund and building a housing resource center. I think there's definitely room to improve, but I think we're on the right track. Researchers want your feedback on the fair housing analysis and recommendations before they present them to the city council next month. We have details on how you can participate on WCNC.com. WCNC Charlotte. Good morning, Carolina. Tune in to the team that's preparing you for your day. We are following two major breaking news stories this morning. See the difference in your morning. We can see clear skies out there off of the distance. Everything is flowing just fine. We're asking where's the money so you can get ahead in 2024. Responsible reporting, community focused, unique content. Good morning, Savannah. Hi, Sarah. Great to see you. See the difference weekday mornings on WCNC Charlotte. Living in a neighborhood run by a homeowners associations association has its upsides and downsides. A Mooresville family found themselves asking where's the money after discovering some of their HOA's approved colors didn't even exist anymore. The family picked a color they liked only to be hit with a thousand dollar fine until neighbors stepped in. Kenneth Threed and his wife, Tisha, say most of the time they've enjoyed their house at the end of a quiet cul-de-sac in the meadows at Reed Creek Community. They've always taken pride in its upkeep. I'm a peaceful guy, you know, in this neighborhood I've been 18 years. Um, we never had no problems. But things started stirring up last fall when the couple decided to refresh their home's exterior paint. Threet admits it was almost completely painted before he learned he needed to fill out a request for architectural approval. So I went to the HOA representative and she said to me, this color you have is not an approved color. After requesting a hearing in which the Threets were denied permission to keep their darker shade of gray, Threet says the board told them they'd have to change the color. We want to be in compliance um, with, with the HOA rules and regulations. So we was trying to work with them. Three then took a drive around his neighborhood. I found out that there was other colors in the neighborhood that was not approved colors. So to be clear, Three says other neighbors had homes painted in colors that were not approved. We were not able to determine whether those neighbors requested and received HOA permission before painting. Either way, Three says he was told to change theirs or else. They charged us $1,000 fine for not having the right color. Another neighbor, Mark Lepard, says he could empathize. The personal feeling was that uh, not everyone on the board had complete empathy with a lot of the requests that were being made. And it just so happened last month, homeowners voted in new HOA board members, including Lepard. From what I've heard personally, there was an overwhelming amount of people that did want to see a difference in the way that the, the rules are enforced on them. Three is one of them. Thank God for Mark and 
the ones that came on. The new board has signed off on the, the paint colors that they chose, and so they don't have to paint their house. Um, they were assessed some fines, and we've waived those, and so they're good to go. It worked out for the Threets, but he says the last several months have been stressful. It also serves as a reminder if you live in a neighborhood run by an HOA to read the guidelines when it comes to changing or adding to the appearance of your house. Homeowners usually have to fill out an application for an architectural review for major changes. It'll save time and aggravation knowing if you can proceed with any kind of construction or remodeling work. Well, if you've been here in Charlotte for a couple of years or maybe longer, you've seen Charlotte continue to grow. But as businesses come and go, there's one local business that is standing the test of time. Dilworth Mattress Factory has been in Charlotte for 92 years, opening up in 1931 during the height of the Depression. WCNC Charlotte's Jesse Pierre spoke to the owners about how they have helped folks rest easy for decades. Mm -hmm. Dilworth Mattress Factory has been in the Dilworth South End community for over 90 years, and there are generations of history behind this door. The photo of Dilworth Mattress Factory founder Thomas Philbeck firmly mounted to the wall. When he started it as a um, as a mattress refurbish business, he would. It was right after the Great Depression. Since 1931, the company has evolved from a mattress repair shop to handmade custom orders helping folks rest easy. We start with a traditional spring right like this on some mattresses. Scott Hirsch picked up the family business and is the current owner where the work is all about the feels. We can make this side soft and this side firm. Along with his wife, Dory Hirsch, who showed off a mattress fit for a queen. This is the only mattress that we actually do not make in our factory. It holds the royal warrant, and this is actually what the entire royal family sleeps on. The factory, in its third location in 92 years, is surrounded by new development. Hurst says he's been around to see a lot of the changes. Plenty of mattress stores have come and gone since we've been here, and, and plenty of businesses in the South End area have come and gone. He says referrals and repeat customers keep their operations from taking a snooze. And the pandemic came along, and people weren't really going out. So it kind of introduced us into uh, mattress sale by appointment only. Adapting with the times, Dilworth Mattress Factory is springing forward to a century and beyond. Sold to generations to generations and kids of, ki kids of parents and, and, th and their kids now. So um, I think it's important for us to continue this uh, tradition. Jesse Pierre, WCNC Charlotte. I'm astonished by the bed for you the Royals. About that. Yeah, I mean, I know it's not the exact bed that they sleep on, but I want, yeah, I want to know more about that. I'm gonna have to ask Jesse. Ask the Royals. Or yeah, they'll, they'll dish on how it feels. Is I'm it just, angelic, I'm just like sleeping on a cloud? Yeah, like yeah. how do they get in touch with them anyway? That caught my eye too. Yeah. All right. Well. When I think about the community, I think about the time that I've been here. I've been in this community almost my entire adult life, so I, I, you, know, you get to know the people. When you know what they care about, then that's what you care about. This community looks at all of us who do weather here at WCNC Charlotte as part of their family. And uh, when you're part of their family, you want to make sure you do it just for them. Time now to connect the dots. When we make the news, make sense. President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris set to campaign here in North Carolina later this month once again. And Democrats think he has a real shot at winning the state come November. Down ballot races could help President Joe Biden pull out a win in the 